of that entire team. Okay, that's why there's some call it times called the hooker, because they hook the ball with their foot. They're the only ones that do that. And in theory, they don't focus on the movement of the team because they know the team will carry them, so to speak, over onto the ball. The person on the eight, though, is able to step back and look at the entire situation underneath everyone's feet, the terrain, and anchor the team in place. Okay, so those are all teammates working together. But does your team see their situation like that? There's someone over the user story of highest value, the must-have user story of the entire sprint. We're going to make sure that person is carried around and protected. But you way back there who might only be working on shoulds or coulds in the current sprint, you have an, a different job that's equally important. You're to look at the lay of the land. You're to look at all our feet, where we're situated, how we're working together or failing to work together, and you're going to help us anchor. So um, that's something to think about um, when it comes to the team itself, okay? Any questions so far? No? Okay. Hey, Mike, uh, just a question on the, uh, yeah, that um, mm -hmm. Kanban um, image. Hey, could you go over the, the Q&A section again? Is, is that like Q&A as yeah. in quality assurance? Um, in software, it would potentially be Q&A. Um, you could have different steps. I just made it really small um, for the purpose of the slide. Oh. I've seen different statuses. Uh, the one thing about status is, is that every status is potential waste. So you have to also consider that is, do we break out dev into different pieces? like? design versus dev versus documentation? Do we break out QA to um, unit testing versus uh, functional testing versus automated testing? You know, like there is inherent waste in having too many steps. So I made it really light, lightweight. But in theory, when you look at the board, there's a lot of stuff going on. You have color coding going on. So if you were to compare this to other tools, like DE stands for defect, user story for user story. So you can see green is money, Red is we embarrassed ourselves, and we have to clean it up. Okay. Another thing on this is you see these little icons here. That would be considered something called churn. Mm. So instead of having defect reports, I like churn reports. Okay. So churn is any time an issue goes in reverse in the workflow. It doesn't matter if it's a user story, a feature, a defect, a spike user story, um, a subtask, or whatever agile tool you're using. But the nature of, we should be moving forward, but we're not. And in fact, we're going worse. We're going in reverse because we're really screwed up. Okay, so a lot of people focus on defects. My definition of defects normally kind of surprises some agile coaches. Mine is that once you deliver something outside the team, you can't unring that bell. Right? Once you deliver something to a customer, whether it's a software service or tangible good, you can't say, oh, give that back to me, you didn't see it. Um, at that point, it is a defect, no question asked. Whether you call it a defect or a bug, that's up to you. No difference in my mind, but whatever terminology works for your Agile tool. However, when you're within the team and you're just working on a user story and the user story says, make you know, the download button red, and the QA engineer looks at it and says, I understand you're colorblind, that's blue. So change the hex you know, code of the color to this. And since I can see those two different colors and you can't, understandable, um, I will pass the story. Some companies say send a defect back because we really want to track who's screwing up. And you're kind of like, well, that's, that's not the behavior I'm really looking for. I'm looking for collaboration. So from a product manager's point of view, he has a simple question. Is the story ready for production? Answer is no, right? So he didn't say, oh, it's ready. Oh, but with defects? Oh, okay, that's nice. That sounds a lot better, right? No, that doesn't sound better at all. So if we're trying to build loyalty with the people who present the business value, you want the conversation to be consistent. The story is done or it's not. There is no, the story is done, but whoa, 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 we have these problems. Well, then it's not done. Right? You're just embarrassing yourself with terminology when it comes to the business. Because the business is like, we don't care about the factory. So 
sending the story back to development or worse yet, back to the backlog because the requirements were poor. Like someone said, make the website fast. What the hell does that mean, right? Fast to me could be five seconds. Fast to you could be three because you're on Wi-Fi and I'm on 3G out in, you know, like in a, a cow pasture or something, right? And so my perception of speed is a lot different than yours. And even worse, when you get to a developer who's in the code, he's like, that's, that's, that's 13 milliseconds to me. Right. And so you're losing track of what fast means. Um, so QA fails something because they think fast means something. Then dev is like, no, 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 I don't think it means that. And then the product owner is like, yeah, fast was a bad term. Send it back to the backlog and I'll go research it. So what has happened is two layers of churn. It's not defects. It is churn. And so we're after the behavioral pattern of the product owner themselves. Product owners should never use the word fast, um, should never use nice to have or make it pretty or, you know, any of those weird perception based terms uh, with no mock ups or anything to support it. So that's why I encourage people to use churn as a reporting mechanism, because anything over like a churn rate of three is when I would start getting conf uh, confused right, or concerned is I understand QA and Dev are going to go back and forth, back and forth on some things. That's fine. But once you go beyond two or three and you're into four or five, like how much rework is that costing us? How much downtime is that burning? And uh, if you would call it a uh, product manager would see it cost of delivery. So that's would be my recommendation to the people on this call is that when people are like, give me a defect report and you're like, or, okay, are you focusing on the things that are in prod where we told a customer it works like A and it works like B? Because that's embarrassing and I agree. Let's get those reports. But if you're focusing on the, the actual development cycle, I want you to focus on churn because it's about behavior. Gotcha. And gotcha. See how they take that. Gotcha. That's very helpful, yep. Michael. Is churn a, a word used in Scrum? I, I don't recall um, here in Scrum. So is, is it a Kanban thing? No, it tends to be an, a, a tool thing. Uh -huh. So um, depending on the, the agile tool or uh, just behaviors of analytic type people, they'll use the word churn rate. So uh, in uh, JIRA, you can add a custom field using uh, one of the many workflow add-ons that'll allow you to increment that field by one. So every time you move it back on the workflow, it'll automatically up the churn rate in the tool. Um, in Rally, uh, unless you use custom script, scripting, you have to remind teams to just up the, the field manually. So a lot of it depends on the tool, and we just add a custom field for it for churn. Okay. Okay, we had a comment in from Paul. I don't know if you can see it. Um, he says, I had not heard the term churn before in this context, but it's very applicable to what the project, what my project team is experiencing this week. Interesting. So I'm glad I don't work in Paul's company. Just kidding, Paul. Paul's like, wait a second. He just had that deer in headlights look. Um, but churn, I, I think when you use the word churn, you can use it in so many contexts, right? And the advantage of that is, remember, if we say Agile is about loyalty, how do I build loyalty with my product owner? How do I build loyalty with my business? How do I build loyalty between dev and QA? You don't do that by putting up a wall that says, how many defects did you write? How many defects did you close? You know, it, it, were the requirements right? Like everyone starts getting so defensive. But when you say, let's just use this word called churn. And they're like, you know, what's that? Are we making butter? Um, are we on a boat that's suddenly going in reverse and all the water behind the boat is churning like crazy, right? Like you give them these analogies that help them step away from their work for a second. <laughs> and then suddenly they're like, yeah, yeah, we have a lot of churn. Okay, is the churn around a certain set of functionality? Is the churn around a certain process? Is the churn around a certain role? You know, that, that's when it becomes interesting to discuss because maybe churn is around a certain set of functionality. Great. But then when you start diving into the requirements of that functionality, it's always like haphazard at best. Okay, and then you say, okay, product owner, why do we keep having haphazard? Well, the customers behind that functionality are very custom and they're very regulated government entities. Like now we're starting to understand the behavioral pattern, what's causing that to occur. So now the team realizes that. Uh, they might say, well, can you invite a couple of those people to the demo going forward? 
so that before we get into new sprints, at least they get like a slight preview as to what the heck is going on. So then we can reduce churn just by nature of people being informed, right? And so that's the goal is we've changed the behavioral pattern, uh, not by being defensive, but by analyzing the, if you call it the trail of tears, uh, you typically start with the symptoms, team not delivering, uh, teams having problems with requirements, but then you get, you keep going back in time and you find the actual problem. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Paul's like, I'm never making a comment again. All right, so looking at the uh, Kanban videos, here's some videos we would look at. As you can tell, my class tends to be uh, sometimes fun. Um, Hoosiers, the hot potato scene when they're passing the ball back and forth. What it shows you is that story size affects speed between cycles and that if you're constantly passing the same size story, a basketball or um, a baseball or a, a one single size box, you get used to that pass, right? You get used to the actual action, uh, the weight of the box or the, uh, or the, of the ball itself, the contour of the ball, how it feels. Um, you, instead of looking at the ball, you start looking at the person, right? And then eventually you get so good, you start looking at the next person that's coming. So you're not even looking at the ball coming at you. You're not looking at the person that's sending it to you. You're actually looking at the next chain of event in preparation. And you're examining that person. Do they have big hands? They might be able to catch it. Oh, they have little hands or they're not as tall and I'm going to have to adjust. So you're already planning ahead because you've taken what a lot of people focus on is, you know, story size, this story size, that, this many hours, this many hours, and no one's bothering to look ahead because they can't. But if we were able to say, listen, every box on the conveyor belt is the same size. We'd be able to track how things get loaded into the trucks better. We'd be able to hand boxes off between people. Think of UPS and FedEx. You know, they ideally want every box to be the same size, right? There's a reason why they say oversize on a lot of boxes, right? And the goal is efficiency. So also when it comes to 300 uh, in the movie, later in the movie, the teams start becoming offensive. They, they leave that cavern and they start getting on the battlefield. But what happens is they start spreading out. Okay. Um, yes, some of them have shields and others have, you know, multiple swords or they drop their spear and get their sword. So they're changing their weapons, their mechanics, uh, because they become offensive. So if you're applying the same meeting structure of scrum to Kanban, you have a problem. You're applying the defensive mentality to an offensive, um, layout and that creates problems. Uh, Transformers 2. Uh, what's incremental about his delivery in one scene is when Optimus Prime is alone in the field and all these uh, Decepticons are attacking him. He's attacking them all together, but he slices them off one piece at a time. Like he, you know, hacks off one of their metallic arms, uh, punches one in the eye, jumps over one. So he's incremental in that he's, if you call it slicing it piece by piece, he's not a, going after one transformer all on its own until it's done. He's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So the same could be true with the development team. They have to realize, is our stuff small enough and the same size that allows us to break our work up appropriately, uh, throw, if you would say, a ball in the air while another one is landing my arm. Uh, that could be spinning this build up in the QA environment. It's going to take an hour to run uh, while this other one was already delivered yesterday. So I'm going to start testing that. You know, and you're moving things around. Um, in the Discovery Channel uh, video that I was showing uh, people, and this was all about juggling, his peripheral vision was, was key. You can tell if someone's a good juggler because their eyes stay focused and they never move while things around them are, you know, moving, okay? Bad jugglers are like, you know, and they're all over the place and, they're, and then their arms start moving and their bodies start moving and that's bad jugglers. We're all bad jugglers. The question is some of us are good ones. Okay, and the good ones don't move their eyes, they don't move their bodies aside from their arms just going side to side, but they have this calmness about them, okay? All right, so regardless of story size, the team's um, way of doing things does not change. Whether you have a large story or a small story, the way they approach it will always be the same. So keep that in mind that things compound and 
if you have a 21 point story and then suddenly a five point story and then an eight point story, the team shows up the same mentality, right? They say, Hey, do I need to design some stuff? Hey, do I need to document some stuff? Hey, do I need to test some stuff? Um, they're approaching it from the same behavior. Okay. So we're going to skip a section here because I don't have a certain video to show you. Okay. The ultimate product owner, this person. They went from the idea of serving all dishes at once to serving each dish in the order that it's on the menu. And we don't think twice of that today. You open up a menu uh, at some sports bar and you're going there to watch NFL or hockey or something. And you look at the appetizers, you expect the appetizers to come before the entree. Right? You expect the salad to come before the entree. You expect normally, unless you tell them, the dessert to come after the entree. That's because you're looking at the order of the things on the menu and you appreciate the delivery pattern. So this ultimate product owner who was a uh, chef, the idea way back when was you ordered your meal and they wheeled it out on this cart, right? And they brought it to your table and everything was laid out and you were done. Um, he changed that completely. That's a market change, right? So every chef from that point forward, for the most part, has followed the idea that you lay out the menu in the order that you would typically deliver it. Okay? And then on top of that, we go, you know, the salad plates tend to be cold. The entree plates tend to be room temperature or warm. The dessert plates, depending on what type of dessert it is, could be warm or cold. So that's something also to keep in mind is that when you change this massive dynamic, suddenly other processes start changing because of the way we work. Here's an actual recipe for Cinnabon. It's very good. Um, I had to make this for a small startup I was working at, and they had about 70 people there. This makes about 12 Cinnabons, give or take. Depends on how much you're eating along the way. Okay, so about 12 Cinnabons. When I had to make it at scale for 70, uh, here's my countertop. Here's all the equipment I needed. Obviously, I went to Costco, as you can tell here, right? And I got all this stuff here. No one sells Philadelphia cream cheese in bulk like that except Costco. So the problem is that when we go to our software development team or some service-oriented organization like marketing or sales, and you dump on them a bunch of stories like this with acceptance criteria and tasking inside of it called, you know, ingredients could be the acceptance criteria. The tasking could actually be the directions of how to build it. When you do it for one set, that's fine. However, the moment that you do it for at scale and say, here's my roadmap and here's the 50 stories behind it and here's the 200 tasks behind it, the, the team's just trying to get their head around the situation. So the one problem is that when they lay everything out in their brain, they have no room to work. They can't roll out the dough. They can't actually physically do the work because they're stuck. So don't overburden your team with showing them everything. And a lot of people think Agile should be so visible that you can see everything and anything at any time. There is a, a limit to how much you can control in your head and laying it out. So I don't show everything to the software teams until things are in certain positions where it makes sense. For example, they don't need to know these are the 1,000 ideas that product management had this year, and we got them down to 10. Do they really need to know about those 990 things they decided not to do? Could be interesting if you sum it up, but they don't have time to read all that. Uh, so that's just the 10 features we're gonna do. Then as the 10 features are coming down the pipe, the team is only working on one to three features a pop in parallel max or nothing gets done. So do I really need them to see all seven features in detail that they're not doing yet? Probably not. It, they might need to know where we're going so that they can build a better product to say, whoa, 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 are you saying in Q4 you want that? That's like tripling our user base. Okay, so that makes sense. But getting into, well, the parameters of the API in Q4 will be, you know, that, that's not gonna help them. All right, so moving through that, just think about that, that showing them everything all the time is not conducive to efficiency, okay? You need to sum up things in certain areas so that they know where they're going, 
But the details of how to move the cruise ship along the time um, when you're not even at the port of call probably isn't helping them. Okay. Uh, here's something from Michael Cohen's book about uh, dog point sizing. This is something you can use to test your team. And you put all these dogs up on the wall and say, okay, scale them from one to 30. And you just hand them the slide. And if they start going up there and putting points up there, you just stop them all and say, what the heck are you guys doing? And they're like, you're doing what, we told, what you told us to do. No, actually, you're doing something wrong. Look at the slide I gave you. And they look at it and say, as a product owner, is that really the user? Okay. What's bigness mean? Because bigness could be the Great Dane or bigness could be the Chihuahua. Depends on what you're looking for, right? Attitude or height. Um, proper dog for my family. What's your family? Do you have kids with special needs? Are you in a, um, an apartment complex? Are you in a house? Are you on a ranch? So sometimes using these team exercises, you tweak it just a little to show them, just like that exercise that I talked about earlier was, you're either a team or you're just a team. And when you start jumping the gun here, so to speak, and doing these things, you're just acting like another team. I can find another vendor who wouldn't pay attention to the user story easily. I can find someone cheaper to do that too. But I want you to do as a collaborative, agile, preferably co-located team is stop for a second and look at what is being requested. Because in the end, if you get this wrong, we have something called churn. And churn in requirements, churn in delivery, and worst case scenario, churn in customers. Churning customers is terrible. It's harder to win a customer back you lost than to get a new one. So churn applies everywhere. And if they apply that in their head, they realize, yeah, I need to pay attention to that. You'll hear about the invest model quite, um, quite often. Independent, negotiable, valuable, estimable, small, and testable. And the reason for that is when you're writing a user story is, do these apply? Um, if you can't negotiate on anything, it's fixed. Thereby, it's not very agile-like. Um, if the team is like, why the heck are we doing this in the first place? And you said, well, don't worry about it. The, the business said we just need to get it done. You're not being very agile in value. It's a value-based methodology. So if you remove the V, what, what are we doing? Um, testable. I love that part. Um, you look at the person and say, how would you test them? So they say, I, I don't know. And the team's like, okay, we'll get started. You're like, well, what just happened? Right? If I can't confirm that it works, you almost want to re uh, replace testable with demoable. If you can't test it, what business do we have demoing it? Right? So something to think about from an invest standpoint is are you investing in the stories, investing in your features, investing in your roadmap to help people understand that um, this is how Agile is applied. So when you apply invest to the dog size stuff, uh, again, what is bigness? You know, what's the value proposition? Um, can we truly estimate this? How can I test without a clear understanding of value? Like they start working off of each other. Um, user story practices. <clears throat> what to avoid if possible is like the SQL and inputting of code. Now, if you're working in like a big data environment, um, an analytical platform, it's understandable that you would say, we need to pull the data from these tables or we're working on normalizing the database. So this user story is about collapsing these tables and moving it here. Um, when you run this query, it should run this fast. Then you know, that makes sense because of the value you're asking for. But if you're writing a fresh website and you're telling them how to actually write the code, why don't you just farm it out to somebody? Because at that point, you don't need an Agile team. You don't need any collaboration at that point. Uh, Moscow rating is our, our next slide, so we'll cover that. Using pictures, oh my goodness. I've asked so many product owners to do this and they fight you tooth and nail because they don't think it's valuable until you stop everybody in the middle of a requirements meeting and you go up to the whiteboard and start drawing the system. And then you say, what do you want to change? And they say, oh, right there, bubble number three. This is what I want to change. And then I say, developer, come on up here. Here's another color. It, it was black on the, on the board. Here's green. 
show us how you'd actually code that thing. And they start circling things and saying, what are we going to do here? Like, product owner, you gave me a visualization. Great. Now I see what's in your head, but you totally missed something. This requires that data. Are you getting us a data set? And then you give the red uh, marker to the QA engineer, and they come up and say, how the heck would I test it? I mean, come on, guys. This API calls on this, but it's only on batch files. But according to the acceptance requirements, it says real-time data. Are we doing a batch? Are we doing it real time? I mean, are you totally changing the entire system here, product owner? What are you doing? Okay, and when you're able to visualize things and communicate with visualization, it cuts down on so much garbage and churn of user store requirements. So using pictures constantly, I don't care if you have to draw it on a whiteboard and write the acceptance criteria next to it, Take a picture on your smartphone, attach it to the Jira ticket or the rally user story or the version one user story so that when you open it up in pre-planning meeting, people say, okay, I see the requirements there and the acceptance criteria. Open up the picture real quick. That doesn't match because you said this and that's what the picture says. So what's, the, what's going on here? Um, so that's using pictures is really easy. If you don't know how to take a picture on your smartphone, I don't know what people are doing saying they're product owners. Um, another thing, walk the business through how this feature is supported. Uh, this can be done in a couple ways. One of the easiest ways is make your acceptance criteria chronological. So you almost want to be able to open up the user story on demo day. And the QA engineer or the developer literally walks through acceptance criteria. All right, so starting with number one, the assumption was they came into the system by means of such process, which means they have this type of file in this format. Here it is. Step number one says we must pull that file in and adjust this field. Okay, I'm gonna show it to you now. Okay, when we adjust that field, it's supposed to kick off these two processes. Notice the first process kicked off right away. The second one was on a delay because do remember, even though it's not in the acceptance criteria, there is a delay on that import process. Okay, so the user story, since it's chronological, is allowing anyone to be cross-trained because they watch it. It allows the product owner to be reinforced as to this is what you asked for, is this what you want? And then the business or anyone like in support that watches the demo is like, oh, that's how it's supposed to run. Well, hold on, and step number five, can you go back to step number five? When that ran, you didn't show any log files. You didn't show anything that indicated that it was complete. How would I know as a support guy that that is complete, right? And so people are starting to get engaged in your product. And if anything, they're saying, this doesn't feel right. And that's exactly what you want in a demo meeting, is the idea that someone says something doesn't feel right, or this does feel right. Uh, they're connecting their limbic brain, their emotional side of their brain to your product line, as opposed to feature one, check, feature two, check. That's your neocortex. If you can get people's limbic brains attached and be loyal to your product or your service, um, that's the ideal state to be in. And a lot of that is based on how you write user stories. Uh, Moscow, must have, should have, could have, won't have. Okay, so this is a rating I use uh, quite often with my product owners. And this rating applies at many different layers. Um, I don't know how many layers your companies all have, but let's say it's a real huge enterprise. You have portfolio, you have program, you have teams. So Moscow at different layers means a different thing. You know, for example, let's, let's dumb it down to something pretty lightweight. I have a feature which has Moscow rated stories in it. Then on top of that, I have a release. So I'm going to have five releases for this feature. It's a really big feature. In release number one, here are my musts to release, my shoulds, and hopefully my could. However, if you don't deliver my shoulds and coulds in the first release, they become musts in the second release. All right, so let's look at the first release. You have a bunch of user stories. And you say, out of this release, how many sprints do we need to accomplish this big release? Two sprints? Three sprints? Okay, cool. So in my first sprint, here's my must, my shoulds, my coulds. If you don't get the shoulds or coulds done, they might become a, a must in the second sprint. And if you still don't get them done by the third sprint, they are definitely a must because the release just can't go. So helping people understand that Moscow applies at different layers um, even in a sprint, you want must, should, could. And you're like, why? Why wouldn't everything be a must? Think of the Kentucky Derby. All the horses line up in a horse gate. 
right? When the bell rings, the horse gate opens. Do the horses go in different directions? No, they all follow the path laid out in front of them. So when you look at the sprint plan, you're saying the first round of the actual track is the musts. Between the second and third area of the track are the shoulds, and the last quarter mile of the track are the coulds. So team, when you show up on the second day of a 10-day sprint and someone says, yeah, 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 I'm working on my should, everybody stop. Explain this to me like I'm an idiot. You're working on a should, your teammates are not done with their musts, and in fact, you have a must and you haven't even started. What the heck are you doing? Why are you working on a should? It doesn't make any logical sense. Okay, so it's not about the points, it's not about the hours, it's not about the requirements, it's not about churn, it's about something that disarms people very quickly. Why are you working on a should when the musts aren't done? And if you can't explain that, I suggest you stop. You know, so that disarms people quite rapidly. Uh, this was taken from uh, the Agile Testing Book by, uh, with Lisa Crispin. <clears throat> uh, they have this model in here. So when someone says, I'm testing, you're kind of like, what type of testing? And if your acceptance criteria just says QA testing or dev testing, it's not educating you as a product owner to what are we testing and more importantly, what are we not testing? Are we not testing performance? Are we not testing security? Do we plan on being the next Home Depot with our credit cards being stolen like, or like Home Depot and Target in the news? Um, do we plan on not actually testing the story? So when we show up on demo days, should I be impressed or should I be scared? Right? And so this educates the team as to maybe they don't have the skills to do scalability testing. Maybe you don't have the tools to do it. But thereby, since I listed out what type of tests we're doing, functional and usability and exploratory, that meant you're not doing these? Yeah. Okay. Is that, what's that reason? Well, we don't have the skill for that. Those guys are really, really expensive and we don't even have those tools. Okay, so until that time happens, when we're willing to pay for that, I as a product owner am accepting that we're not doing X scalability testing. Well, we only have 100 users on the system, so I'm not too concerned. But before we go to 5,000, I better figure out how we're going to handle that. Okay, I got it. Okay, so that's what this type of test measures are for. Okay, we're going to get into acceptance criteria versus acceptance test criteria. Think of a restaurant. Here's acceptance criteria. Okay, so notice the menu on the right-hand side here versus acceptance test criteria is this. So if you're looking at a medium T-bone steak, the acceptance test criteria could potentially fall into this. And a lot of people use these terms interchangeably, but if you're talking to a QA engineer, you could really freak them out if you use acceptance test criteria when you're talking to them using that term because their mind suddenly triggers. Oh, 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 you're asking about this, boundary testing and stuff like that. No, that's not what I'm asking for. Well, you say acceptance test criteria, make up your mind. Okay, so be very cautious. Uh, most product owners are focused on acceptance criteria. They're focused on, again, the delivery. Like if this is what came into the kitchen, you're already talking about, oh, um, side salad, not a primary, appetizer salad. So this goes out actually with the T-bone. Got it. Okay, so you're actually talking about delivery pattern by nature of the acceptance criteria itself. Um, it's business value oriented. If you're looking at a website, for example, you have like why slow out there and a couple things where it grades your website. If you're using a mobile application, you're using something like X Mirage, which allows you to take your iPad and put it on the screen. Okay, so this is demoable. Um, these are the tools that would test acceptance criteria for the most part. And you can even get technical. This is something called Charles Proxy. And by the way, it's one of the best apps I've ever used before. It's really cool. If your acceptance criteria said the website needs to load in one second, according to this um, array, it says 1.2 seconds is how long it took. And the product owner is jumping up and down, jumping up and down, saying, well, why, oh, why me? Why this? And the team says, okay. See all these calls going on here? Yeah. You see this PNG? A PNG is a picture file. Okay, yeah, I don't understand how this means that I went over 1.2 seconds. Well, hang on a second. 
you see this long bar here on the right of how long it took to load? Yeah, that's because you were an idiot. You told us that on an e-commerce website, every picture had to be high definition graphics. I don't know where you got that idea from because Amazon doesn't even do that. They don't do high def because they want the page to load fast. Because if it doesn't load fast, you don't buy. If you click on the picture, then they'll load the high definition graphic because you asked for it. But they don't do that every time. And we told you that this would cause a problem and you didn't listen. So the best we could come up with is 1.2 seconds. So either A, remove the acceptance criteria about high definition graphics, or B, change your acceptance criteria about the duration of the page load because it's just not physically possible and I'm showing you how it actually worked in this tool. So by nature, this would educate the product owner to understand and be loyal to the team. Instead of blaming them, they get it. And then here's the Twitter fail whale, okay? Performance is acceptance criteria. So when you look at this, a different uh, marketing information here, Amazon loses nearly a million an hour if they're down. So if you were to say, our website, if it's down, we lose $50,000 an hour. Okay, so when the team says we're only gonna have 99% uptime, that means we're only down for 3.65 days, which means we almost lost $4 million. Or are you willing to invest in the tools the labor dollars, the delay of features to market window to get us down to 99.99% because now we're down to $43,833. However, between those two levels are maybe two, three, four million dollars of labor licensing and technology. So you have to offset that to say, is it really worth the cost? Don't know. But don't tell me we shouldn't know what our uptime is because it equates to money. But You'd be surprised how my product owners don't know what their uptime should be. And the business is kind of like, well, we just want it to be up and online. Well, what's that mean? Right? And then when it's down, everyone's upset and you're kind of like, but we're up 99% of the year. Well, that's, that's unacceptable. Well, you never told me it wasn't. Okay, so this equates to a lot of money. So getting into acceptance test criteria about the T-bone. Here's our uh, boundary testing. It's typically encoding language uses different applications to test it. So if you're looking at Cucumber, um, yes, it is written in somewhat business speak, but in the background, it is running code. And then here's fitness. And then here's RubyMine running code in the background, writing uh, acceptance tests. So I'll pause here before we dive into more stuff. And uh, what we are going to cover is some stuff around user stories, a little bit on story pointing. Uh, we're probably going to skip most of the meetings of Scrum uh, because we just won't have time. Uh, we'll cover velocity and capacity so you know the difference of terms depending on the tools you're using and the frameworks. And then we're going to get into some metrics. So at least you guys have an idea of like where we can get going here. So how about I pause here now that you know like what's coming, and more importantly what's not. Um, any questions, comments, concerns? No, I'll just say it's been extremely helpful going over a lot of this stuff in some greater level of detail than I've um, experienced in the past. And um, yeah, looking forward to what's coming ahead. Are you going to show us any of the, the, the tools you mentioned, like Rally or, or Jira or any of those? I could, I could show you my personal edition of Jira. Um, I can't open up my my uh, main companies because I'd be in a lot of legal trouble. <laughs> but I could uh, I could show you my personal edition so you could see it. Okay, yeah, that will be nice later on when, when we come back. So how how long should we break for? Oh, yeah, I was just going to continue going. I was just breaking for the uh, purpose of questions. Oh, I see. Okay, <laughs> I thought you needed a break. Okay. Oh no 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 not yet. <clears throat> um, any other questions comments anything? Oh, yeah, uh, we're going to jump into user stories here because you know that's fun. Um, as a financial officer, I want the revenue report to be exportable on the downloads page so I, that I may forward the report to outside vendors. If you would have said, as a product owner, I want the revenue report to be exportable, you would have lost a lot of things. Number one, financial officer has a different technical aptitude than the product owner himself. Forwarding a revenue report about vendors to outside vendors is a security nightmare waiting to happen, right? 
Now that I understand who's doing it, their level of authority in the company, which means they see everything. The financial officer has access to everything when it comes to finance, right? So if I give him a revenue report, he sees everything. Names, addresses, contacts, money, contract numbers, payment methods. And then you're gonna do what with it? Send it to an outside vendor? Are you crazy? So if we're protecting quality at all costs, the value of the company, the value of the story, the value of the feature, right away, since it's written this way, the team can say, stop. Sure, I can develop anything, but I don't want it to be my last sprint working here. So what are you doing? That doesn't make any sense. Logically, legally, anything, right? So there you go. You, you got to focus on that. Acceptance criteria, exportable and XLSX. So it doesn't say XLS. So what you've inclined everybody to understand is you're supporting over a million rows in Excel. If it said XLS, you have inferred only 64,000 rows. So sometimes when we get into this argument with customers about we support Excel or some other technology that has multiple formats, it's better to say we support XLS, but we're gonna follow it up with a future release to support XLSX. If customers knew that, instead of you just saying we support Excel and then realizing the hard way that you don't support XLSX and embarrassing your company and wasting their time and their business, maybe they trained all their teams saying, we're gonna start using this tool because well, now we can load all this data. Well, that's not really true. You can only load 64,000 at a time. Well, why didn't you tell me that? Oh, so user stories should be written in a way that the customer is educated as to what you do and more importantly, what you don't support. So we support XLSX. So that means we obviously support the XLS in size. Export link will be available on the reporting page. Um, it will not force a specific download location from the application. Um, you're helping people understand the headers in the download file should match the UI. And a lot of times in tools, it doesn't. Like the UI looks a certain way because we can override the way fields look. But then when you just do a direct download, you suddenly like, what's this field? Oh, wait a second, that, that's that field. Why did it do that? You know, and people think something's wrong with your product. So helping people understand, do I match it or do I not match it? Customers wanna know. Um, export will be saved on the application server. It'll be stamped in the database. It'll have logs in the debug mode. And if it fails, the server will cancel the job on reset, restart. So we've handled a number of people. Yes, the financial officer is probably um, up until, he would have some interest up to this point. He could come back to get the download for up to 14 days. But at this point, it's transitioning in users to support, to operations. So if someone said the story is too big for a sprint, you could say, well, I could cut it right there. And I could have a separate story all dedicated to operations. So before we release it though, I need both stories guys because I'm not gonna deploy this and screw up my ops team. Okay, that's fine. but Let's build up the actual um, report. Let's see how it exports, the scalability behind it, the performance behind it. Maybe send it to the financial officer as kind of a demo with data in it. And he might come back and say, this is kind of useless. Can you remove these columns? I don't need that extra columns, okay? Let's get that feedback loop before we decide to stamp stuff in the database. That makes sense. Okay, we could do that. Um, more importantly, what does the system do when it fails. And I've seen a lot of people say, well, send, send an alert. That doesn't tell me how the system responds to failure. That tells me how it alerts. And people are confusing that in a lot of user stories in a lot of companies. This says, regardless of alert, if the server fails and the job is running, when the system restarts, cancel the job and restart it. Okay, so that's your way of handling a failure. If you're loading data and it fails and the server's still online, do you want it to back out the changes? Do you want it to just move forward and keep a pending? What if that causes corruption? And a lot of people solve it by saying, well, we'll just alert ops. Great, 
In the meantime, while Ops is still sleeping and trying to get out of their bed in the middle of the night, what do you want the system to do? Corrupt the rest of the system or stop? Shut down the system? This is a real-time event. You know, we, we handle emergency services for the Eastern Seaboard. Shutting down the system would probably put a lot of lives at risk. What do you want to do? So keep that in mind is what do you want to happen when this fails? And if it's not written in there, you have no business building it. Um, defect and bugs. So my wife is a director of QA, and this is a test in one of her interviews is what's the difference between defect and a bug. And if the person literally tries to answer that question, like logically, she says the interview is over. Why are you wasting my time arguing about a defect versus a bug in terminology when the customer was just told they got something and in fact they didn't? That's the type of QA engineer I'm looking for. Is someone who says, can we stop arguing about this? It really doesn't make a difference. We failed. Let's just fix it. Right? So that's something to think about too is our terminology. Sometimes we say a bug is in a lower environment and a defect is in production. In the end, we're embarrassing ourselves because the customer is like, what's the point? It doesn't work. I really don't care about arguing about the term. My business is screwed up. So you want that same mentality to go down to the teams. And in the end, you cannot hot patch loyalty. You can hot patch a product. You cannot patch customer's loyalty once you break it. Okay, bring in the story points here and anchor stories. Be generally accurate, not precisely wrong. If, how do you order your drinks? I mean, do you go into uh, Starbucks and order it like this? If you do, you're probably a nutritionist or an inspector, but that's not normally how we order it. We say grande caramel macchiato, go, okay? If you're going to the Super Bowl and let's just say the, uh, the stadium's right down the street and you happen to win a ticket, would you tell your wife, well, honey, uh, there's 15 minutes per quarter plus a 20 minute half time. Um, traffic is normally, you know, seven minutes. Uh, I will give myself one minute lead time to get to my car. So I'll be home at 757. It, that's a equation for disaster, right? So when it comes to story points, and hours and all that stuff, you are not trying to map story points to hours because then you're just using hours again. Um, when we look at story points, we look at it more like this. And anytime you can get alcohol into a uh, company slide, you know you're doing pretty good. Okay, so here, if our goal is to get home safely from happy hour, uh, home, and it's snowing outside, you make some judgment calls about what you can and cannot do. Okay. But your goal is to get home safely without stopping. Not just home safely, home without stopping. It's snowing. I do not want to pull over on the side of the road. So if I drink one of these 21s, I'm probably going to be pulled over for one reason. If I eat five of these watermelons, I'm going to pull over for another reason. So it's not just about safety. It's about getting home without stopping. So points add up to the same outcome. And that's what they're designed for, is that there's relativity in how they work together. Uh, we're gonna skip some of this stuff because it's for a different type of class. All right, capacity and velocity. Depending on the framework you're using, you may hear, hear the terms are the same. And you're kind of like, wait a minute, how could they be the same in some and some not in others? Because some don't work off of the dictionary. Uh, some focus on just velocity, so like scaled agile framework, for instance, just uses the term velocity for everything because everything's in story point. That's how the framework works. But when you go to the agile tools like Jira or version one or Rally, they have task hours and then they have story points. So since you have both lines of estimation theory, one is relative and one is um, actual, they're different. Capacity is about the actual constraint. How many hours do you have in a day? How many hours are in a sprint? Um, thereby, capacity is constraint of hours. I task in hours, so capacity is driven by tasking. Uh, that's how most of the Agile tools will see it. So when you're talking about task hours, you're typically talking about capacity. However, when we talk about velocity, which is another term that you hear about, and it's always associated to points, 
Many people think it's about speed. Speed describes only how fast you're going. 55 miles an hour, that's called speed. 55 miles an hour going north, that's called velocity. People in aeronautics know this quite well. A plane can hold so much poundage. However, to get it off the runway, you need to be going you know, a certain speed south down the runway. You need a certain velocity to, hit, to take off. So the plane could always hold so much capacity, but if you don't have enough velocity in a certain direction, going into the wind or going against the wind, you know, depending on how you're looking at it, you might need a different velocity, right? So that's how planes work. So when you look at velocity, a plane's velocity is decreasing as it lands. However, we still consider negative acceleration to be increasing. When a plane turns in direction, its velocity changes. Even if the speed is constant due to turning on the afterburner in a fighter jet, your velocity might change because you're changing direction. A plane's speed can increase in a constant direction, thus velocity is also increasing. And so here's Maverick and Goose, rest in peace. Everyone get that uh, movie reference? Okay. All right, so consider that with velocity. Velocity charts should be kind of boring. If you see them going up and down like a heart attack, your team's having a heart attack. Velocity should be slowly increasing, slowly increasing, and this is based on a movie clip we're watching if you're wondering what all the references are. Slowly increasing until the team actually breaks. And then they pull back a little bit and try and get better again. But if your team's going up and down, up and down, we deliver, no, we don't deliver, no, we pulled story from sprint to sprint, Oh my goodness, we can't get anything done. I mean, at some point, people are like ejecting out of the out of the cockpit because they just don't want to work here anymore. If you're trying to wonder what scene this is from, it's uh, behind enemy lines uh, at the beginning of the movie when the the plane is uh, dodging the missile. So if you're really bored tonight and you can't sleep, um, you could watch that scene and say, "Oh wow, that's a really bad agile team." All right, let's get into. Um, all right, we're going to get into some reports before I open it up for questions and stuff. All right, anyone know what uh, TV show that's referencing? Hmm. People are like, hmm. Uh, X Files. Yes, there, Justin. Boom. All right. So, um, this is a bunch of lies. Nothing is that perfect. Um, your team's lying to you. Your proc owner's lying to you. The scrum master's in on it. There's nothing that perfect. I've never seen a chart look like that. Okay. This one is more real. Uh, we have a bunch of hours to do our work, hence the capacity of 180 hours. It's slowly burning down, sometimes not as well as we want, and then it dips, and then a little behind, and then it dips again. The story points, the velocity, you get story point credit when you accept a story, meaning dev did the work, the QA mentality kicked in, the product owner did a small demo on the fly and says, you know what, if you change nothing before the end of the sprint and you do the official demo in front of our customer, um, I would say this works out great. So I'm gonna accept the story right now and give you credit for it. So that's why you start seeing mid sprint, here are your must haves, must haves, are right in this area. They should start kicking in. We're delivering, the product owner's accepting it, thinks it's great. So toward the end of the sprint, when we hit the official demo day with our customers, most of the stuff is already accepted. So now we're just working on the could-haves, if anything at all. This is when um, a bunch of behaviors here, you're not getting stuff done, so it carries over to the next sprint. And then the next sprint, everyone's like, yeah, 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 we're, we're, we're pulling stuff on the first couple of days of the sprint. We're an awesome team. And you're like, no. The only reason why you have that behavior is go back in time because you have that behavior. Ideally, the behavior I actually want is this. But since you guys failed, then you start closing things out. So I don't see why everyone's congratulating themselves on failure. Right? So helping people appreciate that you can't just look at one chart you have to look at the context as to what caused the behavior to occur. 
then getting into dev complete versus not tested. I love that. I have a dev team and then I have a QA team. Well, why would I accept a story if it hasn't been tested? Well, it's been unit tested. Okay, well then let's just deploy. No, 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 it needs functional testing. Oh, so we're not done? No, dev's done. So if we find a problem, what do you do? Well, we'll fix it. So you're telling me you're not done. See, see where we're going with this? Like, if the code's done, the code's done, let's go. Let's rock and roll. But if you're telling me we're gonna embarrass ourselves because something's probably wrong, knowing that you have to change something, why are you saying you're done? Because you're not done. So stop playing that game. Um, that's what typically happens. Uh, this could be, there's no product owner, a uh, managed service model, maybe with dev and one sprint QA and another. So that's something to keep in mind is you should not be accepting things unless you're ready to give it to a customer. Um, here's where a sprint gets canceled. We're not getting anything done. We have all these prod outages, prod outages, prod outages. Oh my goodness, just cancel the sprint already. Uh, is this one? Uh, the team either didn't show up on uh, planning day, the product owner didn't show up on planning day, or people didn't add any tasking. So by the time we added tasking, we're well below where we should be. So what's this massive inefficiency? We lost so much money here because we weren't even booked to our highest capacity. And then here is when uh, we call these spikes. So it's a type of user story typically for a documentation, um, knowledge transfer, throwaway code, stuff that's not going to prod, um, automated testing creation if necessary that has nothing to do with an active story. So the reason why they call it spikes is the team's getting ahead of the game when it comes to hours. Things aren't taking as long as they thought they would. So they bring in this story called a spike because they're just documenting the API or some throwaway code for scalability testing. But it's really fast because I don't need QA to do it. I don't need the BA involved. I don't need the product owner to get me data from production. You know, whatever it is, you don't need all those extra steps like you usually do. So then the hours come back down pretty quickly. So it looks like a heartbeat on the chart. It looks like a spike. Okay, so when we start a sprint, some people build an agile sprint forecast, like the weather. We have this much velocity, hoping to get 55 points. We have a capacity of, this team's over, 393 hours when only we have 377. So that means some people are working overtime. That doesn't sound good. Then we do it must have, should have, could have, and then defects. So if you hand this to somebody in the business and say, in this two weeks, Throughout the timeline, we're gonna have stories showing up on different days, and here's where our actual meetings occur. So I have a calendar for you to say how stories are rolling off the assembly line. I have it in order of must, should, could. So if we run into problems, which ones do you think I'm taking off the list first? Ah, the coulds, yes, naturally, logically, that makes sense, DF85. So that means DF85, if I look on the calendar, that wouldn't show up on the 30th if you pull it out. That makes sense. So this is a sprint plan, a sprint forecast. It's just a way of writing a report, but you're educating the business as to why the priority has been laid out the way it has. And then you're also buffering the team to say, if by chance we're into trouble, which we hope we never do, but if we do, this is the logical way we're pulling stuff out. So team, before you start working on DF85, can you please ask the rest of the team of USB of uh, the three USBs there at the top, 5275, 3825, and 9201 are actually done. Because if they're not done, those are my musts. So it's helping people understand how they should be working together and when they should be engaging. And then when you get into the uh, Agile Sprint outcome, we could say we did have to pull DF85. Uh, the mobile UI developer pulled off due to iOS deployment problems with the X-Files Agile team who were lost in Area 51 code base. Uh, this was replaced with a must-have for the next sprint and more story points. Um, the reason for that is the API tester was available, as was the mobile tester, to validate the security token. So the product owner pulled the story on day four, which allowed the team to reallocate quickly. So you're educating the, com the company about, we understand their scope changes occasionally, but like the shield wall, we negotiated. We're pulling out DF85 to release this person to go work on something critical, but we're bringing something else in that the rest of the team could possibly accommodate. That's called being reasonable. 
Um, another analogy we sometimes use is a tree. If there's a bunch of wind on a tree, don't confuse that with hurricane, snapping of the tree, okay? If you have wind in a sprint, the tree should be able to bend. Whether that bend means the business says, oh, yeah, we're just not getting all the stories we hoped, or the team says, well, we'll bring this in if you take that out. You know, everyone's bending in different directions. I used to want the tree to snap due to too much pressure. And then the reverse is you don't want a petrified forest. No, we will not bring something into sprint. We are agile. Well, that sounds great, right? So you have to think about that perception because in the end, if you had a report that did the outcome, it's either it's done, it's partially done, or it's really not done. So looking at iterative cumulative flow, so remember the product owner is the chef and the nurse is the scrum master. So if the team is chunking out their work, not everything is in progress at once, just portions of it throughout the sprint, slowly pulling away from the defined column, bringing it in in progress, getting stuff done and getting accepted, everyone's happy. This is what happens quite often is at the start of the sprint, the first day we're fine, then two and three days in, almost everything's in flight, and then half the stuff doesn't get done. Then you have this problem. The team's doing good at chunking, but they're not getting any response from the product owner. So as they say, this story's done, this story's done, this story's done, product owner's like, well, I'll just wait until the last day of the sprint to demo it. The team's like, why can't you just look at it right now with me for five minutes? I want to know if we're doing the right thing. So then suddenly a bunch of stuff is accepted, but notice not all of it, because he shows up on planning day or on a demo day and says, why am I getting surprised like this? This isn't what we agreed. And they say, well, actually we didn't surprise you because it was done over here on the fifth and you weren't willing to look at it. Then you have this issue. Our stories aren't ready for planning. So on day one, it looks like everything goes in progress. Well, of course it looks that way because you only have three stories. But then a couple days into the sprint, the product owner shows up and then all these stories, like another 15 get loaded onto the team. So now it looks like almost nothing's in progress, right? Because only three were in progress at that time. And then it's an ambulance ride at the end of the sprint. Whether that ambulance ride is one of your teammates falling over dead or your product owner going to the hospital for getting beat up. And then here's where the product owner can't make up his mind. He has all these great ideas throughout the sprint. So up, down, up, down, pull things out of the sprint, bring things in the sprint, ambulance, ambulance, ambulance. And then eventually the only thing the scrum master can do at the end of the sprint besides saying you broke agile was you know the sprint costs $22,400 in labor? Say goodbye to that, because you're not getting it back. And then here's where the Scrum Master isn't being um, trusted, because no one's updating their hours, or their tasking, or their stories. But at the end of the sprint, miraculously, everything gets completed and accepted. So the product owner's in the circle of trust. He's buddy-buddy with the team, and the Scrum Master's like, why isn't everyone updating? Well, we're in big trouble. We're in big trouble. But at the very end, everything's accepted. So from a standpoint of commitment versus accepted, the team looks awesome because they deliver. But they're clearly having some behavioral problem. Uh, here's waterfall testing in agile companies. The code freeze is more like a code frost because when you find problems, do you change it? Yeah, yeah, we'll change the code. So, but it's frozen. Yeah, but we need to fix it. But it's frozen. Are you thawing the food and then refreezing it and thawing it and refreezing? You know how that tastes in a, in a restaurant, don't you? Okay, so that never really existed. Agile testing in agile companies is we do the story, we test it. We do the story, we test it. So we run out of time. We cut the story. We don't cut quality on all the stories. Uh, let's see here. Plan-based or value-based testing. Plan-based is on requirements and timelines, code coverage. I, I love that code coverage argument because they'll say, oh, we, we covered all the code for all the users we have. Well, we're going to find a new user tomorrow that doesn't work that way. Um, number of tests. Okay, so if I line up a bunch of monitors on a table and I look at all their pixels and I have 15 monitors, does, does that mean I'm better because I did 15 tests? 
Why are you looking at the pixels? Well, because we have a UI. I just wanted to make sure the pixels were right. That's not very valuable. Well, that's not what we're worried about. We're worried about the number of tests and the number of failures, right? So I proved on all these monitors, we support all these monitors. We're good, right? Okay, so think of that when it comes to the number of tests. Uh, it's, it's confused with being more secure and more quality. Um, that's not necessarily true. Uh, when it comes to value, if I knew the customer was a chief financial officer versus a person in logistics who does shipping, and this application is about shipping, who do you think is probably going to have more of the problem using the tool? And since this user story is about the chief financial officer, hmm, maybe I should test it a little differently because he's not the guy who's the primary user. Um, highest value versus least value. If you were to ask your product owner say, what's the most valuable workflow in our, in our entire system? And what's the riskiest one? Okay, so we have 100 tests. Yeah. And you just told me this workflow produces 20% of your value of revenue. Yeah. Why aren't we testing that 20% of the time instead of 1%? Uh, I don't know. Go talk to QA. Well, QA didn't even know it was the most valuable thing because you don't write in user stories. So I can't even get them out of plan-based mentality and focused on value because the story doesn't even indicate what the value is. See the problem? Okay, so that's something to keep, uh, keep in mind is that just testing everything isn't always good. I mean, if you have functionality that's only used 1% of the time, but you test it equally with the part of the product that's used 20, 40, 50% of the time, you're wasting um, time in testing. Uh, different quadrants here. One's from uh, Lisa Crispin's book, which is the quadrants method, and then this is the Michael Cohen book. Uh, what I find is it's easier to go up to QA and ask them what tools they use than it is to really argue about what they should be testing. So if according to this on the left-hand side, they started telling me that they use Selenium and QuickTest Pro, they're focused at the UI layer primarily, which is the most costly part of the system. And it takes the longest to render. If I already knew the data was wrong, why do I need the browser to tell me that it's wrong? Why can't I just write a query that runs in fitness or in curl if I'm calling on the API and I say, show me all vendors that work with um, Xfinity? Well, I expect 2,000 vendors and I only got 20 back. Well, I can't prove that's wrong until I see it in the UI. That's where a lot of people do a lot of their testing is just in the UI. But you're like, you could run 2,000 tests in the amount of time it takes to run one or two tests in the UI, but you're telling me that you're not going to do that? If you find things lower and lower, it's cheaper to fix. Cheaper to fix tool, cheaper to fix time, cheaper to fix process, cheaper to fix embarrassment. When you start getting into the UI, you're getting into critiquing the product, which means you're probably in front of a user at that point or getting really close. However, if you catch it way back here in the team land, you're not going to embarrass yourself. Okay. Uh, so I expect people to have um, agile roadmaps. And a lot of people say, yeah, I do. No, most companies only have product roadmaps. Oh, I thought that's what you meant. No, 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 no. I didn't say product roadmap. I said agile roadmap. Agile roadmap should be about how are we getting better as a team, our behaviors the way we do things. So for example, we have these things called retrospective meetings, right? And those happen every sprint. Great. That's all the team's focused on is their sprint. Give them something bigger. Say, listen, at the start of this quarter, we all agreed we didn't have this, we didn't have this, and we didn't have this. Out of those three things, what's the bullet item we want to solve by the end of the quarter? The big ticket item. Because our product manager is going to have all these product things going on in his roadmap. I want to be able to approach him with a quarterly agile roadmap to say, while you're doing these product changes, we're changing us, our behaviors, our processes, our tools, our artifacts. But what are we going to do? Oh, well, we want the planning meeting to be cleaned up because it runs for like eight hours. I mean, we literally do it for a whole, whole day and then come in the following morning. We don't even get donuts. But we have to show up. 
and we're here for another two hours. This is, this is such a waste of time. And there's 10 people in here. This is crazy. Okay, cool. You want to fix the plan, I mean? Fine. In the first month, we're going to do some user story training <coughs> and make sure our stand-ups are running well because the meetings are like a snowball effect. If you're really bad at these, you're going to be really bad at those. Um, once we do the training, we're going to have to clean up our backlog while we're actively doing product. And then if we clean up our user stories, we can do tasking and capacity training so we do our estimates better. And then lo and behold, the planning meeting could be fixed. But until all those pieces happen, I can't fix the planning. Meeting. I know you didn't want to hear that cough. Okay, so that covers pretty much the material I was going to go over with you guys. I'm willing to answer any questions, cover any topic. Oh, you wanted to see the tool. Uh, let me show you the tool here. Now, there's a bunch of them out there. Um, oh, not that one. I'm not even sure if I have any good data to show you. Right. And this is off my little test server in my house, so I haven't logged in it in about a month. So I'm hoping, oh, it's giving me trouble. I might not be able to show it to you because I wasn't planning on doing my app. Well, let me see if it works. <coughs> Sorry about this. <clears throat> I'm coughing. Doesn't look like my personal app is working. So I'm probably not going to be able to show you anything, unfortunately. No worries. Don't let that be a sign of a don't let that be a sign of your sticks because it actually works really well. <laughs> so so Michael we, is, um, go ahead. Is Jira and Rally pretty much the same functionality or do they do different things? No. Um, Rally is a somewhat, well, it's actually called CA Agile now uh, because CA Technologies bought them. Um, I would still consider them somewhat of a closed loop product. Um, CA lets all their tools typically work together. Maybe not great because they're very similar to Google. They like to acquire companies. So their technology is not always 100% built by them. Uh, it's imported in by means of uh, acquisition. So they don't always work phenomenally together. They work decently, but maybe not phenomenally. Um, CA Agile, or formerly known as Rally, focused a lot on scrum teams. And yes, it was Agile by how it was built. Uh, at last team, who built Jira, um, it was a ticket system by nature. So it has the pros and the cons of being a ticket system, which means you can configure it any way you want, which leads you to uh, a lot of uh, death spirals in process sometimes versus Rally and version one and other competitors don't let you change very much. <coughs> Sorry, I'm, I guess I'm getting close to my limit here in my throat. Um, so, Atlassian also is very strong in the ecosystem. They have an Atlassian marketplace, which doesn't just focus on buy another Atlassian product. Uh, they're more like Apple. You buy the iPhone and then you buy all the apps, right? So they get 25% of the revenue of all the apps that are on their marketplace. So all these vendors build tools out there and 25% of their money goes to Atlassian. So since that's a big form of revenue dollars for them, their product is designed to be more open. Uh, in fact, the version that I have that I obviously have to fix today, um, you can locally install. You own the database. Um, so I can literally see every table that they use, right? And then build an app if I were a developer in that space. So they use Groovy is uh, their primary language. So if you look at, can compare that to version one or CA technologies with Rally. They may give you an image to like a virtual image. So you have your own instance on premise, but you don't actually like get full access to the database. 
right? So they're very limited as to what they allow you to do with that. Um, a lot of their former integrations used to be Ruby uh, scripts. They weren't full apps. Uh, version one's a little better um, in that they put things a lot in their UI. CA has been trying to get better at it. But Atlassian by far is the biggest ecosystem. Uh, they tie into so many different um, software development deployment tools. So they act more like a hub on a, on a wheel of a bicycle, and they want all the spokes coming off of it because their power is in their ecosystem. It's not really actually in the tool. Um, another thing about Jira is that it allows you, a lot of other tools let you add custom fields, but they don't allow you to decide where to put the field on the screen. And you're kind of like, what's that matter? If you're in a planning meeting, you want to focus on value, 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 and priority of value. And then you want to focus on tasking and points. And then you want to focus on what's the delivery on the calendar. Rally would say, put that all into the custom field section. It's all one big blob at the bottom. But your allows you to break it up by tabs and move the fields around. So then there's an efficiency on how's the data presented. So then in the meeting, I'm focused on the planning field when I'm in planning mode, and when I'm in tracking mode, I'm into like capacity and hours. That's helpful to know. Is it free? Is Jira free, or do you need a subscription monthly? Uh, they have many versions. Uh, they have their cloud edition. They have the server edition, which is the most customizable, and that's the one I have. And then they have the data center edition, which is multi-node. Um, nothing is free. <laughs> um, but in all real sense, nothing's free with them. Uh, you can get 10 users on any of their products, or I think the majority of their products, there might be one or two that you can't, for 10 bucks. And it's a license that lasts a year. Once you go over 10, then the price jumps dramatically, right? And then also, um, here, let me show you one thing about it last time, is, and this helps people understand, especially those of you on the phone that actually use Jira. Uh, let me look up script runner. And the reason why I'm looking up script runner, um, this is one of the number one add-ons for Jira. But I need to see a, uh, an actual page for uh, the Elastic Marketplace. Okay. So you look at their pricing, um, not cloud, but let's go to server edition. Pricing is based on user pool. So if you have 250 user license pool of Jira, you have to spend 750 to get script runner, okay? But if you have 10 users, it's 10, 25, 25, and you can see how it starts jumping. So when you're into big corporations, $14,000. Um, now, the one thing behind this, and I did a use case on this, is that $14,000, now script runner is about, a lot about automation and moving things around, uh, like the churn rate field and stuff like that. To, the idea of you have a bunch of subtasks, to create a user story. So you have like, you know, design, API building, uh, functional tests, uh, unit testing, uh, you know, all those different subtasks and they add up into hours. When developers are in the tool and updating their hours and moving, you know, subtasks from, you know, to do, to in progress, to done, you know, like a Kanban board, that's a bunch of clicking, right? And moving stuff on the board. Then when you move all the tasks to complete, you would think in theory that the user story would suddenly go into complete, but it doesn't because Jira, unlike the other tools, has no idea how you're gonna use their tool. This, it wasn't always built just for you know, agile teams. It was built for knock centers and built for marketing teams and sales and stuff. So they said, build your own workflow. We're not gonna include that automation because we don't know what your automation would be anyway. And it's really hard to maintain because it's customized for every company in the entire world. That's crazy. So this company came out at Adaptivist who owns Script Runner, And that's what one of their tools do is allows you to build automation. By adding that automation at scale of, uh, let's say, let's see here. So the user base of 2000 users, 3,300 bucks. We did uh, some computations on this that when you think about how many agile teams are just for 800 users, because that's all that's in my current organization is 800, but as you can see, I'm over 500, so I have to spend 3,300 bucks, right? Because it's the next bucket is, we said, is it worth it? We said, listen, we have roughly 50 teams, give or take five to nine people on average, times 
20 some user stories times roughly about five to 10 subtasks. So you're doing all these computations to realize how many subtasks are out there? How many times are people pointing and clicking at best case scenario, let alone rework? And then you have to go update their parents. We realize that spending $3,300 saved us $450,000 in labor dollars because it's at scale. It's so many people doing little activities of seconds of clicking, waiting for the website to render, you know, making those changes. Why isn't it closing? It should be closing. And we realize that if we add this automation that says when all the subtasks are closed, move the parent user story to ready for demo is the state we use. We're saving close to $400,000. And then when you do that against labor dollars against some of the teams, we have some teams that are over $200,000 of sprint in labor. So you saved in essence almost an entire month of labor because we decided to spend 3,300 bucks. So that's the idea is that you have to do these computations but in the end, you're like, it makes, it's rocket science, right? <laughs> this isn't crazy. You should be able to figure this out. That makes sense. So the, another question, so a tool like uh, Trilo or Trio, whatever they call it, I mean, how does that stack up with these, the Jira's or, or, and rallies and version ones? Trello, um, Trello is, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but it's safe baby steps. Um, because Atlassian bought them. So Atlassian owns Trello, and their goal was when Trello people realize that you've hit your agile maturity at some point, it's so high now that you need like automation. You need um, a service desk portal for operation centers. You need to link issues between each other. You are beyond the lightweight Trello Kanban board. You now have to dive into something deeper. And so that's why they bought them is for they wanted to get that user base. Mm, mm -hmm. So baby steps in the sense of we all start out somewhere, whether the agile maturity is about process or artifacts or something, but there's a reason why they bought that product line when they already had an agile board. So they're going after the target audience that says, if we realize how people utilize Trello, we could do a couple things. One, they realize the tool needs to do more, so they're gonna move to Jira, got them. Two, we realize people who are at an agile maturity cycle, so now we can sell them agile consulting. Check. Uh, now we realize these people need uh, best case practices on this. Ooh, long-term agile methodology changes, like going from Scrum to SAFE, Scaled Agile Framework. Check. No, so they did that to acquire, and uh, that brought all those pieces to them. Wow, I had no idea they had been acquired. I, th I thought it was a little mom and pop somewhere. It was. <laughs> wow. Now it's now it's a big dog on on campus. So um, that that just gives you an idea that what I presented to you is another example of how a product owner should present their stories and their features to their software team. Like you were able to gel that story together to understand the value is we're going to integrate with Trello. Great. The reason why we're doing this though, so you know, is these main bullet points are coaching our transitional pieces, moving them in the Jira, which means we get them into Confluence and Bamboo and all of our other product lines. Like then the team's like, hell yeah, let's integrate. What do we need to do? Get the stories out. Let's start it. You know, and that's from a loyalty standpoint, the difference between saying we got these stories, this sprint called integrate with Trello. And so I guess I was trying to give you a real world example of we talk about agile, agile, agile stories in this class. But this presentation hopefully gives you an idea of I could have presented to say, yeah, they bought Trello and uh, it's just a lighter weight platform and uh, when you get bigger, move to Jira. Yeah. I gave you that extra piece so that you could understand the context and then inform others. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> wow. When did that happen? Do you know, was it recent or has this been for a while? Do you know? I believe, it, I believe it's been in the last year. Wow. So pile move. Yeah. Good strategy. Yep. So. What else do you all got? Any other questions? I mean, we have like another, what, 13 minutes or so. Oh, they just bought OpsGenie too. Oh, dear. That's another small company they just bought. So they're, they're into that acquisition mode now too. Mm. Wow. Okay. Well, um, guys on the phone, you got any questions? Because I don't want to hug it all by asking all the questions in my head. 
<laughs> I put them to sleep. <laughs> Justin said his brain is cooked. <laughs> so, Michael, I have a question regarding the um, story points. Could you yep. maybe just go over a little bit about how how teams actually use those? To, are they used religiously in the right way <laughs> by like your team or? Do you see some common errors? And if so, what are the common errors we should look out for? Okay, so let me give you an example of, I can have two fives, so two watermelons, two fives in the list. But when I look at capacity with the task hours, one says 40 hours and one says 20 hours. And the proctor owner is like, something's wrong. And the scrum master says, that's, that's exactly what it's supposed to be doing. He's like, how's that possible? Okay, look at the stories. The 40 hour five point story is 40 hours of time effort is a documentation story about our active API, which has already been built. So we don't have any doubt that we know what's there because you just read the code. We also know that it's very low complexity because we're not building anything. You're documenting it. And you could just traverse through the code and see what parameters are there. However, it just takes a lot of time. It's tedious. It's annoying. So it's a five. This other five, in fact, it's not 20 hours. It says four hours. All right, so the time is really low on the second story. You're like, what's that? Well based on the subject line it says drop the security table and reload users. Well, that's really easy to do is drop the security table and it normally causes outages when you do that. It's slightly complex because we have to reload the users, but actually the risk is extreme because not only did you want to do this to the security table, which means everyone's wiped out, you're doing it on the same week you have a marketing event? Well, that would look real good at the demo meeting, wouldn't it? So the reason why those stories are there is it got you to ask these questions. You looked at it and said, what the hell is this? This doesn't make any sense. A five is two hours and a five is 40? That's got to be wrong. No, that is precisely right. Because when you look at the breakdown of how you get to a story point, the goal isn't just to be generally accurate. It's to get you to talk. And it got us to talk. So that's exactly what I wanted to happen, right? And that's what uh, the idea is. So if you see like your, if your average is like a five, which is what we typically use, we say that's roughly three to five days. Remember, not five, not three, not four. You have to give them a span because you're not mapping hours to points. So if you say three to five days takes care of this quadrant and it's flexible, good. Focus on these quadrants, which are actually more important anyway. So when you say, oh, 21, are you saying that's because the time is like four times as big? Maybe, or maybe the risk is, or maybe the complexity is, or maybe it's a, a blended approach. But in the end, if our normal story is roughly three to five days, which by the way is about half the size of a sprint at max, I don't want a story bigger than that because if I have must, should, could, and I start with a must of a five, by mid sprint, I'm able to work on my shoulds. But if it's bigger than that, that's, that's a problem. There's a good chance I'm not going to meet my must anyway, let alone the shoulds. So you're using this to also force kind of the mentality of delivery pattern that if your average size box on the conveyor belt is three to five days in size, we can focus on the bigger problems. So when we see someone say a 21, you're like, what's that? Well, open up the user story. Okay, look at the acceptance criteria. It's blank. Okay, what's the problem? It's blank. <laughs> it's blank. It's, it's everything and anything and nothing at the same time. So yeah, it's a 21, it's a 40, it's a 50. It's not worth my time. There's no way you'll get it done in a sprint because we'll spend more time talking about it than we will building anything. Is a story like a project plan? Um, a story is, yeah, more like a user requirement specification. Um, you could say, in essence, 
uh, a PRD would last you an entire project, a product requirements document. Inside that section of the PRD, you could have a user story that says, I want to be able to download the revenue report on the report screen. But the entire PRD is about the entire rework of the reporting uh, UI and back end, and you have about 50 to 100 reports. So if a user story is roughly three to five days a pop, um, we try to keep our features between one to three months a pop, and then our feature groups are obviously pretty close to a quarter. So that should give you an idea of like timeline um, and size of artifacts. So feature group to features to stories, and then when you get down to tasking, your tasking is getting into hours. And anything larger than a four hour task is questionable because no one can help you until they know what that task is about. So if you have someone saying, I'm developing for you know 13 hours, you're like, that's not helping anybody. I need to know, are you building the API? Are you building the reporting UI? Are you doing unit testing? Are you doing this? Oh, well, when I break it down like that, I'm doing four hours there and three hours there and say, exactly. So when I have a problem called you're stuck in API land, I can get another developer to potentially help you with the reporting UI because now I know you didn't start it. So that's kind of stories kind of at, at the lower level. Uh, feature tends to be your glue because customers understand features. User stories, sometimes they understand, but features they get. It's like, what features are in this tool? Well, you can download the reports, you can upload your reports, uh, you can manipulate uh, the resource allocation in the columns, um, you can send an alert to a customer and it has email capability. Great, those are the features. Inside of that could be 20, 50 user stories a pop with 100 to 200 uh, subtasks. That's helpful, Michael. So how do you see um, features being broken into tasks? Is there any method um, advocated generally? So remember, the feature doesn't get broken to tasks. The feature gets broken to stories and spikes and unfortunately defects when you embarrass yourself. Um, so when you look at a feature, focus on the acceptance criteria and say, must have, should have, could have of the acceptance criteria itself. Out of this feature called export reporting capability, what's the must? Well, it's got to export into, a, into an Excel XLS. Okay. What else? Uh, PDF for sure. Okay. What about CSV? Well, CSV is probably a should. I'd like it because then that means we might not need Excel anymore because CSV works with Excel. Um, circling back to Jira, does it still require initial data input? It, it requires a skeleton. I mean, I tell a lot of product owners, don't freak out about coming to planning with everything written out properly. Uh, don't worry about going in front of your customers, everything written out 100%, because that's still the old mentality of serial-based practices. We show up with all the requirements, which isn't true. Uh, we expect our customers to be here six months from now, which we know will not be 100% accurate. We're going to get some, hopefully, because that's called sales department. And you're going to lose some, right? So the idea is you show up with skeletons. Expect the team to help you put the meat on the bones. So show up with, we must support XLS export capability. I'm not an ops guy, so I really don't know what ops needs. And then the team says, well, when it fails, do you want a running log or do you want it stamped in the database or both? And the product owner is like, what's the difference? Well, let me show you real quick. Here's a running log. Boop, 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 boop. See how it just keeps going and going and going and it's kind of hard to like understand it sometimes, but it's really fast. But if I do it by the database, it's going to increase the size of your application, which means it might slow it down in the long, long, long run. What do you want? And so that's the idea is the collaboration started because someone showed up with a skeleton saying the business wants XLS export. But I realize I have more than one customer in the system. I have people called ops. I have people called dev. I have people called executives. And I must think about them holistically but team, I really don't know how to handle the technical side of the operation equation. So I'm hoping you can help me with that. So that gets the uh, collaboration started, but that kind of answers also your other question about the features. The features are about, we need you know, XLS, we need CSV, we need PDF. And then someone says, is that the only customer that uses this? No, there's ops, 
So we need something in there for ops so that they can support when the jobs fail. They need something in ops to know when the data didn't load. They need something in ops for restarting the system. Okay, great. Anybody else? Um, security. Oh, security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Permissions. Okay. Permissions. Um, I need to make sure that we can lock it down so this person can see it and that person. So you're breaking down the feature into understandable pieces of functional, um, how the system would work holistically from all the customer aspects. Um, and that's where I get into, where was it? Uh, where's our customer? Is that a picture? Here. This idea. Security could be Boba Fett. Executives could be, or IT could be Darth Vader, right? Chewy and Han Solo are your, your loyal customers who will do anything for you, but they're a little, you know, crazy sometimes. You have uh, Princess Leia cinnamon buns, right? You have all these different personalities that use the system with different intentions. So sometimes having a, a persona wall like this with different personalities on the wall, and you say, okay, guys, we're talking about features today. How would Leia handle this? How would Darth Vader handle this? How would Jar Jar Binks handle this? Right, because we have all these customers. And then once we decide how they would handle it, you say, okay, let's go Moscow rating. Must have, should have, could have. Am I going to support Leia out of the gate, or is she going to come in a little later? You know, and you're digesting it that way. And so far in Jira, all you had is maybe a feature, sometimes called an epic, is what is the term they use. You have an epic issue that talks about this requirement about the reporting page. You say the customers involved primarily are Darth Vader and Boba Fett. However, secondary customers would be Leia and Jar Jar Binks. And the customers that would rarely come in there are C-3PO. So my data scientists don't really care about using the report um, export functionality, but Darth Vader who's out to get our company definitely does. And that's all you would show up with at first for the team to start collaborating on it. Uh, before stories are even written. And we've hit the top of our hour. Um, I unfortunately have to get going here in just a minute or two, but if you guys have anything else emergency or high priority, feel free to ask. No questions from me, Michael. This has been terrific. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to uh, doing, doing more of these as time goes on. Okay. All right, everybody. Good luck in your uh, careers. Hopefully you will uh, cross pathways again. Take care. Thank Cheers. you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. We'll make some announcements when there's more. Thank you and bye for now. Uh, your PDU certificates, guys. You get your PDU certificates. Um, the learning administrator will uh, get those sent to you. Um, she's not on the call at the moment, but um, she'll have your information and, and get your PDUs. Um, well, the only PDU recipient will be Paul <laughs> until until everyone else gets uh, certified. All right, folks, thank you very much. Awesome. I'm glad you got it, Paul. Um, any other questions that you get, feel free to email them to me and um, I will send them to Michael for him to um, further comment. All right. Thank you and bye for now. Hello, everyone. Those of you who are currently on the call, those of you who are yet to join, <laughs> yeah, I guess you'll watch this at some point, I don't know. But um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our Agile coach, Michael Swanziger, who's gonna be taking us through the minefields <laughs> of Agile. Hopefully we get to the other side, we come out as warriors of Agile. But Michael, thank you very much for joining us and teaching us today. And over to you. Oh, you are on mute, Michael. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let me, let me, I think it's a phone thing. Hang on. There we oh, go. there we go. How's that? It's, yeah, you're good. Darn, I thought I was going to get out of this. <laughs> um, so I've been, uh, I apologize if I uh, have to cough or go on mute briefly because uh, I've been sick for about two weeks. So. Please work with me through my ailing. <laughs> um, I, just, I wanted to open up the meeting before I get started into classroom trouble. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns since the last meeting? Um, people have had time to chew on the information and talk to their you know, cohorts in crime at their offices. Anyone have any questions? 
No? Okay. Well, feel free to ask questions throughout the uh, the class here. Oh, I see something is lit up on my screen. So maybe someone sent a chat. Nope, good to go. Okay, excellent. All right, so we're going to be uh, going through more of the um, the how and the what. We spent a lot of time on the why, talking about human behaviors and understanding, in short, that you know, agile just out of its out of its own merits can make or break your business. Um, if you remind somebody often and repeatedly that you shouldn't be trusted, you probably won't be. Okay, so um, that's something to keep in mind that a lot of people are about, oh, we, we can deliver faster stuff. Well, if it's the wrong stuff and you do it repeatedly, it, it's one thing to be wrong, get feedback and adjust. It's another thing to repeatedly go against that feedback. Uh, you're just, the only person you're really helping is your competitor because they don't even have to do anything. They just have to show up and say, well, I wasn't like that guy. So keep that in mind. Um, as we go into the agile field of Endor here, Scrum is more of a defensive mentality and Kanban is more offensive in its nature. So those who are moving from uh, serial-based processes or more regulated processes tend to have a little more easy uh, with a Scrum. Uh, the reason for that is the meetings are prescribed there's the actual Scrum Guide document. Um, there's more Scrum classes available. And so you're closer to the wall of process because there are processes in Scrum that are very prescripted. Um, Kanban on the reverse, Kanban literally just means signage. So that being its only premise, unless you add something to it, like lean software development practices, XP practices, or others, Kanban by its own nature is just fluid. Okay, so working in that mentality um, is a lot different than working in a defensive, more prescriptive-based mentality. Now, we're going to be going over some of the pros and cons of both. So don't think just because Kanban is offensive, it's more powerful, but also don't think that it shouldn't have rules attached to it. Um, just know that you have to be more fluid in how you apply those rules. All right, so we're going to focus on uh, Scrum here. Scrum out of its nature is uh, pretty prescriptive. It's uh, a defensive approach. And anyone who's watched like really good Hollywood war movies knows that uh, defensive strategies can win the battlefield. Um, a lot of times I show movie clips uh, from like the movie like 300 and uh, Gladiator and a couple others. And what I show is that when the, uh, the shields are locked together, that's like your sprint. Okay, so when your sprint begins, uh, you bring in a set of work in your uh, planning meeting. You commit to that work as best as possible, knowing that it's like a weather forecast, that the weather can change, um, but you're not looking for a hurricane. Uh, you do expect some w windy conditions occasionally, maybe a little bit of rain, but uh, based on your current weather forecast, uh, you want to attain X goal. So you're locking the shield, so to speak. Uh, you call that your sprint plan. And if any enemy, um, called like scope creep or sales guy who wants to sell something to a customer you know, yesterday and forgot to tell you, um, your shields are locked. So nothing gets in unless someone is willing to negotiate to bring something out. Uh, that's one of the um, issues with Scrum is that a lot of people don't follow that rule. Okay, so in all of those Hollywood movies, anytime that the shield wall would come down, uh, the army would be decimated. So consider that, that it shouldn't be hard to negotiate, and isn't that the key word, should. It shouldn't be hard to negotiate with someone to say, hey, uh, my bucket is full of water. If you want to add water to it, guess what? You need to take something out. Or it's just going to get all over the floor. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't believe that. So when they add stuff to the sprint without taking anything out, I mean, is that their way of saying, you're just going to work overtime? Is that their way of saying, you know, I never believed your estimates in the first place. So if you take this on and you actually deliver it, it means your estimates were really poor in the first place. And then lo and behold, occasionally a team does take something on and they do some heroic act and deliver the product. And then the business actually uses that against them. They don't say, hey, thank you very much. They say, hey, this proves that you were wrong. So I'm just going to repeat that behavior over and over and over again. So. Consider the shield wall there. 
Um, the extra ceremonies there that I have on the top right, those are just kind of my own opinions on how long those meetings typically last with a team of five to nine people. When you think about five to nine people at roughly, well, let's just build them at about a hundred bucks an hour, um, very rapidly that meeting gets expensive. So if you show up to plan a meeting and your stories aren't ready, hey, guess what, they're not ready. Don't try and force them to be ready because it's one thing to screw up a meeting, it's another thing to script the product, have rework, uh, screw up customers' expectations, be really embarrassed on a demo call in front of your customers. And if you're in commercial software, uh, that's a position you never want to be in. The last place you want to be in is on the, in the news. Okay, so consider that when you have meetings and have a timeline around them, they're designed to force discipline. So if the discipline isn't there, don't go an even further worse step by saying, oh, well, we'll just figure out during the sprint. Well, guys, if you can even figure it out when nothing was going on during the middle of a meeting, how are you going to figure it out when a lot of stuff is going on called work? So consider that. Then in the Kanban approach, um, it's very fluid. It's a, a lot of juggling. I sometimes show uh, videos in my classes about uh, people juggling balls. And what you show is that not how the one person's good, but how when you have a mixture of people juggling balls in the room, they all handle different amounts of balls. They can all handle the same amount. So that's true when it comes to whether it's dev versus QA or it's Java developer versus REST API developer. Um, there is this idea that people have skills, people have disciplines beyond those skills, and just because one person knows Java and another person knows Java doesn't mean that they could theoretically handle the same amount of work. So you have to keep that in mind, and that's called the work in progress limit. Uh, there typically is a lane at the top of the board called expedite or emergency. Uh, consider that your ambulance lane. You know, when an ambulance is coming down the freeway, people don't just look out their window and say, are you sure you really want to get by me? You know, they move over. There is this idea, and it's written in our laws, that regardless what the impact is, if an emergency vehicle is coming by with their lights and sirens on, you move. Um, in fact, in Germany, on their freeways, if there is a traffic jam, everybody has to move to the sides of the roads. So the fast lane goes to the left, the slow lane goes to the right, and they leave this corridor right down the center of the freeway for emergency vehicles. That's their law. So they're actually uh, preventing any expedite or emergency from causing more hangups than is necessary because they have aligned their work around it. So that's something to keep in mind is that the exercise lane can be abused very quickly because people just think things are important. Um, it shouldn't be important, it should be almost life-saving, life critical, business critical. Okay, so the rest of the work is still prioritized from highest to lowest, but that expedite lane is only used for emergencies. Yep. Uh, going a little further here. All right, so normally I have some videos here and uh, this will give you an idea of the videos that we watch in my classes. So now I'll give the answers to this. So if you wanna, I don't know if you're a war buff or anything in your movies or action adventure, but now you can look at movies a totally different way. Uh, in Centurion there, the army, which was the Roman army, formed up on the road. Uh, they were initially walking um, two by two down the, down the road, massive line of soldiers. And then when they uh, detected that there was trouble up ahead, they formed small teams or if you would call it uh, small circles. Okay, they didn't have one massive circle, uh, they had small circles. The smallest uh, room between soldiers is foot to foot. Okay, so if your heel is up against the heel of the person behind you, um, that's as close as you can get, minimizing the amount of uh, land that you have to defend. Um, the eagle, in that movie, the battle formation uh, that was used was called the, um, it was based on the tortoise. Okay, so what they would do is they would not only form a circle of shields, they would actually put shields on top of them. Okay, so the entire uh, strength behind it was that it was very defensive, a high chance of survivability, but its weakness was its speed. Okay, so that's something to think about when it comes to Scrum versus Kanban is that Scrum could be seen as protecting quality at all costs. And you have to sacrifice something to do that. Uh, sometimes that is speed. Even though Agile tends to be faster in general, um, however, when it comes to comparing the models,
scrum can be slower just by means of the team has to have their shields locked together the, the entire way. In 300, that battle formation is called the phalanx. Um, that's where they're all standing in one line. The one weakness of that formation was the person on the far right had his spear on his right arm, but his shield was on his left, which means he was actually protecting the guy to his left, which also means the guy on the far, far right, unless he was up against a wall of rock, um, he was vulnerable. So that's something I think about your team is that as much as the team is interlocked together, there's always a vulnerability, whether that vulnerability is fear of authority, that vulnerability is a technical constraint, that vulnerability is everyone is a peacemaker. Um, the vulnerability could be everyone is all about, they, they misunderstand everything's about the team or everything's about the customer. They take that to an extreme, which allows them to uh, bring scope creep in. So then in 300, the environment protected them because they were uh, in a cavern between two mountain ridges. So the people on the sides were protected. Uh, when they met up with the Arcadians in the beginning of the movie, the Arcadians outnumbered them um, by many times. And they looked at them as weak. But what they realized was that this team, this 300 Spartans, spoke in one voice. And it was a very loud, uh, loud, resounding voice. But when you asked the Arcadians why they were there or what they did for a living, none of them said that they were soldiers. You know, some people said I was a potter. Uh, others said a blacksmith. But when you ask the Arcadians what they did, or, or the, uh, the Spartans what they did, they all answered with one resounding voice. So that's something to also keep in mind with your teams. And here's a workshop that I present to folks. So if you're taking notes, this is something really easy to do. Uh, it's normally uh, deer in headlights moments uh, for your team. So when I go into teams, whether they're executives or developers, I, I tend to ask them some questions to kind of pull out their ego a little bit. Say, hey, are you a good team? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. Are you a great team? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. One of the best. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and you're starting to like build up the pressure on them, you know, so their ego is actually kicking in. And you're like, okay, okay, let's test that. And you hand out two sticky notes to everybody in the room with a Sharpie. Just two. That's all you need. And they all have all the sticky notes. And you say, okay, I'm going to ask you um, a question. You're going to have five seconds to answer it. If you don't know the answer by the end of five seconds, you're going to put a question mark on the sticky. So I'm looking for a knee-jerk reaction. And you say, okay, first question. Why do you come, what do you believe in and why do you come to work every day? And then you start counting down to give them a little pressure. So five, four, three, two, one. Okay, if you don't know the answer, put a question mark. Now make contact with the person that's standing next to you, like eye contact. Now. I'm going to ask you a question about them, and you're going to have five seconds to answer. Why do they come to work every day, and what do they believe in? Five, four, three, two, one. Question mark. And you say, that second sticky note that you wrote about somebody, I want you to hand it to the person you wrote it about. You know, and then people are kind of like, uh-oh, see where this is going. So they hand the sticky note, and you hear some giggles in the room. That's your first indicator that it's working. And you say, okay. so. First off, when you compare your sticky note to what someone wrote about you, did they write it word for word? Did they even get in the right ballpark? And more importantly, is it the same thing like you wrote about somebody else? Meaning everyone wrote the same thing everywhere. It's not a question of, I just come to work to, you know, to pay the bills. You know, why are we really here? And so what you kind of present to them, you have to do it a little artfully, but typically people get this analogy. You know, you can either be the uh, New England Patriots or you can be the Cleveland Browns. They're both in the NFL. Uh, they're both uh, millions of dollars in budget. They have access to the same draft. They have access to the same recruitment firms, access in theory to the same players. So, when you said you're a team, you said you were one of the best. But unfortunately, you acted like, eh, just a team. We can either be a team or we can be a team. So this is your first realization as to we have a long way to go. And when we apply Scrum and our mentality behind it, 
we're all together or we're not. You can't say my shield wall is secure if I don't even know who I'm defending. Okay, so that goes back to what's Agile about. And a lot of people don't know. They just focus on themselves or speed or something. But if you focus on team, we're going to start over. We're going to focus on loyalty. When we go into our daily stand-ups, we're going to think about how can I make my teammate loyal to me? When I go into demo and I demo our product to our customers, how can I make my customer loyal to me as a delivery team member? And product owner, when you're writing user stories, how can I make my delivery team loyal to my cause? So if you all said the same word called loyalty, it would be your DNA. It would define you and the reason why you're here. It's not a blind loyalty, but it's one that is healthy. So sometimes when I'm coaching people coming out of daily stand-up, um, I'll ask them a question. You know, when, when you were in daily stand-up, what you said, how did you build loyalty with the person standing next to you? When that QA engineer asked you about your API and you got kind of irritated, how did you build loyalty with that? So what do you believe in? Why are you here? And that causes coaching uh, to work in many different ways. So getting into actual job descriptions, though, and I took this off of uh, LinkedIn quite a while ago, a couple of years back, but this is what Atlassian had. Notice what is on there, but more importantly, what is not on there. Just take a minute to read that. Okay, what they're not giving you is years of experience. They're not handing you some resume um, that says, you know, I've been in such and such position, so thereby I get this job. What they're after is a human. A human that believes in something, has a belief in certain areas. Okay, and then here's their counterpart, <clears throat> their QA lead. Someone who's balanced, someone who can challenge the status quo, someone who can see it from both directions, manual versus automated. Um, Someone that speaks up, you know, if you're in a scrum-based model where quality is protected at all costs, you don't want somebody that just shows up and says, I passed the code. You want someone that says, well, we passed the code, but I did some extra testing in this area, and I have a feeling this isn't what we're really looking for, right? And that starts the conversation. So when you look at scrum just by nature, everyone is always huddled together, whether huddled together physically in a physical scrum or huddled together in meetings, huddled together in purpose, huddled together in vision uh, with the roadmap of the product or our agile process. I mean, in theory, they're just together. So in this picture of an actual scrum, the most, a uh, couple of the most important people are the eights and the twos. The twos have their feet over the ball, the purpose of that entire team. Okay, that's why there's some call it times called the hooker because they hook the ball with their foot. They're the only ones that do that. And in theory, they don't focus on the movement of the team because they know the team will carry them, so to speak, over onto the ball. The person on the eight, though, is able to step back and look at the entire situation underneath everyone's feet, the terrain, and anchor the team in place. Okay, so those are all teammates working together. But does your team see their situation like that? There's someone over the user story of highest value, the must-have user story of the entire sprint. We're going to make sure that person is carried around and protected. But you way back there who might only be working on shoulds or coulds in the current sprint, you have an, a different job that's equally important. You're to look at the lay of the land. You're to look at all our feet, where we're situated, how we're working together or failing to work together, and you're going to help us anchor. So um, that's something to think about um, when it comes to the team itself, okay? Any questions so far? No? Okay. Hey, Mike, uh, just a question on the, uh, yeah, that um, mm -hmm. Kanban um, image. Hey, could you go over the, the Q&A section again? Is, is that like Q&A as yeah. in quality assurance? Um, in software, it would potentially be Q&A. Um, you could have different steps. I just made it really small um, for the purpose of the slide. Oh. I've seen different statuses. Uh, the one thing about statuses is that every status is potential waste. 
So you have to also consider that as do we break out dev into different pieces like design versus dev versus documentation? Do we break out QA to um, unit testing versus uh, functional testing versus automated testing? You know, like there is inherent waste in having too many steps. So I made it really light, lightweight. But in theory, when you look at the board, there's a lot of stuff going on. You have color coding going on. So if you were to compare this to other tools, like DE stands for defect, user story for user story. So you can see green is money, red is we embarrassed ourselves. And we have to clean it up. Okay. Another thing on this is you see these little icons here. That would be considered something called churn. So instead of having defect reports, I like churn reports. Okay. So churn is any time an issue goes in reverse in the workflow. It doesn't matter if it's a user story, a feature, a defect, a spike user story, um, a subtask, or whatever agile tool you're using. But the nature of we should be moving forward, but we're not. And in fact, we're going worse. We're going in reverse because we're really screwed up. Okay, so a lot of people focus on defects. My definition of defects normally kind of surprises some Agile coaches. Mine is that once you deliver something outside the team, you can't unring that bell, right? Once you deliver something to a customer, whether it's a software service or tangible good, you can't say, oh, give that back to me, you didn't see it. Um, at that point, it is a defect no question asked. Whether you call it a defect or a bug, that's up to you. No difference in my mind, but whatever terminology works for your Agile tool. However, when you're within the team and you're just working on a user story and the user story says, make you know the download button red, and the QA engineer looks at it and says, I understand you're colorblind, that's blue. So change the hex you know, code of the color to this. And since I can see those two different colors and you can't, understandable, um, I will pass the story. Some companies say send a defect back because we really want to track who's screwing up. And you're kind of like, well, that's, that's not the behavior I'm really looking for. I'm looking for collaboration. So from a product manager's point of view, he has a simple question. Is the story ready for production? Answer is no. Right? So he didn't say, oh, it's ready. Oh, but with defects? Oh, okay, that's nice. That sounds a lot better, right? No, that doesn't sound better at all. So if we're trying to build loyalty with the people who present the business value, you want the conversation to be consistent. The story is done or it's not. There is no, the story is done, but whoa, 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 we have these problems. Well, then it's not done, right? You're just embarrassing yourself with terminology when it comes to the business. Because the business is like, we don't care about the factory. So sending the story back to development or worse yet, back to the backlog because the requirements were poor. Like someone said, make the website fast. What the hell does that mean, right? Fast to me could be five seconds. Fast to you could be three because you're on Wi-Fi and I'm on 3G out in, you know, like in a, a cow pasture or something, right? And so my perception of speed is a lot different than yours. And even worse, when you get to a developer who's in the code, he's like, that's, that's, that's 13 milliseconds to me. Right, and so you're losing track of what fast means. Um, so QA fails something because they think fast means something. Then Dev is like, no, 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 I don't think it means that. And then the product owner is like, yeah, fast was a bad term. Send it back to the backlog, and I'll go research it. So what has happened is two layers of churn. It's not defects. It is churn. And so we're after the behavioral pattern of the product owner themselves. Product owners should never use the word fast, um, should never use nice to have or make it pretty or, you know, any of those weird perception based terms uh, with no mock ups or anything to support it. So that's why I encourage people to use churn as a reporting mechanism, because anything over like a churn rate of three is when I would start getting conf uh, confused right, or concerned is I understand QA and Dev are going to go back and forth, back and forth on some things. That's fine. But once you go beyond two or three and you're in a four or five, like how much rework is that costing us? How much downtime is that burning? And uh, if you would call it a uh, product manager would see it cost of delivery. So that's would be my recommendation to the people on this call is that when people are like, give me a defect report and you're like, 
Or, okay, are you focusing on the things that are in prod where we told a customer it works like A and it works like B? Because that's embarrassing and I agree. Let's get those reports. But if you're focusing on the, the actual development cycle, I want you to focus on churn because it's about behavior. Gotcha. And gotcha. See how they take that. Gotcha. That's very helpful, yep. Michael. Do, is churn a, a word used in Scrum? I, I don't recall um, here in Scrum. So is, is it a Kanban thing? No, it tends to be an, a, a tool thing. Ah. So um, depending on the, the agile tool or uh, just behaviors of analytic type people, they'll use the word churn rate. So uh, in uh, JIRA, you can add a custom field using uh, one of the many workflow add-ons that'll allow you to increment that field by one. So every time you move it back on the workflow, it'll automatically up the churn rate in the tool. Um, in Rally, uh, unless you use custom script, scripting, you have to remind teams to just up the, the field manually. So a lot of it depends on the tool, and we just add a custom field for it for churn. Okay. Okay, we had a comment in from Paul. I don't know if you can see it. Um, he says, I had not heard the term churn before in this context, but it's very applicable to what the project, what my project team is experiencing this week. Interesting. So I'm glad I don't work in Paul's company. Just kidding, Paul. Paul's like, wait a second. He just had that deer in headlights look. Um, but churn, I, I think when you use the word churn, you can use it in so many contexts right? And the advantage of that is, remember, if we say Agile is about loyalty, how do I build loyalty with my product owner? How do I build loyalty with my business? How do I build loyalty between dev and QA? You don't do that by putting up a wall that says, how many defects did you write? How many defects did you close? You know, it, it, were the requirements, right? Like everyone starts getting so defensive. But when you say, let's just use this word called churn. And they're like, you know, what's that? Are we making butter? Um, are we on a boat that's suddenly going in reverse and all the water behind the boat is churning like crazy, right? Like you give them these analogies that help them step away from their work for a second. <laughs> and then suddenly they're like, yeah, yeah, we have a lot of churn. Okay, is the churn around a certain set of functionality? Is the churn around a certain process? Is the churn around a certain role? You know, that, that's when it becomes interesting to discuss because maybe churn is around a certain set of functionality. Great. But then when you start diving into the requirements of that functionality, it's always like haphazard at best. Okay. And then you say, okay, product owner, why do we keep having haphazard? Well, the customers behind that functionality are very custom and they're very regulated government entities. Like now we're starting to understand the behavioral pattern, what's causing that to occur. So now the team realizes that. Uh, they might say, well, can you invite a couple of those people to the demo going forward so that before we get into new sprints, at least they get like a slight preview as to what the heck is going on. So then we can reduce churn just by nature of people being informed. Right. And so that's the goal is we've changed the behavioral pattern, uh, not by being defensive, but by analyzing the, if you call it the trail of tears, uh, you typically start with the symptoms, team not delivering, uh, teams having problems with requirements, but then you get you keep going back in time and you find the actual problem. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Paul's like, I'm never making a comment again. All right. So looking at the uh, Kanban videos, here's some videos we would look at. As you can tell, my class tends to be uh, sometimes fun. Um, Hoosiers, the hot potato scene when they're passing the ball back and forth. What it shows you is that Story size affects speed between cycles in that if you're constantly passing the same size story, a basketball or um, a baseball or a, a one single size box, you get used to that pass, right? You get used to the actual action, uh, the weight of the box or the, uh, or the, of the ball itself, the contour of the ball, how it feels. Um, you, instead of looking at the ball, you start looking at the person. Right. And then eventually you get so good, you start looking at the next person that's coming. So you're not even looking at the ball coming at you. You're not looking at the person that's sending it to you. You're actually looking at the next chain of events in preparation. And you're examining that person. Do they have big hands? They might be able to catch it. Oh, they have little hands or they're not as tall and I'm going to have to adjust. So you're already planning ahead because you've taken what a lot of people focus on is 
you know, story size, this story size, that this many hours, this many hours, and no one's bothering to look ahead because they can't. But if we were able to say, listen, every box on the conveyor belt is the same size. We'd be able to track how things get loaded into the trucks better. We'd be able to hand boxes off between people. Think of UPS and FedEx. You know, they ideally want every box to be the same size, right? There's a reason why they say oversize on a lot of boxes, right? And the goal is efficiency. So also when it comes to 300 uh, in the movie, later in the movie, the teams start becoming offensive. They, they leave that cavern and they start getting on the battlefield. But what happens is they start spreading out. Okay. Um, yes, some of them have shields and others have, you know, multiple swords or they drop their spear and get their sword. So they're changing their weapons, their mechanics, uh, because they become offensive. So if you're applying the same meeting structure of scrum to Kanban, you have a problem. You're applying a defensive mentality to an offensive, um, layout and that creates problems. Uh, Transformers 2. Uh, what's incremental about his delivery in one scene is when Optimus Prime is alone in the field and all these uh, Decepticons are attacking him. He's attacking them all together, but he slices them off one piece at a time. Like he, you know, hacks off one of their metallic arms, uh, punches one in the eye, jumps over one. So he's incremental in that he's, if you call it slicing it piece by piece, he's not going after one transformer all on its own until it's done. He's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So the same could be true with the development team. They have to realize, is our stuff small enough and the same size that allows us to break our work up appropriately, uh, throw, if you would say, a ball in the air while another one is landing in my arm. Uh, that could be spinning this build up in the QA environment. It's going to take an hour to run uh, while this other one was already delivered yesterday. So I'm going to start testing that. You know, and you're moving things around. Um, in the Discovery Channel uh, video that I was showing uh, people, and this was all about juggling, his peripheral vision was, was key. You can tell someone's a good juggler because their eyes stay focused and they never move while things around them are, you know, moving, okay? Bad jugglers are like, you know, and they're all over the place and, they're, and then their arms start moving and their bodies start moving and that's bad jugglers. We're all bad jugglers. The question is some of us are good ones. Okay, and the good ones don't move their eyes, they don't move their bodies aside from their arms, just going side to side, but they have this calmness about them. Okay, all right, so regardless of story size, the team's um, way of doing things does not change. Whether you have a large story or a small story, the way they approach it will always be the same. So keep that in mind that things compound and if you have a 21 point story and then suddenly a five point story and then an eight point story, the team shows up the same mentality, right? They say, Hey, do I need to design some stuff? Hey, do I need to document some stuff? Hey, do I need to test some stuff? Um, they're approaching it from the same behavior. Okay. So we're going to skip a section here because I don't have a certain video to show you. Okay. The ultimate product owner, this person. They went from the idea of serving all dishes at once to serving each dish in the order that it's on the menu. And we don't think twice of that today. You open up a menu uh, at some sports bar and you're going there to watch NFL or hockey or something. And you look at the appetizers, you expect the appetizers to come before the entree. Right? You expect the salad to come before the entree. You expect normally, unless you tell them, the dessert to come after the entree. That's because you're looking at the order of the things on the menu and you appreciate the delivery pattern. So this ultimate product owner who was a uh, chef, the idea way back when was you ordered your meal and they wheeled it out on the cart, right? And they brought it to your table and everything was laid out and you were done. Um, he changed that completely. That's a market change, right? So every chef from that point forward, for the most part, has followed the idea that you lay out the menu in the order that you would typically deliver it. Okay? And then on top of that, we go, you know, the salad plates tend to be cold. The entree plates tend to be room temperature or warm. The dessert plates, depending on what type of dessert it is, could be warm or cold. So that's something also to keep in mind is that when you change this massive dynamic, 
suddenly other processes start changing because of the way we work. Here's an actual recipe for Cinnabon. It's very good. Um, I had to make this for a small startup I was working at, and they had about 70 people there. This makes about 12 Cinnabons, give or take, depends on how much you're eating along the way. Okay, so about 12 Cinnabons. When I had to make it at scale for 70, uh, here's my countertop, here's all the equipment I needed. Obviously, I went to Costco, as you can tell here, right? And I got all this stuff here. No one sells Philadelphia cream cheese in bulk like that except Costco. So the problem is that when we go to our software development team or some service-oriented organization like marketing or sales, and you dump on them a bunch of stories like this, with acceptance criteria and tasking inside of it called, you know, ingredients could be the acceptance criteria, the tasking could actually be the directions of how to build it. When you do it for one set, that's fine. However, the moment that you do it for at scale and say, here's my roadmap and here's the 50 stories behind it and here's the 200 tasks behind it, the, the team's just trying to get their head around the situation. So the one problem is that when they lay everything out in their brain, they have no room to work. They can't roll out the dough. They can't actually physically do the work because they're stuck. So don't overburden your team with showing them everything. And a lot of people think Agile should be so visible that you can see everything and anything at any time. There is a, a limit to how much you can control in your head and laying it out. So, I don't show everything to the software teams until things are in certain positions where it makes sense. For example, they don't need to know, these are the 1,000 ideas that product management had this year, and we got them down to 10. Do they really need to know about those 990 things they decided not to do? Could be interesting if you sum it up, but they don't have time to read all that. Uh, so that's just the 10 features we're going to do. Then, as the 10 features are coming down the pipe, the team is only working on one to three features a pop in parallel, max, or nothing gets done. So do I really need them to see all seven features in detail that they're not doing yet? Probably not. It, they might need to know where we're going. So that they can build a better product to say, whoa, 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 are you saying in Q4 you want that? That's like tripling our user base. Okay, so that makes sense. But getting into, well, the parameters of the API in Q4 will be, you know, that, that's not going to help them. All right, so moving through that, just think about that, that showing them everything all the time is not conducive to efficiency. Okay, you need to sum up things in certain areas so that they know where they're going. But the details of how to move the cruise ship along the time um, when you're not even at the port of call probably isn't helping them. Okay. Uh, here's something from Michael Cohen's book about uh, dog point sizing. This is something you can use to test your team. And you put all these dogs up on the wall and say, okay, scale them from one to 30. And you just hand them the slide. And if they start going up there and putting points up there, you just stop them and say, what the heck are you guys doing? And they're like, you're doing what, we told, what you told us to do. No, actually, you're doing something wrong. Look at the slide I gave you. And they look at it and say, as a product owner, is that really the user? Okay. What's bigness mean? Because bigness could be the Great Dane or bigness could be the Chihuahua. Depends on what you're looking for. Right? Attitude or height. Um, proper dog for my family. What's your family? Do you have kids with special needs? Are you in a, um, an apartment complex? Are you in a house? Are you on a ranch? So sometimes using these team exercises, you tweak it just a little to show them, just like that exercise that I talked about earlier was, you're either a team or you're just a team. And when you start jumping the gun here, so to speak, and doing these things, you're just acting like another team. I can find another vendor who wouldn't pay attention to the user story easily. I can find someone cheaper to do that too. But I want you to do as a collaborative, agile, preferably co-located team is stop for a second 
and look at what is being requested. Because in the end, if you get this wrong, we have something called churn. And churn in requirements, churn in delivery, and worst case scenario, churn in customers. Churning customers is terrible. It's harder to win a customer back you lost than to get a new one. So churn applies everywhere. And if they apply that in their head, they realize, yeah, I need to pay attention to that. You'll hear about the invest model quite, um, quite often. Independent, negotiable, valuable, estimable, small, and testable. And the reason for that is when you're writing a user story is do these apply? Um, if you can't negotiate on anything, it's fixed. Thereby, it's not very agile-like. Um, if the team is like, why the heck are we doing this in the first place? And you said, well, don't worry about it. The, the business said we just need to get done. You're not being very agile in value. It's a value-based methodology. So if you remove the V, what, what are we doing? Um, testable. I love that part. Um, you look at the person and say, how would you test them? So they say, I, I don't know. And the team's like, okay, we'll get started. And you're like, well, what just happened? Right? If I can't confirm that it works, you almost want to re, uh, replace testable with demoable. If you can't test it, what business do we have demoing it? Right? So something to think about from an invest standpoint is are you investing in the stories, investing in your features, investing in your roadmap to help people understand that um, this is how Agile is applied. So when you apply invest to the dog size stuff, uh, again, what is bigness? You know, what's the value proposition? Um, can we truly estimate this? How can I test without a clear understanding of value? Like they start working off of each other. Um, user story practices. <clears throat> what to avoid if possible is like the SQL and inputting of code. Now, if you're working in like a big data environment, um, an analytical platform, it's understandable that you would say, we need to pull the data from these tables or we're working on normalizing the database. So this user story is about collapsing these tables and moving it here. Um, when you run this query, it should run this fast. Then you know, that makes sense because of the value you're asking for. But if you're writing a fresh website and you're telling them how to actually write the code, why don't you just farm it out to somebody? Because at that point, you don't need an Agile team. You don't need any collaboration at that point. Uh, Moscow rating is our, our next slide, so we'll cover that. Using pictures, oh my goodness. I've asked so many product owners to do this and they fight you tooth and nail because they don't think it's valuable until you stop everybody in the middle of a requirements meeting and you go up to the whiteboard and start drawing the system. And then you say, what do you want to change? And they say, oh, right there, bubble number three. This is what I want to change. And then I'd say, developer, come on up here. Here's another color. It, it was black on the, on the board. Here's green. Show us how you'd actually code that thing. And they start circling things and saying, what are we going to do here? Like, product owner, you gave me a visualization. Great. Now I see what's in your head, but you totally missed something. This requires that data. Are you getting us a data set? And then you give the red uh, marker to the QA engineer, and they come up and say, how the heck would I test it? I mean, come on, guys. This API calls on this, but it's only on batch files. But according to the acceptance requirements, it says real-time data. Are we doing a batch? Are we doing it real time? I mean, are you totally changing the entire system here, product owner? What are you doing? Okay, and when you're able to visualize things and communicate with visualization, it cuts down on so much garbage and churn of user store requirements. So using pictures constantly, I don't care if you have to draw it on a whiteboard and write the acceptance criteria next to it, take a picture on your smartphone, attach it to the Jira ticket or the rally user story or the version one user story. So that when you open it up in pre-planning meeting, people say, okay, I see the requirements there and the acceptance criteria. Open up the picture real quick. That doesn't match. Because you said this, and that's what the picture says. So what's, the, what's going on here? Um, so that's using pictures is really easy. If you don't know how to take a picture on your smartphone, I don't know what people are doing saying they're product owners. Um, another thing, walk the business through how this feature is supported. Uh, this can be done in a couple ways. One of the easiest ways is make your acceptance criteria chronological. So you almost want to be able to open up the user story on demo day and the QA engineer or the developer literally walks through acceptance criteria. All right, 
So starting with number one, the assumption was they came into the system by means of such process, which means they have this type of file in this format. Here it is. Step number one says we must pull that file in and adjust this field. Okay, I'm gonna show it to you now. Okay, when we adjust that field, it's supposed to kick off these two processes. Notice the first process kicked off right away. The second one was on a delay because do remember, even though it's not in the acceptance criteria, there is a delay on that import process. Okay, so the user story, since it's chronological, is allowing anyone to be cross-trained because they watch it. It allows the product owner to be reinforced as to this is what you asked for, is this what you want? And then the business or anyone like in support that watches the demo is like, oh, that's how it's supposed to run. Well, hold on, and step number five, can you go back to step number five? When that ran, you didn't show any log files. You didn't show anything that indicated that it was complete. How would I know as a support guy that that is complete, right? And so people are starting to get engaged in your product. And if anything, they're saying, this doesn't feel right. And that's exactly what you want in a demo meeting is the idea that someone says something doesn't feel right or this does feel right. Uh, they're connecting their limbic brain, their emotional side of their brain to your product line as opposed to feature one, check, feature two, check. That's your neocortex. If you can get people's limbic brains attached and be loyal to your product or your service, um, that's the ideal state to be in. And a lot of that is based on how you write user stories. Uh, Moscow must have, should have, could have, won't have. Okay, so this is a rating I use uh, quite often with my product owners. And this rating applies at many different layers. Um, I don't know how many layers your companies all have, but let's say it's a real huge enterprise. You have portfolio, you have program, you have teams. So Moscow at different layers means different things. You know, for example, let's, let's dumb it down to something pretty lightweight. I have a feature which has Moscow rated stories in it. Then on top of that, I have a release. So I'm gonna have five releases for this feature. It's a really big feature. And release number one, here are my must, to release my shoulds and hopefully my could. However, if you don't deliver my shoulds and coulds in the first release, they become must in the second release. All right, so let's look at the first release. You have a bunch of user stories. And you say, out of this release, how many sprints do we need to accomplish this big release? Two sprints, three sprints? Okay, cool. So in my first sprint, here's my must, my shoulds, and my coulds. If you don't get the shoulds or coulds done, they might become a, a must in the second sprint. And if you still don't get them done by the third sprint, they are definitely a must because the release just can't go. So helping people understand that Moscow applies at different layers, um, even in a sprint, you want must, should, could. And you're like, why? Why wouldn't everything be a must? Think of the Kentucky Derby. All the horses line up in a horse gate, right? When the bell rings, the horse gate opens. Do the horses go in different directions? No, they all follow the path laid out in front of them. So when you look at the sprint plan, you're saying the first round of the actual track is the musts. Between the second and third area of the track are the shoulds, and the last quarter mile of the track are the coulds. So team, when you show up on the second day of a 10 day sprint and someone says, yeah, 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 I'm working on my should, everybody stop. Explain this to me like I'm an idiot. You're working on a should, your teammates are not done with their musts. And in fact, you have a must and you haven't even started. What the heck are you doing? Why are you working on a should? It doesn't make any logical sense. Okay, so it's not about the points, it's not about the hours, it's not about the requirements, it's not about churn, it's about something that disarms people very quickly. Why are you working on a should when the musts aren't done? And if you can't explain that, I suggest you stop. You know, so that disarms people quite rapidly. Uh, this was taken from uh, the Agile Testing Book by, uh, with Lisa Crispin. <clears throat> uh, they have this model in here. So when someone says I'm testing, you're kind of like, what type of testing? And if your acceptance criteria just says QA testing or dev testing, it's not educating you as a product owner to what are we testing and more importantly, what are we not testing? 
Are we not testing performance? Are we not testing security? Do we plan on being the next Home Depot with our credit cards being stolen like, or like Home Depot and Target in the news? Um, do we plan on not actually testing the story? So when we show up on demo days, should I be impressed or should I be scared? Right? And so this educates the team as to maybe they don't have the skills to do scalability testing. Maybe you don't have the tools to do it. But thereby, since I listed out what type of tests we're doing, functional and usability and exploratory, that meant you're not doing these? Yeah. Okay. Is that, what's that reason? Well, we don't have the skill for that. Those guys are really, really expensive and we don't even have those tools. Okay. So until that time happens when we're willing to pay for that, I as a product owner am accepting that we're not doing X scalability testing. Well, we only have 100 users on the system, so I'm not too concerned. But before we go to 5,000, I better figure out how we're going to handle that. Okay, I got it. Okay, so that's what this type of test measures are for. Okay, we're going to get into acceptance criteria versus acceptance test criteria. Think of a restaurant. Here's acceptance criteria. Okay, so notice the menu on the right-hand side here. Versus acceptance test criteria is this. So if you're looking at a medium T-bone steak, the acceptance test criteria could potentially fall into this. And a lot of people use these terms interchangeably, but if you're talking to a QA engineer, you could really freak them out if you use acceptance test criteria when you're talking to them using that term because their mind suddenly triggers. Oh, 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 you're asking about this boundary testing and stuff like that. No, that's not what I'm asking for. Well, you said acceptance test criteria. Make up your mind. Okay, so be very cautious. Uh, most product owners are focused on acceptance criteria. They're focused on, again, the delivery. Like if this is what came into the kitchen, you're already talking about, oh, um, side salad, not a primary appetizer salad. So this goes out actually with the T-bone. Got it. Okay, so you're actually talking about delivery pattern by nature of the acceptance criteria itself. Um, it's business value oriented. If you're looking at a website, for example, you have like why slow out there and a couple things where it grades your website. If you're using a mobile application, you're using something like X Mirage, which allows you to take your iPad and put it on the screen. Okay, so this is demoable. Um, these are the tools that would test acceptance criteria for the most part. And you can even get technical. This is something called Charles Proxy. And by the way, it's one of the best apps I've ever used before. It's really cool. If your acceptance criteria said the website needs to load in one second, according to this um, array, it says 1.2 seconds is how long it took. And the product owner's jumping up and down, jumping up and down, saying, well, I, oh, why me? Why this? And the team says, okay, see all these calls going on here? Yeah. You see this PNG? A PNG is a picture file. Okay, yeah, I don't understand how this means that I went over 1.2 seconds. Well, hang on a second. You see this long bar here on the right of how long it took to load? Yeah, that's because you were an idiot. You told us that on an e-commerce website, every picture had to be high-definition graphics. I don't know where you got that idea from because Amazon doesn't even do that. They don't do high depth because they want the page to load fast. Because if it doesn't load fast, you don't buy. If you click on the picture, then they'll load the high definition graphic because you asked for it. But they don't do that every time. And we told you that this would cause a problem and you didn't listen. So the best we could come up with is 1.2 seconds. So either A, remove the acceptance criteria about high definition graphics, or B, change your acceptance criteria about the duration of the page load because it's just not physically possible and I'm showing you how it actually worked in this tool. So. By nature, this would educate the product owner to understand and be loyal to the team. Instead of blaming them, they get it. And then here's the Twitter fail whale. Okay, performance is acceptance criteria. So when you look at this, a different uh, marketing information here. Amazon loses nearly a million an hour if they're down. So if you were to say our website, if it's down, we lose fifty thousand dollars an hour. Okay. So when the team says we're only going to have 99% uptime, that means we're only down for 3.65 days, which means we almost lost $4 million. Are you willing to invest in the tools, the labor dollars, the delay of features to market window to get us down to 99.99% because now we're down to $43,833? 
However, between those two levels are maybe two, three, four million dollars of labor licensing and technology. So you have to offset that to say, is it really worth the cost? Don't know. But don't tell me we shouldn't know what our uptime is because it equates to money. But you'd be surprised that my product owners don't know what their uptime should be. And the business is kind of like, well, we just wanted to be up and lo- online. Well, what's that mean? Right. And then when it's down, everyone's upset and you're kind of like, but we're up 99% of the year. Well, that's, that's unacceptable. Well, you never told me it wasn't. Okay. So this equates to a lot of money. So getting into acceptance test criteria about the T-bone, here's our uh, boundary testing. It's typically encoding language. It uses different applications to test it. So if you're looking at Cucumber, um, yes, it is written in somewhat business speak, but in the background, it is running code. And then here's fitness. And then here's RubyMine running code in the background, writing uh, acceptance tests. Okay. So I'll pause here before we dive into more stuff. And uh, what we are going to cover is some stuff around user stories, a little bit on story pointing. Uh, we're probably going to skip most of the meetings of Scrum uh, because we just won't have time. Uh, we'll cover velocity and capacity so you know the difference of terms depending on the tools you're using and the frameworks. And then we're going to get into some metrics. So at least you guys have an idea of like where we can get going here. So how about I pause here now you know like what's coming, and more importantly what's not. Um, any questions, comments, concerns? No, I'll just say it's been extremely helpful going over a lot of this stuff in some greater level of detail than I've um, experienced in the past. And um, yeah, looking forward to what's coming ahead. Are you going to show us any of the, the, the tools you mentioned, like Rally or, or Jira or any of those? I could, I could show you my personal edition of Jira. Um, okay. I can't open up my, my uh, main companies because I'd be in a lot of legal trouble. <laughs> but I could, uh, I could show you my personal edition so you could see it. Okay. Yeah, that would be nice later on when, when we come back. So how, how long should we break for? Oh, yeah, I was just going to continue going. I was just breaking for the uh, purpose of questions. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> I thought you needed a break. Okay. Oh, no, 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 not yet. Um, any other questions, comments, anything? No? Yeah. Uh, we're going to jump into user stories here because, you know, that's fun. Um, as a financial officer, I want the revenue report to be exportable on the downloads page so I, that I may forward the report to outside vendors. If you would have said, as a product owner, I want the revenue report to be exportable, you would have lost a lot of things. Number one, financial officer has a different technical aptitude than the product owner himself. Forwarding a revenue report about vendors to outside vendors is a security nightmare waiting to happen. Right? Now that I understand who's doing it, their level of authority in the company, which means they see everything. The financial officer has access to everything when it comes to finance, right? So if I give him a revenue report, he sees everything. Names, addresses, contacts, money, contract numbers, payment methods. And then you're going to do what with it? Send it to an outside vendor? Are you crazy? So if we're protecting quality at all costs, the value of the company, the value of the story, the value of the feature, right away since it's written this way, the team can say, stop. Sure, I can develop anything, but I don't want it to be my last sprint working here. So what are you doing? That doesn't make any sense. Logically, legally, anything, right? So there you go. You, you got to focus on that. Acceptance criteria, exportable and XLSX. So it doesn't say XLS. So what you've inclined everybody to understand is you're supporting over a million rows in Excel. If it said XLS, you have inferred only 64,000 rows. So sometimes when we get into this argument with customers about we support Excel or some other technology that has multiple formats, it's better to say we support XLS, but we're going to follow it up with a future release to support XLSX. Customers knew that instead of you just saying we support Excel and then realizing the hard way that you don't support XLSX and embarrassing your company and wasting their time and their business 
Maybe they trained all their teams saying, we're going to start using this tool because well, now we can load all this data. Well, that's not really true. You can only load 64,000 at a time. Well, why didn't you tell me that? Oh. So user stories should be written in a way that the customer is educated as to what you do and more importantly, what you don't support. So we support XLSX. So that means we obviously support the XLS in size. Export link will be available on the reporting page. Um, it will not force a specific download location from the application. Um, you're helping people understand the headers in the download file should match the UI. And a lot of times in tools, it doesn't. Like the UI looks a certain way because we can override the way fields look. But then when you just do a direct download, you suddenly like, what's this field? Oh, wait a second. That, that's that field. Why did it do that? You know, and people think something's wrong with your product. So helping people understand, do I match it or do I not match it? Customers want to know. Um, export will be saved on the application server. It'll be stamped in the database. It'll have logs in the debug mode. And if it fails, the server will cancel the job on reset, restart. So we've handled a number of people. Yes, the financial officer is probably um, up until he would have some interest up to this point. He could come back to get the download for up to 14 days. But at this point, it's transitioning in users to support, to operations. So if someone said the story is too big for a sprint, you could say, well, I could cut it right there. And I could have a separate story all dedicated to operations. So before we release it, though, I need both stories, guys, because I'm not going to deploy this and screw up my ops team. OK, it's fine. But let's build up the actual um, report. Let's see how it exports, the scalability behind it, the performance behind it. Maybe send it to the financial officer as kind of a demo with data in it. And he might come back and say, this is kind of useless. Can you remove these columns? I don't need that extra columns. OK? Let's get that feedback loop before we decide to stamp stuff in the database. That makes sense. OK, we could do that. Um, more importantly, what does the system do when it fails? And I've seen a lot of people say, well, send, send an alert. That doesn't tell me how the system responds to failure. That tells me how it alerts. And people are confusing that in a lot of user stories in a lot of companies. This says, regardless of alert, if the server fails and the job is running, when the system restarts, cancel the job and restart it. Okay? So that's your way of handling a failure. If you're loading data and it fails and the server's still online, do you want it to back out the changes? Do you want it to just move forward and keep a pending? What if that causes corruption? And a lot of people solve it by saying, well, we'll just alert ops. Great. In the meantime, while Ops is still sleeping and trying to get out of their bed in the middle of the night, what do you want the system to do? Corrupt the rest of the system or stop? Shut down the system? This is a real-time event. You know, we, we handle emergency services for the Eastern Seaboard. Shutting down the system would probably put a lot of lives at risk. What do you want to do? So keep that in mind is what do you want to happen when this fails? And if it's not written in there, you have no business building it. Um, defect and bugs. So my wife is the director of QA, and this is a test in one of her interviews. It is what's the difference between defect and a bug? And if the person literally tries to answer that question, like logically, she says the interview is over. Why are you wasting my time arguing about a defect versus a bug in terminology when the customer was just told they got something, and in fact they didn't? That's the type of QA engineer I'm looking for is someone who says, can we stop arguing about this? It really doesn't make a difference. We failed. Let's just fix it. Right? So that's something to think about, too, is our terminology. Sometimes we say a bug is in a lower environment and a defect is in production. In the end, we're embarrassing ourselves because the customer is like, what's the point? It doesn't work. I really don't care about arguing about the term. My business is screwed up. So you want that same mentality to go down to the teams. And in the end, you cannot hot patch Loyalty. You cannot patch a product. You cannot patch customers' loyalty once you break it. Okay, bring in the story points here and anchor stories. 
be generally accurate, not precisely wrong. If, how do you order your drinks? I mean, do you go into uh, Starbucks and order it like this? If you do, you're probably a nutritionist or an inspector. But that's not normally how we order it. We say grande caramel macchiato, go, okay? If you're going to the Super Bowl and let's just say the, uh, the stadium's right down the street and you happen to win a ticket, would you tell your wife, well, honey, uh, there's 15 minutes per quarter plus a 20 minute halftime. Um, traffic is normally, you know, seven minutes. Uh, I will give myself one minute lead time to get to my car. So I'll be home at 757. It, that's the uh, equation for disaster, right? So when it comes to story points and hours and all that stuff, you are not trying to map story points to hours because then you're just using hours again. Um, when we look at story points, we look at it more like this. And anytime you can get alcohol into a uh, company slide, you know you're doing pretty good. Okay, so here, if our goal is to get home safely from happy hour, uh, home, and it's snowing outside, you make some judgment calls about what you can and cannot do, okay? But your goal is to get home safely without stopping. Not just home safely, home without stopping. It's snowing. I do not want to pull over on the side of the road. So if I drink one of these 21s, I'm probably going to be pulled over for one reason. If I eat five of these watermelons, I'm going to pull over for another reason. So it's not just about safety. It's about getting home without stopping. So points add up to the same outcome. And that's what they're designed for, is that there's relativity in how they work together. Uh, we're gonna skip some of this stuff because it's for a different type of class. All right, capacity and velocity. Depending on the framework you're using, you may hear, hear the terms are the same. And you're kind of like, wait a minute, how could they be the same in some and some not in others? Because some don't work off of the dictionary. Uh, some focus on just velocity. So like scaled agile framework, for instance, just uses the term velocity for everything because everything's in story point. That's how the framework works. But when you go to the agile tools like Jira or version one or rally, they have task hours and then they have story points. So since you have both lines of estimation theory, one is relative and one is um, actual, they're different. Capacity is about the actual constraint. How many hours do you have in a day? How many hours are in a sprint? Um, thereby, capacity is constraint of hours. I task in hours, so capacity is driven by tasking. Uh, that's how most of the Agile tools will see it. So when you're talking about task hours, you're typically talking about capacity. However, when we talk about velocity, which is another term that you hear about, and it's always associated to points, Many people think it's about speed. Speed describes only how fast you're going. 55 miles an hour, that's called speed. 55 miles an hour going north, that's called velocity. People in aeronautics know this quite well. A plane can hold so much poundage. However, to get it off the runway, you need to be going you know, a certain speed south down the runway. You need a certain velocity to, to take off. So the plane could always hold so much capacity, but if you don't have enough velocity in a certain direction, going into the wind or going against the wind, you know, depending on how you're looking at it, you might need a different velocity, right? So that's how planes work. So when you look at velocity, a plane's velocity is decreasing as it lands. However, we still consider negative acceleration to be increasing. When a plane turns in direction, its velocity changes. Even if the speed is constant due to turning on the afterburner in a fighter jet, your velocity might change because you're changing direction. A plane's speed can increase in a constant direction, thus velocity is also increasing. And so here's Maverick and Goose, rest in peace. Everyone get that uh, movie reference? Okay. All right, so consider that with velocity. Velocity charts should be kind of boring. If you see them going up and down like a heart attack, your team's having a heart attack. Velocity should be slowly increasing, slowly increasing, and this is based on a movie clip we're watching if you're wondering what all the references are. 
slowly increasing until the team actually breaks. And then they pull back a little bit and try and get better again. But if your team's going up and down, up and down, we deliver, no, we don't deliver, no, we pulled story from sprint to sprint, oh my goodness, we can't get anything done. I mean, at some point, people are like ejecting out of the, out of the cockpit because they just don't want to work here anymore. If you're trying to wonder what scene this is from, it's uh, behind enemy lines uh, at the beginning of the movie when the, the plane is uh, dodging the missile. So if you're really bored tonight and you can't sleep, um, you could watch that scene and say, oh, wow, that's a really bad agile team. All right, let's get into... Um, All right, we're going to get into some reports before I open it up for questions and stuff. All right. Anyone know what uh, TV show that's referencing? Hmm. People are like, hmm. Uh, X-Files. Yes. There, Justin. Boom. All right. So um, this is a bunch of lies. Nothing is that perfect. Um, your team's lying to you. Your product owner's lying to you. The scrum master's in on it. There's nothing that perfect. I've never seen a chart look like that. Okay. This one is more real. Uh, we have a bunch of hours to do our work, hence the capacity of 180 hours. It's slowly burning down, sometimes not as well as we want, and then it dips, and then a little behind, and then it dips again. The story points, the velocity, you get story point credit when you accept a story, meaning dev did the work, the QA mentality kicked in, the product owner did a small demo on the fly and says, you know what? If you change nothing before the end of the sprint and you do the official demo in front of our customer, um, I would say this works out great. So I'm going to accept the story right now and give you credit for it. So that's why you start seeing mid sprint. Here are your must haves. Must haves are right in this area. They should start kicking in. We're delivering, the product owner is accepting it, thinks it's great. So toward the end of the sprint, when we hit the official demo day with our customers, most of the stuff is already accepted. So now we're just working on the could haves, if anything at all. This is when um, a bunch of behaviors here, you're not getting stuff done, so it carries over to the next sprint. And then the next sprint, everyone's like, yeah, 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 we're, we're, we're pulling stuff on the first couple of days of the sprint. We're an awesome team. And you're like, no. The only reason why you have that behavior is go back in time because you have that behavior. Ideally, the behavior I actually want is this. But since you guys failed, then you start closing things out. So I don't see why everyone's congratulating themselves on failure. Right? So helping people appreciate that you can't just look at one chart. You have to look at the context as to what caused the behavior to occur. Then getting into dev complete versus not tested. I love that. I have a dev team and then I have a QA team. Well, why would I accept a story if it hasn't been tested? Well, it's been unit tested. Okay, well then let's just deploy. No, 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 it needs functional testing. Oh, so we're not done? No, dev's done. So if we find a problem, what do you do? Well, we'll fix it. So you're telling me you're not done. See, see where we're going with this? Like, if the code's done, the code's done, let's go. Let's rock and roll. But if you're telling me we're going to embarrass ourselves because something's probably wrong, knowing that you have to change something, why are you saying you're done? Because you're not done. So stop playing that game. Um, that's what typically happens. Uh, this could be there's no product owner, a uh, managed service model, maybe with dev and one sprint QA and another. So that's something to keep in mind is you should not be accepting things unless you're ready to give it to a customer. Um, here's where a sprint gets canceled. We're not getting anything done. We have all these prod outages, prod outages, prod outages. Oh my goodness, just cancel the sprint already. Okay, is this one? Uh, the team either didn't show up on uh, planning day, the product owner didn't show up on planning day, or people didn't add any tasking. So by the time we added tasking, we're well below where we should be. So what's this massive inefficiency? We lost so much money here because we weren't even booked to our highest capacity. And then here is when uh, we call these spikes. So it's a type of user story typically for a documentation, um, knowledge transfer, 
throwaway code, stuff that's not going to prod, um, automated testing creation if necessary that has nothing to do with an active story. So the reason why they're called spikes is the team's getting ahead of the game when it comes to hours. Things aren't taking as long as they thought they would. So they bring in this story called a spike because they're just documenting the API or some throwaway code for scalability testing. But it's really fast because I don't need QA to do it. I don't need the BA involved. I don't need the product owner to get me data from production. You know, whatever it is, you don't need all those extra steps like you usually do. So then the hours come back down pretty quickly. So it looks like a heartbeat on the chart. It looks like a spike. Okay, so when we start a sprint, some people build an agile sprint forecast, like the weather. We have this much velocity, hoping to get 55 points. We have a capacity of, this team's over, 393 hours when only we have 377. So that means some people are working overtime. That doesn't sound good. Then we do must have, should have, could have, and then defects. So if you hand this to somebody in the business and say, in this two weeks, throughout the timeline, we're gonna have stories showing up on different days, and here's where our actual meetings occur. So I have a calendar for you to say how stories are rolling off the assembly line. I have it in order of must, should, could. So if we run into problems, which ones do you think I'm taking off the list first? Ah, the coulds, yes, naturally, logically, that makes sense, DF85. So that means DF85, if I look on the calendar, that wouldn't show up on the 30th if you pull it out. That makes sense. So this is a sprint plan, a sprint forecast. It's just a way of writing a report. But you're educating the business as to why the priority has been laid out the way it has. And then you're also buffering the team to say, if by chance we're into trouble, which we hope we never do, but if we do, this is the logical way we're pulling stuff out. So team, before you start working on DF85, can you please ask the rest of the team of USB, uh, the three USBs there at the top, 5275, 3825, and 9201 are actually done? Because if they're not done, those are my musts. So it's helping people understand how they should be working together and when they should be engaging. And then when you get into the uh, Agile Sprint outcome, we can say we did have to pull DF85. Uh, the mobile UI developer pulled off due to iOS deployment problems with the X-Files Agile team who were lost in Area 51 code base. Uh, this was replaced with a must-have for the next sprint and more story points. Um, the reason for that is the API tester was available, as was the mobile tester, to validate the security token. So the product owner pulled the story on day four, which allowed the team to reallocate quickly. So you're educating the, com the company about we understand their scope changes occasionally, but like the shield wall, we negotiated. We're pulling out DF85 to release this person to go work on something critical, but we're bringing something else in that the rest of the team could possibly accommodate. That's called being reasonable. Um, another analogy we sometimes use is a tree. If there's a bunch of wind on a tree, don't confuse that with hurricane snapping of the tree, okay? If you have wind in a sprint, the tree should be able to bend. Whether that bend means the business says, oh, yeah, we're just not getting all the stories we hoped, or the team says, well, we'll bring this in if you take that out. You know, everyone's bending in different directions. I used to want the tree to snap due to too much pressure. And then the reverse is you don't want a petrified forest. No, we will not bring something into sprint. We are agile. Well, that sounds great, right? So you have to think about that perception because in the end, if you had a report that did the outcome, it's either it's done, it's partially done, or it's really not done. So looking at iterative cumulative flow, so remember the product owner is the chef and the nurse is the scrum master. So if the team is chunking out their work, not everything is in progress at once, just portions of it throughout the sprint, slowly, pulling away from the defying column, bringing it in in progress, getting stuff done and getting accepted, everyone's happy. This is what happens quite often is at the start of the sprint, the first day we're fine, then two and three days in, almost everything's in flight, and then half the stuff doesn't get done. Then you have this problem, the team's doing good at chunking, but they're not getting any response from the product owner. So as they say, this story's done, this story's done, this story's done, Proctor was like, well, I'll just wait until the last day of the sprint to demo it. 
A team's like, why can't you just look at it right now with me for five minutes? I want to know if we're doing the right thing. So then suddenly a bunch of stuff is accepted, but notice not all of it because he shows up on planning day or on a demo day and says, why am I getting surprised like this? This isn't what we agreed. And they say, well, actually, we didn't surprise you because it was done over here on the fifth and you weren't willing to look at it. Then you have this issue. My stories aren't ready for planning. So on day one, it looks like everything goes in progress. Well, of course it looks that way because you only have three stories. But then a couple days into the sprint, the product owner shows up and then all these stories, like another 15 get loaded onto the team. So now it looks like almost nothing's in progress, right? Because only three were in progress at that time. And then it's an ambulance ride at the end of the sprint. Whether that ambulance ride is one of your teammates falling over dead or your product owner going to the hospital for getting beat up. And then here's where the product owner can't make up his mind. He has all these great ideas throughout the sprint. So up, down, up, down, pull things out of sprint, bring things in sprint, ambulance, ambulance, ambulance. And then eventually the only thing the scrum master can do at the end of the sprint, besides saying you broke agile, was, you know, the sprint costs $22,400 in labor. Say goodbye to that because you're not getting it back. And then here's where the scrum master isn't being um, trusted because no one's updating their hours or their tasking or their stories. But at the end of the sprint, miraculously, everything gets completed and accepted. So the product owner's in the circle of trust. He's buddy buddy with the team. And the scrum master's like, why isn't everyone updating? Well, we're in big trouble. We're in big trouble. But at the very end, everything's accepted. So from a standpoint of commitment versus accepted, the team looks awesome because they deliver. But they're clearly having some behavioral problems. Uh, here's waterfall testing in agile companies. The code freeze is more like a code frost because when you find problems, do you change it? Yeah, yeah, we'll change the code. So, but it's frozen. Yeah, but we need to fix it. But it's frozen. Are you thawing the food and then refreezing it and thawing it and refreezing? You know how that tastes in a in a restaurant, don't you? Okay, so that never really existed. Agile testing in agile companies is we do the story, we test it. We do the story, we test it. So we run out of time. We cut the story. We don't cut quality on all the stories. Uh, let's see here. Plan-based or value-based testing. Plan-based is on requirements and timelines, code coverage. I, I love that code coverage argument because they'll say, oh, we, we covered all the code for all the users we have. Well, we're going to find a new user tomorrow that doesn't work that way. Um, number of tests. Okay, so if I line up a bunch of monitors on a table and I look at all their pixels and I have 15 monitors, does, does that mean I'm, I'm better because I did 15 tests? Why are you looking at the pixels? Well, because we have a UI. I just want to make sure the pixels are right. That's not very valuable. Well, that's not what we're worried about. We're worried about the number of tests and the number of failures, right? So I proved on all these monitors. We support all these monitors. We're good, right? Okay, so think of that when it comes to the number of tests. Uh, it's, it's confused with being more secure and more quality. Um, that's not necessarily true. Uh, when it comes to value, if I knew the customer was a chief financial officer versus a person in logistics who does shipping, and this application is about shipping, who do you think is probably going to have more of the problem using the tool? And since this user story is about the chief financial officer, hmm, maybe I should test it a little differently because he's not the guy who's the primary user. Um, highest value versus least value. If you were to ask your product owner to say, what's the most valuable workflow in our, in our entire system? And what's the riskiest one? Okay, so we have 100 tests, yeah. And you just told me this workflow produces 20% of your value of revenue. Yeah. Why aren't we testing that 20% of the time instead of 1%? Uh, I don't know, go talk to QA. Well, QA didn't even know it was the most valuable thing because you don't write in user stories. So I can't even get them out of plan-based mentality and focused on value because the story doesn't even indicate what the value is. See the problem? Okay, so that's something to keep, uh, keep in mind is that 
just testing everything isn't always good. I mean, if you have functionality that's only used 1% of the time, but you test it equally with the part of the product that's used 20, 40, 50% of the time, you're wasting um, time in testing. Uh, different quadrants here, one's from uh, Lisa Crispin's book, which is the quadrants method, and then this is the Michael Cohen book. Uh, what I find is it's easier to go up to QA and ask them what tools they use than it is to really argue about what they should be testing. So if according to this on the left-hand side, they started telling me that they use Selenium and Quick Test Pro, they're focused at the UI layer primarily which is the most costly part of the system. And it takes the longest to render. If I already knew the data was wrong, why do I need the browser to tell me that it's wrong? Why can't I just write a query that runs in fitness or in curl if I'm calling on the API and I say, show me all vendors that work with um, Xfinity. Well, I expect 2000 vendors and I only got 20 back. Well, I can't prove that's wrong until I see it in the UI. That's where a lot of people do a lot of their testing is just in the UI. But you're like, you can run 2,000 tests in the amount of time it takes to run one or two tests in the UI, but you're telling me that you're not gonna do that? If you find things lower and lower, it's cheaper to fix. Cheaper to fix tool, cheaper to fix time, cheaper to fix process, Cheaper to fix embarrassment. When you start getting into the UI, you're getting into critiquing the product, which means you're probably in front of the user at that point, or getting really close. However, if you catch it way back here in the team land, you're not gonna embarrass yourself. Okay. Uh, so I expect people to have um, agile roadmaps. And a lot of people say, yeah, I do. No, most companies only have product roadmaps. Oh, I thought that's what you meant. No, 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 no. I didn't say product roadmap, I said agile roadmap. Agile roadmap should be about how are we getting better as a team, our behaviors, the way we do things. So for example, we have these things called retrospective meetings, right? And those happen every sprint, right? That's all the team's focused on is their sprint. Give them something bigger, say, listen, at the start of this quarter, we all agreed we didn't have this, we didn't have this, and we didn't have this. Out of those three things, what's the bullet item we want to solve by the end of the quarter? The big ticket item. Because our product manager is going to have all these product things going on in his roadmap. I want to be able to approach him with a quarterly agile roadmap to say, while you're doing these product changes, we're changing us, our behaviors, our processes, our tools, our artifacts. But what are we going to do? Oh, well, we want the planning meeting to be cleaned up because it runs for like eight hours. I mean, we literally do it for a whole, whole day and then come in the following morning. We don't even get donuts, but we have to show up and we're here for another two hours. This is, this is such a waste of time. And there's 10 people in here. This is crazy. Okay, cool. You want to fix the planning meeting? Fine. In the first month, we're going to do some user story training <coughs> and make sure our standups are running well because the meetings are like a snowball effect. If you're really bad at these, you're gonna be really bad at those. Um, once we do the training, we're gonna to have to clean up our backlog while we're actively doing product. And then if we clean up our user stories, we can do tasking and capacity training so we do our estimates better. And then lo and behold, the planning meeting could be fixed. But until all those pieces happen, I can't fix the planning. I know you didn't want to hear that cough. Okay, so that covers pretty much the material I was going to go over with you guys. Um, willing to answer any questions, cover any topic. Oh, you wanted to see the tool. Uh, let me show you the tool here. Now, there's a bunch of them out there. Um, oh, not that one. I'm not even sure if I have any good data to show you. Right. And this is off my little test server in my house, so I haven't logged into it in about a month. 
So I'm hoping, oh, it's giving me trouble. I might not be able to show it to you because I wasn't planning on doing my app. So let me see if it works. <coughs> Sorry about this. <clears throat> I'm coughing. Doesn't look like my personal app is working. So I'm probably not going to show you anything, unfortunately. No worries. Don't we let that be a sign of a. Don't let we that be a sign of your sticks because it actually works really well. <laughs> so, so Michael, we, is, um, is Jira and Rally pretty much the same functionality, or do they do different things? No. Um, Rally is a somewhat well. It's actually called CA Agile now uh, because CA Technologies bought them. Um, I would still consider them somewhat of a closed loop product. Um, CA lets all their tools typically work together. Maybe not great because they're very similar to Google. They like to acquire companies. So their technology is not always 100% built by them. Uh, it's imported in by means of uh, acquisition. So they don't always work phenomenally together. They work decently, but maybe not phenomenally. Um, CA Agile, or formerly known as Rally, focused a lot on Scrum teams. And yes, it was Agile by how it was built. Uh, at last team who built Jira, um, it was a ticket system by nature. So it has the pros and the cons of being a ticket system, which means you can configure it any way you want, which leads you to uh, a lot of uh, death spirals in process sometimes versus Rally and version one and other competitors don't let you change very much. <coughs> Sorry, I'm, I guess I'm getting close to my limit here in my throat. Um, so Atlassian also is very strong in the ecosystem. They have an Atlassian marketplace, which doesn't just focus on buy another Atlassian product. Uh, they're more like Apple. You buy the iPhone and then you buy all the apps, right? So they get 25% of the revenue of all the apps that are on their marketplace. So all these vendors build tools out there and 25% of their money goes to Atlassian. So since that's a big form of revenue dollars for them, their product is designed to be more open. Uh, in fact, the version that I have that I obviously have to fix today, um, you can locally install. You own the database. Um, so I can literally see every table that they use. Right, and then build an app if I were a developer in that space. So they use Groovy as uh, their primary language. So if you look at, com compare that to version one or CA Technologies with Rally, they may give you an image, to like a virtual image, so you have your own instance on premise, but you don't actually like get full access to the database. Right, so they're very limited as to what they allow you to do with that. Um, a lot of their former integrations used to be Ruby uh, scripts. They weren't full apps. Uh, version one's a little better um, in that they put things a lot in their UI. CA has been trying to get better at it. But Atlassian by far is the biggest ecosystem. Uh, they tie into so many different um, software development deployment tools. So they act more like a hub on a, on a wheel of a bicycle, and they want all the spokes coming off of it because their power is in their ecosystem. It's not really actually in the tool. Um, another thing about Jira is that it allows you, a lot of other tools let you add custom fields, but they don't allow you to decide where to put the field on the screen. And you're kind of like, what's that matter? If you're in a planning meeting, you want to focus on value, 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 and priority of value. And then you want to focus on tasking and points. And then you want to focus on what's the delivery on the calendar. Rally would say, put that all into the custom field section. It's all one big blob at the bottom. But Jira allows you to break it up by tabs and move the fields around. So then there's an efficiency on how's the data presented. So then in the meeting, I'm focused on the planning fields when I'm in planning mode. And when I'm in tracking mode, I'm into like capacity and hours. That's helpful to know. Is it free? Is Jira free or do you need a subscription monthly? Uh, they have many versions. Uh, they have their cloud edition. They have the server edition, which is the most customizable, and that's the one I have. And then they have the data center edition, which is multi-node. Um, nothing is free. <laughs> um, 
but in all real sense, nothing's free with them. Uh, you can get 10 users on any of their products, or I think the majority of their products, there might be one or two that you can't, for 10 bucks. And it's a license that lasts a year. Once you go over 10, then the price jumps dramatically, right? And then also, um, here, let me show you one thing about it last time is, and this helps people understand, especially those of you on the phone that actually use Jira. Uh, let me look up Script Runner. And the reason why I'm looking up Script Runner, um, this is one of the number one add-ons for Jira. But I need to see a, uh, an actual page for uh, the Lassie Marketplace. Okay. So you look at their pricing, um, not cloud, but let's go to server edition. Pricing is based on user pool. So if you have 250 user license pool of Jira, you have to spend 750 to get Script Runner. Okay. But if you have 10 users, it's 10, 25, 25. And you can see how it starts jumping. So when you're into big corporations, $14,000. Um, now, the one thing behind this, and I did a use case on this, is that $14,000. Now, Script Runner is about, a lot about automation and moving things around, uh, like the churn rate field and stuff like that. To, the idea of you have a bunch of subtasks to create a user story. So you have like you know design, API building, uh, functional tests, uh, unit testing, uh, you know, all those different subtasks, and they add up into hours. When developers are in the tool and updating their hours and moving, you know, subtasks from, you know, to do, to in progress, to done, you know, like a Kanban board, that's a bunch of clicking, right, and moving stuff on the board. Then when you move all the tasks to complete, you would think in theory that the user story would suddenly go into complete, but it doesn't. Because Jira, unlike the other tools, has no idea how you're going to use their tool. This, it wasn't always built just for, you know, agile teams. It was built for knock centers and built for marketing teams and sales. and stuff. So they said, build your own workflow. We're not going to include that automation because we don't know what your automation would be anyway. And it's really hard to maintain because it's customized for every company in the entire world. That's crazy. So this company came out, at Adaptivist, who owns Script Runner. And that's what one of their tools do, is allows you to build automation. By adding that automation at scale of, uh, let's say, let's see here, so the user base of 2,000 users, 3,300 bucks. We did uh, some computations on this, that when you think about how many Agile teams are just for 800 users, because that's all that's in my current organization is 800, but as you can see, I'm over 500, so I have to spend 3,300 bucks, right? Because it's the next bucket, is we said, is it worth it? We said, listen, we have roughly 50 teams, give or take five to nine people on average, times 20 some user stories, times roughly about five to 10 subtasks. So you're doing all these computations to realize how many subtasks are out there? How many times are people pointing and clicking at best case scenario, let alone rework? And then you have to go update their parents. We realize that spending $3,300 saved us $450,000 in labor dollars because it's at scale. It's so many people doing little activities of seconds of clicking, waiting for the website to render, you know, making those changes. Why isn't it closing? It should be closing. And we realize that if we add this automation that says, when all the subtasks are closed, move the parent user story to ready for demo is the state we use. We're saving close to $400,000. And then when you do that against labor dollars against some of the teams, we have some teams that are over $200,000 a sprint in labor. So you saved, in essence, almost an entire month of labor because we decided to spend 3300 bucks. So that's the idea is that you have to do these computations but in the end, you're like, it makes, it's rocket science, right? <laughs> this isn't crazy. You should be able to figure this out. That makes sense. So the, another question, so a tool like uh, Trilo, or Trio, whatever they call it, I mean, how does that stack up with these, the Jira's or, or, and Rallies and version ones? Trello, um, Trello is, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but it's safe baby steps. Um, because Atlassian bought them. So Atlassian owns Trello, and their goal was when Trello people realize that you've hit your agile maturity at some point, 
It's so high now that you need like automation. You need um, a service desk portal for operation centers. You need to link issues between each other. You are beyond the lightweight Trello Kanban board. You now have to dive into something deeper. And so that's why they bought them is for they wanted to get that user base. Mm -hmm. So baby steps in the sense of we all start out somewhere, whether the agile maturity is about process or artifacts or something, but there's a reason why they bought that product line when they already had an agile board. So they're going after the target audience that says, if we realize how people utilize Trello, we could do a couple things. One, they realize the tool needs to do more, so they're going to move to Jira. Got them. Two, we realize people who are at an agile maturity cycle, so now we can sell them agile consulting. Check. Uh, now we realize these people need uh, best case practices on this. Ooh, long-term agile methodology changes, like going from Scrum to Safe, Scaled Agile Framework. Check. No, so they did that to acquire, and uh, that brought all those pieces to them. Wow. I had no idea they had been acquired. I, I thought it was a little mom and pop somewhere. It was. <laughs> wow. now, now it's a big dog on, on campus. <laughs> so um, that, that just gives you an idea that what I presented to you is another example of how a product owner should present their stories and their features to their software team. Like you were able to gel that story together to understand the value is we're going to integrate with Trello. Great. The reason why we're doing this, though, so you know, is these main bullet points are coaching our transitional pieces, moving them into Jira, which means we get them into Confluence and Bamboo and all of our other product lines. Like then the team's like, hell yeah, let's integrate. What do we need to do? Get the stories out. Let's start it. You know, and that's from a loyalty standpoint, the difference between saying, we got these stories, this sprint called Integrate with Trello. And so I guess I was trying to give you a real world example of, we talk about agile, agile, agile stories in this class, but this presentation hopefully gives you an idea of I could have presented to say, yeah, they bought Trello and uh, it's just a lighter weight platform and uh, when you get bigger, move to Jira. I gave you that extra piece so that you could understand the context and then inform others. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. When did that happen? Do you know, was it recent or has this been for a while? Do you know? I believe, it, I believe it's been in the last year. Wow. It's a power move. Yeah. Good strategy. Yep. So what else do you all got? Any other questions? I mean, we have like another, what, 13 minutes or so. Oh, they just bought Ops Genie too. Oh, so that's another small company they just bought. So they're, they're into that acquisition mode now too. Mm. Wow. Okay. Well, um, guys on the phone, you got any questions? Because I don't want to hug it all by asking all the questions in my head. <laughs> I put them to sleep. <laughs> Justin said his brain is cooked. <laughs> so, Michael, I have a question regarding the um, story points. Could you yep. maybe just go over a little bit about how how teams actually use those? To, are they used religiously in the right way <laughs> by like your team or? Do you see some common errors? And if so, what are the common errors we should look out for? Okay, so let me give you an example of, I can have two fives, so two watermelons, two fives in the list. But when I look at capacity with the task hours, one says 40 hours and one says 20 hours. And the proctor owner's like, something's wrong. And the scrum master says, that's, that's exactly what it's supposed to be doing. He's like, how's that possible? Okay, look at the stories. The 40-hour, five-point story is 40 hours of time effort is a documentation story about our active API, which has already been built. So we don't have any doubt that we know what's there because you just read the code. We also know that it's very low complexity because we're not building anything. You're documenting it. And you could just traverse through the code and see what parameters are there. 
However, it just takes a lot of time. It's tedious. It's annoying. So it's a five. This other five, in fact, it's not 20 hours. It says four hours. All right, so the time is really low on the second story. You're like, what's that? Well, based on the subject line, it says drop the security table and reload users. Well, that's really easy to do is drop the security table. That normally causes outages when you do that. It's slightly complex because we have to reload the users, but actually the risk is extreme because not only did you want to do this to the security table, which means everyone's wiped out, you're doing it on the same week you have a marketing event. Well, that would look real good at the demo meeting, wouldn't it? So the reason why those stories are there is it got you to ask these questions. You looked at it and said, what the hell is this? This doesn't make any sense. A five is two hours and a five is 40? That's got to be wrong. No, that is precisely right. Because when you look at the breakdown of how you get to a story point, the goal isn't just to be generally accurate. It's to get you to talk. And it got us to talk. So that's exactly what I wanted to happen, right? And that's what uh, the idea is. So if you see like your, if your average is like a five, which is what we typically use, we say that's roughly three to five days. Remember, not five, not three, not four. You have to give them a span because you're not mapping hours to points. So if you say three to five days takes care of this quadrant and it's flexible, good. Focus on these quadrants, which are actually more important anyway. So when you say, Oh, at 21, are you saying that's because the time is like four times as big? Maybe, or maybe the risk is, or maybe the complexity is, or maybe it's a, a blended approach. But in the end, if our normal story is roughly three to five days, which by the way is about half the size of a sprint at max, I don't want a story bigger than that because if I have must, shoulds, coulds, and I start with a must of a five, by mid sprint, I'm able to work on my shoulds. But if it's bigger than that, that's, that's a problem there's a good chance I'm not gonna meet my must anyway, let alone the shoulds. So you're using this to also force kind of the mentality of delivery pattern, that if your average size box on the conveyor belt is three to five days in size, we can focus on the bigger problems. So when we see someone say a 21, you're like, what's that? Well, open up the user story. Okay, look at the acceptance criteria. It's blank. Okay, what's the problem? It's blank. <laughs> it's blank. It's it's everything and anything and nothing at the same time. So yeah, it's a 21. It's a 40. It's a 50. It's not worth my time. There's no way you'll get it done in the sprint because we'll spend more time talking about it than we will building anything. Is a story like a project plan? Um, a story is yeah more like a user requirement specification. Um, you could say in essence uh, a PRD would last you an entire project a proc requirements document. Inside that section of the PRD, you could have a user story that says, I want to be able to download the revenue report on the report screen. But the entire PRD is about the entire rework of the reporting uh, UI and backend, and you have about 50 to 100 reports. So if a user story is roughly three to five days a pop, um, we try to keep our features between one to three months a pop. And then our feature groups are obviously pretty close to a quarter. So that should give you an idea of like timeline um, and size of artifacts. So feature group to features to stories. And then when you get down to tasking, your tasking is getting into hours. And anything larger than a four hour task is questionable because no one can help you until they know what that task is about. So if you have someone saying, I'm developing for you know 13 hours, you're like, that's not helping anybody. I need to know, are you building the API? Are you building the reporting UI? Are you doing unit testing? Are you doing this? Oh, well, when I break it down like that, I'm doing four hours there and three hours there and say, exactly. So when I have a problem called you're stuck in API land, I can get another developer to potentially help you with the reporting UI because now I know you didn't start it. So that's kind of stories kind of at, at the lower level. Uh, feature tends to be your glue, because customers understand features. User stories, sometimes they understand, but features they get. It's like, what features are in this tool? Well, you can download the reports, you can upload your reports, 
Uh, you can manipulate uh, the resource allocation in the columns. Um, you can send an alert to a customer and it has email capability. Great, those are the features. Inside of that could be 20, 50 user stories a pop with 100 to 200 uh, subtasks. That's helpful, Michael. So how do you see um, features being broken into tasks? Is there any method um, advocated generally? So remember, the feature doesn't get broken into tasks. The feature gets broken into stories and spikes and, unfortunately, defects when you embarrass yourself. Um, so when you look at a feature, focus on the acceptance criteria and say, must have, should have, could have of the acceptance criteria itself out of this feature called export reporting capability. What's the must? Well, it's got to export into, a, into an Excel XLS. Okay. What else? Uh, PDF for sure. Okay. What about CSV? Well, CSV is probably a should. I'd like it because then that means we might not need Excel anymore because CSV works with Excel. Um, circling back to Jira, does it still require initial data input? It, it requires a skeleton. I mean, I tell a lot of product owners, don't freak out about coming to planning with everything written out properly. Uh, don't worry about going in front of your customer with everything written out 100%, because that's still the old mentality of serial-based practices we show up with all the requirements, which isn't true. Uh, we expect our customers to be here six months from now, which we know will not be 100% accurate. We're going to get some, hopefully, because that's called sales department. And you're going to lose some, right? So the idea is you show up with skeletons. Expect the team to help you put the meat on the bones. So show up with, we must support XLS export capability. I'm not an ops guy, so I really don't know what ops needs. And then the team says, well, when it fails, do you want a running log or do you want it stamped in the database or both? And the product owner is like, what's the difference? Well, let me show you real quick. Here's a running log. Boop, 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 boop. See how it just keeps going and going and going and it's kind of hard to like understand it sometimes, but it's really fast. But if I do it by the database, it's gonna increase the size of your application, which means it might slow it down in the long, long, long run. What do you want? And so that's the idea is the collaboration started because someone showed up with a skeleton saying the business wants XLS export. But I realize I have more than one customer in the system. I have people called ops. I have people called dev. I have people called executives. And I must think about them holistically. But team, I really don't know how to handle the technical side of the operation equation. So I'm hoping you can help me with that. So that gets the uh, collaboration started. But that kind of answers also your other question about the features. The features are about, we need you know, XLS, we need CSV, we need PDF. And then someone says, is that the only customer that uses this? No, there's ops. So we need something in there for ops so that they can support when the jobs fail. They need something in ops to know when the data didn't load. They need something in ops for restarting the system. Okay, great. Anybody else? Um, security. Oh, security, yeah, 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 permissions, okay. Permissions. Um, I need to make sure that we can lock it down so this person can see it and that person. So you're breaking down the feature into understandable pieces of functional, um, how the system would work holistically from all the customer aspects. Um, and that's where I get into, where was it? Uh, where's our customer? Is that a picture? Here. This idea. Security could be Boba Fett. Executives could be, or IT could be Darth Vader, right? Chewy and Han Solo are your, your loyal customers who will do anything for you, but they're a little, you know, crazy sometimes. You have uh, Princess Leia cinnamon buns, right? You have all these different personalities that use the system with different intentions. So sometimes having a, a persona wall like this with different personalities on the wall, and you say, okay, guys, we're talking about features today. How would Leia handle this? How would Darth Vader handle this? How would Jar Jar Binks handled this, right? Because we have all these customers. And then once we decide how they would handle it, you say, okay, let's go Moscow rating. Must have, should have, could have. Am I going to support Leia out of the gate or is she going to come in a little later? You know, and you're digesting it that way. And so far in Jira, all you had is maybe a feature, sometimes called an epic is what is the term they use. You have an epic issue that talks about 
this requirement about the reporting page. You say the customers involved primarily are Darth Vader and Boba Fett. However, secondary customers would be Leia and Jar Jar Binks. And the customers that would rarely come in there are C-3PO. So my data scientists don't really care about using the report um, export functionality, but Darth Vader, who's out to get our company, definitely does. And that's all you would show up with at first for the team to start collaborating on it uh, before stories are even written. And we've hit the top of our hour. Um, I unfortunately have to get going here in just a minute or two, but if you guys have anything else emergency or high priority, feel free to ask. No questions from me, Michael. This has been terrific. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to uh, doing, doing more of these as time goes on. Okay. All right, everybody. Good luck in your uh, careers. Hopefully, you will uh, cross pathways again. Take care. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. We'll make some announcements when there's more. Thank you, and bye for now. Uh, your PDU certificates, guys. You get your PDU certificates. Um, the learning administrator will uh, get those sent to you. Um, she's not on the call at the moment, but um, she'll have your information and, and get your PDUs. Um, well, the only PDU recipient will be Paul <laughs> until, until everyone else gets uh, certified. All right, folks, thank you very much. Awesome, I'm glad you got it, Paul. Um, any other questions that you get, feel free to email them to me and um, I will send them to Michael for him to um, further comment. All right, thank you and bye for now. Hello everyone. Those of you who are currently on the call, those of you who are yet to join, <laughs> yeah, I guess you'll watch this at some point, I don't know. But um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our Agile coach, Michael Swanziger, who's going to be taking us through the minefields of Agile. Hopefully we get to the other side, we come out as warriors of Agile. But Michael, thank you very much for joining us and teaching us today. And over to you. Oh, you are on mute, Michael. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let me, let me, I think it's a phone thing. Hang on. There we oh, go. Oh, there we go. How's that? It's, yeah, you're good. Darn, I thought I was going to get out of this. <laughs> um, so I've been, uh, I apologize if I uh, have to cough or go on mute briefly because uh, I've been sick for about two weeks. So please work with me through my ailing. <laughs> um, I just, I wanted to open up the meeting before I get started into class material. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns since the last meeting? Um, people have had time to chew on the information and talk to their you know, cohorts in crime at their offices. Anyone have any questions? No? Okay. Well, feel free to ask questions throughout the, uh, the class here. Oh. I see something just lit up on my screen, so maybe someone sent a chat. Nope, good to go. Okay, excellent. All right, so we're going to be uh, going through more of the um, the how and the what. We spent a lot of time on the why, talking about human behaviors and understanding, in short, that you know, agile just out of its out of its own merits can make or break your business. Um, if you remind somebody often and repeatedly that you shouldn't be trusted, you probably won't be. Okay, so um, that's something to keep in mind that a lot of people are about, oh, we, we can deliver faster stuff. Well, if it's the wrong stuff and you do it repeatedly, it, it's one thing to be wrong, get feedback and adjust. It's another thing to repeatedly go against that feedback. Uh, you're just, the only person you're really helping is your competitor because they don't even have to do anything. They just have to show up and say, well, I wasn't like that guy. So. Keep that in mind. Um, as we go into the Agile field of Endor here, Scrum is more of a defensive mentality and Kanban is more offensive in its nature. So those who are moving from uh, serial-based processes or more regulated processes tend to have a little more easy uh, with a Scrum. Uh, the reason for that is the meetings are prescribed. There's the actual Scrum guide document um, there's more Scrum classes available. 
And so you're closer to the wall of process because there are processes in Scrum that are very prescripted. Um, Kanban on the reverse, Kanban literally just means signage. So that being its only premise, unless you add something to it, like lean software development practices, XP practices, or others, Kanban by its own nature is just fluid. Okay, so working in that mentality um, is a lot different than working in a defensive, more prescriptive-based mentality. Now, we're going to be going over some of the pros and cons of both. So don't think just because Kanban is offensive, it's more powerful, but also don't think that it shouldn't have rules attached to it. Um, just know that you have to be more fluid in how you apply those rules. All right, so we're going to focus on uh, Scrum here. Scrum out of its nature is uh, pretty prescriptive. It's uh, a defensive approach, and anyone who's watched like really good Hollywood war movies knows that uh, defensive strategies can win the battlefield. Um, a lot of times I show movie clips uh, from like the movie like 300 and uh, Gladiator and a couple others. And what I show is that when the, uh, the shields are locked together, that's like your sprint. Okay, so when your sprint begins, uh, you bring in a set of work in your uh, planning meeting. You commit to that work as best as possible, knowing that it's like a weather forecast, that the weather can change, um, but you're not looking for a hurricane. Uh, you do expect some w windy conditions occasionally, maybe a little bit of rain, but uh, based on your current weather forecast, uh, you want to attain X goal. So you're locking the shield, so to speak. Uh, you call that your sprint plan. And if any enemy um, called like scope creep or sales guy who wants to sell something to a customer, you know, yesterday and forgot to tell you, um, your shields are locked. So nothing gets in unless someone is willing to negotiate to bring something out. Uh, that's one of the um, issues with Scrum is that a lot of people don't follow that rule. Okay. So in all those Hollywood movies, anytime that the shield wall would come down, uh, the army would be decimated. So consider that, that it shouldn't be hard to negotiate, and isn't that the key word, should. It shouldn't be hard to negotiate with someone to say, hey, uh, my bucket is full of water. If you want to add water to it, guess what? You need to take something out. Or it's just going to get all over the floor. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't believe that. So when they add stuff to the sprint without taking anything out, I mean, is that their way of saying, you're just going to work overtime? Is that their way of saying, you know, I never believed your estimates in the first place. So if you take this on and you actually deliver it, it means your estimates were really poor in the first place. And then lo and behold, occasionally a team does take something on and they do some heroic act and deliver the product. And then the business actually uses that against them. They don't say, hey, thank you very much. They say, hey, this proves that you were wrong. So I'm just going to repeat that behavior over and over and over again. So consider the shield wall there. Um, the extra ceremonies there that I have on the top right, those are just kind of my own opinions on how long those meetings typically last with a team of five to nine people. When you think about five to nine people at roughly, well, let's just build them at about a hundred bucks an hour, um, very rapidly that meeting gets expensive. So if you show up to plan a meeting and your stories aren't ready, hey, guess what? They're not ready. Don't try and force them to be ready because it's one thing to screw up a meeting. It's another thing to script the product, have rework. Uh, screw up customers' expectations, be really embarrassed on a demo call in front of your customers. And if you're in commercial software, uh, that's a position you never want to be in. The last place you want to be in is on in the news. Okay, so consider that when you have meetings and have a timeline around them, they're designed to force discipline. So if the discipline isn't there, don't go an even further worse step by saying, oh, well, we'll just figure out during the sprint. Well, guys, if you can even figure it out when nothing was going on during the middle of a meeting, how are you going to figure it out when a lot of stuff is going on called work? So consider that. Then in the Kanban approach, um, it's very fluid. It's a, a lot of juggling. I sometimes show uh, videos in my classes about uh, people juggling balls. And what you show is that not how the one person's good, but how when you have a mixture of people juggling balls in the room, they all handle different amounts of balls. They can all handle the same amount. So that's true when it comes to whether it's dev versus QA or it's 
Java developer versus REST API developer. Um, there is this idea that people have skills, people have disciplines behind those skills, and just because one person knows Java and another person knows Java doesn't mean that they could theoretically handle the same amount of work. So you have to keep that in mind, and that's called the work in progress limit. Uh, there typically is a lane at the top of the board called expedite or emergency. Uh, consider that your ambulance lane. You know, when an ambulance is coming down the freeway, people don't just look out their window and say, are you sure you really want to get by me? You know, they move over. There is this idea, and it's written in our laws, that regardless what the impact is, if an emergency vehicle is coming by with their lights and sirens on, you move. Um, in fact, in Germany, on their freeways, if there is a traffic jam, everybody has to move to the sides of the roads. So the fast lane goes to the left, the slow lane goes to the right, and they leave this corridor right down the center of the freeway for emergency vehicles. That's their law. So they're actually uh, preventing any expedite or emergency from causing more hangups than is necessary because they have aligned their work around it. So that's something to keep in mind is that the exercise lane can be abused very quickly because people just think things are important. Um, it shouldn't be important, it should be almost life-saving, life critical, business critical. Okay, so the rest of the work is still prioritized from highest to lowest, but that expedite lane is only used for emergencies. Yep. Uh, going a little further here. All right, so normally I have some videos here and uh, this will give you an idea of the videos that we watch in my classes. So I'll give the answers to this. So if you want to, I don't know if you're a war buff or anything in your movies or action adventure, but now you can look at movies a totally different way. Uh, in Centurion there, the army, which was the Roman army, formed up on the road. Uh, they were initially walking um, two by two down the, down the road, massive line of soldiers. And then when they uh, detected that there was trouble up ahead, they formed small teams or if you would call it uh, small circles. Okay, they didn't have one massive circle. Uh, they had small circles. The smallest uh, room between soldiers is foot to foot. Okay, so if your heel is up against the heel of the person behind you, um, that's as close as you can get, minimizing the amount of uh, land that you have to defend. Um, the eagle in that movie, the battle formation uh, that was used was called the... Um, it was based on the tortoise, okay? So what they would do is they would not only form a circle of shields, they would actually put shields on top of them, okay? So the entire uh, strength behind it was that it was very defensive, a high chance of survivability, but its weakness was its speed, okay? So that's something to think about when it comes to scrum versus Kanban is that scrum could be seen as protecting quality at all costs. And you have to sacrifice something to do that. Uh, sometimes that is speed. Even though Agile tends to be faster in general, um, however, when it comes to comparing the models, Scrum can be slower just by means of the team has to have their shields locked together the, the entire way. In 300, that battle formation was called the Phalanx. Um, that's where they're all standing in one line. The one weakness of that formation was the person on the far right had his spear on his right arm, but his shield was on his left, which means he was actually protecting the guy to his left, which also means the guy on the far, far right, unless he was up against a wall of rock, um, he was vulnerable. So that's something I think about your team is that as much as the team is interlocked together, there's always a vulnerability, whether that vulnerability is fear of authority, that vulnerability is a technical constraint, that vulnerability is everyone is a peacemaker, um, the vulnerability could be everyone is all about, they, they misunderstand everything's about the team or everything's about the customer. They take that to an extreme, which allows them to uh, bring scope creep in. So then in 300, the environment protected them because they were uh, in a cavern between two mountain ridges. So the people on the sides were protected. Uh, when they met up with the Arcadians in the beginning of the movie, the Arcadians outnumbered them. Um, by many times, and they looked at them as weak. But what they realized was that this team, this 300 Spartans, spoke in one voice, and it was a very loud, uh, loud, resounding voice. But when you asked the Arcadians why they were there, 
or what they did for a living. None of them said that they were soldiers. You know, some people said I was a potter, uh, others said a blacksmith. But when you ask the Arcadians what they did, or, or the, uh, the Spartans what they did, they all answered with one resounding voice. So that's something to also keep in mind with your teams. And here's a workshop that I present to folks. So if you're taking notes, this is something really easy to do. Uh, it's normally uh, deer and headlights moments uh, for your team. So when I go into teams, whether they're executives or developers, I, I tend to ask them some questions to kind of pull out their ego a little bit say, hey, are you a good team? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. Are you a great team? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. One of the best. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and you're starting to, like, build up the pressure on them, you know, so their ego is actually kicking in. And you're like, okay, okay, let's test that. And you hand out two sticky notes to everybody in the room with a Sharpie. Just two. That's all you need. And they all have all the sticky notes. And you say, okay, I'm going to ask you um, a question. You're going to have five seconds to answer it. If you don't know the answer by the end of five seconds, you're going to put a question mark on the sticky. So I'm looking for a knee-jerk reaction. And you say, okay, first question. Why do you come, what do you believe in and why do you come to work every day? And then you start counting down to give them a little pressure. So five, four, three, two, one. Okay, if you don't know the answer, put a question mark. Now make contact with the person that's standing next to you, like eye contact. Now. I'm going to ask you a question about them, and you're going to have five seconds to answer. Why do they come to work every day, and what do they believe in? Five, four, three, two, one. Question mark. And you say, that second sticky note that you wrote about somebody, I want you to hand it to the person you wrote it about. You know, and then people are kind of like, uh-oh, see where this is going. So they hand the sticky note, and you hear some giggles in the room. That's your first indicator that it's working. And you say, okay. so. First off, when you compare your sticky note to what someone wrote about you, did they write it word for word? Did they even get in the right ballpark? And more importantly, is it the same thing like you wrote about somebody else? Meaning everyone wrote the same thing everywhere. It's not a question of, I just come to work to, you know, to pay the bills. You know, why are we really here? And so what you kind of present to them, you have to do it a little artfully, but typically people get this analogy. You know, you can either be the uh, New England Patriots or you can be the Cleveland Browns. They're both on the NFL. Uh, they're both uh, millions of dollars in budget. They have access to the same draft. They have access to the same recruitment firms, access in theory to the same players. So, when you said you're a team, you said you were one of the best. But unfortunately, you acted like, eh, just a team. We can either be a team or we can be a team. So this is your first realization as to we have a long way to go. And when we apply scrum and our mentality behind it, we're all together or we're not. You can't say my shield wall is secure if I don't even know who I'm defending. Okay, so that goes back to what's Agile about. And a lot of people don't know. They just focus on themselves or speed or something. But if you focus on team, we're going to start over. We're going to focus on loyalty. When we go into our daily stand-ups, we're going to think about how can I make my teammate loyal to me? When I go into demo and I demo our product to our customers, how can I make my customer loyal to me as a delivery team member? And product owner, when you're writing user stories, how can I make my delivery team loyal to my cause? So if you all said the same word called loyalty, it would be your DNA. It would define you and the reason why you're here. It's not a blind loyalty, but it's one that is healthy. So sometimes when I'm coaching people coming out of daily stand-up, um, I'll ask them a question. You know, when, when you were in daily stand-up, what you said, how did you build loyalty with the person standing next to you? When that QA engineer asked you about your API and you got kind of irritated, how do you build loyalty with that? So what do you believe in? Why are you here? And that causes coaching uh, to work in many different ways. So getting into actual job descriptions, though, and I took this off of uh, LinkedIn quite a while ago, a couple of years back, but this is what Atlassian had. Notice what is on there, but more importantly, what is not on there. Take a minute to read that. OK. 
okay, what they're not giving you is years of experience. They're not handing you some resume um, that says, you know, I've been in such and such position, so thereby I get this job. What they're after is a human, a human that believes in something, has a belief in certain areas, Okay, and then here's their counterpart, their QA lead. Someone who's balanced, someone who can challenge the status quo, someone who can see it from both directions, manual versus automated, um, someone that speaks up. You know, if you're in a scrum-based model where quality is protected at all costs, you don't want somebody that just shows up and says, I passed the code. You want someone that says, well, we passed the code, but I did some extra testing in this area and I have a feeling this isn't what we're really looking for, right? And that starts the conversation. So when you look at Scrum just by nature, everyone is always huddled together, whether huddled together physically in a physical Scrum or huddled together in meetings, huddled together in purpose, huddled together in vision uh, with the roadmap of the product or our agile process. I mean, in theory, they're just together. So. In this picture of an actual scrum, the most, a uh, couple of the most important people are the eights and the twos. The twos have their feet over the ball, the purpose of that entire team. Okay, that's why there's some call at times called the hooker, because they hook the ball with their foot. They're the only ones that do that. And in theory, they don't focus on the movement of the team because they know the team will carry them, so to speak, over onto the ball. The person on the eight, though, is able to step back and look at the entire situation underneath everyone's feet, the terrain, and anchor the team in place. Okay, so those are all teammates working together. But does your team see their situation like that? There's someone over the user story of highest value, the must have user story of the entire sprint. We're going to make sure that person is carried around and protected. But you, way back there, who might only be working on shoulds or coulds in the current sprint, you have an, a different job that's equally important. You're to look at the lay of the land. You're to look at all our feet, where we're situated, how we're working together or failing to work together, and you're going to help us anchor. Okay? So um, that's something to think about um, when it comes to the team itself. Okay? Any questions so far? No. Yeah. Hey, Mike, uh, just a question on the uh, yeah that um, mm -hmm. Kanban um, image. Could, could you go over the the Q and A section again? Is is that like Q and A yeah. as in quality assurance? Um, in software, it would potentially be Q and A. Um, you could have different steps. I just made it really small um, for the purpose of the slide. Oh. I've seen different statuses. Uh, the one thing about status is is that Every status is potential waste. So you have to also consider that is, do we break out dev into different pieces, like design versus dev versus documentation? Do we break out QA to um, unit testing versus uh, functional testing versus automated testing? You know, like there is inherent waste in having too many steps. So I made it really light, lightweight. But in theory, when you look at the board, there's a lot of stuff going on. You have color coding going on. So if you were to compare this to other tools, like DE stands for defect, user story for user story. So you can see green is money, red is we embarrassed ourselves. And we have to clean it up. Okay. Another thing on this is you see these little icons here. That would be considered something called churn. Mm. So instead of having defect reports, I like churn reports. Okay. So churn is any time an issue goes in reverse in the workflow. It doesn't matter if it's a user story, a feature, a defect, a spike user story, um, a subtask, or whatever agile tool you're using. But the nature of we should be moving forward, but we're not. And in fact, we're going worse. We're going in reverse because we're really screwed up. Okay, so a lot of people focus on defects. My definition of defects normally kind of surprises some Agile coaches. Mine is that once you deliver something outside the team, you can't unring that bell, right? Once you deliver something to a customer, whether it's a software service or tangible good, 
He can't say, oh, give that back to me. You didn't see it. Um, at that point, it is a defect, no question asked. Whether you call it a defect or a bug, that's up to you. No difference in my mind, but whatever terminology works for your Agile tool. However, when you're within the team and you're just working on a user story and the user story says, make you know, the download button red, and the QA engineer looks at it and says, I understand you're colorblind, that's blue. So change the hex you know, code of the color to this. And since I can see those two different colors and you can't, understandable, um, I will pass the story. Some companies say send a defect back because we really want to track who's screwing up. And you're kind of like, well, that's, that's not the behavior I'm really looking for. I'm looking for collaboration. So from a product manager's point of view, he has a simple question. Is the story ready for production? Answer is no, right? So he didn't say, oh, it's ready. Oh, but with defects? Oh, okay, that's nice. That sounds a lot better, right? No, that doesn't sound better at all. So if we're trying to build loyalty with the people who present the business value, you want the conversation to be consistent. The story is done or it's not. There is no, the story is done, but whoa, 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 we have these problems. Well, then it's not done, right? You're just embarrassing yourself with terminology when it comes to the business. Because the business is like, we don't care about the factory. So sending the story back to development or worse yet, back to the backlog because the requirements were poor. Like someone said, make the website fast. What the hell does that mean, right? Fast to me could be five seconds. Fast to you could be three because you're on Wi-Fi and I'm on 3G out in, you know, like in a, a cow pasture or something, right? And so my perception of speed is a lot different than yours. And even worse, when you get to a developer who's in the code, he's like, that's, that's, that's 13 milliseconds to me, right? And so you're losing track of what fast means. Um, so QA fails something because they think fast means something. Then dev is like, no, 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 I don't think it means that. And then the product owner is like, yeah, fast was a bad term. Send it back to the backlog and I'll go research it. So what has happened is two layers of churn. It's not defects, it is churn. And so we're after the behavioral pattern of the product owner themselves. Product owners should never use the word fast, um, should never use nice to have or make it pretty or you know, any of those weird perception-based terms uh, with no mock-ups or anything to support it. So that's why I encourage people to use churn as a reporting mechanism because anything over like a churn rate of three is when I would start getting conf uh, confused, right? Or concerned is I understand QA and Dev are gonna go back and forth, back and forth on some things, that's fine. But once you go beyond two or three and you're in a four or five, like how much rework is that costing us? How much downtime is that burning? And uh, if you would call it a uh, product manager would see it cost of delivery. So that's would be my recommendation to the people on this call is that when people are like, give me a defect report and you're like, or, okay, are you focusing on the things that are in prod where we told a customer it works like A and it works like B? Because that's embarrassing and I agree. Let's get those reports. But if you're focusing on the, the actual development cycle, I want you to focus on churn because it's about behavior. Gotcha. And gotcha. See how they take that. Gotcha. That's very helpful, yep. Michael. Is churn a, a word used in Scrum? I, I don't recall um, hearing Scrum. So is, is it a Kanban thing? No, it tends to be an, a, a tool thing. Ah. So um, depending on the, the Agile tool or uh, just behaviors of analytic type people, they'll use the word churn rate. So uh, in uh, JIRA, you can add a custom field using uh, one of the many workflow add-ons that'll allow you to increment that field by one. So every time you move it back on the workflow, it'll automatically up the churn rate in the tool. Um, in Rally, uh, unless you use custom script, scripting, you have to remind teams to just up the, the field manually. So a lot of it depends on the tool, and we just add a custom field for it for churn. Okay. Okay, we had a comment in from Paul. I don't know if you can see it. Um, he says, I had not heard the term churn before in this context, but it's very applicable to what, the project, what my project team is experiencing this week. Interesting. So I'm glad I don't work at Paul's company. Just kidding, Paul. Paul's like, wait a second, he just had that deer in headlights look. Um, but churn, I, I think when you use the word churn, you can use it in so many contexts, right? And the advantage of that is 
remember, if we say agile is about loyalty, how do I build loyalty with my product owner? How do I build loyalty with my business? How do I build loyalty between dev and QA? You don't do that by putting up a wall that says, how many defects did you write? How many defects did you close? You know, it, it, were the requirements right? Like everyone starts getting so defensive. But when you say, let's just use this word called churn. And they're like, you know, what's that? Are we making butter? Um, are we on a boat that's suddenly going in reverse and all the water behind the boat is churning like crazy, right? Like you give them these analogies that help them step away from their work for a second. <laughs> and then suddenly they're like, yeah, yeah, we have a lot of churn. Okay, is the churn around a certain set of functionality? Is the churn around a certain process? Is the churn around a certain role? You know, that, that's when it becomes interesting to discuss because maybe churn is around a certain set of functionality. Great. But then when you start diving into the requirements of that functionality, it's always like haphazard at best. Okay. And then you say, okay, product owner, why do we keep having haphazard? Well, the customers behind that functionality are very custom and they're very regulated government entities. Like now we're starting to understand the behavioral pattern, what's causing that to occur. So now that the team realizes that, uh, they might say, well, can you invite a couple of those people to the demo going forward so that before we get into new sprints, at least they get like a slight preview as to what the heck is going on. So then we can reduce churn just by nature of people being informed, right? And so that's the goal is we've changed the behavioral pattern. Uh, not by being defensive, but by analyzing the, if you call it the trail of tears, uh, you typically start with the symptoms, team not delivering, uh, teams having problems with requirements, but then you get, you keep going back in time and you find the actual problem. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Paul's like, I'm never making a comment again. All right. So looking at the uh, Kanban videos, here's some videos we would look at. As you can tell, my class tends to be uh, sometimes fun. Um, Hoosiers, the hot potato scene when they're passing the ball back and forth. What it shows you is that story size affects speed between cycles and that if you're constantly passing the same size story, a basketball or um, a baseball or a, a one single size box, you get used to that pass, right? You get used to the actual action, uh, the weight of the box or the, uh, or the, of the ball itself the contour of the ball, how it feels. Um, you, instead of looking at the ball, you start looking at the person, right? And then eventually you get so good, you start looking at the next person that's coming. So you're not even looking at the ball coming at you. You're not looking at the person that's sending it to you. You're actually looking at the next chain of events in preparation. And you're examining that person. Do they have big hands? They might be able to catch it. Oh, they have little hands or they're not as tall and I'm going to have to adjust. So you're already planning ahead because you've taken what a lot of people focus on is, you know, story size, this story size, that this many hours, this many hours, and no one's bothering to look ahead because they can't. But if we were able to say, listen, every box on the conveyor belt is the same size. We'd be able to track how things get loaded into the trucks better. We'd be able to hand boxes off between people. Think of UPS and FedEx. You know, they ideally want every box to be the same size right? There's a reason why they say oversize on a lot of boxes, right? And the goal is efficiency. So also when it comes to 300 uh, in the movie, later in the movie, the teams start becoming offensive. They, they leave that cavern and they start getting on the battlefield. But what happens is they start spreading out. Okay. Um, yes, some of them have shields and others have, you know, multiple swords or they drop their spear and get their sword. So they're changing their weapons, their mechanics, uh, because they become offensive. So if you're applying the same meeting structure of Scrum to Kanban, you have a problem. You're applying a defensive mentality to an offensive um, layout, and that creates problems. Uh, Transformers 2, uh, what's incremental about his delivery in one scene is when Optimus Prime is alone in the field and all these uh, Decepticons are attacking him. He's attacking them all together but he slices them off one piece at a time like he you know hacks off one of their metallic arms uh, punches one in the eye jumps over one so he's incremental in that he's if you call it slicing it piece by piece he's not a, going after one transformer all on its own until it's done he's going back and forth back and forth back and forth 
So the same could be true with the development team. They have to realize, is our stuff small enough and the same size that allows us to break our work up appropriately, uh, throw, if you would say, a ball in the air while another one is landing my arm. Uh, that could be spinning this build up in the QA environment. It's going to take an hour to run uh, while this other one was already delivered yesterday. So I'm going to start testing that. You know, and you're moving things around. Um, in the Discovery Channel uh, video that I was showing uh, people, and this was all about juggling, his peripheral vision was, was key. You can tell someone's a good juggler because their eyes stay focused and they never move while things around them are, you know, moving. Okay. Bad jugglers are like, you know, and they're all over the place and they're, and then their arms start moving and their bodies start moving. And that's bad jugglers. We're all bad jugglers. Question is some of us are good ones. Okay. And the good ones don't move their eyes. They don't move their bodies aside from their arms, just going side to side but they have this calmness about them, okay? All right, so regardless of story size, the team's um, way of doing things does not change. Whether you have a large story or a small story, the way they approach it will always be the same. So keep that in mind that things compound, and if you have a 21-point story and then suddenly a five-point story and then an eight-point story, the team shows up the same mentality, right? They say, hey, do I need to design some stuff? Hey, do I need to document some stuff? Hey, do I need to test some stuff? Um, they're approaching it from the same behavior. Okay, so we're gonna skip a section here because I don't have a certain video to show you. Okay, the ultimate product owner, this person. They went from the idea of serving all dishes at once to serving each dish in the order that it's on the menu. And we don't think twice of that today. You open up a menu uh, at some sports bar and you're going there to watch NFL or hockey or something. And you look at the appetizers, you expect the appetizers to come before the entree. Right? You expect the salad to come before the entree. You expect normally, unless you tell them, the dessert to come after the entree. That's because you're looking at the order of the things on the menu and you appreciate the delivery pattern. So this ultimate product owner who is a uh, chef the idea way back when was you ordered your meal and they wheeled it out on this cart, right? And they brought it to your table and everything was laid out and you were done. Um, he changed that completely. That's a market change, right? So every chef from that point forward, for the most part, has followed the idea that you lay out the menu in the order that you would typically deliver it. Okay? And then on top of that, we go, you know, the salad plates tend to be cold. The entree plates tend to be room temperature or warm. The dessert plates, depending on what type of dessert it is, could be warm or cold. So that's something also to keep in mind is that when you change this massive dynamic, suddenly other processes start changing because of the way we work. Here's an actual recipe for Cinnabon. It's very good. Um, I had to make this for a small startup I was working at, and they had about 70 people there. This makes about 12 Cinnabons, give or take, depends on how much you're eating along the way. Okay, so about 12 Cinnabons. When I had to make it at scale for 70, uh, here's my countertop, here's all the equipment I needed. Obviously, I went to Costco, as you can tell here, right? And I got all this stuff here. No one sells Philadelphia cream cheese in bulk like that except Costco. So the problem is that when we go to our software development team or some service oriented organization like marketing or sales and you dump on them a bunch of stories like this with acceptance criteria and tasking inside of it called you know ingredients could be the acceptance criteria the tasking could actually be the directions of how to build it when you do it for one set that's fine however the moment that you do it for at scale and say, here's my roadmap, and here's the 50 stories behind it, and here's the 200 tasks behind it. The, the team's just trying to get their head around the situation. So the one problem is that when they lay everything out in their brain, they have no room to work. They can't roll out the dough. They can't actually physically do the work because they're stuck. So don't overburden your team with showing them everything. And a lot of people think Agile should be so visible that you can see everything and anything at any time. There is a, a limit to how much you can control in your head and laying it out. So 
I don't show everything to the software teams until things are in certain positions where it makes sense. For example, they don't need to know, these are the 1,000 ideas that product management had this year, and we got them down to 10. Do they really need to know about those 990 things they decided not to do? Could be interesting if you sum it up, but they don't have time to read all that. Uh, so that's just the 10 features we're gonna do. Then as the 10 features are coming down the pipe, the team is only working on one to three features a pop in parallel, max, or nothing gets done. So do I really need them to see all seven features in detail that they're not doing yet? Probably not. It, they might need to know where we're going so that they can build a better product to say, whoa, 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 are you saying in Q4 you want that? That's like tripling our user base. Okay, so that makes sense. But getting into, well, the parameters of the API in Q4 will be, you know, that, that's not gonna help them. All right, so moving through that, just think about that, that showing them everything all the time is not conducive to efficiency. Okay, you need to sum up things in certain areas so that they know where they're going, but the details of how to move the cruise ship along the time um, when you're not even at the port of call probably isn't helping them. Okay. Uh, here's something from Michael Cohen's book about uh, dog point sizing. This is something you can use to test your team. And you put all these dogs up on the wall and say, okay, scale them from one to 30. And you just hand them the slide. And if they start going up there and putting points up there, you just stop them on and say, what the heck are you guys doing? And they're like, you're doing what, we told, what you told us to do. No, actually, you're doing something wrong. Look at the slide I gave you. And they look at it and say, as a product owner, is that really the user? Okay. What's bigness mean? Because bigness could be the Great Dane or bigness could be the Chihuahua. Depends on what you're looking for, right? Attitude or height. Um, proper dog for my family. What's your family? Do you have kids with special needs? Are you in a, um, an apartment complex? Are you in a house? Are you on a ranch? So sometimes using these team exercises, you tweak it just a little to show them, just like that exercise that I talked about earlier was, you're either a team or you're just a team. And when you start jumping the gun here, so to speak, and doing these things, you're just acting like another team. I can find another vendor who wouldn't pay attention to the user story easily. I can find someone cheaper to do that too. But I want you to do as a collaborative, agile, preferably co-located team is stop for a second and look at what is being requested. Because in the end, if you get this wrong, we have something called churn. And churn in requirements, churn in delivery, and worst case scenario, churn in customers. Churning customers is terrible. It's harder to win a customer back you lost than to get a new one. So churn applies everywhere. And if they apply that in their head, they realize, yeah, I need to pay attention to this. You'll hear about the invest model quite, um, quite often. Independent, negotiable, valuable, estimable, small, and testable. And the reason for that is when you're writing a user story is, do these apply? Um, if you can't negotiate on anything, it's fixed, thereby it's not very agile-like. Um, if the team is like, why the heck are we doing this in the first place? And you said, well, don't worry about it. The, the business said we just need to get it done. You're not being very agile in value. It's a value-based methodology. So if you remove the V, what, what are we doing? Um, testable, I love that part. Um, you look at the person and say, how would you test them? So they say, I, I don't know. And the team's like, okay, we'll get started. And you're like, well, what just happened, right? If I can't confirm that it works, you almost want to re uh, replace testable with demoable. If you can't test it, what business do we have demoing it, right? So something to think about from an invest standpoint is are you investing in the stories, investing in your features, investing in your roadmap to help people understand that um, this is how Agile is applied. So when you apply invest to the dog size stuff, uh, again, what is bigness? You know, what's the value proposition? 
Um, can we truly estimate this? How can I test without a clear understanding of value? Like they start working off of each other. Um, user story practices. <clears throat> what to avoid if possible is like the SQL and inputting of code. Now, if you're working in like a big data environment, um, an analytical platform, it's understandable that you would say, we need to pull the data from these tables or we're working on normalizing the database. So this user story is about collapsing these tables and moving it here. Um, when you run this query, it should run this fast then. You know, that makes sense because of the value you're asking for. But if you're writing a fresh website and you're telling them how to actually write the code, why don't you just farm it out to somebody? Because at that point, you don't need an agile team. You don't need any collaboration at that point. Uh, Moscow rating is our, our next slide, so we'll cover that. Using pictures. Oh, my goodness. I've asked so many product owners to do this, and they fight you tooth and nail because they don't think it's valuable until you stop everybody in the middle of a requirements meeting and you go up to the whiteboard and start drawing the system. And then you say, what do you want to change? And they say, oh, right there, bubble number three. This is what I want to change. And then I say, developer, come on up here. Here's another color. It, it was black on the, on the board. Here's green. Show us how you'd actually code that thing. And they start circling things and saying, what are we going to do here? Product owner, you gave me a visualization, great, now I see what's in your head, but you totally missed something. This requires that data. Are you getting us a data set? And then you give the red uh, marker to the QA engineer and they come up and say, how the heck would I test it? I mean, come on guys, this API calls on this, but it's only on batch files. But according to the acceptance requirements, it says real-time data. Are we doing a batch? Are we doing a real time? I mean, are you totally changing the entire system here, product owner? What are you doing? Okay, and when you're able to visualize things and communicate with visualization, it cuts down on so much garbage and churn of user store requirements. So using pictures constantly, I don't care if you have to draw it on a whiteboard and write the acceptance criteria next to it, take a picture on your smartphone, attach it to the Jira ticket or the rally user story or the version one user story. So that when you open it up in pre-planning meeting, people say, okay, I see the requirements there and the acceptance criteria, open up the picture real quick. That doesn't match because you said this and that's what the picture says. So what's, the, what's going on here? Um, so that's using pictures is really easy. If you don't know how to take a picture on your smartphone, I don't know what people are doing saying they're product owners. Um, another thing, walk the business through how this feature is supported. Uh, this can be done in a couple ways. One of the easiest ways is make your acceptance criteria chronological. So you almost want to be able to open up the user story on demo day and the QA engineer or the developer literally walks through acceptance criteria. All right, so starting with number one, the assumption was they came into the system by means of such process, which means they have this type of file in this format. Here it is. Step number one says we must pull that file in and adjust this field. Okay, I'm gonna show it to you now. Okay, when we adjust that field, it's supposed to kick off these two processes. Notice the first process kicked off right away. The second one was on a delay because do remember, even though it's not in the acceptance criteria, there is a delay on that import process. Okay, so the user story, since it's chronological, is allowing anyone to be cross-trained because they watch it. It allows the product owner to be reinforced as to this is what you asked for, is this what you want? And then the business or anyone like in support that watches the demo is like, oh, that's how it's supposed to run. Well, hold on, and step number five, can you go back to step number five? When that ran, you didn't show any log files. You didn't show anything that indicated that it was complete. How would I know as a support guy that that is complete, right? And so people are starting to get engaged in your product. And if anything, they're saying, this doesn't feel right. And that's exactly what you want in a demo meeting is the idea that someone says something doesn't feel right or this does feel right. Uh, they're connecting their limbic brain, their emotional side of their brain to your product line as opposed to feature one, check, feature two, check. That's your neocortex. If you can get people's limbic brains attached and be loyal to your product or your service, um, that's the ideal state to be in. And a lot of that is based on how you write user stories. Uh, Moscow, must have, should have, could have, won't have. Okay, so this is a rating I use uh, quite often with my product owners. And this rating applies at many different layers. 
Um, I don't know how many layers your companies all have, but let's say it's a real huge enterprise. You have portfolio, you have program, you have teams. So Moscow at different layers means a different thing. You know, for example, let's, let's dumb it down to something pretty lightweight. I have a feature which has Moscow rated stories in it. Then on top of that, I have a release. So I'm going to have five releases for this feature. It's a really big feature. And release number one, here are my musts to release, my shoulds, and hopefully my coulds. However, if you don't deliver my shoulds and coulds in the first release, they become musts in the second release. All right, so let's look at the first release. You have a bunch of user stories. And you say, out of this release, how many sprints do we need to accomplish this big release. Two sprints, three sprints? Okay, cool. So in my first sprint, here's my must, my shoulds, and my coulds. If you don't get the shoulds or coulds done, they might become a, a must in the second sprint. And if you still don't get them done by the third sprint, they're definitely a must because the release just can't go. So helping people understand that Moscow applies at different layers, um, even in a sprint, you want must, should, could, and you're like, why? Why wouldn't everything be a must? Think of the Kentucky Derby. All the horses line up in a horse gate, right? When the bell rings, the horse gate opens. Do the horses go in different directions? No, they all follow the path laid out in front of them. So when you look at the sprint plan, you're saying the first round of the actual track is the musts. Between the second and third area of the track are the shoulds, and the last quarter mile of the track, the coulds. So team, when you show up on the second day of a 10 day sprint and someone says, yeah, 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 I'm working on my should, everybody stop. Explain this to me like I'm an idiot. You're working on a should, your teammates are not done with their musts. And in fact, you have a must and you haven't even started. What the heck are you doing? Why are you working on a should? It doesn't make any logical sense. Okay, so it's not about the points, it's not about the hours, it's not about the requirements, it's not about churn, it's about something that disarms people very quickly. Why are you working on a should when the musts aren't done? And if you can't explain that, I suggest you stop. You know, so that disarms people quite rapidly. Uh, this was taken from uh, the Agile Testing Book by, uh, with Lisa Crispin. <clears throat> Uh, they have this model in here. So when someone says I'm testing, you're kind of like, what type of testing? And if your acceptance criteria just says QA testing or dev testing, it's not educating you as a product owner to what are we testing and more importantly, what are we not testing? Are we not testing performance? Are we not testing security? Do we plan on being the next Home Depot with our credit cards being stolen like, or like Home Depot and Target in the news? Um, do we plan on not actually testing the story? So when we show up on demo day, should I be impressed or should I be scared? Right? And so this educates the team as to maybe they don't have the skills to do scalability testing. Maybe you don't have the tools to do it. But thereby, since I listed out what type of tests we're doing, functional and usability and exploratory, that meant you're not doing these? Yeah. Okay. Is that, what's that reason? Well, we don't have the skill for that. Those guys are really, really expensive and we don't even have those tools. Okay, so until that time happens when we're willing to pay for that, I as a product owner am accepting that we're not doing X scalability testing. Well, we only have 100 users on the system, so I'm not too concerned. But before we go to 5,000, I better figure out how we're going to handle that. Okay, I got it. Okay, so that's what this type of test measures are for. Okay, we're going to get into acceptance criteria versus acceptance test criteria. Think of a restaurant. Here's acceptance criteria. Okay, so notice the menu on the right-hand side here versus acceptance test criteria is this. So if you're looking at a medium T-bone steak, the acceptance test criteria could potentially fall into this. And a lot of people use these terms interchangeably, but if you're talking to a QA engineer, you could really freak them out if you use acceptance test criteria when you're talking to them using that term because their mind suddenly triggers. Oh, 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 you're asking about this. 
boundary testing and stuff like that. No, that's not what I'm asking for. Well, you said acceptance test criteria. Make up your mind. Okay, so be very cautious. Uh, most product owners are focused on acceptance criteria. They're focused on, again, the delivery. Like if this is what came into the kitchen, you're already talking about, oh, um, side salad, not a primary appetizer salad. So this goes out actually with the T-bone. Got it. Okay, so you're actually talking about delivery pattern by nature of the acceptance criteria itself. Um, it's business value oriented. If you're looking at a website, for example, you have like why slow out there and a couple things where it grades your website. If you're using a mobile application, you're using something like X Mirage, which allows you to take your iPad and put it on the screen. Okay, so this is demoable. Um, these are the tools that would test acceptance criteria for the most part. And you can even get technical. This is something called Charles Proxy. And by the way, it's one of the best apps I've ever used before. It's really cool. If your acceptance criteria said the website needs to load in one second, according to this um, array, it says 1.2 seconds is how long it took. And the product owner's jumping up and down, jumping up and down, saying, well, why, oh, why me? Why this? And the team says, okay, see all these calls going on here? Yeah. You see this PNG? A PNG is a picture file. Okay, yeah, I don't understand how this means that I went over 1.2 seconds. Well, hang on a second. You see this long bar here on the right of how long it took to load? Yeah, that's because you were an idiot. You told us that on an e-commerce website, every picture had to be high definition graphics. I don't know where you got that idea from because Amazon doesn't even do that. They don't do high def because they want the page to load fast. Because if it doesn't load fast, you don't buy. If you click on the picture, then they'll load the high definition graphic because you asked for it. But they don't do that every time. And we told you that this would cause a problem and you didn't listen. So the best we could come up with is 1.2 seconds. So either A, remove the acceptance criteria about high definition graphics, or B, change your acceptance criteria about the duration of the page load because it's just not physically possible and I'm showing you how it actually worked in this tool. So by nature, this would educate the product owner to understand and be loyal to the team. Instead of blaming them, they get it. And then here's the Twitter fail whale, okay? Performance is acceptance criteria. So when you look at this, a different uh, marketing information here, Amazon loses nearly a million an hour if they're down. So if you were to say, our website, if it's down, we lose $50,000 an hour. Okay, so when the team says we're only gonna have 99% uptime, that means we're only down for 3.65 days, which means we almost lost $4 million. Or are you willing to invest in the tools, the labor dollars, the delay of features to market window to get us down to 99.99% because now we're down to $43,833. However, between those two levels are maybe two, three, four million dollars of labor licensing and technology. So you have to offset that to say, is it really worth the cost? Don't know. But don't tell me we shouldn't know what our uptime is because it equates to money, but you'd be surprised how my product owners don't know what their uptime should be. And the business is kind of like, well, we just want it to be up and online. Well, what's that mean, right? And then when it's down, everyone's upset and you're kind of like, but we're up 99% of the year. Well, that's, that's unacceptable. Well, you never told me it wasn't. Okay, so this equates to a lot of money. So getting into acceptance test criteria about the T-bone, here's our uh, boundary testing. It's typically encoding language, it uses different applications to test it. So if you're looking at Cucumber, um, yes, it is written in somewhat business speak, but in the background, it is running code. And then here's fitness. And then here's RubyMine running code in the background, writing uh, acceptance tests. So I'll pause here before we dive into more stuff. And uh, what we are gonna cover is some stuff around user stories, a little bit on story pointing. Uh, we're probably gonna skip most of the meetings of Scrum uh, because we just won't have time. Uh, we'll cover velocity and capacity so you know the difference of terms depending on the tools you're using and the frameworks. And then we're gonna get into some metrics. So at least you guys have an idea of like where we can get going here. So how about I pause here now you know like what's coming, and more importantly what's not. Um, any questions, comments, concerns?
No, I'll just say it's been extremely helpful going over a lot of this stuff in some greater level of detail than I've um, experienced in the past. And um, yeah, looking forward to what's coming ahead. Are you going to show us any of the, the, the tools you mentioned, like Rally or, or Jira or any of those? I could, I could show you my personal edition of Jira. Um, I can't open up my, my uh, main companies because I'd be in a lot of legal trouble. <laughs> but I could, uh, I could show you my personal edition so you could see it. Okay. Yeah, that will be nice later on when, when we come back. So how, how long should we break for? Oh, yeah, I was just going to continue going. I was just breaking for the uh, purpose of questions. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> I thought you needed a break. Okay. Oh, no, 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 not yet. <clears throat> um, any other questions, comments, anything? No? Yeah. Uh, we're going to jump into user stories here because, you know, that's fun. Um, as a financial officer, I want the revenue report to be exportable on the downloads page so I, that I may forward the report to outside vendors. If you would have said, as a product owner, I want the revenue report to be exportable, you would have lost a lot of things. Number one, financial officer has a different technical aptitude than the product owner himself. Forwarding a revenue report about vendors to outside vendors is a security nightmare waiting to happen, right? Now that I understand who's doing it, their level of authority in the company, which means they see everything. The financial officer has access to everything when it comes to finance, right? So if I give him the revenue report, he sees everything. Names, addresses, contacts, money, contract numbers, payment methods. And then you're going to do what with it? Send it to an outside vendor? Are you crazy? So if we're protecting quality at all costs, the value of the company, the value of the story, the value of the feature, right away, since it's written this way, the team can say, stop. Sure, I can develop anything, but I don't want it to be my last sprint working here. So what are you doing? That doesn't make any sense. Logically, legally, anything, right? So there you go. You, you got to focus on that. Acceptance criteria, exportable and XLSX. So it doesn't say XLS. So what you've inclined everybody to understand is you're supporting over a million rows in Excel. If it said XLS, you have inferred only 64,000 rows. So sometimes when we get into this argument with customers about we support Excel or some other technology that has multiple formats, it's better to say we support XLS, but we're going to follow it up with a future release to support XLSX. If customers knew that, instead of you just saying we support Excel and then realizing the hard way that you don't support XLSX and embarrassing your company and wasting their time and their business, maybe they trained all their teams saying, we're going to start using this tool because well, now we can load all this data. Well, that's not really true. You can only load 64,000 at a time. Well, why didn't you tell me that? Oh. So user stories should be written in a way that the customer is educated as to what you do and more importantly, what you don't support. So we support XLSX. So that means we obviously support the XLS in size. Export link will be available on the reporting page. Um, it will not force a specific download location from the application. Um, you're helping people understand the headers in the download file should match the UI. And a lot of times in tools, it doesn't. Like the UI looks a certain way because we can override the way fields look. But then when you just do a direct download, you suddenly like, what's this field? Oh, wait a second. That, that's that field. Why did it do that? You know, and people think something's wrong with your product. So helping people understand, do I match it or do I not match it? Customers want to know. Um, export will be saved on the application server. It'll be stamped in the database. It'll have logs in the debug mode. And if it fails, the server will cancel the job on reset, restart. So we've handled a number of people. Yes, the financial officer is probably um, up until he would have some interest up to this point. He could come back to get the download for up to 14 days. But at this point, it's transitioning in users to support, to operations. So if someone says the story is too big for a sprint, you could say, well, I could cut it right there. And I could have a separate story all dedicated to operations. 
So before we release it, though, I need both stories, guys, because I'm not going to deploy this and screw up my ops team. Okay, that's fine. But let's build up the actual um, report. Let's see how it exports, the scalability behind it, the performance behind it. Maybe send it to the financial officer as kind of a demo with data in it. And he might come back and say, this is kind of useless. Can you remove these columns? I don't need that extra columns. Okay. Let's get that feedback loop before we decide to stamp stuff in the database. That makes sense. Okay, we could do that. Um, more importantly, what does the system do when it fails? And I've seen a lot of people say, well, send, send an alert. That doesn't tell me how the system responds to failure. That tells me how it alerts. And people are confusing that in the income. All right, welcome everyone sure. to our meeting for today. We have our esteemed coach and colleague, Agile coach, who's gonna be taking us through the trajectory of Agile, helping us get into the nuts and bolts of what exactly it is. Some of you are thinking of taking the PMP exam, or you're thinking of taking the ACP exam, or you just wanna know a little bit more about Agile. Well, Michael is gonna get you on the right tracks. So without much ado, I'd like to welcome Michael to the microphone and um, take it away, Michael. Good morning, everybody. I think it's morning across America right now still. Um, yes, th thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm an Agile coach. I uh, have my own little side company, but I also work for uh, Comcast. Um, I'm an okay guy, go, though. So even though the customer service sometimes has issues, um, I'm an okay guy. You can still talk to me. Uh, we're going to be going through some stuff here. Um, can you all see my screen? Just want to make yes. sure you can see my screen. Yeah, okay, and I'm, a, I'm a looking to the side because I'm sharing my second monitor because it has better resolution. I mean, I'm not really trying to show you a profile of my face, like a mugshot or anything. So I apologize that I'm not always looking at the camera. Um, you can find pretty much a lot of trainers, uh, the majority of trainers teach Agile as um, you know process and they'll go through the artifacts and things of that nature. Uh, there's a handful of trainers out of every, you know, like 100 that take you down a different route. And yes, we do talk about the artifacts because they're necessary in the roles, but we try and take you down a different motivational route. And that's the route I tend to go down. Um, we're gonna get into some human behaviors, uh, the way we communicate with each other. And my goal behind that is if I can motivate people to approach um, the process or the tools or uh, you know, our people, then everything else just comes along for the ride. And it makes more sense when you're explaining the process to say, well, if we can focus on the behavior or focus on the motivational factor, then you understand why you would want to do the process and the metrics that may or may not be present would back up your, uh, your presentation. So on my screen here, uh, this is from a, a class that I had for um, a couple days back in 2013 with uh, the PMI in Denver. So this was sanctioned by the PMI. Um, I would assume you probably get PDU credits for this course that we're going through. So today I think it's two hours, so you get like two PDUs if you wanna claim those. And then if you show up to, I don't know, uh, if we're having you know, the second session, that would be another two hours. So the question I ask at the beginning of the class of uh, what is the most resilient parasite? Yeah, you know, and that gets people thinking because you know that's not a normal question to ask in an agile class. But what it is, is um, it's an idea. And the reason I say that is not only do I love the movie Inception, which is what this is kind of based on, and actually the class was called Project Inception, so you might see some movie posters throughout the course material today. But the reason is if I told you to stop thinking about a pink elephant, you instantly are thinking about a pink elephant. And then if I say, well, forget I said that, then you're thinking about it again. And the more and more you think about it, you're reinforcing the idea in your head. And it gets harder and harder for you to let go of it. I mean, the worst thing to say to someone is when they're upset, be calm. And when you're trying to get them to forget something, forget we said that, right? And the reason is you're reinforcing whatever that behavioral pattern is of the moment. So if I were to say, I want you to forget that Agile is about process, but focus on a different idea, um, that would be that Agile is about loyalty. And these are the kind of comments that I use with product managers when I'm training them. A loyal customer should not be confused with a paying customer. 
And product managers know that right away. Uh, they understand that just because someone found your product to be the solution of the moment and they paid for it, doesn't mean they care anything about you, doesn't mean they understand anything about your company. In fact, you, they may buy a product thinking it's from this company and then realize later it was a distributor who got it from another company who actually made it in the first place, right? So there's no loyalty there when it comes to paying customers. A loyal customer is different. Sometimes we call them partners, right? And because they have a different behavioral mentality. Uh, same is true with a loyal employee. It shouldn't be confused with a paid one. The majority of your employees are paid, right? Hopefully so, or you'll be in a lawsuit, right? But the case is, why do we say, my goodness, that's a loyal employee? Or wow, what, that, you know, that's loyalty right there, buddy. You know, and the reason why we call that out is it's a set of behaviors about that person that is different than the rest of your employees at the moment. It doesn't mean everyone else is disloyal, but you're calling out that behavior for, you know, a certain reason. So when we look at how we even communicate, this is uh, based on the book, uh, It Starts With Why, which is, I recommend that book highly. Um, he goes over this and he calls it the golden circle. This is, you know, a, uh, from a biologist standpoint, if you were looking down at someone's head from above them, uh, into their brain, you would see the brain is made up of these different layers. Uh, the neocortex, uh, which is about your rational thinking. You know, when someone talks about metrics, they're talking from that part of their brain. Uh, when they're talking about the limbic brain systems, which include the reptilian stem, they're talking about feelings. That's when you come out of an interview and you say, I don't know what it is, but something about this person just feels right. You look at the resume and say, man, he doesn't know how to write a resume. It's really bad. But something about this guy feels right. Or that person really stutters or they have some communication problem, but something about them feels right. And then you hire that person. They turn out to be the most loyal employee you've ever seen before uh, doing things you didn't even ask them to do. They're just going ahead and doing it. And they're one of the best employees you've ever had in your life. It, that's because it was the limbic brain, the emotions behind it um, that were causing you to make that decision. And then you tried to rationalize it, you know, with their resume or with their skill or with their output over time. So here's an example of how people explain agile. If you come from the neocortex perspective and you were walking into a chief financial officer's office, you would say, hey, I think we need to move to agile. You know, we would have uh, faster code delivery, maybe better quality. Uh, we would have, uh, you know, different style meetings, you know, smaller meetings throughout the week. And the CFO is like, this doesn't mean much to me. You know, go, go talk to some developer guy, right? Someone who comes from the limbic brain perspective from inside out would say to the CFO, um, you know, first off, thanks for taking the time with me today. You know, our products are subscription-based, which means we're really focused on customer retention. And more so, we're concerned about a loyal customer base. What if I told you I found a way that we could inspire our customers to want to be loyal to us, to continue forward with their relationship with us, and lo and behold, give us feedback that allows us to build things in a more efficient manner? And, you know, the CFO kind of scratches his head and he's thinking in the back because he rationalizes things, you know, based on an Excel spreadsheet that is in his head. And he goes, subscription-based services, customer retention, loyal customers. Loyal customers come back. Okay, interested. How are you, how are you gonna do this? Well, we're gonna, we have a process that allows us to, you know, include customers into giving feedback cycles. And I don't mean just our product works. I mean, tell us the truth. Your, your product sucks, and here's the reason why. Your product is phenomenal. I don't know what it is, but something about it makes me really comfortable. And for us to be able to go down that pathway with them to understand what's triggering them to feel that way. And if we can do that and apply it to our product on not just a, an occasional um, delivery, but on a repeatable pattern. So instead of us doing this long drawn out, we give you product every six months. And then you forget about us and then you're not loyal to us anymore. But if, you know, if I figured out what really drove your behavior and included that into our product or service, if you're a service oriented company, and the customer every two weeks was reminded why we're awesome. Every two weeks, they showed up and said, you did what you told me you would do. That would incline them to want to work with us. And the CFO was like, go on. 
okay, and so if, if we constantly do this, then also our team morale is going to increase, which I think is going to reduce our turnover rate of our customer, our, our customer service base um, when it comes to our outward facing customer service. Are also our morale inside of our developers and QA engineers because every two weeks or you know better yet every day we're going to have this daily meeting where we show up and they go over what they work on and they inspire each other to work like teammates something we don't do today because everyone reports to their manager in some spreadsheet and it just never works out they feel like there's authoritarian regime around here and we just want teams and then the CFO goes, okay, how much money do you need? And he goes through some of that and says, okay, start with a prototype team, whatever. And he says, what should I call this? And the person turns around and says, oh, by the way, it's called Agile. So you didn't start off with saying, here's Agile, here's the metrics, here's the process. I, I, I hope you believe in this. You cornered it around behaviors, feelings, customer retention, a loyalty, and it was supported by a process supported by how you did things and then lo and behold by the way you were explaining agile in the first place and that was just a change of how you communicate but that's how the thought-provoking companies do communicate and in this book start with why he goes over that's how apple communicates um, you know for example uh, there a lot of their commercials used to say think different right they didn't try and sell your product they tried to sell you a belief so if you believed in that, you would do the same thing. Okay, so the same here is true with Agile is you can approach it from a process-oriented perspective, from a certification, a rule perspective. But if you approach it differently, um, you move people to want to join you. So uh, we're going to skip this work, uh, workshop because obviously I don't have the video that I can show you right now. But I'll, if we have time at the end, I'll go over what the video is so that you could do it with your team. Why Agile? Positives and negatives. Notice most of the positives are negatives too. If you're faster to market with the wrong thing, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, the only person you're helping is your competitor. Okay, so when people say we're faster to market, you can say, well, anyone can be faster with the wrong thing. Heck, I could do that right now. Here, let me type hello world in a text file. Hey, look at me, I'm a developer. Is that what you wanted? Does that make me Agile? Okay, so faster to market only works if it's the right thing. Uh, quick feedback, that's great you get quick feedback, but if someone keeps telling you that you're wrong and every day you keep proving to them, number one, you are wrong, and two, you don't listen, how long is that customer gonna stick around? All right, so as you look at the different agile frameworks, you will notice some of them are designed more around speed, some are designed more around visibility, and do know that all those positives can be negatives if you're not approaching it properly. At the top is your serial-based waterfall mentality. Now these sticky notes are the really, really big ones. We're talking like almost the size of a sheet of paper. Okay, so just think of that in your head. If I broke across an application, how it works on the top and said, this is what we're gonna work on over the next six months. And then someone says, we're agile. We do stories. We don't use a PRD, we don't use a BRD, an MRD, SFS, any of those acronyms that you would find out there for big documents. Instead, we use these little things called user stories. And what they are is a slice of the system uh, for a user. Okay, great, so if I sliced all these sticky notes up with my hands, you would notice that they don't cut perfectly. This is not a pair of scissors. A system doesn't work like that. You can't just cut it with a pair of scissors and say, it's gonna be perfect. No, you have crossover. You have this API calls on that database. This UI works with that API. And in fact, that API not only serves up the browser on your desktop, but then serves this mobile system over there, right? So you have cross bleed all over the place. So when you're doing this and you just line everything up and say, I'm not changing anything about scope. You just told me Agile would be faster if I made these stories smaller. But lo and behold, based on this picture here, it's taking longer. And why is that? Because of the cross bleed, because of the multiple meetings that you now have, you, you may not have a, a big release go, no go, but you have a daily stand up every day. You have now, if you're in the scrum mentality, um, you have pre-planning meetings, you have planning meetings, you have demos constantly. If you're in the Kanban flow, uh, your daily activity is, you are doing a daily planning meeting every day, just on smaller stuff. 
So that idea of the overhead kicks in. The only way it's faster is if I looked at those large items at the top and focused on those little green squares and said, those are the points of value. That's all the customer wants. Those are the must haves of the must shoulds and coulds. Those are the musts. Those are what you work on. Okay. So if I focused on that and that alone, it becomes like that. That's the only way agile is actually better is you're focusing on faster to market with the right thing. Quick feedback triggers us to develop the right thing. We're visible about what we are working on, which is the right thing. We have less documentation because we're not building everything. Okay, so that's when the positives kick in. Otherwise, if you're doing everything the way you used to do and you're just slicing things up and calling yourself agile because you have a daily scrum, then you turn into this mess. Uh, a couple of good books out there. Uh, one here is the Toyota Product Development System. You will find a lot of things about Agilus are based on a lot of things Toyota did in the past. Okay, so one thing about Toyota is their their product owners must do a couple of things to just work on um, architecture of a car. You are forced as a architect to go work in Japan at their car dealerships for six months. You're not allowed to go to the corporate headquarters and focus on architecture, which is what they asked you for, until you sit in the sales office for six months. That's how they run it. Another thing is their chief product owners there who actually you know, govern the entire project plans and features and stuff, they're with the company at least 15 years before they're allowed to have that position. Okay, so it gives you an idea of one, the loyal base that they have for customers to stick around that long, or I mean employees. Two, they focus on putting them in front of customers first before they allow them to do anything. And another thing about, um, I'm not sure if any of you have their Toyota minivan. I don't know how many of you have like 15 kids or anything, but you might have their minivan. Notice that if you go to Home Depot and you take out their seats in the back, you can fit a full piece of plywood in it. Now, most of us are like strapping it to our car, going into the lumber area and say, can you cut this in half for me? It's not going to fit my truck or it's not going to fit my uh, SUV or anything of that nature. Toyota said, listen, they had a case study where they told the architects to drive around America for six months with customers to where they went to observe their activities. Now, obviously, they paid the customers, you know, for them to be snooped on the whole time. But they're watching their behaviors when it came to their minivan and what they noticed is that people were strapping plywood on top of the minivan. So they focused on the value proposition and said, that's pretty simple to solve. If we can get the seats out of there and make sure the wheel wells are further enough apart, that's a selling point. Suddenly we solved that big problem. So that's what happened with them. And they give a couple of those examples in their books, focusing on customers and understanding their behavioral trends. And then they said, listen, you're not allowed to even do your job until you understand the trends of our customers let alone change anything. So Agile is simple, not easy. If someone's told you it's easy, they're probably a consultant, okay? And they're trying to sell you something. Um, Agile is simple. The simplicity of focus on customers, respond to their feedback, have a consistent meeting every day called the daily standup, have demos, have pre-planning, all that stuff. Simple. The hard part is we work with people. People come with all this other stuff. They come with cultural differences. They come with gender differences. They come with ethics and religion and all that stuff. And HR tells us to avoid that. However, when you're focusing on teams, you have to understand their motivations. And that's where Agile becomes a little difficult. For example, I learned this by working with a lot of uh, the folks from India. I was noticing that the offshore team was not showing up to my daily stand-up meeting every morning and they were the testing team at night. And I was asking them, saying, I really need you on this call. I really need you on this call every morning. We're a team, we're a team, we're a team. And the only person that showed up from India was the lead. And so I was starting to get frustrated and I had built a good relationship with the Indians that were here in America onshore. And one of them pulled me aside and said, you just don't understand us. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, this is pretty simple. I just want to get people to show up at the meeting, people who did the work. He goes, you're not understanding us. This is 
He goes, examine the situation. You're dealing with culture issues and gender issues. And I'm like, okay, explain. I'm interested. I, I want to help this team. And he said, the person who's offshore, what gender are they? And I said, she, she's a female. And I said, okay. Realize that in our culture, we focus on, you know, we treat people differently based on a couple things. One is gender. Two, sometimes religion. Three, education. He said, so first off, if you're highly educated and you're onshore in America and you're a female, the males offshore will respect you. However, if you're offshore and you're a female, they will be very authoritarian and only the male will show up to your meeting. So he's like, you need to break through to people to help them understand what you're looking for, but you have to be empathetic to who we are. And so I thought about it and thought about it and I eventually talked to the lead offshore and said, I respect you, your professional career. I understand you're pretty highly educated to be in the position you're in leading your team. Um, I don't know anything about, you know, perhaps your religion or anything of that nature, but what I do know is that you're dealing with an American culture here that is focused on the simplicity of the people who do the work should be the ones who give the answer to the questions. And the reason is we're trying to reduce inefficiency or misunderstandings like a telephone game. I'm asking that we compromise and help me learn how to respect you guys better. But at the same time, could you please have her show up at the meeting so that we can just get the most efficient message possible? about how the tests were last night. And from that day forward, she showed up to every single meeting. So Agile is simple. It's not easy because it's no longer an authoritarian perspective. It is not a long drawn out project plan, Gantt chart, um, critical pathway perspective. A lot of it is focused around behavioral pattern thinking and adjusting to that. And that means everyone's adjusting. Okay, another way to look at it too is another simple example is I worked with a company in Denver that built uh, fast search engine technology. So think of like Microsoft, Bing, Google, you know, they're all advertising companies, but in the end, uh, they have search engine technology. And we were working for a client that was in Europe and they had multiple divisions, one in the UK, um, a, you know, a couple spread out throughout the different Europe countries. And the one thing about Europe, unlike America, is that every single country has a different set of rules. Like on one website, you can put someone's address, but not their name. On another website, you can put their address, but not their city. And then on another website, you can put their full-blown address and name, but not the telephone number. So you had to know all these legal laws uh, going across different you know, countries, even though it's the same company uh, that was giving up this you know, advertising. And we really disappointed our customer. And what I noticed on the demo was we were demoing search engine terms. And the customer goes, do you guys not know us yet? And like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You know, we're not showing the customer information. We're following the laws. And he goes, you still don't understand us yet. He goes, look at the words you're using. And like, what about them? And he goes, look at that word, behavior. Is that how we spell it in the UK? Our customers are here. Our culture is here. You're in America and you're spelling behavior as an American. Spell it the way the UK does. And so what we reinforced every two weeks for a matter of months is we didn't know our customer, we didn't care about our customer, we weren't listening, and eventually it blew up in a meeting that they said, the example's right in your face, the word behavior. If you can't even get your test data to focus on how customers use our products, what do we need you for? So that's where Agile is simple. It's about customer needs, but it's not easy because the people you're working with, for example, Americans testing United Kingdom products, Indians testing American-based products. We have different cultures. And until you can understand the culture for whom you're testing, you're not doing Agile the way you're supposed to. Okay. All right, so here is a, um, a bell curve. We see a lot of this when it comes to like bonuses at the end of the year, right? And we're all trying to say, oh, you got all the threes in the center and the fives on the right and the ones and twos on the left, right? Let's apply this bell curve to Agile. If you were to look at your marketplace and say the majority of my customers are where, you would say they're in the center. 
that's like your Super Bowl ad. That's why it costs you like a couple million dollars for 30 seconds. If you're trying to a attack the market with something so general that everyone just gets it, right? Angela say, that's how we used to work. That's your six month release right there. You build so much stuff that you deploy it and you hope one, your customers are still there. And two, the ones that are there, there's something in our feature base that'll, that'll get them, right? And will say, no, 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 that's, that's ridiculous. Every two weeks show up with something and get their feedback. And then the following week, the following two weeks, you work based on their feedback. And then the following week, you work on their feedback. So on the left-hand side of this bell curve, when it comes to market dynamics, is the idea that, first off, the people on the left care about talking about things. They're the people who use Yelp. They are the people who use Facebook Marketplace. They are the people who put reviews out there. Uh, they're the people streaming stuff in LinkedIn constantly. They're the people who care. And so they will use your product first, and then they'll tell their friends. Now, the question is what they tell their friends could be bad, it could be good. But if I could get those people to show up to my demo meetings, then they're gonna market my product for me. So for those of you who are building an internal product in your company, you're looking inside your company in different departments for people with this behavior. They're the type who like to talk, the people who like to give feedback, but also more importantly, they like to tell their friends. So if you want to market a message called, let's start doing Agile, or you want to market a service called, we do contracting for a customer, or you want to market a tangible product, we build an e-commerce website. You go after these people because they will market your message for you that number one, this company listens to feedback. Number two, they included my feedback, which is really interesting. You see that feature right there? That's because of me. And number three, this is where they're going. I didn't need a commercial for that. They did it for you. So that's how Agilists work on that. And then there's a book out there called The Tipping Point. And what it proves is that when 15 to 18% of the market of people you're trying to get to use your product or service, use it, the rest of the market catapults and starts using it. So that's just marketing 101. Okay, so we went through a lot of stuff there. Um, let me pause for a second. Uh, let me see here. Is there a way to, I don't know how to unmute anybody here. Um, audio options. I'm trying to find a way to unmute everybody. Or you can just unmute yourself. Right. If you have any I, questions, I let me pause that. there. <laughs> I'll do that for you, Michael. So folks, Thanks. if you've got any questions, you can chat them in. Otherwise, you can ask them as I unmute you. I just ask for a favor, um, if you can locally mute yourself, so that whatever's happening in the background uh, isn't apparent to, to us, that'll be great. So I'm gonna mute everyone. Three, two, one, go. Okay, everyone's on, on mute. Yep, that's correct. Does anyone have any questions or yes, comments or concerns? That's great. Um, okay. Yes, let me see. Sounds like we might have to mute everybody again. Someone's on another call. Okay. Okay. So, since no one has any questions, I'm going to keep moving forward. I just want to make sure I had a natural pause here because we're going through, if you were to say, in the limbic brain perspective, I'm going through the why right now mm -hmm. and a little bit of the how. I'm talking to you from inside to say, this is how human behavior works. And when you apply it to how we do our work, how Toyota did their stuff, how marketing 101 works, you can understand why now we say, I want the customer at my demo meetings. Mm -hmm. So before I even talk to you about a demo meeting or I talk to you about an iteration or any of that stuff, it's like, if you get this, you can go talk to a CFO, you can talk to a project manager, you can talk to a customer, you can talk to a funding source, you can talk to a developer and say, do you understand now why we invited the people we did to the demo meeting? and the people who weren't there, why we didn't want them there, right? And so if you can do that, then you can coach these people if you were a scrum master and do that job. Absolutely, and Michael, so, I just comment that this is, this is extremely helpful in putting everything into perspective and helping us think right. Oh, wow. I'm trying not to fall asleep for the next couple of slides because they have a lot of detail on them. Um, waterfall history. 
So back in 1970, Winston Royce came up with managing the development of large software teams. And then the, the Department of Defense came out with the standard based on that um, document, or at least the initial document, which is the waterfall diagram. And inside this spec for the military, they had 428 pages of specs on process. We're not talking software specs. We're talking specs of how to do the process itself. On page nine, there were four to five testing stages after coding. Page 13 said you need to have 17 documents before coding was even allowed to begin. So think BRD, MRD, SFS, and you know, like uh, 12 or 13 other acronyms right behind them. Test plan had to be approved. And then I just got lost on page 29. I didn't know what the heck was going on there. And then on page 30, this scared the daylights out of me. You spent all this time arguing about testing stages and test plans, but then if you updated the source code later, you didn't have to test it. So what I'm trying to say is, I tend to ask the question, do you believe that government jobs, whether you agree with the public, private, you know, political battle, that's another question, but do you believe as it stands that if we turned over all government jobs to the private sector in one swoop, would that impact the private sector significantly? And no one seems to argue that fact. And I say, yes, absolutely. And I said, okay, so that means the public sector has a large amount of people in it. So back in 1988, obviously the military is ahead of any um, private sector, uh, at least in the sense of technology, because there's a lot of classified stuff out there, right? And then eventually some of it gets declassified. So you hear about the company called DARPA, and they make stuff for the military. And then eventually, like 10, you know, five, 10 years later, there's something that comes out that they say, oh, yeah, this was based on DARPA's technology, and now the public is allowed to use it. So back in 1988, if you wanted to be in software, that's what you had to follow. Now, a lot of the people who were in that timeline are now managers in companies today. So for years, they were forced to follow this procedure ingrained in their brain every single day. This is how you do software. This is how you do it correctly. And if you don't abide by this, well, one, you're not being loyal to our military. Two, you're bringing risk in. So they had ingrained for years this behavior. And then lo and behold, some young guy comes out of a startup and says, Agile, Agile, Agile. It's, it's so simple, man. Why do we need all these testing stages? Why do you need all those documents? Come on, man, just get it together. This is why Agile is simple, but it's not easy. These invoke behaviors, right? So at first there's an event, then there's an attitude change, then it becomes part of your nature, and then suddenly it's a habit. So you weren't there back in 1988, young person, to stop this from happening. You weren't next to this person for years while they were in the military serving our country. And then you weren't with them for years in the private sector while they still use this mentality. But lo and behold, you show up and you think that Agile is just gonna be simple. It's not that simple. These people think differently. So that's some of the hardest parts of moving people forward. But when we go back to how do we get people out of that trend? We say, okay, so this is where you came from. Thank you for your service for our country, great. Did you know that back in 1970s, some guy came out with this and he goes, yeah, 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 we had to study that in the military and say, well, let's analyze that for a second. When you look at it, the actual person who wrote it said, I believe in this concept, but the implementation described above is risky and invites failure. He also said that a major redesign was required. And here's something that should scare the daylights out of PMP folks. The development process is returned to the origin and one can expect up to 100% overrun in schedule and or costs. So what he's saying is if you follow this process, I guarantee you it's gonna cost more and you're gonna be late. So when you think of your PMP exam and there's a section on ethics, is it ethical to give somebody an estimate that you know 100% chance is wrong? And it's not just wrong, like, oh, we're going to be off by, like, you know, 5% just because, you know, we lose some employees, gain some employees, and we have some just trends. No, 100% overrun is what the person who devised the waterfall original statement to be said even his process does this. So it makes you question, like, 
you're trying to move these people around that have been ingrained in this procedure for a long time, and they say it's, it's dedicated on my my education back in the military, and lo and behold, military was based on Winston Royce's thesis. So let's see what the doctor actually had to say. And that's what he's saying. He's not saying agile, but he's saying that something else has to be better than this. So when you focus on, okay, what else did he have to say? Some of the changes he wanted to do is the version finally delivered to the customer is actually the second version. The entire process done in miniature. Testing is the phase with the greatest risk in terms of dollars and schedule. So why are we doing it last? And it's important to involve the customer in a formal way so that he has committed himself. Doesn't sound like a customer to me. Sounds like a committed partner, a loyal partner. So these are all the things he said probably had to be changed. He just didn't use the term agile. But when you talk to people about agile, well, we have short sprints. We have loyal customers who show up to demo. We're focused on test-driven development. Uh, we're actually, we may build a lot of stories, but eventually we deploy an ultimate version that isn't what the original was. Hmm. Okay, so we are in agreement more than you think, person. You just didn't read all the pages below his diagram. You're so used to looking at the waterfall diagram that you forgot there, there were all these paragraphs beneath it of what he said was wrong with it and what needed to change. So that's what we kind of get to is that's how you move people around is show them where you have a constant denominator with them and then educate them a little further. So the only problem he lists at the end is the simpler method has never worked on large scale development efforts. Okay, so in essence, he's saying even if he made all these changes, you can add a little scale. So that's something you kind of have to maybe have in your back pocket is this is where Waterfall got its origination. It was in the military for so long. And back then, if you wanted to do anything with high tech, that's where you would be. And then when those people came into the normal private sector, they took all this with them. So why are we surprised they act that way? But if I could educate them on truly the backbone of what, where things came from, they might have a conversation with me about Agile instead of an argument. Okay, so now we're going to look in, uh, all right, here's your movie poster, the first one. He is hiding something when we need to find out what that is. Who is he? He is your customer. And this was a couple of years back. Um, they had a multiple studies that back in 2014, 2015, Generation Y would make not only up 50% of the market force, but 50% of the workforce. Because, you know, baby boomers and Generation X, they're either retiring or just getting higher up in executive positions. So they're not the doers. Not usually. Not anymore. So as Generation Y kicks in, they just come with this behavioral trend. Uh, interesting thing here where it says language 99, it doesn't mean they know 99 languages. What I based that on was there were a bunch of studies about the behaviors of these people, of these teenagers. Right. And what they notice is that, you know, they use instant messaging and they're on their phones. And if, if we were the naughty parent, who, you know, who looked at all their text messages, we would see random nines and random 99s. And they kept studying this and saying, what is going on? Why is why do we see these numbers randomly showing up constantly? And what they realized is that when a couple teenagers were honest about it, they said nine means the parent is in the room. Ninety nine means they left the room. So you can talk about different things. So they have their own way of discussing things. We are used to PRDs and BRDs being hundreds of pages, and they can sum it up in 140 characters, a tweet. That's how they work. So when we talk about like the daily stand-up trying to keep it close to 15 minutes, it's because they already have one foot out the door. They're like, just tell me what I need to know so I can just go do what I do. Why do I need to be in here for two hours? Okay, so that's the human behavioral trends that we're working with. Can skip a workshop here. So the shade here um, was this lady named Molly, but she's referenced as Mal, and Mal means bad in the movie. So what is bad for your business? Bad is market delays, competitors, patents expiring. Sometimes it's us. Sometimes we're the problems that we're the people who have problems. And I don't just mean people who don't know Agile. Agilists have lots of problems too, right? They can't communicate very well sometimes. Um, they're pushing people a little too hard, too fast. They're asking for too much simplicity. 
you know, no rains on the system. Okay, so we have to look at ourselves sometimes and say, if I am the change agent, what behavior do I bring to my team? So let's look here at, uh, and normally this class, by the way, is two days. You're getting flooded with info, but part of it is I'm trying to get through all this stuff so that you can ask questions. Uh, we don't have the workshops going on, but do know this class tends to be a little slower and there's like movie clips and stuff we watch, so it's a lot funnier. This is product management 101. That's the cash cow right there. Everyone wants to milk it. Okay, that was a bad product management um, joke. At the very top is waterfall, at the very bottom is agile. You start off in the red, regardless of flow. You're building a product or a service, no one's bought it yet. You're burning cash. That's just the way it is. You go into orange, which means you have enough people on your system or enough people buying your service that it makes up for any development cost and anything to keep the lights on. Green means you're in the green, making revenue dollars, uh, making profit, and you have enough to build new stuff, not just keep the existing stuff running. And then eventually your competitors come in, um, they start building similar technology, perhaps better technology. Your patents run out if you're a manufacturer and now there's generics out there. And eventually you're bleeding red again because a lot of your customer base is left. Agilists get there a little faster. How? Well, we don't wait six months to deploy something. We deploy something as soon as possible. We get feedback right away. Initially, we might be working with, if we're in software, we're working with you know, IT, we're working with product managers on potential uh, sizes of the market, the amount of customers you're expecting on the system you know, in the first year as opposed to five years. So we're building a lot of backend stuff to prepare for performance. So we're demoing it to those people because they care about that. But eventually we get to the point of showing part of the website to customers, maybe a alpha group to say, some of this data is test, some of this is live, give us, a, give us feedback on, do you like how we get the data to flow on the screen or is that not how you would do it? You know, if we have the submit button three tabs down, but you only fill in the first tab with information every time, that's really stupid. We should put the submit button on the first tab. You know, so we're understanding the feedback and getting responses. Eventually we have a live system and we're there before the big market splash. Now we may not have as much functionality as someone would potentially have in six months, you know, on the second month. But what we do have is a number of loyal people already. We have IT in our bucket, we have product management on board, we have project managers on board, funding sources on board, a couple customers saying, that's the flow I need, can you add the next feature? Great, I'll give you feedback. Now can you add the next feature? Great. And eventually there's enough features to where they say, I'm going to train my team internally to start using your product. Doesn't have all the stuff I want in the end yet, but I do know we're getting there because I've already believed in what you're doing. I'm showing up to your demo every two weeks and what you show me is great. By doing it this way, instead of focusing on the market type, like product managers typically would, we're focusing on building customer loyalty because this customer is showing up to your demo meeting and is paying you to use your product and give you free feedback so that you can build the right product. And they're giving you your, their time every two weeks. And since you respond to them, their beliefs become your beliefs. Their values are your values. So you become one and the same. So what's happening is you're locking them into your system from a technological standpoint, from a process standpoint, and more importantly, from a value standpoint. And if we approach Agile that way, then when our customers, competitors uh, kick in, they say, why would I go to that competitor? All I need is a guarantee from you is that you are going to do something like that soon. Because why would I go anywhere else? Because the cool thing is you're gonna implement whatever that is with my feedback based on my business problems not just make it general for everybody. So why would I leave you? So then you have more time to build the next feature or sunset your product. So that's product management applied to Agile. Remember, we're not really talking about, yes, incremental is on there, but I didn't tell you about a bunch of sprints. I didn't give you sprint cycles. I didn't give you stories or story points or any of the stuff you're gonna find you know, in normal classes. I'm focusing on why people act the way they act, how we get people to stay with our system, and lo and behold, Agile is one of the gateways that gets you there. Okay. All right, so here's 
pragmatic marketing, this is one of their older frameworks. They change it slightly every year. This is like the top dog when it comes to product management training next to the 280 group. So if you're looking for product management training, um, that's a company that I typically talk to quite often. But what they talk about here is that uh, the product owner, which is the term we're going to be going over, sits here in the center. He knows the difference between a buyer and a user. And if you get user stories or requirements that say, as a product owner, as a product owner, as a product owner, go buy them a bag of dog food and put it on their desk. And they'll be like, what the heck is this for? And you say, what's the difference between a buyer and a user? Because every one of your user stories says, as a product owner. One, you don't use the system. And two, you certainly don't pay for the system. So one, you're neither one of those people. And he goes, well, what's the difference? And he says, who do you think bought this dog food and who would eat it? If that's the bare basic difference between a buyer and a user. And if you can't tell your software team what the difference is, then we're going to build the wrong thing. So product owner, I never want to see a user story that says as a product owner, because you are neither the buyer nor the user. But if you were one of those, there's a good chance you're not the other one of those. So we need to build software so it works for everybody. Okay, so that's a lot of these are why questions. But when you get into the kind of hows and how we're doing things, this is actually where your agile team sits is in the center. They sit knowing enough about strategy to build the right feature set, and they know enough about the tactical in production noise to respond. So that's why they're sitting in the center and focused on buyers and users and requirements. I'm going to skip this because that's a workshop. A change in culture. There you go. So you'll see this in a lot of pictures. Normally, it's just a triangle to a triangle. Mine goes a little bit 3D here. So we go from the time scope budget perspective to scope time cost quality perspective. Before, we would estimate the time and budget. And you'd be like, wait a second. We didn't really estimate. We said this project would take six months. Well, when you're four months into that project, you're going to realize you're four months late. So a couple things can happen. The time can be extended or the budget gets increased. Because to change the scope, you have to walk into some CFO's office or CEO's office and say, I don't agree with you. That always goes over real well, right? They typically give you more time or they say, here's a bunch of money, go hire a bunch of people because they're all plug and play and I'm sure they'll be up to speed in two weeks. Okay, so that's typically what's happening in the waterfall mentality is one of those constraints get changed. However, we're gonna flip the scale. We're gonna say, listen, we're gonna, have fixed constraints called time, costs, and quality. And how do we do that? Every two weeks, well, if you're a scrum team, every two weeks, every two weeks, every two weeks, every two weeks, the time scale has not changed. The costs remain pretty close to the same. Why? Because you're not hiring and firing people every two weeks. If you do, you got a bigger problem on your hands. Okay, so that typically is the same. The, you're not spinning up new servers every week. You may spit up a, uh, spin up a server cluster you know, once every quarter or something, so the costs do change, like licensing and server costs. But in the end, it's the same team with the same salary, with the same servers, and the same licensing, so the costs are the same as they were last week and the week before. Then quality kicks in. We're focused on maybe test-driven development, or we're focused on automation testing, things of that nature, so quality becomes a central point of the actual plan itself as opposed to it's just a stage. So what's the estimate, scope? If every two weeks I go to a customer and say, how do you feel about that? And he says, dude, I don't know what you did, but this sucks. And you say, oh, thanks for that, I'll just keep going. You're gonna lose that customer. But if he says, no, this sucks, and you say, okay. Well, we only changed so much in the last two weeks. Did you feel this way last week? No, I no, I didn't feel that way. Okay, so at least we limited it down to what spawned you, okay. so. Is it something when you're in the UI? Yeah. Okay, so out of the 10 user stories we did, seven of them are the UI. Okay, so we're getting closer. Do you feel that way around this area or this area? I feel it around the second one. Oh, okay, so it's the financial data you're having problems with. Okay, that gets us down to three stories. So these are the three things we changed. Which one do you feel uncomfortable with? Actually, all three of them. Why? Well, you see right there, it has the vendor information right there. Should I be worried that somebody's going to see my name in that list? Oh, oh, you're having a problem with the security constraint and visibility of your vendor. Okay, we can fix that. But it started off with you were listening to how they felt, but it caused a scope change. So that's why estimate is scope, because we're focused on 
the must haves, not the shoulds, not the coulds, but the musts. And then every time we're asking our customer base, reevaluating, saying, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about this? I don't want to know if it works. I already know it works because it's in production. I want to know how you feel about it because that'll determine if I continue down this path. Okay, so that's the change. All right, here's the Agile Manifesto. We value the things on the left more than the things on the right. Doesn't mean we ignore the things on the right. If I have working software that educates customers by virtue of its UI, by virtue of the data flow, by virtue of the error messages, instead of saying invalid password, it might actually say invalid password, you did not meet these constraints. Out of these five constraints, this is the one you didn't meet. You didn't use a special character. Wow, I educated you. I don't need comprehensive documentation to tell you what the constraints are because I put it on the screen. So by working software, it doesn't just mean no errors. It means does it educate them? Does it lead them through whatever process you're making? If I get these people to be more interactive and more efficient, the less and less I have to support them with process constraints or additional tools because they are communicating, and so on and so on. This is taken from the Agile Coaching Book. We tend to use this analogy of a tree quite often in coaching. So a horticulturist will come to your house and he'll look up and see all the dead leaves. He doesn't start counting how many apples you have left. He looks at you dead in the eye and says, where's the closest source of water? Show it to me. Uh, yeah, you see how that water is streaming through that area where you decided to dump your oil from last year from your snowblower? What do you think is happening to that water and that oil mixture because your tree's right there? So I don't need to count how many apples you have. You're poisoning your tree. So we focus a lot on the roots, around the principles and how we want the teams to work. And then if we're feeding the tree, called the team properly, they will start growing in different ways. And then eventually you'll be able to harvest their fruits like a, a couple quarters out. Okay, so we use that a lot. Another analogy is when Agile say, you can never interrupt the sprint. You say, guys, look outside for a second. See that tree over there? Do you think it's healthy? Yeah. Has it been here a long time? Yeah. Is it windy out? Yeah. Why didn't the why didn't this tree snap? Wind is a change. Well, it's bending. Exactly. I need you to bend. I'm not asking you to snap. This is not a hurricane. But I don't want you to be a petrified forest. So work with me. So we use tree analogies quite often to help teams understand, number one, how they grow as a team. Number two, how you uh, get them to harvest over time. But last but not least is you're helping the team understand that like a living tree that is healthy, we don't say a petrified forest is healthy, and we certainly don't say a tree that snapped is healthy. But everything in between has a sense of healthiness to it, depending on the conditions of the weather surrounding them. So think of the weather conditions as your business. Waterfall-based planning, agile value-based planning. So we would build all this stuff and we'd focus a lot on the front end, meaning the front end of requirements, front end of design analysis and coding, and then lo and behold, we ran out of time for testing and then we just deployed it. And then we'd follow it up with hot patches. Then the agile folks say, well, one, we're gonna give more time to the people who actually do the work. We're gonna not just be focused on coding versus testing, we're gonna do test-driven development, meaning I only build until the test passes. And then I focus on automated stuff, continual integration, and then we do these quick and light deployments of pieces of code, pieces of functionality. Instead of saying I support Excel six months from now, I'm going to say I support XLS. I didn't say I support XLSX, I support XLS. 64,000 rows in a spreadsheet. And then in the next sprint or the next release, we're gonna support XLSX, meaning a million rows. So we further enhance the system. Between those two releases, no one thought XLSX was a bug because we never told the customer we did that. We told them we supported XLS. So we slowly and slowly start ramping up more and more functionality. But what you're not seeing is a lot of hot patches as a normalcy. I'm not saying you'll never have to fix the system, but what I am saying is that the normalcy is that you're slowly deploying pieces out because there's less risk to it. 
So when you're looking at the waterfall-based model, you can deploy all you want. However, you cannot patch someone's loyalty with a technical solution. So once you tell somebody, yeah, we work that way, and then they come back and say, no, you don't. You just broke loyalty with that customer. Okay. The agilists may approach it, and yes, they get bugs too, but there's less scenarios of it happening. There is, and even the ones that do get tend to be smaller because you only released a portion of the code base. You did not overwrite everything because it's a six, nine month long project. So you're dealing with a more isolated problem, which means less business impact and less customers affected. The severity is lower. However, in this model, since it's a longer drawn out plan and you're changing more, when something's wrong, you got to hot patch the whole thing, right? And then everyone's upset and you spend more time trying to patch someone's loyalty when they're ticked off with you and you're saying, well, good thing we only release every six months because he'll forget about it by the time we have our next one. Versus the ads are like, we really disappointed our customer in the last sprint. Let's really take care of him in this sprint and demo to him that we really care in two weeks. And let's fix our problem. Our problem is us. Okay, so that's the main difference between the plan-based models. And then I'll pause after this next slide again. Another way to look at it is since we know the time, you can start doing some equations to say, well, seven team members with an average salary is 40 bucks an hour. In two weeks, we have 10 working days, which means 80 hours is how like Accenture or TCS or one of those managed service providers would bill us. So seven team members times 80 hours equals 560 hours times $40 an hour is $22,400 in labor to do nothing. What's worse is if we build the wrong thing because then I have to pay him another $22,000 to fix it and maybe another $22,000 to fix it again. But if product owner, you just don't schedule that user story because it's not ready and you have us work on things that are ready, we're using our labor cost properly. So before we start, I want to know, is this problem in production worth $22,400? Is this customer gonna pay us $22,400 for this emergency fix? Or is this just some sales guy telling you that it sounds good? Because I have real numbers here for you that don't change very often. So I know exactly how much my sprint is worth to you. Okay, so Agile is not like chaos. I mean, on some teams it is because they're not applying the principles properly. But in the end, you have a lot of control over your cost. You have a lot of control over the consistent pattern that's developing. Um, you're impacting the business in smaller doses, which allows them to change their business processes in a more uh, fluid manner. Um, you have a way for the teams to grow career-wise and with your customer base. And then lo and behold, when we come back to Product Management 101, in the end, we need money for the company or we don't survive. We are now getting customers who stick around longer, get value hopefully earlier, are more importantly marketing our products for us so we don't even have to use all our marketing money anymore. We don't have to buy coffee cups. What good's a coffee cup when I have a customer telling someone else that we're awesome? That's better than a coffee cup. So all these pieces together are why we do Agile in the right manner. So I'll pause there. Any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to put them in chat. So basically in an hour, you covered about four hours of stuff. So if your brain's about to explode, that's why. <laughs> Mine is trying to catch up. It's buffering. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So we went over the why portion. So literally on this class, I spend the first day or day or almost an entire day on the why. Is if people understand the why, now when we get into the how and coaching people understand the procedures and all that stuff, it makes more sense. Like, yeah, I really want to pay attention to X, Y, Z because if I screw this up, I know that I'm going to screw this up with the customer, which means this to the market, to my product manager, to my business. Where before you might have said, well, the sprint, we carried the story from one sprint to another. You know, no one's really mad at us, and that's it. Well, there's a bigger picture than that. And so that's what I'm trying to employ across all of you. Um, one video I make all my new Scrum Masters watch is Moneyball. So if, you have a, if you're a new Scrum Master or have a new Scrum Master, I suggest you go buy them a DVD and say, go watch it. And then when they come and say, I watched it last time, it was really good. You say, go watch it again. 
And then eventually they'll pick up on a lot of the excerpts out of there. And it was about changing the way teams work. So that's a good video. Um, all right. So we're going to get into the know your agile terms. Don't fall asleep. It is an eye chart. The term you never want people to get away with is backlog. If someone says you says, well, it's in the backlog, you, you hold them by their arms and say, which one? Because a lot of people just say backlog. It's in the backlog. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I'm going to worry about it. I don't know which one you're talking about. If they say product backlog, this is the dumping ground of ideas. If they say it's in the product backlog, it just means you're like anybody else that's just making some random request and who knows when it'll happen. If they say release backlog, it's targeted to go to prod at some point. The question is what sprint or what flow, if you're a Kanban team, um, would eventually uh, fall on. And then if you're in the iteration sprint backlog from a scrum perspective, what that means is it is scheduled. You can exactly see what cycle it's going to appear in and it's moving forward. So backlog is very, um, it's very loaded when it comes to terms. So if you're use, working with a vendor like Accenture, Amdocs or somebody and they say it's in the backlog, you, you stop the meeting right there and say, you better tell me which one. If they say, what do you mean which one? Say, okay, we got a bigger problem on our hands. Because if you're telling me that you just have one backlog and you don't think about releases and you don't think about sprints, but you just told me on the previous phone call that you're all scrum based, we got a problem. Because that's like 101 when it comes to planning, which backlog. Incremental and iterative, we're gonna go over that in a cute little picture here in a minute. Task, user story velocity and stuff like that we're gonna be covering as well. Incremental and iterative. Now you could, Ask someone if they like to drink coffee or if they like to drink wine. Normally someone likes to be caffeinated or they like to be, uh, you know, wind up. So one of the two normally works for the conversation. Here's an example of a coffee tester. The coffee in the center at the very bottom of that cup is what they're thinking of marketing. And maybe those are the beans next to it that they said, this is the, this is the new batch of beans. We're trying to figure out those cool marketing names for this. And we really don't know. So what are we going to do? We're gonna take all these, all these coffees that we already have in the marketplace right now and we're gonna line them all up. We're gonna line up their grounds. We're gonna line them up as if they've already been brewed. And this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a, we're gonna sniff the primary cup. And then we're gonna sniff all these back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to figure out which aroma is closest. Then we're going to take a sip out of the first cup, and then we're going to sip out of this cup, and then we're going to sip out of the first cup again, and then we're going to sip out of this one cup way in the back, and then we're going to sip out of the first cup. And what I'm trying to get on my palate is to understand which one is it closest to and in what way. Is it acidic like that one, but it has a smell of chocolate like that one? And you're slowly, slowly, slowly bringing the coffee down in the cup to nothing. That's called incremental delivery. You're incrementally delivering value. I identified it has earthly tones. Ah, I, I just realized it has a pH level of such and such. That's delivery, that's incremental. But the iterative part about it is the sniffing, the sipping, the repetitive action behind the incremental value delivery. So every time I'm sniffing, I'm iterative, doing it over and over and over again. Sniff, 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 sip, sip, sip. That's like, that's why iterative is about the sprint itself. You have two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. It is repetitive, it is constant. The incremental value is about the release itself. And that may or may not follow your iterative pattern of the sprint. You could release every day as sprints come off the assembly line. You could release every two weeks to follow the sprint. You could release once a month because we just don't want to interrupt the business. Or you could say, I just don't really get Agile yet, and we're going to release every six months. Okay, fine. But that's the difference between incremental and iterative if you are on a test. Another way of looking at things is this is how the business looks at things. Fruit salad, love it. Everything in it, love it. This is how a development team sees it. That's how a product owner should see it when it comes to role definition. And this is how a product manager or a sales engineer would see it. Okay. Which fruit would you cut last if you're making fruit salad? Just think about that for a second. There's a couple of fruits there that you would have to consider, like which one do I cut 
first? Which one do I cut last? Think of the apples and the bananas. Why wouldn't you cut them first? They oxidize. So here's a question for the technical folks. Team, how does our product oxidize in production? What do you mean oxidize? Well, if I cut a piece of fruit, it oxidizes by just sitting there because oxygen is attacking it. That's why it gets that nasty brown rusty color. That's why apple juice doesn't look like this white color. It looks brown in the jar because it's been oxidized. So tell me, how does our product oxidize in, in prod? What do you mean? Do customers use it? Yeah. So every time they use it, do they add data to it? Yeah. That's called oxidizing. It's aging. Time is aging our product. The fact that it's used, even just normally, oxidizes our product. So when it comes to delivering a feature set, you are ordering things in delivery based on a number of things. Does it oxidize in prod? Number two, do we have any nut allergies? Well, I don't see it in the requirements. I'm assuming they're okay. That's a, that's a crazy assumption to make. I don't want to kill anybody today. So how about you go check on that before we shut down someone's business because we gave them the wrong product? Okay, lactose intolerance, wheat perhaps. There's so many things when you break down a feature, whether it's fruit salad or a product line or a service, that you're providing in an agile fashion, that when you break it down, you start seeing things differently. When all together, you see value and revenue, but then when you're allowed to break it down and say, before I execute delivery pattern, check on my customer. Is this who they are? Is this who you want to sell it to? That'll determine how I deliver. Um, here's some agile terms <clears throat> that you'll hear from people. 100% code coverage always makes me giggle. If you built something idiot-proof, the world will make a better idiot. Okay, so you're never 100% code coverage anyway. That's a fallacy. Dev and QA managers tend to get nervous. Uh, and this is from the movie uh, Lean on Me. Joe Clark says, tear down those cages in the cafeteria. If you treat them like animals, that's exactly how, you will be, how they will behave. So when you start bringing teams together, like Dev and QA, instead of being separate, or business analysts from the teams suddenly becoming product owners or something of that nature, or portfolio uh, project managers turn to scrum masters and now they're on the team. People start getting nervous about their careers, naturally, right? They've been in this career, they're uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable because of the unknown. I mean, if they knew their job was ending, they'd actually be more comfortable than the fact that they just don't know, okay? So how do we work with them? We say, first off, dev and QA managers, if we bring Two people that are two types of mentality together. What do you think that turns you into? Well, that means I'm fired. Well, that's only if you choose not to work with this. Well, what do you mean? Can you become a people manager? Can you become a team manager? Well, I've never been in QA. Well, how do you think the QA manager feels right now down the hallway? He's never been a dev manager before. So he's having the same question of if we decide instead of you having your QA team versus their development team, and we say, no, we're going to cut it in half. Half of the dev move over here, half of the QA move over there, and there's still two teams. Who said we're firing you? You're only going to get fired if you choose not to be that team manager. So that means the QA manager needs to probably ask you for advice on how to work with developers. And you need to go to the QA manager and say, I've always worked with the concept delivery guys. I've never worked with the people who actually break the stuff. So coach me too. That's the difference. So a lot of these things change in Agile. Uh, metrics, I've seen this before. I had a bunch of developers who were never wanting to refactor and were always focused on deliver, deliver, deliver because they were bonus in how many lines of code they had. When I found that out, I'm like, what the heck are you doing? Well, you know, we really just want to push code out. And I looked at them and I'm like, have you ever written code before? No, I just, I just want to make sure they deliver. Okay, so I have somebody who's never been in code before dictating a policy around someone's pay rate dedicated to something that encourages the system to be slower. More code means more space, which means the system reads more lines. There's this thing called refactoring, that it removes code because we're allowed to reuse objects or reduce the size of the code base, but it still has the same functionality. 
But what your metric, your bonus says, don't do that because I won't pay you for that. And the same would be true with um, a bug team. If you said, you get paid based on how many bugs you have, and there are companies out there that do this. They're called crowdfunded bug finders. And a lot of people sign up for part-time work for this and you get paid based on how many bugs you have. Well, if we have a UI, what's the fastest way to find bugs? Line up a bunch of different monitors on a table and just stare at the pixels. Because guaranteed, one of the resolutions won't work. Right, that's the problem with browsers and the problem with pixels is that it's really hard sometimes to like make things work. So let's just do that. Does that mean it's valuable? Well, why didn't you find these bugs around like the date and stuff? Well, that's hard to find, man. Why, why would I do that if I'm getting paid based on my bugs? I'm just gonna go look at the pixels. That's my pay. So we have to look at how we incentivize our team. It is not about being siloed. It is not about unvaluable things. Um, it is not about authority. It is about producing something, not just for output, but a, in the end for outcome, business outcome happy customers showing up at our demo and saying, not only does your product work, I feel comfortable with it. That's what we're after. Okay. So this was not part of the plan. Okay, and in this movie, she was considered the architect and she guides the team through this maze. So that is your scrum master. The maze of process, the maze of culture, the maze of people. So in the Scrum Guide, it actually says service to the product owner, service to the organization, service to the delivery team. And if you go to the CSM course, you're going to spend a majority of the class on service to the delivery team. Why? Because service to the product owner means you need to be in a product management class. Service to the organization means you need to understand business people. So sometimes program managers have a little leg up here because they're used to doing funding and stuff of that nature, but they also have a leg down because they're used to doing funding and stuff with executives. So service to the organization is about getting people to change their behaviors and their cultures to accept this idea of agile and fall in line with this principle. It is not about trying to get more funding. Okay, so that's the difference between the typical program manager mentality, perhaps project manager, and moving into a scrum master is about, you're about behaviors. And if I were to look at this chart in the back, not the eye chart that says agile roadmaps, if you can read this, you don't need glasses. That was based on the movie Spaceballs. But the actual heart diagram. Some people would say that looks healthy. To me, that looks like a dang heart attack. Because if I were a sprint team that delivered, didn't deliver, delivered, didn't deliver, up and down, up and down, it looks like they're in chaos. So that type of chart would mean one thing for a business person, another thing for a scrum master is like the only consistency we have is inconsistency. That's a problem. Because every two weeks we show our customer we're inconsistent. That's really bad. So they look at things differently. Uh, difference between a scrum master and an agile coach. So there's your agile coach and there's your scrum master. Okay, so the difference is strategic versus tactical if they're both in the same company at the same time. And then there's that high performance tree I was talking about in the background from agile coaching book. They're focused on the orchard of trees which represent the teams versus this person directly triaging a team looking at problems versus symptoms on the direct team itself. That's the difference. Um, these slides are based on the Scrum Guide from a couple of years ago, so some of the terms have changed. So I haven't updated the slides in just a little bit, so I apologize for that. But in the end, you're responsible if you're a Scrum Master for ensuring Scrum is understood and enacted if you're truly using Scrum as the Agile framework, okay? This is not about you ensuring the product is the right product. You may be focused on speed because you want an efficient process you want a process that's highly collaborative, highly visible. So yes, you're interested in probably speed because you're looking at in-out, in-out metrics. But you are a servant leader to the team. Again, you have three roles, service to the product owner, service to the dysfunctional team, and service to the organization. Okay, here's your angry Microsoft. Here's how Apple treats their employees with you know, they have cameras all over the place because they don't want you to take the iPhone 76 into a bar and leave it there and be in the news, right? Amazon's about selling, Google's about buying. So the Scrum Master going from one of these organizations to another, you have to approach them differently. It's not like, well, two weeks is two weeks, everybody. 
their behaviors and their values are different from organization to organization. And in Microsoft, probably division by division, right? So how a Scrum Master works through this is normally the hardest job that they have because they don't have a lot of experience in human behavioral trend thinking and um, changing behavioral sets across an organization. They may good, be good at getting funding from a business source, but that's not about behavior. Okay, so this part is really difficult for Scrum Masters typically. And then you have your dysfunctional family that you have to worry about and work with them. Notice removing impediments is only one piece of three slides. So if that's the first thing you see on a job description, I would challenge that in the interview. Well, it's all about removing impediments. Do you really have that many impediments that I'm spending all my time at a team layer removing impediments? What's wrong? That sounds like a symptom to me. What's the real problem you have going on in your organization? Okay. The majority of your time should be coaching, teaching, coaching, leading, clearly communicating, teaching, understanding, understanding, leading, helping, causing. Sorry, removing impediments is only one line. Then we get into an idea can rewrite all the rules. That is why I have to steal it. So who's the stealer? There's your product owner, the Gordon Ramsay wannabe from Kitchen Nightmares. He wants to steal the idea of value from the customer and apply it to his menu of products or features. So the Gordon Ramsay wannabe, hopefully not dropping the F-bomb too often, but he has maybe multiple teams, multiple products. He does a lot of story slicing. It took me a long time to figure out how to like move the words around like that. So. Just so you know, I spent a lot of time for you guys. Way in the past, I didn't know you were coming, but here you are. So here's your Gordon Ramsay wannabe, deciding what team's working on what. If you were to say he's kind of an expediter of the kitchen, he's calling out to all the line chefs, in what order do we want delivery in? So a lot of times, this is the role that actually is the hardest to find. And I'm having that trouble at my current company right now, we're working through that. But I've found this to be the same it, in most companies I worked at. The product owner role, people focus on the word owner and they're all about the authority, but then they're not about the actual role itself. They cling on to this idea that if I own that title, that means I'm in charge of everything. It's a tactical type of owner, the tactical person. Just like there is a captain to a cruise liner who helps determine the port of call. And that's like your product manager saying, we're on this cruise, we're gonna show up at San Jose, we're gonna you know, go to this port, go to that port, go to this port. But when you get close to the ports, he doesn't actually run the ship. He looks at his navigator and says, you know the channel three-dimensionally. You know all the sonograms, you know the floor bed, you know everything. I already determined the port of call. I'm gonna go back to my stateroom. You get the ship down this channel. Let me know if you have any issues. Hopefully we don't sink, have a good day. And the navigator takes over. He's telling the different department heads, hey, turn on the thrusters, 50% in a 20 degree down angle. You over there, you know, it's move the rudder this degree. He's going through all those patterns, moving the ship down the channel, avoiding the reefs. It didn't change the idea that the captain said, you're going to that port. Let me know when you get there. That's called a product manager. He's looked at the market of customers that have bought tickets. He's looked at the available delivery windows called the ports and said, I want to be at that port at that time. Then the product owner shows up and says, I'm the navigator for this team or teams or departments that will deliver that product or service for you called get to the port on time. Now that I know where you want to go, leave it to me. So that's the difference between product owner project, uh, product manager is that main difference. The owner does not mean captain. The owner means, in essence, navigator. Okay? So they're responsible. If they hit the reef, they're responsible for making that decision. Okay? So that's what the difference is. So when it comes to who is responsible, like who do I put in that role, this is the, one of the hardest roles around is the product owner themselves because they are the glue when it comes to product, value, and delivery. The Scrum Master ensures the rules are followed, the culture is changing, people are bettering their behaviors, but they do not determine if the button is red or blue on that screen. They don't determine if you're changing the button in this sprint or two sprints down the road because it's not as valuable to do it now. 
That is not their decision to make. They're not concerned about that. What they are concerned about is once you set the schedule product owner, the team abides by it. So sometimes you're trying to figure out who to put in that role. If I use a marketer, oh great, they're gonna have a lot of information from the customers, but they might not know the technical. If I use somebody who's a project manager, they might have a lot of skill set in scheduling, but does that mean they're product savvy? Does that mean that they are technical savvy? Maybe, maybe not. And if I pick a business analyst or a developer and move them up into product owner role, they might really be bad at scheduling because scheduling is not just about technical, it's about when is the opportune time from the business to deliver something. There's always a window of opportune time for revenue generation or least amount of risk to a business because we're not changing all these department heads or some organization structure that's going on. A product owner who's focused on the market would know when those changes are occurring, but someone in the technical may not know that. So that's why the product owner, it's really hard to find the exact right glue, but it is a glue. It's like an epoxy glue. I need a mixture of this agent, change agent, I need a mixture of this hardening agent over here, and when I stir them together with a couple Q-tips, I can spread it on my boat and I can fix the patch on my boat. But if I only have one of the agents called market savvy or technical savvy, it's not going to cause the glue, the epoxy, to actually hold. All right, so the product owner typically is a sole person. The worst thing you can have is a committee deciding if a button should be red. The product owner remains accountable. So sometimes I have seen product owners bonus on not necessarily revenue generation, but customer perhaps retention or a blend of customer retention, customer satisfaction, uh, revenue generation, and delivery consistency. That would be a nice blended approach of a bonus structure versus a product manager is probably dedicated some of their bonus direct to revenue generation because they work directly with sales they're determining what's the right market problem to solve. So they're more inclined in their bonuses around there versus the product owners focused around the delivery pattern itself. If you have both of them in the same organization, another way to look at it is a product owner is tactically available for the majority of their time to the team, but they're strategically engrossed with customer feedback, whether they occasionally fly on a plane or they're on a couple of conference calls with customers that are like real customers, not just the sales guys who are trying to sell everything. The product manager, though, is the reverse. He's interested enough about what's coming out to make some determinations, but um, he's focused on the market strategy, and he knows enough about the noise to say, is that the strategy and customers I want? Uh, a way to determine that would say, you know, T-Mobile was in the news, what, a couple of years back, about how they dumped 10% of their customers. Well, why did they make that decision strategically? Because tactically on a daily basis, they knew that those 10% of the customers were calling their call centers more than any other customer in their base. So they were using up the majority of their call center labor when it should have been spread more equally. So they said, I don't want those customers. They actually cost me more money than they actually give me. So strategically, we're going to eventually cut them off and we're going to focus forward on this new customer base. That's how a product manager would see things. A product owner says, who are you cutting out of the system? How many is it? Okay, so does that mean I don't have to worry about the scale of system that you told me six months ago? Oh, I still have to worry about because you're trying to get new customers from AT&T and Verizon to jump ship. Okay, I'll continue forward in building the product for you. Something that's sometimes helpful is a persona wall. I've seen this in a couple of companies where you take a movie that most people know and you write down what their personalities are on the wall and say, okay, so Han Solo and Chewie, they have this personality set together. Leia Cinnamon Buns has this personality. She tends to get loyalty quite often in most of the uh, meetings that I have when I go over this. Jar Jar Banks is always humorous. Sometimes that's your IT department, but sometimes Darth Vader is the IT department. Um, depends on what company you're in, but those are typically the personas that people attach to IT for some reason. And then sometimes you're, here's like your data scientist, you know, they're really good with data, but they're really bad at communicating or something of that nature, even though he's supposed to be a communication droid, right? So you write out all these different personalities and then you start assigning, uh, you have one column for internal customers and another column for external customers. And what you're looking for is from an external point of view, who's Darth Vader? Is that our competitor? Is that a certain customer that always just beats the hell out of us? Or from an internal 
perspective is, you know, Darth Vader IT, is Darth Vader the legal department, is Darth Vader, you know, uh, portfolio management because it really come down on us. But you're trying to understand personas. So when you bring a story to a team and say, as Darth Vader, internal Darth Vader, I want security to have such and such, you know, feature sets to it so that I can do a full audit. And they say, who the heck is Darth Vader? And they open it up and they say, oh, legal. Oh, this is in case we're getting sued. Okay. Um, it's not just an IT thing. If it was IT, it'd be Jar Jar Binks because for some reason they don't always know what they're doing. But no, you said Darth Vader. So when I go to test this, you're really concerned from an audit perspective more than you are actually from a security IT perspective. Got it. Okay, I'm going to test a little bit for So that's what a persona was for. It's to help the team, which is actually the next slide, of all these different personalities understand who the heck they're building for. And perhaps, just perhaps, they might build it differently. Watch out for the ninja on a team. They always go poof when you need them. You know, they don't show up to a meeting. Um, they're not there for half the sprint, but miraculously they come out at the very end and assassinate the story, and they always win. So just be careful about if you have a couple ninjas on your team. All right, so let me pause here before we dig into some more stuff here. Uh, we have half hour left. We're getting close to surprisingly make pretty good product owners. Why? Because they break down a product based on the customer. They tend to ask those questions, like who's this for? Is it for legal? Is it for IT? Um, how do they use the system? So they're very interested, not from a developer, just is it the right thing to build? Or more importantly, is it the right way to build it? Is actually what developers focus on. They focus on the right way. Product owners need to focus on is it the right thing in the first place? And then the Scrum Masters back everybody up by saying, are we building it fast enough so we get those feedback loops? So the product owner in here, let me give a, there's a great, great video here that I'm just going to bring up so you guys can see it and then you can watch it. I just sent it out to everyone in my division at my company. I'm actually using it as a, all the Scrum Masters have to, um, hey, you get to see everything that I've been looking at lately. Um, Let's see here, the uh, Agile product ownership. And there it is, because I looked it up lately. This one right here, this video is 15 minutes long. I highly stress all of you watch it. Oh, um, so Michael, we, we, all we, only see, we only see your presentation because you're sharing the application. Oh. oh, okay, okay, hold on one second. I'm moving over here. here oh, here we see, we see it. Mm -hmm. So I suggest you all write that down. It has 1.5 million views on it. So there's a good chance someone that you talk to has probably seen it. It's 15 or almost 16 minutes long. Um, the most important section for leaders is actually the last three minutes because they talk about what about multiple teams. Mm. So they literally, um, let me pause it here. And he starts off with the PO itself. And he literally builds everything around it. So it doesn't directly answer like who you select to put in that role, but you start seeing like how this piece straps on that piece, how that straps on this piece. And the whole time the product owner is in charge of all this. So mm -hmm. you're starting to see, Oh wow, that's where the scheduling kicks in. Oh, that's where he's talking customer negotiation. That's where he's talking release patterns. That's where he's talking uh, metrics, you know, and this is how he says no versus yes. Like mm -hmm. I'm starting to get an idea of the skill set I'm looking for and knowing I'm going to not find perfection. I am going to find that blend. Um, but I do pick on QA engineers partly because I was a QA engineer and I became a product owner at one point. So it was, it was a natural progression for me because I was always asking those questions like, you know, who is, um, who's this customer? Who is it? And occasionally um, I would, I was told back at that time when I was first learning agile, it was stressed that the QA engineer did a lot of the demos. And the reason is not because they built it, but because they can tell people how they tested it and more importantly, how they did not test it mm. as they did the demo, right? So they would say, here's the, we got it, you know, deployed to QA and this is what the problems were just from the deployment itself. So operations teams, if you're watching the demo, you got to watch out for this. And then product owner, when I went through your feature and that's cool, your acceptance criteria was chronological. That is phenomenal. And by the way, that's a, that's a good tip for product owners. Acceptance criteria should be chronological. So that literally you open up the user story and say, start at step one. And then the QA engineer is like, well, that would have been nice, but unfortunately step two is actually step one. That's a big problem and you didn't even understand how it worked. So let's figure that out. So the, the QA engineer is going through the flow 
and saying, by the way, when I got to this point, you told me in the acceptance criteria to support 100 customers. I actually tested it for 1,000. And we have a lot better metrics than you thought we did. So kudos to the dev guys. Great job, guys. You know, and like the team's getting built up. But the product owner is like, wow, that's actually better, you know, metrics. And I can go back to my product manager, the captain of the ship, and say, we're actually going to get to the port of call faster than we thought when it came to scale. So that's why product uh, QA engineers tend to be pretty good product owners. Uh, in general, I know that's a stereotype because there's some pretty bad QA engineers out there. But they understand scheduling because they have to do um, test cases. Right. They have to know when to load the data, when not to load the data. And then they ask the questions like, you said this is a number field. Is it a number field or currency? Mm. Oh, it's cur oh, it's currency. So why the heck is this table open to everybody? <laughs> like they ask those big questions like, I could test it, but let's pause before I even bother testing it. What the heck are you doing? That's a security nightmare. You know, and they ask those questions. So then they naturally go on that. If you can't find good QA engineers to move into product owners, you do kind of have to make the decision, do I grab a marketing fluffy guy and then hopefully he can be trained in the technical or do I grab a technical guy and say, remove your hat because when you are scheduling stories, you're going to be inclined to tell them how to do it. Exactly. I need you to say, I have a problem. You tell me the three implementation methods and the pros and cons to both. And I make a business call, not a technical call. Mm. So they tell me that problem. And then project managers are typically a decent blend. But you have to take off the hat of getting funding. You have to take off the hat of you're in charge of everybody, uh -huh. uh, the critical pathways. Critical pathways are good, but you're focused on – your critical pathway can change every two weeks. Mm. So you're more about the sprint. So that's why I use the term Moscow rating, must have, should have, could have. So you have a release based on must have, should have, could have, and you say in this release, here's a must. So those musts are probably going to go into sprints, whether that's one or two sprints or three sprints. And you say, okay, so every one of these sprints has must-have criteria from the release. Great. So in the first sprint, out of the 20 stories I added, these are the five musts. And then here's like the 10 to 12 shoulds and the rest are coulds. And the team's like, why'd you do it that way? Think of a horse gate when you're at the Kentucky Derby. All the horses come out in the same direction. That's your musts. You're telling the which direction the horses should ride. And then the team, if you think of a beehive, they swarm on those stories and say, we need to get something to QA. We need to get something to QA. And then when we do that, we can dissipate and move out to the majority of the stories, which are the shoulds. And then if we run into trouble, the product owner has educated the product manager at the start of the sprint to say, I align the sprint must, should, could. So product manager, when you're talking to your customers and you hear that I'm in trouble, which stories do you think I'm pulling out? The coulds. Mm -hmm. Right. And so those coulds become shoulds in the next sprint. And if we still don't make it, the shoulds become musts in the next sprint. So you do have a line of thinking to say the release will be met, but this is how I angle. So project managers are good at that mm. because they're used to critical pathways, but they do have, you know, if they're really strong there, they might be just mediocre and maybe technical or mediocre in business and they have to make up for those gaps. Right. That's helpful. So, so in the Scrum Guide, it was said that the, the product owner is solely responsible. Is it, is, do you see that in practice being, tr being true, that the product owner has the sole responsibility and clout to dictate the backlog, product backlog um, order and prioritization? In new, brand new teams, I can see that happening in existing organizations. Um, put it this way, it's taken me over a year and a half to prove that point. Mm. Because they said, oh, um, we're not going to fund a product owner. We're going to divvy out the roles. Oh, I love that. The technical <laughs> owner is going to write the stories for the customers they don't know. The scheduling is going to happen by a product manager who doesn't even know the names of the delivery team. And then the Scrum Master, you just hold it together and write some metrics. <laughs> right? And that's typically what happens in practice is because the role is so misunderstood. Um, when you look up training, there's training dedicated to Scrum Masters. They have so many certs available to Scrum Masters, it's crazy. That's true. They have tons of certs available to project managers. Dev guys have coding classes and stuff. And then you see this product owner, and you're like, all right, how many classes does he have? He has the CSPO, and then he has Pragmatic Marketing, which isn't an agile company. He has the 280 Group, which isn't an agile company. And they're like, okay, so we're going to have the least trained guy in charge of everything. That's good. <laughs> So 
custom classes around product ownership you have to normally invest in and they get lost. But then when, if you guys watch that video that I just told you about, you're going to realize like why it's so critical that that is like the cornerstone. The scrum master and product owner are the cornerstones. If you decide to scale, you have to make sure the foundation of the building is intact. But a lot of people don't put that cornerstone in. They say, scrum master, you got this. We're going to divvy out the roles of the product owner. And you're like, what the hell just happened? And then the metrics just keep collapsing. Thank you for answering that, uh, Michael. That's very helpful. For, for these um, folks like uh, Fabian, I'm not sure how you practice uh, Agile in your firm or if you do. The folks at Biotech, um, Paul, if you want to speak to any Agile um, behaviors you've seen and ask questions, Justin, everyone else from Biotech, feel free to, to jump in here. But for me, you know, I, I found this session to be very helpful in giving me the right mindset. You know, even though I've been for um, for Scrum and, and Agile training, this is extremely um, eye-opening and it grounds you back to, to the reality of what it's all about. So, um, Paul, I don't know if you, you want to come on. I'm going to unmute you. You're one of my um, bosses anyway, one of my champs from previous. So I'm going to unmute you, Paul. Uh, warning. <laughs> So here we go. Paul, are you there? Hey, Phil. Hey, Paul. Sorry to put you on the spot, but yeah, you're you're one of my bosses. That's right. So, so unfortunately, I'm in an environment with a lot of background noise. They got the uh, the landscape crew outside mowing the lawn right now, so I don't know. <laughs> no, that, that's fine. That's background. fine. I just wanted you to speak really quickly, Paul, to. Any agile behaviors or not that you've seen uh, within your firm? Have you seen agile practiced on any level at all that um, you can ask questions or that Michael can speak to for clarity? So I have seen some. I have seen some, uh, but a lot of it is so inconsistent because I see different pockets. For instance, at my current client site, there are certain departments trying to implement either Kanban or agile or some other things, but it's a isolated group within the mm. larger community, which the large community does not understand what the, what those practices are. And I think they spend so much time in conflict that they really don't, they say they try to do implement some of those processes, but they can't because they, I, I guess the, the organization is not set up for that and does not support it. So I think they found themselves mm. kind of putting in it to the side because as it was said earlier, it takes so many different roles with the project manager, the analyst, the team to all be on the same page of that. Um, but my current client is working on trying to do a little bit of what was talked about today, but um, the big, the big issue is what was said a moment ago by Michael was we get a lot of people, we need to get this done, but then there's not a lot of, well, how do we get it done? Who is going to be responsible? And the uh, thing you said a moment ago about the either the product owner or the system owner, uh, very true on my current project that right now the project team on my project is almost telling sometimes the system owner what they want. And we're not getting a lot of feedback because the person who will be on paper, the system owner, they're like, just give me the system working. I don't want to make those decisions. You guys are the ones who have done projects like this. What should I be asking for? And so it's a little disconnect. The project team is telling themselves what the system owner, uh, what does the system owner want? And sometimes there's some disconnect there. Mm. Yep. Another problem is, um, so the picture I put up here, because you mentioned Kanban, is that the role mm -hmm. itself, especially the, the product owner, changes behaviors based on which um, Agile framework you're using. If you're an offensive-based Kanban, and that's all you are, your true Kanban, perhaps with some lean development in it, you need to be a very, very, very disciplined uh, product owner because you're giving up some of the rules of process that Scrum comes with. Because Scrum is closer, I would say, closer to waterfall because you have designated gates. And yes, there, it's in miniature. Um, the feedback loop is there, which makes it agile. The responsiveness, the small stories making it agile. The culture is there. So I'm not saying that Scrum is waterfall. I'm just saying it's easier sometimes for waterfall people to identify to because they're, they see gates. They see some form of 
uh, control versus the compound flow is just like a hose. You know, the terminology I use for scrum is if you're, you have a big pool in the backyard and you're trying to figure out how to fill it up. That's like someone like a business person saying, when are you going to give me this feature group? Not just features, this feature group, buddy, because that's the way we used to work. Six months out, you give me this feature group. And you're like, but I got sprints, I got releases. It doesn't change the fact that the business wants dates. They just want to know, oh, so you're going to give me multiple dates. Okay, well, give them to me all perfectly, because that always works, right? You, in the scrum mentality, it's like filling up a Home Depot bucket, because you know within a sprint, I have so many people with so many hours, so many points, so many calendar days. So regardless how you plan, whether it's by points, hours, or calendar days, you're still filling up a bucket, right? And you fill up the bucket as high as you can because everyone wants everyone at 100% because that always works out well too, right? 100%, nothing will happen. So you fill up this bucket full of water, five gallons, which means it's really heavy. And then you're going to walk across this unlevel terrain called your backyard. It's not flat. It's up and down. You've been meaning to re-landscape for a long time. So the bucket is swaying back and forth, spilling water. Sounds like someone was scheduled at 100% and they got distracted. That sounds normal, right? Then you take this bucket and you pour the water into the pool and you realize, oh my goodness, that's all that it filled the pool and I got to do this how many times? Oh, boy, this will be fun. So you spend hours and hours walking across the backyard with a bucket. And then someone comes into your backyard called neighbor and he's holding a beer and he's like, huh, that's kind of funny. What are you doing? I'm filling up my pool. You know, dude, there's a better way to do this. What's that? And he just puts his beer down, grabs your hose takes it to the pool, drops it in there, and comes back and turns the spigot on and says, I can tell you when the pool fills based on how much water comes out because the hose is consistent. And then you look at your neighbor and say, but John, you're a plumber. I'm not. I'm just a homeowner. Of course you know flow. I don't know flow. I just know five-gallon bucket holds five gallons. So a lot of people are concerned of moving from Scrum to Kanban and Kanban to Scrum because a lot of it's around scheduling. In Scrum, you commit, you deliver. So that means you can have somewhat of a quote-unquote lazy product owner, a, a ninja product owner, or somebody that's just not fully there. And the team will probably make up for some of that by committing because they do these plan-based events. Kanban is the hose is on or it's not. The hose is kinked or it's not. The hose is too long or too short, or it's not. There's no middle ground. So once you turn the hose on, you can measure. So is the hose too long? You have too many gates in the way. Did you know that a hose, when you double its size, you lose more than 50% of water flow rate? That's why you want the shortest hose possible to whatever you're filling, because there's less vibration in the hose. But scrum guys don't care about that. They say, fill up the bucket, get the bucket across the yard, fill, drop it in there, let us know if you spill any water, and we'll move on to the next sprint. So product owners, when you go back to your original question of who's the right person, sometimes you have to say, well, what flow are we using here? Well, we're agile. That doesn't answer the question. What agile framework are we using? Because that'll also help determine what type of product owner I want because maybe my more inexperienced ones will be a little better in Scrum because they have the team to help get them up to speed and make them better. However, if I put them in Kanban and they're deploying every single night in automated fashions and they have to make decisions every single day on what story to schedule and you don't know good scheduling tactics, you are the wrong guy to put in that role. But you might be okay in Scrum. So, that's why I wanted to throw that out there is because you mentioned Kanban and it's not that simple to just say, well, do you have this glue of skills? It's also about, is the glue going to be conducive to the material you're putting it on? Like plastic glue works on plastics. Other glues work on metals. And so scrum is a plastic. Kanban might be a metal in this analogy. And you're saying, listen, I understand your glue. You're just not going to be conducive to this material. So I need to put you on that material. And I saw, I think, a couple questions were coming in, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Here we go. That, that was just me um, asking oh. some of my champions who have been in other classes. So, Connor, I know Connor may have um, some perspectives or questions to share as well. Hey, Connor, feel free to jump in. Fabian, if you've got any questions or comments, 
uh, don't hesitate to put them in. But um, I was just wondering, you know, speaking of um, the hose and the bucket analogy, do you see like towards the, you know, the, the big day of, of the release or the end of the sprint, do you see teams still falling back into those behaviors from waterfall, trying to, trying to work abnormal hours to, to cram everything in? Do you see that happening a lot? Oh, yeah. I see it all the time. Um, I just found out from one of my scrum masters last night in an email that one of the dev managers is having a metrics review today. And I'm like, what metrics are they going over? Well, they're going over hours and stuff. And I'm like, scrum master, what's going on? You're not, are they trying to change the culture back? No, no, no. They just want to make sure they're billing, you know, they're, they're racking up as many hours as they can. I'm thinking like, all right, so what about the value of the product? Those are the metrics I'm interested in. Why are you going after the individual hours? I don't care how much hours you worked last night if you're not going to be on time anyway. Mm. Like, interesting, I don't like you working off hours, but if you worked off hours because you were trying to get something done and you get it done, great. Now let's work on why are we doing that? It, was that a one-time event? Okay. Or is this continual? Bad culture, let's fix it. But if you're not going to be on time anyway, I don't really care you worked eight hours last night. Interesting. Sorry to hear that, but we didn't reach our goal anyway. So what's the point? Um, so that's some of the differences. Um, the product owner argument is always ongoing. Um, we're starting to realize, I really had, it, our company actually changed the title from product owner to the technical owner. And I finally had a couple of directors tell me, and it, I told you it's been almost a year. And they came up to me and said, now I know why you didn't want us to use the term technical owner because all these developers are trying to be product owners and they don't know what the heck is going on. And I'm like, okay, now that you understand it, we have to pay for our sins and we have to undo it. And it's going to take a while to do it. Probably going to take a quarter or two to do it. So when you're thinking in product roadmap perspective, you're not going to number one, see the problem get cured if you're all on board on fixing it for a couple quarters, which means you're not going to get the realization of the benefits probably for the third quarter. And they're like, wow, that's a long time. And I said, well, look at it this way. Every quarter is three months. How many sprints are in a month? Two, maybe two and a half, depending on if it's a long month. Okay, so to change a product owner's behavior around story grooming, sizing, estimating, scheduling, I only have so many product planning meetings to see if it works. I can help them along the way without the team, but in the end, they have to make sure their product meeting works with the team. So I only have like two times I can do this a month-ish. So that's six times over the course of three months. Okay, probably not going to be very good at it, but maybe we're fixing things. So two quarters to fix the behaviors and get the meetings in line, then a quarter for the behaviors to settle into outcomes. So there you go. So I recommend the Scrum Masters if you're, you know, all potential being Scrum Masters, you have to think like a product owner does because your product is the team. Your product is the culture. So you need to have an agile roadmap just like a product manager has a product roadmap. So when he slaps the roadmap down in front of you and says, in Q1, we're doing this with the product, and you say, oh, that's nice. In Q1, we're doing this with the agile process. He's like, what do you mean? Well, if I do this, I'm going to speed you up in the third quarter. But if you don't give me the time to make those changes because you're flooding me with feature requests, you're not going to get that benefit. So now it's a business conversation. And most Scrum Masters don't do that either is they don't have agile roadmaps. So it's not just the product owner showing up and being the right person. Now you have to look at the Scrum Master and say, where's your roadmap? I didn't know we had to have roadmaps. I thought we were just about sprints and stories. No, no, no. You have a product called a team. So you're almost hiring two product owners, just one's dedicated to process and culture and one's dedicated to the actual tangible product or service. That's a really powerful analogy. I'd, I'd never thought of it like that. Absolutely. We had a question come in from Paul. Um, what do you do when your organization doesn't want to invest the time to fix or retrain their behavior? Well, what they're not noticing is that they do have the time because they're paying for it right now. There are, you have to help them understand, and it takes a while. So first off, patience, unfortunately, is going to be your number one um, asset. And empathy. You will see the symptoms at the team layer. 
Okay, so first get them to realize when they say, man, the team doesn't deliver, team doesn't deliver, say, that's an interesting symptom. Are we having that symptom someplace else? Well, yeah, this other team's doing this too. Okay, interesting symptom. Who else? Symptom, symptom, symptom. I am a doctor. I am about problems. If you're blowing your nose and coughing, I don't just hand you a Kleenex and say your cold has been cured. You have the time to blow your nose, but you didn't have the time to wash your hands. Okay, so let's focus on where do you think the problems are? If the fish are dying downriver, you probably don't just scoop out the fish. You go upriver and say, who's dumping the toxic waste? Because if I dump more fish in here, they're all going to die too. So you're using these different analogies to help people appreciate that, number one, you're listening to them and you hear them. It's like someone coming up to your cube and saying, I have a problem. No doubt you do, right? But is it a problem or is it a symptom? From your perspective, it's a problem, but I'm looking at holistically across the organization to see if it's actually a number of symptoms due to a problem. And they don't see that because they're stuck in their area. Um, then going through that piece of how do we invest the time? Well, you have the time to do hot fixes. Can you imagine if you didn't have to do hot fixes? We wouldn't have to, one, do multiple deployments, risk our entire code base. We wouldn't have to change our user guides. We wouldn't have to retrain customer service. The product owner wouldn't have to say sorry 500 times on the phone every day, and he could focus on what money you're giving me for new features. The solution guy is, you know, and you go through this yada yada of symptom, 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 because we had the time to shove it down the customer's throats, and it was the wrong product. So that means we had the time to do it a different way. We chose not to. We chose to spend the money elsewhere. So when it comes to like, um, and if they need dollars and cents, that's where like this slide up here, this one that you saw earlier, labor cost does come in handy. Um, the reason is most scrum masters and most product owners do not know how much their sprint costs. At my current company, I can't give you the actual number, obviously, but we spent over $150,000 in labor in one sprint across a normal sized agile team who works on big data. So I can't give you the actual number, but I'm trying to stress that it was very expensive. When I bring these numbers then to people, I say, this isn't me trying to squeeze every dollar out of people, but I'm trying to impress on you that you have the time to spend that money once, twice, three, four, five times before you get the feature right. Instead of, you know, instead of doing it that way, how about you write a spike to research the technology before you start building it? and then demo to the team what it is and then make the decision is it worth that 150,000 or 300,000 or 450,000 if we're wrong so the same is true then you're finding ways to first start with talking about why why are these behaviors the way they are why do you see them as symptoms not problems and then move out to the how of the process and then eventually come out to the what don't start from the what and come in because you always will end up stopping at the how because you lose people. If you come to them with facts and figures, we had this many bugs, we had this many stories, we had this, people don't care. But if you focus on the why, behaviors and motivations, they will start to listen. Uh, what else do we have here? Would you address the symptom in a group setting or the individual? If it's tactical, I tend to do it um, individual first. Like if I'm a scrum master on a team, I'll pull them aside and go over whatever symptom it is. Um, I tend to coach product owners on the side first before you do it in front of a team because remember, some people come from the background of authoritation, uh, authority, owner means authority, I'm in charge, right? And you have to be a little empathetic to that, even if it's right or wrong. When it comes to business though, and you're into the product manager realm, directors and people who do funding, I find group settings help a little better there because they have a lot of people underneath them and all their wings. And so when I present data to them, you have to one, make it very palatable. And again, that's why the why, how, what approach tends to work. Focus on symptoms, roll, and use the term roll up to behaviors. So you're almost like painting them a, uh, a report. Teams to products to programs to portfolio in their head they're seeing it and they're seeing the roll up of nature and you're not pointing the finger at anybody you're saying if you see this symptom happening and it rolls up to this this is actually what it becomes hey look at that at this level it's another symptom 
So this symptom actually caused the ones beneath it. Let's roll it up a little higher to what we're in control of as a senior leadership team. Okay, you guys made a decision to do this. The pros and cons were this. Yes, we got the pros. However, we also got these cons, and even the cons we didn't even realize. This is what it caused us to do. So the question is, do you still have the time to not retrain people, the time not to deploy properly, the time to do this, because it's hurting your customers, it's hurting how your VPs look at you, or do we have the time to solve the problem? And then when they normally say, oh, no, no, we have time to solve the problem, you say, do you really? Let me lay it out for you. And then you lay out your roadmap in front of them and show them this is not a, we retrain the product owners and in two weeks they're better. It's multi-quarter. That's when the results kick in. So if you delay your decision, you delay that rollout. Um, another good example is here, I'm gonna bring it up on the screen. Um, it is Domino Chain Reaction. This one right here, Domino Chain Reaction that has 3.4 million views on it. He actually has an article. The first Domino is five millimeters in height and one millimeter thick. When he pushes that over after 13 dominoes, the last domino weighs over 100 pounds. If you continued those dominoes in size, meaning he's increasing them all by one and a half times, if you did it to 29 dominoes, the last domino would be the size of the Empire State Building. And that's just science. So what it's showing is most people think dominoes of the first video here where everything's the same size. When it comes to organizational changes, organizational changes fail for two reasons. One, the domino that first drops is too heavy and squashes everybody. Number two, dominoes are occurring, but eventually you try to make it the next domino larger than two times the size of the one that's hitting it. When you do that, that domino will not fall. So that means we become impatient and we push too many things at once, maybe in concurrency or a serial pattern, whatever it is, whether you're doing things in parallel or not, at some point you put something too large in front of something, like we put a tool changing, like moving from Rally to Jira, Jira to version one or something, and we didn't lay that out. Or the process has changed, we threw this intake process out there or some governance and the chain reaction ends. And the problem with that though is to get the chain reaction to restart means you have to have the amount of gravitation necessary to move that. So how are you gonna get that now that everyone feels like they just got stalled? So hope that answers some of your questions, but um, sometimes the group setting is good more with business people because they start arguing about like, because it's a, a series of symptoms leading up to a roll up. But when you get more tactical work, it's more personal. Uh, think of why don't we want agile teams to be like three or four people because it gets personal. Well, man, if the dude who coded this would have just done it right, what do you mean? I'm the only developer on this team, you know, and it becomes really personal. So individual at the personal level, but more general as you get higher up the chain, because you're talking about holistic and patterns across multiple uh, levels. Mm. Very interesting. Thank you, Leon Seal, for that uh, question. We, we, we could probably go on and on with questions, Michael. So um, I know we're three minutes away. Does anyone else have any questions for Michael to answer? Or concerns? Because you know- They just know how long it takes me to answer the question. <laughs> well, I, I think my last question will be, how do you see agile teams working in reality compared to these fully planned driven teams. For example, a lot of companies that I've worked with, you see people coming in and bouncing around. Do you see more loyalty in agile teams, more commitment to stay for the long haul, or is it pretty much the same? When, when you uh, approach it properly, I see loyalty increasing. Just know that just like you have a demo meeting, every two weeks we remind the customer if we're, we're worth having a business with or not. Every day, your team does that in daily stand-up. So sometimes when I'm coaching at the tactical level, if I have to do something in front of the entire team, like a developer says I'm developing, I'll pause everybody and say, hold on guys, you just said you're developing. You're a developer. Congratulations. Thanks for showing up today. <laughs> right? How did 
that encourage your counterpart here, whether it's another developer or a BA or the product owner or a QA engineer, to be loyal to you? Mm. Does developing help them? They're like, well, what do you mean? What do you want me to say? Are you in the middle of working on the API? Are you in the middle of working on the UI? Are you having problems with data? Because you complain that the QA engineer asks too many questions. Well, he's asking questions because you just tell him you're developing. You just tell him you show up. But if you tell him that you're having problems with the organization structure and the API, guess what he's going to write more tests for and what he's not going to write tests about. He's going to spend more time on the organization area because you indicated that's a problem. Mm. But he's not going to spend a lot of time on the things you said were fine. So guess what? Less questions. So loyalty kicks in when you start adding those behaviors and the co coaching behind it. And then you do this, but you're, you're consistent in that pattern. So if a product owner shows up with an empty user story, you stop everybody and say, product owner, how does nothing in the user story or acceptance criteria that says make the website fast, make your team loyal to you? What the hell is fast? <laughs> is fast three seconds, is fast five milliseconds? You know, the developer is going to code it based on his approach, but he's not the one that uses your product. Sure. Yeah. Right? And so you just have to be consistent in that behavior, and then eventually the team becomes – you don't want them to be happy. You want them to be disciplined because discipline will make them confident, which brings happiness. Mm -hmm. If I wanted you just to be happy, I'd buy you donut. <laughs> Okay, Michael. Well, with that, I'm just going to hand it back to you for final closing comments and remarks. And everyone else who's been on the call, those of you PMPs looking for your PDUs, uh, Connor, Paul, um, those are going to be got a, gotten across to you. Margaret's on the call, so she's taking note of that, our learning admin. And um, anyone else that has any uh, comments, concerns, feel free to email them to us. Um, we'll get them back to Michael come with um, answers to your questions next time. But Michael, any closing remarks? Um, my closing remarks is you're more capable of doing things than you realize. So unfortunately, the one thing on the flip side of the coin is there is no one in a boat rowing to you. There's no life preserver coming at you. And a lot of times we as leaders like Scrum Masters and others, we have to understand there's nobody but you. So first off, don't wait for others to save you. But at the same time, on the flip side of the coin is you are more capable than you realize you are. So have hope because um, positivity will take you a long way. So that's all I got. Well, thank you all for joining me. Thank you, Michael. And we look forward to seeing you again in a few weeks. Bye, everyone. All right. See you. Cheers. Okay. All right, welcome everyone sure. to our meeting for today. We have our esteemed coach and colleague, Agile coach, who's gonna be taking us through the trajectory of Agile, helping us get into the nuts and bolts of what exactly it is. Some of you are thinking of taking the PMP exam, or you're thinking of taking the ACP exam, or you just wanna know a little bit more about Agile. Well, Michael is gonna get you on the right tracks. So without much ado, I'd like to welcome Michael to the microphone and um, take it away, Michael. Good morning, everybody. I think it's morning across America right now still. Um, yes, th thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm an Agile coach. I uh, have my own little side company, but I also work for uh, Comcast. Um, I'm an okay guy, go, though. So even though the customer service sometimes has issues, um, I'm an okay guy. You can still talk to me. Uh, we're going to be going through some stuff here. Um, can you all see my screen? Just want to make yes. sure you can see my screen. Yeah, okay, and I'm, a, I'm a looking to the side because I'm sharing my second monitor because it has better resolution. I mean, I'm not really trying to show you a profile of my face, like a mugshot or anything. So I apologize. I'm not always looking at the camera. Um, you can find pretty much a lot of trainers. Uh, the majority of trainers teach Agile as um, you know process, and they'll go through the artifacts and things of that nature. Uh, there's a handful of trainers out of every, you know, like 100 that take you down a different route. And yes, we do talk about the artifacts because they're necessary in the roles, but we try and take you down a different motivational route. And that's the route I tend to go down. Um, we're gonna get into some human behaviors, uh, the way we communicate with each other. And my goal behind that is if I can motivate people to approach um, the process or the tools or 
uh, you know, our people, then everything else just comes along for the ride. And it makes more sense when you're explaining the process to say, well, if we can focus on the behavior or focus on the motivational factor, then you understand why you would want to do the process and the metrics that may or may not be present would back up your, uh, your presentation. So on my screen here, uh, this is from a, a class that I had for um, a couple days back in 2013 with uh, the PMI in Denver. So this was sanctioned by the PMI. Um, I would assume you probably get PDU credits for this course that we're going through. So today I think it's two hours, so you get like two PDUs if you wanna claim those. And then if you show up to, I don't know, uh, for having, you know, the second session, that would be another two hours. So the question I ask at the beginning of the class of uh, what is the most resilient parasite? You know, and that gets people thinking because, you know, that's not a normal question to ask in an agile class. But what it is is um, it's an idea. And the reason I say that is not only do I love the movie Inception, which is what this is kind of based on, and actually the class was called Project Inception, so you might see some movie posters throughout the course material today. But the reason is if I told you to stop thinking about a pink elephant, you instantly are thinking about a pink elephant. And then if I say, well, forget I said that, then you're thinking about it again. And the more and more you think about it, you're reinforcing the idea in your head. And it gets harder and harder for you to let go of it. I mean, the worst thing to say to someone is when they're upset, be calm. And when you're trying to get them to forget something, forget we said that, right? And the reason is you're reinforcing whatever that behavioral pattern is of the moment. So if I were to say, I want you to forget that Agile is about process, but focus on a different idea, um, that would be that Agile is about loyalty. And these are the kind of comments that I use with product managers when I'm training them. A loyal customer should not be confused with a paying customer. And product managers know that right away. Uh, they understand that just because someone found your product to be the solution of the moment and they paid for it, doesn't mean they care anything about you, doesn't mean they understand anything about your company. In fact, you, they may buy a product thinking it's from this company and then realize later it was a distributor who got it from another company who actually made it in the first place, right? So there's no loyalty there when it comes to paying customers. A loyal customer is different. Sometimes we call them partners. Right, and because they have a different behavioral mentality. The uh, same is true with a loyal employee. It shouldn't be confused with a paid one. The majority of your employees are paid, right? Hopefully so, or you'll be in a lawsuit, right? But the case is, why do we say, my goodness, that's a loyal employee? Or wow, what, that, you know, that's loyalty right there, buddy. You know, and the reason why we call that out is it's a set of behaviors about that person that is different than the rest of your employees at the moment. It doesn't mean everyone else is disloyal, but you're calling out that behavior for you know a certain reason. So when we look at how we even communicate, this is uh, based on the book, uh, It Starts With Why, which is, I recommend that book highly. Um, he goes over this and he calls it the golden circle. This is, you know, a uh, from a biologist standpoint, if you were looking down at someone's head from above them, uh, into their brain, you would see the brain is made up of these different layers. Uh, the neocortex, uh, which is about your rational thinking. You know, when someone talks about metrics, they're talking from that part of their brain. Uh, when they're talking about the limbic brain systems, which include the reptilian stem, they're talking about feelings. That's when you come out of an interview and you say, I don't know what it is, but something about this person just feels right. You look at the resume and say, man, he doesn't know how to write a resume. This is really bad. But something about this guy feels right. Or that person really stutters, or they have some communication problem, but something about them feels right. And then you hire that person, they turn out to be the most loyal employee you've ever seen before, uh, doing things you didn't even ask them to do, they're just going ahead and doing it, and they're one of the best employees you've ever had in your life. It, that's because it was the limbic brain, the emotions behind it, um, that were causing you to make that decision. And then you tried to rationalize it, you know, with their resume or with their skill or with their output over time. So here's an example of how people explain Agile. If you come from the neocortex perspective and you were walking into a chief financial officer's office, you would say, hey, I think we need to move to Agile. You know, we would have uh, faster code delivery, maybe better quality, uh, we would have, uh, you know, different style meetings, you know, smaller meetings throughout the week. And the CFO is like, the 
this doesn't mean much to me. You know, go, go talk to some developer guy, right? Someone who comes from the limbic brain perspective from inside out would say to the CFO, um, you know, first off, thanks for taking the time with me today. You know, our products are subscription based, which means we're really focused on customer retention. And more so, we're concerned about a loyal customer base. What if I told you I found a way that we could inspire our customers to want to be loyal to us, to continue forward with their relationship with us, and lo and behold, give us feedback that allows us to build things in a more efficient manner. And, you know, the CFO kind of scratches his head, and he's thinking in the back because he rationalizes things, you know, based on an Excel spreadsheet that is in his head. And he goes, subscription-based services, customer retention, loyal customers. Loyal customers come back. Okay, interested. How are you, how are you going to do this? Well, we're going to, we have a process that allows us to, you know, include customers into giving feedback cycles. And I don't mean just our product works. I mean, tell us the truth. Your, your product sucks. And here's the reason why. Your product is phenomenal. I don't know what it is, but something about it makes me really comfortable. And for us to be able to go down that pathway with them to understand what's triggering them to feel that way. And if we can do that and apply it to our products on not just a, an occasional um, delivery, but on a repeatable pattern. So instead of us doing this long drawn out, we give you product every six months. And then you forget about us. And then you're not loyal to us anymore. But if, you know, if I figured out what really drove your behavior and included that into our product or service, if you're a service oriented company, and the customer every two weeks was reminded why we're awesome. Every two weeks, they showed up and said, you did what you told me you would do. That would incline them to want to work with us. And the CFO was like, go on. Okay, and so if, if we constantly do this, then also our team morale is going to increase, which I think is going to reduce our turnover rate of our customer, our, our customer service base um, when it comes to our outward-facing customer service, our, also our morale inside of our developers and QA engineers, because every two weeks or, you know, better yet, every day, we're going to have this daily meeting where we show up and they go over what they work on and they inspire each other to work like teammates. Something we don't do today because everyone reports to their manager in some spreadsheet and it just never works out. They feel like there's authoritarian regime around here and we just want teams. And then the CFO goes, okay, how much money do you need? And he goes through some of that and says, okay, start with a prototype team, whatever. And he says, what should I call this? And the person turns around and says, oh, by the way, it's called Agile. So you didn't start off with saying, here's Agile, here's the metrics, here's the process, I, I, I hope you believe in this. You cornered it around behaviors, feelings, customer retention, a loyalty, and it was supported by a process, supported by how you did things, and then lo and behold, by the way, you were explaining Agile in the first place. And that was just a change of how you communicate. But that's how the thought-provoking companies do communicate. And in this book, Start With Why, he goes over, that's how Apple communicates. Um, you know, for example, uh, their, a lot of their commercials used to say, think different, right? They didn't try and sell you a product, they tried to sell you a belief. So if you believed in that, you would do the same thing, okay? So the same here is true with Agile, is you can approach it from a process-oriented perspective, from a certification, a rule perspective, but if you approach it differently, um, you move people to want to join you. So uh, we're going to skip this work, uh, workshop because obviously I don't have the video that I can show you right now. But I'll, if we have time at the end, I'll go over what the video is so that you could do it with your team. Why Agile? Positives and negatives. Notice most of the positives are negatives too. If you're faster to market with the wrong thing, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, the only person you're helping is your competitor. Okay, so when people say we're faster to market, you can say, well, anyone can be faster with the wrong thing. Heck, I could do that right now. Here, let me type hello world in a text file. Hey, look at me, I'm a developer. Is that what you wanted? Does that make me agile? Okay, so faster to market only works if it's the right thing. Uh, quick feedback, that's great you get quick feedback, but if someone keeps telling you that you're wrong, 
And every day you keep proving to them, number one, you are wrong, and two, you don't listen, how long is that customer gonna stick around? All right, so as you look at the different agile frameworks, you will notice some of them are designed more around speed, some are designed more around visibility, and do know that all those positives can be negatives if you're not approaching it properly. At the top is your serial-based waterfall mentality. Now, these sticky notes are the really, really big ones. We're talking like almost the size of a sheet of paper. Okay, so just think of that in your head. If I broke across an application, how it works on the top and said, this is what we're gonna work on over the next six months. And then someone says, we're agile. We do stories. We don't use a PRD, we don't use a BRD, an MRD, SFS, any of those acronyms that you would find out there for big documents. Instead, we use these little things called user stories. And what they are is a slice of the system uh, for a user. Okay, great, so if I sliced all these sticky notes up with my hands, you would notice that they don't cut perfectly. This is not a pair of scissors. A system doesn't work like that. You can't just cut it with a pair of scissors and say, it's gonna be perfect. No, you have crossover. You have this API calls on that database. This UI works with that API. And in fact, that API not only serves up the browser on your desktop, but then serves this mobile system over there, right? So you have cross bleed all over the place. So when you're doing this and you just line everything up and say, I'm not changing anything about scope. You just told me Agile would be faster if I made these stories smaller. But lo and behold, based on this picture here, it's taking longer. And why is that? Because of the cross bleed, because of the multiple meetings that you now have, you, you may not have a, a big release go, no go, but you have a daily stand up every day. You have now, if you're in the scrum mentality, um, you have pre-planning meetings, you have planning meetings, you have demos constantly. If you're in the Kanban flow, uh, your daily activity is, you are doing a daily planning meeting every day, just on smaller stuff. So that idea of the overhead kicks in. The only way it's faster is if I looked at those large items at the top and focused on those little green squares and said, those are the points of value. That's all the customer wants. Those are the must haves of the must shoulds and coulds. Those are the musts. Those are what you work on. Okay. So if I focused on that and that alone, it becomes like that. That's the only way agile is actually better is you're focusing on faster to market with the right thing. Quick feedback triggers us to develop the right thing. We're visible about what we are working on, which is the right thing. We have less documentation because we're not building everything. Okay, so that's when the positives kick in. Otherwise, if you're doing everything the way you used to do and you're just slicing things up and calling yourself agile because you have a daily scrum, then you turn into this mess. Uh, a couple of good books out there. Uh, one here is the Toyota Product Development System. You will find a lot of things about Agilus are based on a lot of things Toyota did in the past. Okay, so one thing about Toyota is their their product owners must do a couple of things to just work on um, architecture of a car. You are forced as a architect to go work in Japan at their car dealerships for six months. You're not allowed to go to the corporate headquarters and focus on architecture, which is what they asked you for, until you sit in the sales office for six months. That's how they run it. Another thing is their chief product owners there who actually you know, govern the entire project plans and features and stuff, they're with the company at least 15 years before they're allowed to have that position. Okay, so it gives you an idea of one, the loyal base that they have for customers to stick around that long, or I mean employees. Two, they focus on putting them in front of customers first before they allow them to do anything. And another thing about, um, I'm not sure if any of you have their Toyota minivan. I don't know how many of you have like 15 kids or anything, but you might have their minivan. Notice that if you go to Home Depot and you take out their seats in the back, you can fit a full piece of plywood in it. Now, most of us are like strapping it to our car, going into the lumber area and say, can you cut this in half for me? It's not going to fit my truck or it's not going to fit my uh, SUV or anything of that nature. Toyota said, listen, they had a case study where they told the architects to drive around America for six months with customers 
to where they went to observe their activities. Now, obviously, they paid the customers, you know, for them to be snooped on the whole time. But they're watching their behaviors when it came to their minivan. And what they noticed is that people were strapping plywood on top of the minivan. So they focused on the value proposition and said, that's pretty simple to solve. If we can get the seats out of there and make sure the wheel wells are further enough apart, that's a selling point. Suddenly we solved that big problem. So that's what happened with them. And they give a couple of those examples in their books, focusing on customers and understanding their behavioral trends. And then they said, listen, you're not allowed to even do your job until you understand the trends of our customers, let alone change anything. So agile is simple, not easy. If someone's told you it's easy, they're probably a consultant. Okay, and they're trying to sell you something. Um, agile is simple. The simplicity of focus on customers, respond to their feedback, have a consistent meeting every day called the daily stand-up, have demos, have pre-planning, all that stuff. Simple. The hard part is we work with people. People come with all this other stuff. They come with cultural differences. They come with gender differences. They come with ethics and religion and all that stuff. And HR tells us to avoid that. However, when you're focusing on teams, you have to understand their motivations. And that's where Agile becomes a little difficult. For example, I learned this by working with a lot of uh, the folks from India. I was noticing that the offshore team was not showing up to my daily stand-up meeting every morning. And they were the testing team at night. And I was asking them, saying, I really need you on this call. I really need you on this call every morning. We're a team. We're a team. We're a team. And the only person that showed up from India was the lead. And so I was starting to get frustrated. And I had built a good relationship with the Indians that were here in America onshore. And one of them pulled me aside and said, you just don't understand this. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, this is pretty simple. I just want to get people to show up at the meeting, people who did the work. He goes, you're not understanding us. This is, he goes, examine the situation. You're dealing with culture issues and gender issues. And I'm like, okay, explain. I'm interested. I, I want to help this team. And he said, the person who's offshore, what gender are they? And I said, she, she's a female. And I said, okay. Realize that in our culture, we focus on, you know, we treat people differently based on a couple things. One is gender, two, sometimes religion, three, education. He said, so first off, if you're highly educated and you're onshore in America and you're a female, the males offshore will respect you. However, if you're offshore and you're a female, they will be very authoritarian and only the male will show up to your meeting. So he's like, you need to break through to people to help them understand what you're looking for, but you have to be empathetic to who we are. And so I thought about it and thought about it, and I eventually talked to the lead offshore and said, I respect you, your professional career. I understand you're pretty highly educated to be in the position you're in leading your team. Um, I don't know anything about, you know, perhaps your religion or anything of that nature, but what I do know is that you're dealing with an American culture here that is focused on the simplicity of the people who do the work should be the ones who give the answer to the questions. And the reason is we're trying to reduce inefficiency or misunderstandings like a telephone game. I'm asking that we compromise and help me learn how to respect you guys better. But at the same time, could you please have her show up at the meeting so that we can just get the most efficient message possible? about how the tests were last night. And from that day forward, she showed up to every single meeting. So Agile is simple. It's not easy because it's no longer an authoritarian perspective. It is not a long drawn out project plan, Gantt chart, um, critical pathway perspective. A lot of it is focused around behavioral pattern thinking and adjusting to that. And that means everyone's adjusting. Okay, another way to look at it too is another simple example is I worked with a company in Denver that built uh, fast search engine technology. So think of like Microsoft, Bing, Google, you know, they're all advertising companies, but in the end, uh, they have search engine technology. And we were working for a client that was in Europe and they had multiple divisions, one in the UK, um, 
you know, a couple spread out throughout the different Europe countries. And the one thing about Europe, unlike America, is that every single country has a different set of rules. Like on one website, you can put someone's address, but not their name. On another website, you can put their address, but not their city. And then on another website, you can put their full-blown address and name, but not the telephone number. So you had to know all these legal laws uh, going across different you know, countries, even though it's the same company uh, that was giving up this you know, advertising. And we really disappointed our customer. And what I noticed on the demo was we were demoing search engine terms. And the customer goes, do you guys not know us yet? And like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You know, we're not showing the customer information. We're following the laws. And he goes, you still don't understand us yet. He goes, look at the words you're using. And like, what about them? And he goes, look at that word, behavior. Is that how we spell it in the UK? Our customers are here. Our culture is here. You're in America and you're spelling behavior as an American. Spell it the way the UK does. And so what we reinforced every two weeks for a matter of months is we didn't know our customer, we didn't care about our customer, we weren't listening, and eventually it blew up in a meeting that they said, the example's right in your face, the word behavior. If you can't even get your test data to focus on how customers use our products, what do we need you for? So that's where Agile is simple. It's about customer needs, but it's not easy because the people you're working with, for example, Americans testing United Kingdom products, Indians t testing American-based products. We have different cultures. And until you can understand the culture for whom you're testing, you're not doing Agile the way you're supposed to. Yeah. All right, so here is a, um, a bell curve. We see a lot of this when it comes to like bonuses at the end of the year, right? And we're all trying to say, oh, you got all the threes in the center and the fives on the right and the ones and twos on the left, right? Let's apply this bell curve to Agile. If you were to look at your marketplace and say the majority of my customers are where, you would say they're in the center. That's like your Super Bowl ad. That's why it costs you like a couple million dollars for 30 seconds. If you're trying to attack the market with something so general that everyone just gets it, right? Agilists say, that's how we used to work. That's your six month release right there. You build so much stuff that you deploy it and you hope one, your customers are still there. And two, the ones that are there there's something in our feature base that'll, that'll get them, right? And will say, no, 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 that's, that's ridiculous. Every two weeks show up with something and get their feedback. And then the following week, the following two weeks, you work based on their feedback. And then the following week, you work on their feedback. So on the left-hand side of this bell curve, when it comes to market dynamics, is the idea that first off, the people on the left care about talking about things. They're the people who use Yelp. They are the people who use Facebook Marketplace. They are the people who put reviews out there. Uh, they're the people streaming stuff in LinkedIn constantly. They're the people who care. And so they will use your product first, and then they'll tell their friends. Now, the question is what they tell their friends could be bad. It could be good. But if I could get those people to show up to my demo meetings, then they're going to market my product for me. So for those of you who are building an internal product in your company, you're looking inside your company in different departments for people with this behavior. They're the type who like to talk, the people who like to give feedback, but also more importantly, they like to tell their friends. So if you want to market a message called, let's start doing Agile, or you want to market a service called, we do contracting for a customer, or you want to market a tangible product, we build an e-commerce website. You go after these people, because they will market your message for you that number one, this company listens to feedback. Number two, they included my feedback, which is really interesting. You see that feature right there? That's because of me. And number three, this is where they're going. I didn't need a commercial for that. They did it for you. So that's how Agilists work on that. And then there's a book out there called The Tipping Point. And what it proves is that when 15 to 18% of the market of people you're trying to get to use your product or service, use it. The rest of the market catapults and starts using it. So that's just marketing 101. Okay, so we went through a lot of stuff there. Um, let me pause for a second. Uh, let me see here. Is there a way to, I don't know how to unmute anybody here. Um, 
audio options. I'm trying to find a way to unmute everybody. Or you can just unmute yourself. Right. If you have any I, questions, I let me pause that. there. <laughs> I'll do that for you, Michael. So folks, Thanks. if you've got any questions, you can chat them in. Otherwise, you can ask them as I unmute you. I just ask for a favor um, if you can locally mute yourself so that whatever's happening in the background uh, isn't apparent to, to us, that will be great. So I'm going to mute everyone. Three, two, one, go. Okay, everyone's on, on mute. Yep, that's correct. Does anyone have any questions or yes, comments that's or concerns? That's great. Um, okay. Yes, let me see. Sounds like we might have to mute everybody again. Someone's on another call. Okay. Okay. So, since no one has any questions, I'm going to keep moving forward. I just want to make sure I had a natural pause here because we're going through, if you were to say, in the limbic brain perspective, I'm going through the why right now. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of the how. I'm talking to you from inside to say, this is how human behavior works. And when you apply it to how we do our work, how Toyota did their stuff, how marketing 101 works, you can understand why now we say, I want the customer at my demo meetings. Mm -hmm. So before I even talk to you about a demo meeting or I talk to you about an iteration or any of that stuff, it's like, if you get this, you can go talk to a CFO, you can talk to a project manager, you can talk to a customer, you can talk to a funding source, you can talk to a developer and say, do you understand now why we invited the people we did to the demo meeting and the people who weren't there why we didn't want them there right and so if you can do that then you can coach these people if you were a scrum master and do that job absolutely and michael so, i just comment that this is this is extremely helpful in putting everything into perspective and helping us think right oh wow i'm trying not to fall asleep for the next couple of slides because they have a lot of detail on them um waterfall history so back in 1970, Winston Royce came up with managing the development of large software teams. And then the, the Department of Defense came out with the standard based on that um, document, or at least the initial document, which is the waterfall diagram. And inside this spec for the military, they had 428 pages of specs on process. We're not talking software specs. We're talking specs of how to do the process itself. On page nine, there were four to five testing stages after coding. Page 13 said you need to have 17 documents before coding was even allowed to begin. So think BRD, MRD, SFS, and you know, like uh, 12 or 13 other acronyms right behind them. Test plan had to be approved. And then I just got lost on page 29. I didn't know what the heck was going on there. And then on page 30, this scared the daylights out of me. You spent all this time arguing about testing stages and test plans, but then if you updated the source code later, you didn't have to test it. So what I'm trying to say is, I tend to ask the question, do you believe that government jobs, whether you agree with the public, private, you know, political battle, that's another question, but do you believe as it stands that if we turned over all government jobs to the private sector in one swoop, would that impact the private sector significantly? And no one seems to argue that fact. And I say, yes, absolutely. And I said, okay, so that means the public sector has a large amount of people in it. So back in 1988, obviously the military is ahead of any um, private sector, uh, at least in the sense of technology, because there's a lot of classified stuff out there, right? And then eventually some of it gets declassified. So you hear about the company called DARPA, and they make stuff for the military. And then eventually, like 10, you know, five, 10 years later, there's something that comes out that they say, oh, yeah, this was based on DARPA's technology, and now the public is allowed to use it. So back in 1988, if you wanted to be in software, that's what you had to follow. Now, a lot of the people who were in that timeline are now managers in companies today. So for years, they were forced to follow this procedure ingrained in their brain every single day. This is how you do software. This is how you do it correctly. And if you don't abide by this, well, one, you're not being loyal to our military. Two, you're bringing risk in. So they had ingrained for years this behavior. And then lo and behold, some young guy comes out of a startup and says, Agile, Agile, Agile. 
It's, it's so simple, man. Why do we need all these testing stages? Why do you need all those documents? Come on, man, just get it together. This is why Agile is simple, but it's not easy. These invoke behaviors, right? So at first there's an event, then there's an attitude change, then it becomes part of your nature, and then suddenly it's a habit. So you weren't there back in 1988, young person, to stop this from happening. You weren't next to this person for years while they were in the military serving our country. And then you weren't with them for years in the private sector while they still use this mentality. But lo and behold, you show up and you think that Agile is just going to be simple. It's not that simple. These people think differently. So that's some of the hardest parts of moving people forward. But when we go back to how do we get people out of that trend, we say, okay, so this is where you came from. Thank you for your service for our country. Great. Did you know that back in 1970s, some guy came out with this and he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had to study that in the military and say, well, let's analyze that for a second. When you look at it, the actual person who wrote it said, I believe in this concept, but the implementation described above is risky and invites failure. He also said that a major redesign was required. And here's something that should scare the daylights out of PMP folks. The development process is returned to the origin and one can expect up to 100% overrun in schedule and or costs. So what he's saying is if you follow this process, I guarantee you it's gonna cost more and you're gonna be late. So when you think of your PMP exam and there's a section on ethics, is it ethical to give somebody an estimate that you know 100% chance is wrong. And it's not just wrong like, oh, we're gonna be off by like, you know, 5% just because, you know, we lose some employees, gain some employees, and we have some just trends. No, 100% overrun is what the person who devised the waterfall original statement to be said even his process does this. So it makes you question, like, you're trying to move these people around that have been ingrained in this procedure for a long time, and they say it's, it's dedicated on my, my education back in the military, and lo and behold, military was based on Winston Royce's thesis. So let's see what the doctor actually had to say. And that's what he's saying. He's not saying agile, but he's saying that something else has to be better than this. So when you focus on, okay, what else did he have to say? Some of the changes he wanted to do is the version finally delivered to the customer is actually the second version. The entire process done in miniature. Testing is the phase with the greatest risk in terms of dollars and schedule. So why are we doing it last? And it's important to involve the customer in a formal way so that he has committed himself. Doesn't sound like a customer to me. Sounds like a committed partner, a loyal partner. So these are all the things he said probably had to be changed. He just didn't use the term agile. But when you talk to people about agile, well, we have short sprints. We have loyal customers who show up to demo. We're focused on test-driven development. Uh, we're actually, we may build a lot of stories, but eventually we deploy an ultimate version that isn't what the original was. Hmm. Okay, so we are in agreement more than you think, person. You just didn't read all the pages below his diagram. You're so used to looking at the waterfall diagram that you forgot there, there were all these paragraphs beneath it of what he said was wrong with it and what needed to change. So that's what we kind of get to is that's how you move people around is show them where you have a constant denominator with them and then educate them a little further. So the only problem he listed at the end is the simpler method has never worked on large scale development efforts. Okay, so in essence, he's saying even if he made all these changes, can agile scale. So that's something you kind of have to maybe have in your back pocket is this is where Waterfall got its origination. It was in the military for so long. And back then, if you wanted to do anything of high tech, that's where you would be. And then when those people came into the normal private sector, they took all this with them. So why are we surprised they act that way? But if I could educate them on truly the backbone of what where things came from, they might have a conversation with me about Agile instead of an argument. Okay, so now we're gonna look in, uh, all right, here's your movie poster, the first one. He is hiding something when we need to find out what that is. Who is he? He is your customer. And this was a couple of years back. Um, 
they had a multiple studies that back in 2014, 2015, Generation Y would make not only up 50% of the market force, but 50% of the workforce. Because, you know, baby boomers and Generation X, they're either retiring or just getting higher up in executive positions. So they're not the doers. Not usually. Not anymore. So as Generation Y kicks in, they just come with this behavioral trend. Uh, interesting thing here where it says language 99, it doesn't mean they know 99 languages. What I based that on was there were a bunch of studies about the behaviors of these people, of these teenagers, right? And what they noticed is that, you know, they use instant messaging and they're on their phones. And if, if we were the naughty parent, who, you know, who looked at all their text messages, we would see random nines and random 99s. And they kept studying this and saying, what is going on? Why, is, why do we see these numbers randomly showing up constantly? And what they realized is that when a couple teenagers were honest about it, they said, nine means the parent is in the room, 99 means they left the room. So you can talk about different things. So they have their own way of discussing things. We are used to PRDs and BRDs being hundreds of pages, and they can sum it up in 140 characters. A tweet. That's how they work. So when we talk about like the daily stand-up trying to keep it close to 15 minutes, it's because they already have one foot out the door. They're like, just tell me what I need to know so I can just go do what I do. Why do I need to be in here for two hours? Okay, so that's the human behavioral trends that we're working with. I'm going to skip a workshop here. So the shade here um, was this lady named Molly, but she references Mal, and Mal means bad in the movie. So what is bad for your business? Bad is market delays, competitors, patents expiring. Sometimes it's us. Sometimes we're the problems that we're the people who have problems. And I don't just mean people who don't know Agile. Agilists have lots of problems too, right? They can't communicate very well sometimes. Um, they're pushing people a little too hard, too fast. They're asking for too much simplicity. You know, no reins on the system. Okay, so we have to look at ourselves sometimes and say, if I am the change agent, what behavior do I bring to my team? So let's look here at, uh, and normally this class, by the way, is two days. You're getting flooded with info, but part of it is I'm trying to get through all this stuff so that you can ask questions. Uh, we don't have the workshops going on, but do know this class tends to be a little slower and there's like movie clips and stuff we watch, so it's a lot funnier. This is product management 101. That's the cash cow right there. Everyone wants to milk it. Okay, that was a bad product management um, joke. At the very top is waterfall, at the very bottom is agile. You start off in the red, regardless of flow. You're building a product or a service, no one's bought it yet. You're burning cash. That's just the way it is. You go into orange, which means you have enough people on your system or enough people buying your service that it makes up for any development cost and anything to keep the lights on. Green means you're in the green, making revenue dollars, uh, making profit, and you have enough to build new stuff, not just keep the existing stuff running. And then eventually your competitors come in, um, they start building similar technology, perhaps better technology. Your patents run out if you're a manufacturer, and now there's generics out there, and eventually you're bleeding red again because a lot of your customer base is left. Agilists get there a little faster. How? Well, we don't wait six months to deploy something. We deploy something as soon as possible. We get feedback right away. Initially, we might be working with, if we're in software, we're working with you know, IT, we're working with product managers on potential uh, sizes of the market, the amount of customers you're expecting on the system you know, in the first year as opposed to five years. So we're building a lot of backend stuff to prepare for performance. So we're demoing it to those people because they care about that. But eventually we get to the point of showing part of the website to customers, maybe a alpha group to say, some of this data is test, some of this is live, give us, a, give us feedback on, do you like how we get the data to flow on the screen or is that not how you would do it? You know, if we have the submit button three tabs down, but you only fill in the first tab with information every time, that's really stupid. We should put the submit button on the first tab. You know, so we're understanding the feedback and getting responses. Eventually we have a live system and we're there before the big market splash. Now we may not have as much functionality as someone would potentially have in six months, you know, on the second month. But what we do have is a number of loyal people already. We have IT in our bucket. 
We have product management on board. We have project managers on board, funding sources on board, a couple customers saying, that's the flow I need. Can you add the next feature? Great. I'll give you feedback. Now, can you add the next feature? Great. And eventually there's enough features to where they say, I'm going to train my team internally to start using your product. Doesn't have all the stuff I want in the end yet, but I do know we're getting there because I've already believed in what you're doing. I'm showing up to your demo every two weeks and what you show me is great. By doing it this way, instead of focusing on the market type, like product managers typically would, we're focusing on building customer loyalty because this customer is showing up to your demo meeting and is paying you to use your product and give you free feedback so that you can build the right product. And they're giving you their time every two weeks. And since you respond to them, their beliefs become your beliefs. Their values are your values. So you become one and the same. So what's happening is you're locking them into your system from a technological standpoint, from a process standpoint, and more importantly, from a value standpoint. And if we approach Agile that way, then when our customers, competitors uh, kick in, they say, why would I go to that competitor? All I need is a guarantee from you is that you are going to do something like that soon. Because why would I go anywhere else? Because the cool thing is you're going to implement whatever that is with my feedback based on my business problems, not just make it general for everybody. So why would I leave you? So then you have more time to build the next feature or sunset your product. So that's product management applied to Agile. Remember, we're not really talking about, yes, incrementals on there, but I didn't tell you about a bunch of sprints. I didn't give you sprint cycles. I didn't give you stories or story points or any of the stuff you're gonna find you know, in normal classes, I'm focusing on why people act the way they act, how we get people to stay with our system, and lo and behold, Agile is one of the gateways that gets you there. Okay. All right, so here's uh, Pragmatic Marketing. This is one of their older frameworks. They change it slightly every year. This is like the top dog when it comes to product management training next to the 280 group. So if you're looking for product management training, um, that's a company that I typically talk to quite often. But what they talk about here is that uh, the product owner, which is a term we're going to be going over, sits here in the center. He knows the difference between a buyer and a user. And if you get user stories or requirements that say, as a product owner, as a product owner, as a product owner, go buy them a bag of dog food and put it on their desk. And they'll be like, what the heck is this for? And you say, what's the difference between a buyer and a user? Because every one of your user stories says, as a product owner. One, you don't use the system, and two, you certainly don't pay for the system. So one, you're neither one of those people. And he goes, well, what's the difference? And he says, who do you think bought this dog food, and who would eat it? If that's the bare basic difference between a buyer and a user, and if you can't tell your software team what the difference is, then we're going to build the wrong thing. So product owner, I never want to see a user story that says as a product owner because you are neither the buyer nor the user. But if you were one of those, there's a good chance you're not the other one of those. So we need to build software so it works for everybody. And so that's a lot of these are why questions. But when you get into the kind of hows and how we're doing things, this is actually where your agile team sits is in the center. They sit knowing enough about strategy to build the right feature set and they know enough about the tactical in production noise to respond. So that's why they're sitting in the center and focused on buyers and users and requirements. I'm gonna skip this because that's a workshop. A change in culture, there you go. So you'll see this on a lot of pictures. Normally it's just a triangle to a triangle. Mine goes a little bit 3D here. So we go from the time scope budget perspective to scope time cost quality perspective. Before we would estimate the time and budget and be like, wait a second, we didn't really estimate. We said this project would take six months. Well, when you're four months into that project, you're going to realize you're four months late. So a couple things can happen. The time can be extended or the budget gets increased because to change the scope, you have to walk into some CFO's office or CEO's office and say, I don't agree with you. That always goes over real well, right? They typically give you more time. Or they say, here's a bunch of money, go hire a bunch of people because they're all plug and play and I'm sure they'll be up to speed in two weeks. Okay, so that's typically what's happening in the waterfall mentality is one of those constraints get changed. However, we're gonna flip the scale. We're gonna say, listen, 
we're going to have fixed constraints called time, costs, and quality. And how do we do that? Every two weeks, well, if you're a scrum team, every two weeks, every two weeks, every two weeks, every two weeks, the time scale has not changed. The costs remain pretty close to the same. Why? Because you're not hiring and firing people every two weeks. If you do, you got a bigger problem on your hands. Okay, so that typically is the same. The, you're not spinning up new servers every week. You may spit up a, uh, spin up a server cluster, you know, once every quarter or something. So the costs do change, like licensing and server costs. But in the end, it's the same team with the same salary, with the same servers and the same licensing. So the costs are the same as they were last week and the week before. Then quality kicks in. We're focused on maybe test-driven development, or we're focused on automation testing, things of that nature. So quality becomes a central point of the actual plan itself, as opposed to it's just a stage. So what's the estimate scope? If every two weeks I go to a customer and say, how do you feel about that? And he says, dude, I don't know what you did, but this sucks. And you say, oh, thanks for that. I'll just keep going. You're going to lose that customer. But if he says, no, this sucks, and you say, okay. Well, we only changed so much in the last two weeks. Did you feel this way last week? No, no, I didn't feel that way. Okay, so at least we limited it down to what spawned you. Okay, so is it something when you're in the UI? Yeah. Okay, so out of the 10 user stories we did, seven of them are the UI. Okay, so we're getting closer. Do you feel that way around this area or this area? I feel it around the second one. Oh, okay, so it's the financial data you're having problems with. Okay, that gets us down to three stories. So these are the three things we changed. Which one do you feel uncomfortable with? Actually, all three of them. Why? Well, you see right there, it has the vendor information right there. Should I be worried that somebody's going to see my name in that list? Oh. Oh, you're having a problem with the security constraint and visibility of your vendor. Okay, we can fix that. But it started off with you were listening to how they felt, but it caused a scope change. So that's why estimate is scope, because we're focused on the must-haves, not the shoulds, not the coulds, but the musts. And then every time we're asking our customer base, reevaluating, saying, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about this? I don't want to know if it works. I already know it works because it's in production. I want to know how you feel about it, because that'll determine if I continue down this path. Okay, so that's the change. All right, here's the Agile Manifesto. We value the things on the left more than the things on the right. Doesn't mean we ignore the things on the right. If I have working software that educates customers by virtue of its UI, by virtue of the data flow, by virtue of the error messages, instead of saying invalid password, it might actually say invalid password, you did not meet these constraints. Out of these five constraints, this is the one you didn't meet. You didn't use a special character. Wow, I educated you. I don't need comprehensive documentation to tell you what the constraints are because I put it on the screen. So by working software, it doesn't just mean no errors. It means does it educate them? Does it lead them through whatever process you're making? If I get these people to be more interactive and more efficient, the less and less I have to support them with process constraints or additional tools because they are communicating, and so on and so on. This is taken from the Agile Coaching Book. We tend to use this analogy of a tree quite often in coaching. So a horticulturist will come to your house, and he'll look up and see all the dead leaves. He doesn't start counting how many apples you have left. He looks at you dead in the eye and says, where's the closest source of water? Show it to me. Uh, yeah, you see how that water is streaming through that area where you decided to dump your oil from last year from your snowblower? What do you think is happening to that water and that oil mixture because your tree's right there? So I don't need to count how many apples you have. You're poisoning your tree. So we focus a lot on the roots, around the principles and how we want the teams to work. And then if we're feeding the tree, called the team, properly, they will start growing in different ways. And then eventually you'll be able to harvest their fruits like a, a couple quarters out. Okay, so we use that a lot. Another analogy is when Agile say, you can never interrupt the sprint. You say, guys, look outside for a second. See that tree over there? Do you think it's healthy? Yeah. Has it been here a long time? Yeah. Is it windy out? Yeah. Why didn't the why didn't this tree snap? 
Wind is a change. Well, it's bending, exactly. I need you to bend. I'm not asking you to snap. This is not a hurricane. But I don't want you to be a petrified forest. So work with me. So we use tree analogies quite often to help teams understand, number one, how they grow as a team. Number two, how you uh, get them to harvest over time. But last but not least is you're helping the team understand that like a living tree that is healthy, we don't say a petrified forest is healthy, and we certainly don't say a tree that snapped is healthy. But everything in between has a sense of healthiness to it, depending on the conditions of the weather surrounding them. So think of the weather conditions as your business. Waterfall-based planning, agile value-based planning. So we would build all this stuff, and we'd focus a lot on the front end, meaning the front end of requirements, front end of design analysis and coding, and then lo and behold, we ran out of time for testing, and then we just deployed it. And then we'd follow it up with hot patches. Then the other folks say, well, one, we're going to give more time to the people who actually do the work. We're going to not just be focused on coding versus testing. We're going to do test-driven development, meaning I only build until the test passes. And then I focus on automated stuff, continual integration. And then we do these quick and light deployments of pieces of code pieces of functionality. Instead of saying I support Excel six months from now, I'm going to say I support XLS. I didn't say I support XLSX, I support XLS. 64,000 rows in a spreadsheet. And then in the next sprint or the next release, we're gonna support XLSX, meaning a million rows. So we further enhance the system. Between those two releases, no one thought XLSX was a bug because we never told the customer we did that. We told them we supported XLS. So we slowly and slowly start ramping up more and more functionality. But what you're not seeing is a lot of hot patches as a normalcy. I'm not saying you'll never have to fix the system, but what I am saying is that the normalcy is that you're slowly deploying pieces out because there's less risk to it. So when you're looking at the waterfall-based model, you can deploy all you want. However, you cannot patch someone's loyalty with a technical solution. So once you tell somebody, yeah, we work that way, and then they come back and say, no, you don't. You just broke loyalty with that customer. Okay. The agilists may approach it, and yes, they get bugs too, but there's less scenarios of it happening. There is, and even the ones that do get tend to be smaller because you only released a portion of the code base. You did not overwrite everything because it's a six, nine month long project. So you're dealing with a more isolated problem, which means less business impact and less customers affected. The severity is lower. However, in this model, since it's a longer drawn out plan and you're changing more, when something's wrong, you got to hot patch the whole thing, right? And then everyone's upset and you spend more time trying to patch someone's loyalty when they're ticked off with you and you're saying, well, good thing we only release every six months because he'll forget about it by the time we have our next one. Versus the agile, so like, we really disappointed our customer in the last sprint. Let's really take care of him in this sprint and demo to him that we really care in two weeks. And let's fix our problem. Our problem is us. Okay, so that's the main difference between the plan-based models. And then I'll pause after this next slide again. Another way to look at it is, since we know the time, you can start doing some equations to say, well, seven team members with an average salary is 40 bucks an hour. In two weeks, we have 10 working days, which means 80 hours is how like Accenture or TCS or one of those managed service providers would bill us. So seven team members times 80 hours equals 560 hours times $40 an hour is $22,400 in labor to do nothing. What's worse is if we build the wrong thing because then I have to pay him another $22,000 to fix it and maybe another $22,000 to fix it again. But if Product owner, you just don't schedule that user story because it's not ready, and you have us work on things that are ready. We're using our labor cost properly. So before we start, I want to know, is this problem in production worth $22,400? Is this customer going to pay us $22,400 for this emergency fix? Or is this just some sales guy telling you that it sounds good? Because I have real numbers here for you that don't change very often. So I know exactly how much my sprint is worth to you. Okay, so agile is not like chaos. I mean, on some teams it is because they're not applying the principles properly. But in the end, 
you have a lot of control over your cost. You have a lot of control over the consistent pattern that's enveloping. Um, you're impacting the business in smaller doses, which allows them to change their business processes in a more uh, fluid manner. Um, you have a way for the teams to grow career-wise and with your customer base. And then lo and behold, when we come back to Product Management 101, in the end, we need money for the company or we don't survive. We are now getting customers who stick around longer, get value hopefully earlier, are more importantly marketing our products for us so we don't even have to use all our marketing money anymore. We don't have to buy coffee cups. What good's a coffee cup when I have a customer telling someone else that we're awesome? That's better than a coffee cup. So all these pieces together are why we do Agile in the right manner. So I'll pause there. Any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to put them in chat. So basically in an hour, you covered about four hours of stuff. So if your brain's about to explode, that's why. <laughs> Mine is trying to catch up, it's buffering. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So we went over the why portion. So literally on this class, I spend the first day or day or almost an entire day on the why. Is if people understand the why, now when we get into the how and coaching people understand the procedures and all that stuff, it makes more sense. Like, yeah, I really want to pay attention to X, Y, Z, because if I screw this up, I know that I'm going to screw this up with the customer, which means this to the market, to my product manager, to my business, where before you might have said, well, the sprint, we carried the story from one sprint to another, you know, no one's really mad at us, and that's it. Well, there's a bigger picture than that. And so that's what I'm trying to employ across all of you. Um, one video I make all my new Scrum Masters watch is Moneyball. So if, you have a, if you're a new Scrum Master or have a new Scrum Master, I suggest you go buy them a DVD and say, go watch it. And then when they come and say, I watched it last time, it was really good, you say, go watch it again. And then eventually they'll pick up on a lot of the excerpts out of there. And it was about changing the way teams work. So that's a good video. Um, all right. So we're going to get into the know your agile terms. Don't fall asleep. It is an eye chart. The term you never want people to get away with is backlog. If someone says you says, well, it's in the backlog. You, you hold them by their arms and say, which one? Because a lot of people just say backlog. It's in the backlog, don't worry about it. Yeah, I am gonna worry about it, because I don't know which one you're talking about. If they say product backlog, this is the dumping ground of ideas. If they say it's in the product backlog, it just means you're like anybody else that's just making some random request and who knows when it'll happen. If they say release backlog, it's targeted to go to prod at some point. The question is what sprint or what flow, if you're a Kanban team, um, would eventually uh, fall on. And then if you're in the iteration sprint backlog from a scrum perspective, what that means is it is scheduled, you can exactly see what cycle it's gonna appear in and it's moving forward. So backlog is very, um, it's very loaded when it comes to terms. So if you're use, working with a vendor like Accenture, Amdocs or somebody and they say, it's in the backlog, you, you stop the meeting right there and say, you better tell me which one. If they say, what do you mean which one? Say, okay, we got a bigger problem on our hands. Because if you're telling me that you just have one backlog and you don't think about releases and you don't think about sprints, but you just told me on the previous phone call that you're all scrum based, we got a problem because that's like 101 when it comes to planning, which backlog. Incremental and iterative, we're gonna go over that in a cute little picture here in a minute. Task, user story velocity and stuff like that we're gonna be covering as well. Incremental and iterative. Now you could ask someone if they like to drink coffee or if they like to drink wine. Normally someone likes to be caffeinated or they like to be, uh, you know, wind up. So one of the two normally works for the conversation. Here's an example of a coffee tester. The coffee in the center at the very bottom of that cup is what they're thinking of marketing. And maybe those are the beans next to it that they said, this is the, this is the new batch of beans. We're trying to figure out those cool marketing names for this and we really don't know. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna take all these, all these coffees that we already have in the marketplace right now, and we're gonna line them all up. We're gonna line up their grounds, we're gonna line them up as if they've already been brewed. And this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a, we're gonna sniff the primary cup, and then we're gonna sniff all these back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, to figure out which aroma is closest. 
Then we're going to take a sip out of the first cup, and then we're going to sip out of this cup, and then we're going to sip out of the first cup again, and then we're going to sip out of this one cup way in the back, and then we're going to sip out of the first cup. And what I'm trying to get on my palate is to understand which one is it closest to and in what way. Is it acidic like that one, but it has a smell of chocolate like that one? And you're slowly, slowly, slowly bringing the coffee down in the cup to nothing. That's called incremental delivery. You're incrementally delivering value. I identified it has earthly tones. Ah, I, I just realized it has a pH level of such and such. That's delivery. That's incremental. But the iterative part about it is the sniffing, the sipping, the repetitive action behind the incremental value delivery. So every time I'm sniffing, I'm iterative, doing it over and over and over again. Sniff, 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 sip, sip, sip. That's like, that's why iterative is about the sprint itself. You have two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. It is repetitive, it is constant. The incremental value is about the release itself. And that may or may not follow your iterative pattern of the sprint. You could release every day as sprints come off the assembly line. You could release every two weeks to follow the sprint. You could release once a month because we just don't want to interrupt the business. Or you could say, I just don't really get Agile yet and we're going to release every six months. Okay, fine. But that's the difference between incremental and iterative if you are on a test. Another way of looking at things is this is how the business looks at things. Fruit salad, love it. Everything in it, love it. This is how a development team sees it. That's how a product owner should see it when it comes to role definition. And this is how a product manager or a sales engineer would see it. Okay. Which fruit would you cut last if you're making fruit salad? Just think about that for a second. There's a couple of fruits there that you would have to consider, like which one do I cut first? Which one do I cut last? Think of the apples and the bananas. Why wouldn't you cut them first? They oxidize. So here's a question for the technical folks. Team, how does our product oxidize in production? What do you mean oxidize? Well, if I cut a piece of fruit, it oxidizes by just sitting there because oxygen is attacking it. That's why it gets that nasty brown, rusty color. That's why apple juice doesn't look like this white color it looks brown in the jar because it's been oxidized. So tell me, how does our product oxidize in, in prod? What do you mean? Do customers use it? Yeah. So every time they use it, do they add data to it? Yeah. That's called oxidizing. It's aging. Time is aging our product. The fact that it's used, even just normally, oxidizes our product. So when it comes to delivering a feature set, you are ordering things in delivery based on a number of things. Does it oxidize in prod? Number two, do we have any nut allergies? Well, I don't see it in the requirements. I'm assuming they're okay. That's a, that's a crazy assumption to make. I don't want to kill anybody today. So how about you go check on that before we shut down someone's business because we gave them the wrong product? Okay, lactose intolerance, wheat perhaps. There's so many things when you break down a feature, whether it's fruit salad or a product line or a service that you're providing in an agile fashion, that when you break it down, you start seeing things differently. When all together, you see value and revenue, but then when you're allowed to break it down and say, before I execute delivery pattern, check on my customer. Is this who they are? Is this who you want to sell it to? That'll determine how I deliver. Um, here's some agile terms <clears throat> that you'll hear from people. 100% code coverage always makes me giggle. If you built something idiot proof, the world will make a better idiot. Okay, so you're never 100% code coverage anyway. That's a fallacy. Dev and QA managers tend to get nervous. Uh, and this is from the movie uh, Lean on Me. Joe Clark says, tear down those cages in the cafeteria. If you treat them like animals, that's exactly how, you will be, how they will behave. So when you start bringing teams together, like Dev and QA, instead of being separate or business analysts from the teams, suddenly becoming product owners or something of that nature or portfolio 
uh, project managers turn to scrum masters and now they're on the team. People start getting nervous about their careers, naturally, right? They've been in this career, they're uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable because of the unknown. I mean, if they knew their job was ending, they'd actually be more comfortable than the fact that they just don't know, okay? So how do we work with them? We say, first off, dev and QA managers, if we bring two people to, or two types of mentality together, what do you think that turns you into? Well, that means I'm fired. Well, that's only if you choose not to work with this. Well, what do you mean? Can you become a people manager? Can you become a team manager? Well, I've never been in QA. Well, how do you think the QA manager feels right now down the hallway? He's never been a dev manager before. So he's having the same question of if we decide instead of you having your QA team versus their development team, and we say, no, we're going to cut it in half. Half of the dev move over here, half of the QA move over there, and there's still two teams. Who said we're firing you? You're only going to get fired if you choose not to be that team manager. So that means the QA manager needs to probably ask you for advice on how to work with developers. And you need to go to the QA manager and say, I've always worked with the concept delivery guys. I've never worked with the people who actually break the stuff. So coach me too. That's the difference. So a lot of these things change in Agile. Uh, metrics, I've seen this before. I had a bunch of developers who were never wanting to refactor and were always focused on deliver, deliver, deliver because they were bonus in how many lines of code they had. When I found that out, I'm like, what the heck are you doing? Well, you know, we really just want to push code out. And I looked at them and I'm like, have you ever written code before? No, I just, I just want to make sure they deliver. Okay, so I have somebody who's never been in code before dictating a policy around someone's pay rate dedicated to something that encourages the system to be slower. More code means more space, which means the system reads more lines. There's this thing called refactoring, that it removes code because we're allowed to reuse objects or reduce the size of the code base, but it still has the same functionality. But what your metric, your bonus says, don't do that because I won't pay you for that. And the same would be true with um, a bug team. If you said, you get paid based on how many bugs you have, and there are companies out there that do this, they're called crowdfunded bug finders, and a lot of people sign up for part-time work for this and you get paid based on how many bugs you have. Well, if we have a UI, what's the fastest way to find bugs? Line up a bunch of different monitors on a table and just stare at the pixels. Because guaranteed, one of the resolutions won't work. Right, that's the problem with browsers and the problem with pixels is that it's really hard sometimes to like make things work. So let's just do that. Does that mean it's valuable? Well, why didn't you find these bugs around like the date and stuff? Well, that's hard to find, man. Why, why would I do that if I'm getting paid based on my bugs? I'm just gonna go look at the pixels. That's my pay. So we have to look at how we incentivize our team. It is not about being siloed. It is not about unvaluable things. Um, it is not about authority. It is about producing something, not just for output, but a, in the end for outcome, business outcome happy customers showing up at our demo and saying, not only does your product work, I feel comfortable with it. That's what we're after. Okay. So this was not part of the plan. Okay, and in this movie, she was considered the architect and she guides the team through this maze. So that is your scrum master. The maze of process, the maze of culture, the maze of people. So in the scrum guide, it actually says service to the product owner, service to the organization, service to the delivery team. And if you go to the CSM course, you're going to spend a majority of the class on service to the delivery team. Why? Because service to the product owner means you need to be in a product management class. Service to the organization means you need to understand business people. So sometimes program managers have a little leg up here because they're used to doing funding and stuff of that nature, but they also have a leg down because they're used to doing funding and stuff with executives. So service to the organization is about getting people to change their behaviors and their cultures to accept this idea of agile and fall in line with its principles. It is not about trying to get more funding. Okay, so that's the difference between the typical program manager mentality, perhaps project manager, and moving into a scrum master is about, you're about behaviors. And if I were to look at this chart in the back, not the eye chart that says agile roadmaps, if you can read this, you don't need glasses. That was based on the movie Spaceballs. But the actual heart diagram. Some people would say, that looks healthy. To me, that looks like a dang heart attack. 
Because if I were a sprint team that delivered, didn't deliver, delivered, didn't deliver, up and down, up and down, it looks like they're in chaos. So that type of chart would mean one thing for a business person, another thing for a scrum master is like the only consistency we have is inconsistency. That's a problem. Because every two weeks we show our customer we're inconsistent. That's really bad. So they look at things differently. Uh, difference between a scrum master and an agile coach. So there's your agile coach and there's your scrum master. Okay, so the difference is strategic versus tactical if they're both in the same company at the same time. And then there's that high performance tree I was talking about in the background from agile coaching book. They're focused on the orchard of trees, which represent the teams versus this person directly triaging a team, looking at problems versus symptoms on the direct team itself. That's the difference. Um, these slides are based on the Scrum Guide from a couple of years ago, so some of the terms have changed. So I haven't updated the slides in just a little bit, so I apologize for that. But in the end, you're responsible if you're a Scrum Master for ensuring Scrum is understood and enacted if you're truly using Scrum as the Agile framework, okay? This is not about you ensuring the product is the right product. You may be focused on speed because you want an efficient process you want a process that's highly collaborative, highly visible. So yes, you're interested in probably speed because you're looking at in-out, in-out metrics. But you are a servant leader to the team. Again, you have three roles, service to the product owner, service to the dysfunctional team, and service to the organization. Okay, here's your angry paperclip Microsoft. Here's how Apple treats their employees with you know, they have cameras all over the place because they don't want you to take the iPhone 76 into a bar and leave it there and be in the news, right? Amazon's about selling, Google's about buying. So the Scrum Master going from one of these organizations to another, you'd have to approach them differently. It's not like, well, two weeks is two weeks, everybody. Their behaviors and their values are different from organization to organization. And in Microsoft, probably division by division, right? So. How a Scrum Master works through this is normally the hardest job that they have because they don't have a lot of experience in human behavioral trend thinking and um, changing behavioral sets across an organization. They may good, be good at getting funding from a business source, but that's not about behavior. Okay, so this part is really difficult for Scrum Masters typically. And then you have your dysfunctional family that you have to worry about and work with them. Notice removing impediments is only one piece of three slides. So if that's the first thing you see on a job description, I would challenge that in the interview. Well, it's all about removing impediments. Do you really have that many impediments that I'm spending all my time at a team layer removing impediments? What's wrong? That sounds like a symptom to me. What's the real problem you have going on in your organization? Okay. The majority of your time should be coaching, teaching, coaching, Leading, clearly communicating, teaching, understanding, understanding, leading, helping, causing. Sorry, removing impediments is only one line. Then we get into an idea can rewrite all the rules. That is why I have to steal it. So who's the stealer? There's your product owner, the Gordon Ramsay wannabe from Kitchen Nightmares. He wants to steal the idea of value from the customer and apply it to his menu of products or features. So the Gordon Ramsay wannabe, hopefully not dropping the F-bomb too often, but he has maybe multiple teams, multiple products. He does a lot of story slicing. It took me a long time to figure out how to like move the words around like that. So just so you know, I spent a lot of time for you guys. Way in the past, I didn't know you were coming, but here you are. So here's your Gordon Ramsay wannabe, deciding what team's working on what. If you were to say he's kind of an expediter of the kitchen, He's calling out to all the line chefs, in what order do we want delivery in? So a lot of times, this is the role that actually is the hardest to find. And I'm having that trouble at my current company right now, we're working through that. But I've found this to be the same at most companies I worked at. The product owner role, people focus on the word owner and they're all about the authority. But then they're not about the actual role itself. They cling on to this idea that if I own that title, that means I'm in charge of everything. It's a tactical type of owner, the tactical person. Just like there is a captain to a cruise liner, 
who helps determine the port of call. And that's like your product manager saying, we're on this cruise, we're gonna show up at San Jose, we're gonna you know, go to this port, go to that port, go to this port. But when you get close to the ports, he doesn't actually run the ship. He looks at his navigator and says, you know the channel three-dimensionally. You know all the sonograms, you know the floor bed, you know everything. I already determined the port of call. I'm gonna go back to my stateroom. You get the ship down this channel. Let me know if you have any issues. Hopefully we don't sink. Have a good day. And the navigator takes over. He's telling the different department heads, hey, turn on the thrusters 50% in a 20 degree down angle. You over there, you know, it's move the rudder this degree. He's going through all those patterns, moving the ship down the channel, avoiding the reefs. It didn't change the idea that the captain said, you're going to that port. Let me know when you get there. That's called a product manager. He's looked at the market of customers that have bought tickets. He's looked at the available delivery windows called the ports and said, I want to be at that port at that time. Then the product owner shows up and says, I'm the navigator for this team or teams or departments that will deliver that product or service for you called get to the port on time. Now that I know where you want to go, leave it to me. So that's the difference between product owner project, uh, product manager is that main difference. The owner does not mean captain. The owner means in essence navigator. Okay. So they're responsible. If they hit the reef, they're responsible for making that decision. Okay. So that's what the difference is. So when it comes to who is responsible, like who do I put in that role? This is the, one of the hardest roles around is the product owner themselves because they are the glue when it comes to product value and delivery. The scrum master ensures the rules are followed, the culture is changing, people are bettering their behaviors, that they do not determine if the button is red or blue on that screen. They don't determine if you're changing the button in this sprint or two sprints down the road because it's not as valuable to do it now. That is not their decision to make. They're not concerned about that. What they are concerned about is once you set the schedule product owner, the team abides by it. So sometimes you're trying to figure out who to put in that role. If I use a marketer, Oh, great. They're going to have a lot of information from the customers, but they might not know the technical. If I use somebody who's a project manager, they might have a lot of skill set in scheduling, but does that mean they're product savvy? Does that mean that they are technical savvy? Maybe, maybe not. And if I pick a business analyst or a developer and move them up into product owner role, they might really be bad at scheduling because scheduling is not just about technical. It's about when is the opportune time from the business to deliver something. There's always a window of opportune time for revenue generation or least amount of risk to a business because we're not changing all these department heads or some organization structure that's going on. A product owner who's focused on the market would know when those changes are occurring, but someone in the technical may not know that. So that's why the product owner, it's really hard to find the exact right glue, but it is a glue. It's like an epoxy glue. I need a mixture of this agent change agent i need a mixture of this hardening agent over here and when i stir them together with a couple q-tips i can spread it on my boat and i can fix the patch on my boat but if i only have one of the agents called market savvy or technical savvy it's not going to cause the glue the epoxy to actually hold all right so the product owner typically is a sole person the worst thing you can have is a committee deciding if a button should be red the product owner remains accountable. So sometimes I have seen product owners bonus on not necessarily revenue generation, but customer perhaps retention or a blend of customer retention, customer satisfaction, uh, revenue generation, and delivery consistency. That would be a nice blended approach of a bonus structure versus a product manager is probably dedicated some of their bonus direct to revenue generation because they work directly with sales they're determining what's the right market problem to solve. So they're more inclined in their bonuses around there versus the product owners focused around the delivery pattern itself. If you have both of them in the same organization, another way to look at it is the product owner is tactically available for the majority of their time to the team, but they're strategically engrossed with customer feedback, whether they occasionally fly on a plane or they're on a couple of conference calls with customers that are like real customers, not just the sales guys who are trying to sell everything. The product manager, though, is the reverse. 
he's interested enough about what's coming out to make some determinations, but um, he's focused on the market strategy and he knows enough about the noise to say, is that the strategy and customers are want? Uh, a way to determine that would say, you know, T-Mobile was in the news, what, a couple of years back about how they dumped 10% of their customers. Well, why did they make that decision strategically? Because tactically on a daily basis, they knew that those 10% of the customers were calling their call centers more than any other customer in their base. So they were using up the majority of their call center labor when it should have been spread more equally. So they said, I don't want those customers. They actually cost me more money than they actually give me. So strategically, we're going to eventually cut them off and we're going to focus forward on this new customer base. That's how a product manager would see things. A product owner says, who are you cutting out of the system? How many is it? Okay, so does that mean I don't have to worry about the scale of system that you told me six months ago? Oh, I still have to worry about because you're trying to get new customers from AT&T and Verizon to jump ship. Okay, I'll continue forward in building the product for you. Something that's sometimes helpful is a persona wall. I've seen this in a couple of companies where you take a movie that most people know and you write down what their personalities are on the wall and say, okay, so Han Solo and Chewie, they have this personality set together. Leia Cinnamon Buns has this personality. She tends to get loyalty quite often in most of the uh, meetings that I have when I go over this. Jar Jar Banks is always humorous. Sometimes that's your IT department, but sometimes Darth Vader is the IT department. Um, depends on what company you're in, but those are typically the personas that people attach to IT for some reason. And then sometimes you're, here's like your data scientist, you know, they're really good with data, but they're really bad at communicating or something of that nature, even though he's supposed to be a communication droid, right? So you write out all these different personalities and then you start assigning, uh, you have one column for internal customers and another column for external customers. And what you're looking for is from an external point of view, who's Darth Vader? Is that our competitor? Is that a certain customer that always just beats the hell out of us? Or from an internal pers perspective is, you know, Darth Vader IT? Is Darth Vader the legal department? Is Darth Vader, you know, uh, portfolio management because they really come down on us? But you're trying to understand personas. So when you bring a story to a team and say, as Darth Vader, internal Darth Vader, I want security to have such and such, you know, feature sets to it so that I can do a full audit. And they say, who the heck is Darth Vader? And they open it up and they say, oh, legal. Oh, this is in case we're getting sued. Okay. Um, it's not just an IT thing. If it was IT, it'd be Jar Jar Binks because for some reason they don't always know what they're doing. But no, you said Darth Vader. So when I go to test this, you're really concerned from an audit perspective more than you are actually from a security IT perspective. Got it. Okay, I'm going to test a little differently. So that's what a persona wall is for. It's to help the team, which is actually the next slide, of all these different personalities understand who the heck they're building for. And perhaps, just perhaps, they might build it differently. Watch out for the ninja on a team. They always go poof when you need them. You know, they don't show up to a meeting. Um, they're not there for half the sprint, but miraculously they come out at the very end and assassinate the story and they always win. So just be careful about if you have a couple ninjas on your team. All right, so let me pause here before we dig into some more stuff here. Uh, we have half hour left. We're getting close to surprisingly make pretty good product owners. Why? Because they break down a product based on the customer. They tend to ask those questions, like who's this for? Is it for legal? Is it for IT? Um, how do they use the system? So they're very interested, not from a developer, just is it the right thing to build? Or more importantly, is it the right way to build it? Is actually what developers focus on. They focus on the right way. Product owners need to focus on is it the right thing in the first place? And then the Scrum Masters back everybody up by saying, are we building it fast enough so we get those feedback loops? So the product owner, and here, let me give a... There's a great, great video here that I'm just going to bring up so you guys can see it and then you can watch it. I just sent it out to everyone in my division at my company. I'm actually using it as a, all the Scrum Masters have to, um, hey, you get to see everything that I've been looking at lately. Um, let's see here, the uh, Agile product ownership. And there it is because I looked it up lately. This one right here, this video is 15 minutes long. I highly stress all of you watch it. Oh, um, so oh, Michael, we, 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 only see, we only see your presentation because you're sharing the application. Oh, oh okay, okay, hold on one second. I'm moving over here. here oh, here we see, we see it. Mm -hmm. 
So I suggest you all write that down. It has 1.5 million views on it. So there's a good chance someone that you talk to has probably seen it. It's um, 15 or okay. almost 60 minutes long. Um, the most important section for leaders is actually the last three minutes because they talk about what about multiple teams. Mm. So they literally, um, let me pause it here. And he starts off with the PO itself. And he literally builds everything around it. So it doesn't directly answer like who you select to put in that role, but you start seeing like how this piece straps on that piece, how that straps on this piece. And the whole time the product owner is in charge of all this. So you're starting to see, oh, wow, that's where the scheduling kicks in. Oh, that's where he's talking customer negotiation. That's where he's talking release patterns. That's where he's talking uh, metrics, you know, and this is how he says no versus yes. Like mm -hmm. I'm starting to get an idea of the skill set I'm looking for and knowing I'm going to not find perfection, that I'm going to find that blend. Um, but I do pick on QA engineers partly because I was a QA engineer and I became a product owner at one point. So it was, it was a natural progression for me. Because I was always asking those questions like, you know, who is, um, who's this customer? Who is it? And occasionally um, I would, I was told back at that time when I was first learning Agile, it was stressed that the QA engineer did a lot of the demos. And the reason is not because they built it, but because they can tell people how they tested it and more importantly, how they did not test it mm. as they did the demo. Right. So they would say, here's the, we got it, you know, deployed the QA and this is what the problems were just from the deployment itself. So operations teams, if you're watching the demo, you got to watch out for this. And then product owner, when I went through your feature and that's cool, your acceptance criteria was chronological. That is phenomenal. And by the way, that's a, that's a good tip for product owners. Acceptance criteria should be chronological so that literally you open up the user story and say, start at step one. And then the QA engineer is like, well, that would have been nice, but unfortunately, step two is actually step one. That's a big problem, and you didn't even understand how it worked. So let's figure that out. So the, the QA engineer is going through the flow and saying, by the way, when I got to this point, you told me an acceptance criteria to support 100 customers. I actually tested it for 1,000. And we have a lot better metrics than you thought we did. So kudos to the dev guys. Great job, guys. You know, And like the team's getting built up. But the product owner is like, wow, that's actually better, you know, metrics. And I can go back to my product manager, the captain of the ship and say, we're actually going to get to the port of call faster than we thought when it came to scale. So that's why product uh, QA engineers tend to be pretty good product owners. Uh, in general, I know that's a stereotype because there's some pretty bad QA engineers out there, but they understand scheduling because they have to do um, test cases. Right. They have to know when to load the data, when not to load the data. And then they ask the questions like, you said this is a number field. Is it a number field or currency? Mm. Oh, it's current. Oh, it's currency. So why the heck is this table open to everybody? <laughs> like they ask those big questions. Like I could test it, but let's pause before I even bother testing it. What the heck are you doing? That's a security nightmare. You know, and they ask those questions. So then they naturally go on that. If you can't find good QA engineers to move into product owners, you do kind of have to make the decision. Do I grab a marketing fluffy guy <laughs> and then hopefully he can be trained in the technical or do I grab a technical guy and say, remove your hat because when you are scheduling stories, you're going to be inclined to tell them how to do it. Exactly. I need you to say, I have a problem. You tell me the three implementation methods and the pros and cons to both. And I make a business call, not a technical call. Mm. So they tell me that problem. And then project managers are typically a decent blend. But you have to take off the hat of getting funding. You have to take off the hat of you're in charge of everybody, uh -huh. uh, the critical pathways. Critical pathways are good, but you're focused on – your critical pathway can change every two weeks. Mm. So you're more about the sprint. So that's why I use the term Moscow rating, must have, should have, could have. So you have a release based on must have, should have, could have, and you say in this release, here's the must. So those musts are probably going to go into sprints, whether that's one or two sprints or three sprints. And you say, okay, so every one of these sprints has must-have criteria from the release. Great. So in the first sprint, out of the 20 stories I added, these are the five musts. And then here's like the 10 to 12 shoulds and the rest are coulds. And the team's like, why'd you do it that way? Mm -hmm. Think of a horse gate when you're at the Kentucky Derby. All the horses come out in the same direction. That's your must. You're telling the which direction the horses should ride. And then the team, if you think of a beehive, they swarm on those stories and say, we need to get something to QA. We need to get something to QA. And then when we do that, we can dissipate and move out to the majority of the stories, which are the shoulds. 
And then if we run into trouble, the product owner has educated the product manager at the start of the sprint to say, I align the sprint must, should, could. So product manager, when you're talking to your customers and you hear that I'm in trouble, which stories do you think I'm pulling out? The coulds. Mm -hmm. Right. And so those coulds become shoulds in the next sprint. And if we still don't make it, the shoulds become musts in the next sprint. So you do have a line of thinking to say the release will be met, but this is how I angle. So project managers are good at that mm. because they're used to critical pathways, but they do have, you know, if they're really strong there, they might be just mediocre and maybe technical or mediocre in business and they have to make up for those gaps. Right. That's helpful. So, so in the Scrum Guide, it was said that the, the product owner is solely responsible. Is it, is, do you see that in practice being, tr being true that the product owner has the sole responsibility and clout to dictate the backlog, product backlog um, order and prioritization? In new, brand new teams, I can see that happening in existing organizations um, put it this way, it's taken me over a year and a half to prove that point mm. because they said, oh, um, we're not going to fund a product owner. We're going to divvy out the roles. Oh, I love that. The technical <laughs> owner is going to write the stories for the customers they don't know. The scheduling is going to happen by a product manager who doesn't even know the names of the delivery team. And then the scrum master, you just hold it together and write some metrics. <laughs> right? And that's typically what happens in practice is because the role is so misunderstood. Um, when you look up training, there's training dedicated to Scrum Masters. They have so many certs available to Scrum Masters, it's crazy. That's true. They have tons of certs available to project managers. Dev guys have coding classes and stuff. And then you see this product owner and you're like, all right, how many classes does he have? Mm -hmm. He has the CSPO and then he has Pragmatic Marketing, which isn't an agile company. He has the 280 group, which isn't an agile company. And they're like, okay, so we're going to have the least trained guy in charge of everything. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> So custom classes around product ownership, you have to normally invest in and they get lost. But then when, if you guys watch that video that I just told you about, you're going to realize like why it's so critical that that is like the cornerstone. The scrum master and product owner are the cornerstones. If you decide to scale, you have to make sure the foundation of the building is intact. But a lot of people don't put that cornerstone in. They say, scrum master, you got this. We're going to give you out the roles of the product owner. And you're like, what the hell just happened? and then the metrics just keep collapsing. Thank you for answering that, uh, Michael. That's very helpful. For, for these um, folks like uh, Fabian, I'm not sure how you practice uh, Agile in your firm or if you do. The folks at Biotech, um, Paul, if you want to speak to any Agile um, behaviors you've seen and ask questions, Justin, everyone else from Biotech, feel free to, to jump in here. But for me, you know, I, I found this session to be very helpful in giving me the right mindset. You know, even though I've been for um, for Scrum and, and Agile training, this is extremely um, eye-opening and it grounds you back to to the reality of what it's all about. So, um, Paul, I don't know if you, you want to come on. I'm going to unmute you. You're one of my um, bosses anyway, one of my champs from previous. So I'm going to unmute you, Paul. Uh, warning. <laughs> So here we go. Paul, are you there? Hey, Phil. Hey, Paul. Sorry to put you on the spot, but yeah, you're you're one of my bosses. That's right. from so, so unfortunately, I'm in an environment with a lot of background noise. They got the uh, the landscape crew outside mowing the lawn right now, so I don't know. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's fine. That's fine. I just wanted you to speak really quickly, Paul, to any agile behaviors or not that you've seen uh, within your firm? Have you seen agile practiced on any level at all that um, you can ask questions or that Michael can speak to for clarity? So I have seen some, I have seen some, uh, but a lot of it is so inconsistent because I see different pockets. For instance, at my current client site, there are certain departments trying to implement either Kanban or agile or some other things, but, it's a isolated group within the larger community, which the larger community does not understand what the, what those practices are. And I think they spend so much time in conflict that they really don't, they say they try to do implement some of those processes, but they can't because they, I guess the, the organization is not set up for that and does not support it. So I think they've found themselves 
kind of putting it to the side because as it was said earlier, it takes so many different roles We have the project manager, the analyst, the team to all be on the same page of that. Um, but my current client is working on trying to do a little bit of what was talked about today, but um, the big, the big issue is what was said a moment ago by Michael was we get a lot of people, we need to get this done, but then there's not a lot of, well, how do we get it done? Who is going to be responsible? And the uh, thing you said a moment ago about the, either the product owner or the system owner, uh, very true on my current project that right now the project team on my project is almost telling sometimes the system owner what they want. And we're not getting a lot of feedback because the, person who will be on paper, the system owner, they're like, just give me the system working. I don't want to make those decisions. You guys are the ones who have done projects like this. What should I be asking for? And so it's a little disconnect. The project team is telling themselves what the system owner, uh, what does the system owner want? And sometimes there's some disconnect there. Mm. Yep. Another problem is, um, so the picture I put up here, because you mentioned Kanban is that the role itself, especially the, the product owner, changes behaviors based on which um, Agile framework you're using. If you're an offensive-based Kanban, and that's all you are, you're true Kanban, perhaps with some lean development in it, you need to be a very, very, very disciplined uh, product owner because you're giving up some of the rules of process that Scrum comes with. Because Scrum is closer I would say closer to waterfall because you have designated gates. And yes, there, it's in miniature. Um, the feedback loop is there, which makes it agile. The responsiveness, the small stories making it agile. The culture is there. So I'm not saying that Scrum is waterfall. I'm just saying it's easier sometimes for waterfall people to identify to because they're, they see gates. They see some form of uh, control versus the compound flow is just like a hose. You know, if, the terminology I use for scrum is if you're, you have a big pool in the backyard and you're trying to figure out how to fill it up, that's like someone, like a business person saying, when are you going to give me this feature group? Not just features, this feature group, buddy, because that's the way we used to work. Six months out, you give me this feature group. And you're like, but I got sprints, I got releases. It doesn't change the fact that the business wants dates. They just want to know, oh, so you're going to give me multiple dates. Okay, well, give them to me all perfectly, because that always works, right? You, in the scrum mentality, it's like filling up a Home Depot bucket because you know within a sprint, I have so many people with so many hours, so many points, so many calendar days. So regardless how you plan, whether it's by points, hours, or calendar days, you're still filling up a bucket, right? And you fill up the bucket as high as you can because everyone wants everyone at 100% because that always works out well too, right? 100%, nothing will happen. So you fill up this bucket full of water, five gallons, which means it's really heavy. And then you're gonna walk across this unlevel terrain called your backyard. It's not flat, it's up and down, you've been meaning to re-landscape for a long time. So the bucket is swaying back and forth, spilling water. Sounds like someone was scheduled at 100% and they got distracted. That sounds normal, right? Then you take this bucket and you pour the water into the pool and you realize, oh my goodness, that's all that, it filled the pool and I gotta do this how many times? Oh boy, this will be fun. So you spend hours and hours walking across the backyard with a bucket. And then someone comes into your backyard called neighbor and he's holding a beer and he's like, huh, that's kind of funny. What are you doing? I'm filling up my pool. You know, dude, there's a better way to do this. What's that? And he just puts his beer down, grabs your hose, takes it to the pool, drops it in there and comes back and turns the spigot on and says, I can tell you when the pool fills based on how much water comes out because the hose is consistent. And then you look at your neighbor and say, but John, you're a plumber. I'm not, I'm just a homeowner. Of course you know flow. I don't know flow. I just know five gallon bucket holds five gallons. So a lot of people are concerned of moving from Scrum to Kanban and Kanban to Scrum because a lot of it's around scheduling. In Scrum, you commit, you deliver. So that means you can have somewhat of a quote unquote lazy product owner, a, a ninja product owner, or somebody that's just not fully there. And the team will probably make up for some of that by committing because they do these plan based events. Kanban is the hose is on or it's not. The hose is kinked or it's not. The hose is too long or too short or it's not. There's no middle ground. 
So once you turn the hose on, you can measure. So is the hose too long? You have too many gates in the way. Did you know that a hose, when you double its size, you lose more than 50% of water flow rate? That's why you want the shortest hose possible to whatever you're filling, because there's less vibration in the hose. But scrum guys don't care about that. They say, fill up the bucket, get the bucket across the yard, fill, drop it in there, let us know if you spill any water, and we'll move on to the next sprint. So product owners, when you go back to your original question of who's the right person, sometimes you have to say, well, what flow are we using here? Well, we're agile. That doesn't answer the question. What agile framework are we using? Because that'll also help determine what type of product owner I want. Because maybe my more inexperienced ones will be a little better in Scrum because they have the team to help get them up to speed and make them better. However, if I put them in Kanban and they're deploying every single night in automated fashions and they have to make decisions every single day on what story to schedule and you don't know good scheduling tactics, you are the wrong guy to put in that role. But you might be okay in Scrum. So that's why I wanted to throw that out there because you mentioned Kanban and it's not that simple to just say, well, do you have this glue of skills? It's also about, is the glue going to be conducive to the material you're putting it on? Like plastic glue works on plastics. Other glues work on metals. And so scrum is a plastic, Kanban might be a metal in this analogy. And you're saying, listen, I understand your glue. You're just not going to be conducive to this material. So I need to put you on that material. And I saw, I think a couple questions were coming in maybe. Yeah, maybe, here we go. That, that was just me um, asking oh. some of my champions who've been in other classes. So Connor, I know Connor may have um, some perspectives or questions to share as well. Hey Connor, feel free to jump in. Fabian, if you got any questions or comments, uh, don't hesitate to put them in. But um, I was just wondering, you know, speaking of, um, the hose and the bucket analogy. Do you see like towards the, you know, the, the big day of, of the release or the end of the sprint, do you see teams still falling back into those behaviors from waterfall, trying to, trying to work abnormal hours to, to cram everything in? Do you see that happening a lot? Oh yeah, I see it all the time. Um, I just found out from one of my scrum masters last night in an email that one of the dev managers is having a metrics review today. And I'm like, what metrics are they going over? Well, they're going over hours and stuff. And I'm like, Scrum Master, what's going on? You're not, are they trying to change the culture back? No, no, no. They just want to make sure they're billing, you know, they're, they're racking up as many hours as they can. I'm thinking like, all right, so what about the value of the product? Those are the metrics I'm interested in. Why are you going after the individual hours? I don't care how much hours you worked last night if you're not going to be on time anyway. Mm. Like, interesting. I don't like you working off hours, but... If you worked off hours because you were trying to get something done and you get it done, great. Now let's work on why are we doing that? It, was that a one-time event? Okay. Or is this continual? Bad culture. Let's fix it. But if you're not going to be on time anyway, I don't really care you worked eight hours last night. Interesting. Sorry to hear that, but we didn't reach our goal anyway. So what's the point? Um, so that's some of the differences. Um, the product owner argument is always ongoing. Um, we're starting to realize, I really had, our company actually changed the title from product owner to the technical owner. And I finally had a couple of directors tell me, and I told you it's been almost a year. And they came up to me and said, now I know why you didn't want us to use the term technical owner, because all these developers are trying to be product owners and they don't know what the heck is going on. And I'm like, okay, now that you understand it, we have to pay for our sins. And we have to undo it. It's going to take a while to do it. Probably going to take a quarter or two to do it. So when you're thinking in product roadmap perspective, you're not going to, number one, see the problem get cured if you're all on board on fixing it for a couple quarters, which means you're not going to get the realization of the benefits probably for the third quarter. And they're like, wow, that's a long time. And I said, well, look at it this way. Every quarter is three months. How many sprints are in a month? Two, maybe two and a half, depending on if it's a long month. Okay, so to change a product owner's behavior around story grooming, sizing, estimating, scheduling, I only have so many 
product planning meetings to see if it works. I can help them along the way without the team, but in the end, they have to make sure their product meeting works with the team. So I only have like two times I can do this a month-ish. So that's six times over the course of three months. Okay, probably not gonna be very good at it, but maybe we're fixing things. So two quarters to fix the behaviors and get the meetings in line, then a quarter for the behaviors to settle into outcomes. So there you go. So I recommend the Scrum Masters if you're you know, all potential being Scrum Masters, you have to think like a product owner does because your product is the team. Your product is the culture. So you need to have an agile roadmap just like a product manager has a product roadmap. So when he slaps the roadmap down in front of you and says, in Q1, we're doing this with the product, and you say, oh, that's nice. In Q1, we're doing this with the agile process. He's like, what do you mean? Well, if I do this, I'm going to speed you up in the third quarter. But if you don't give me the time to make those changes because you're flooding me with feature requests, you're not going to get that benefit. So now it's a business conversation. And most Scrum Masters don't do that either, is they don't have Agile roadmaps. So it's not just the product owner showing up and being the right person. Now you have to look at the Scrum Master and say, where's your roadmap? I didn't know we had to have roadmaps. I thought we were just about sprints and stories. No, no, no. You have a product called a team. So you're almost hiring two product owners, just one's dedicated to process and culture and one's dedicated to the actual tangible product or service. That's a really powerful analogy. I'd, I'd never thought of it like that. Absolutely. We had a question come in from Paul. Um, what do you do when your organization doesn't want to invest the time to fix or retrain their behavior? Well, what they're not noticing is that they do have the time because they're paying for it right now. There are, you have to help them understand, and it takes a while. So first off, patience, unfortunately, is going to be your number one um, asset and empathy, you will see the symptoms at the team layer. Okay, so first get them to realize when they say, man, the team doesn't deliver, team doesn't deliver, you say, that's an interesting symptom. Are we having that symptom someplace else? Well, yeah, this other team's doing this too. Okay, interesting symptom. Who else? Symptom, symptom, symptom. I am a doctor, I am about problems. If you're blowing your nose and coughing, I don't just hand you a Kleenex and say your cold has been cured. You have the time to blow your nose, but you didn't have the time to wash your hands. Okay, so let's focus on where do you think the problems are? If the fish are dying downriver, you probably don't just scoop up the fish. You go upriver and say, who's dumping the toxic waste? Because if I dump more fish in here, they're all going to die too. So you're using these different analogies to help people appreciate that, number one, you're listening to them and you hear them. It's like someone coming up to your cube and saying, I have a problem. No doubt you do, right? But is it a problem or is it a symptom? From your perspective, it's a problem, but I'm looking at holistically across the organization to see if it's actually a number of symptoms due to a problem. And they don't see that because they're stuck in their area. Um, then going through that piece of how do we invest the time? Well, you have the time to do hot fixes. Can you imagine if you didn't have to do hot fixes? We wouldn't have to, one, do multiple deployments, risk our entire code base. We wouldn't have to change our user guides. We wouldn't have to retrain customer service. The product owner wouldn't have to say sorry 500 times on the phone every day, and he could focus on what money you're giving me for new features. The solution guy is, you know, and you go through this yada yada of symptom, 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 because we had the time to shove it down the customer's throats, and it was the wrong product. So that means we had the time to do it a different way. We chose not to. We chose to spend the money elsewhere. So when it comes to like, um, and if they need dollars and cents, that's where like this slide up here, this one that you saw earlier, labor cost does come in handy. Um, the reason is most scrum masters and most product owners do not know how much their sprint costs. At my current company, I can't give you the actual number, obviously, but we spent over $150,000 in labor in one sprint across a normal sized agile team who works on big data. So I can't give you the actual number, but I'm trying to stress that it was very expensive. When I bring these numbers then to people, I say, this isn't me trying to squeeze every dollar out of people, but I'm trying to impress on you that you have the time to spend that money once, twice, three, four, five times before you get the feature right. Instead of, you know, instead of doing it that way, how about you write a spike to research a technology before you start building it? 
and then demo to the team what it is, and then make the decision, is it worth that 150,000 or 300,000 or 450,000 if we're wrong? So the same is true then, you're finding ways to first start with talking about why. Why are these behaviors the way they are? Why do you see them as symptoms, not problems? And then move out to the how of the process. And then eventually come out to the what. Don't start from the what and come in because you always will end up stopping at the how because you lose people. If you come to them with facts and figures, we had this many bugs, we had this many stories, we had this, people don't care. But if you focus on the why, behaviors and motivations, they will start to listen. Uh, what else do we have here? Would you address the symptom in a group setting or the individual? If it's tactical, I tend to do it um, individual first. Like if I'm a scrum master on a team, I'll pull them aside and go over whatever symptom it is. Um, I tend to coach product owners on the side first before you do it in front of a team because remember, some people come from the background of authoritation, uh, authority, owner means authority, I'm in charge, right? And you have to be a little empathetic to that, even if it's right or wrong. When it comes to business though, and you're into the product manager realm, directors and people who do funding, I find group settings help a little better there because they have a lot of people underneath them and all their wings. And so when I present data to them, you have to one, make it very palatable. And again, that's why the why, how, what approach tends to work. Focus on symptoms, roll and use the term roll up to behaviors. So you're almost like painting them a, uh, a report teams to products to programs to portfolio in their head they're seeing it and they're seeing the roll up of nature and you're not pointing the finger at anybody you're saying if you see this symptom happening and it rolls up to this this is actually what it becomes hey look at that at this level it's another symptom so this symptom actually caused the ones beneath it let's roll it up a little higher to what we're in control of as a senior leadership team okay you guys made a decision to do this the pros and cons were this yes we got the pros However, we also got these cons, and even the cons we didn't even realize, this is what it caused us to do. So the question is, do you still have the time to not retrain people, the time not to deploy properly, the time to do this, because it's hurting your customers, it's hurting how your VPs look at you, or do we have the time to solve the problem? And then when they normally say, oh, no, no, we have time to solve the problem, you say, do you really? Let me lay it out for you. And then you lay out your roadmap in front of them and show them this is not a, we retrain the product owners and in two weeks they're better. It's multi-quarter. That's when the results kick in. So if you delay your decision, you delay that rollout. Um, another good example is here, I'm gonna bring it up on the screen. Um, it is Domino Chain Reaction. This one right here, Domino Chain Reaction, that has 3.4 million views on it. He actually has an article. The first domino is five millimeters in height and one millimeter thick. When he pushes that over, after 13 dominoes, the last domino weighs over 100 pounds. If you continued those dominoes in size, meaning he's increasing them all by one and a half times, if you did it to 29 dominoes, the last domino would be the size of the Empire State Building. And that's just science. So what it's showing is most people think dominoes of the first video here where everything's the same size. When it comes to organizational changes, organizational changes fail for two reasons. One, the domino that first drops is too heavy and squashes everybody. Number two, Dominoes are occurring, but eventually you try to make it the next domino larger than two times the size of the one that's hitting it. When you do that, that domino will not fall. So that means we become impatient and we push too many things at once, maybe in concurrency or a serial pattern, whatever it is, whether you're doing things in parallel or not, at some point you put something too large in front of something, like we put a tool changing, like moving from Rally to Jira, Jira to version one or something, and we didn't lay that out. Or the process has changed, we threw this intake process out there, or some governance, and the chain reaction ends. And the problem with that though is to get the chain reaction to restart means you have to have the amount of gravitation 
necessary to move that. So how are you going to get that now that everyone feels like they just got stalled? So hope that answers some of your questions, but um, sometimes the group setting is good more with business people because they start arguing about like, because it's a, a series of symptoms leading up to a roll up. But when you get more tactical work, it's more personal. Uh, think of why don't we want agile teams to be like three or four people because it gets personal. Well, man, if the dude who coded this would have just done it right, what do you mean? I'm the only developer on this team, you know, and it becomes really personal. So individual at the personal level, but more general as you get higher up the chain, because you're talking about holistic and patterns across multiple uh, levels. Mm. Very interesting. Thank you, Leon Seal, for that uh, question. We, we, we could probably go on and on with questions, Michael. So um, I know we're three minutes away. Does anyone else have any questions for Michael to answer or concerns? Because you know, they just know how long it takes me to answer the question. <laughs> well, I, I think my last question will be, how do you see agile teams working in reality compared to these fully planned driven teams? For example, a lot of companies that I've worked with, you see people coming in and bouncing around. Do you see more loyalty in agile teams, more commitment to stay for the long haul, or is it pretty much the same? When, when you uh, approach it properly, I see loyalty increasing. Just know that just like you have a demo meeting, every two weeks we remind the customer if we're, we're worth having a business with or not. Every day, your team does that in daily stand-up. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I'm coaching at the tactical level, if I have to do something in front of the entire team, like a developer says I'm developing, I'll pause everybody and say, hold on, guys. You just said you're developing. You're a developer. Congratulations. Thanks for showing up today. <laughs> right? How did that encourage your counterpart here, whether it's another developer or a BA or the product owner or a QA engineer, to be loyal to you? Mm. Does developing help them? They're like, well, what do you mean? What do you want me to say? Are you in the middle of working on the API? Are you in the middle of working on the UI? Are you having problems with data? Because you complain that the QA engineer asked too many questions. Well, he's asking questions because you just tell him you're developing. You just tell him you show up. But if you tell him that you're having problems with the organization structure and the API, guess what he's going to write more tests for and what he's not going to write tests about. He's going to spend more time on the organization area because you indicated that's a problem. Mm. But he's not going to spend a lot of time on the things you said were fine. So guess what? Less questions. So Loyalty kicks in when you start adding those behaviors and the co coaching behind it. And then you do this, but you're, you're consistent in that pattern. So if a product owner shows up with an empty user story, you stop everybody and say, product owner, how does nothing in the user story or acceptance criteria that says make the website fast, make your team loyal to you? What the hell is fast? <laughs> is fast three seconds, is fast five milliseconds? You know, the developer is going to code it based on his approach, but he's not the one that uses your product. Sure. Yeah. Right. And so you just have to be consistent in that behavior. And then eventually the team becomes, you don't want them to be happy. You want them to be disciplined because discipline will make them confident, which brings happiness. Mm -hmm. If I wanted you just to be happy, I'd buy you donut. <laughs> okay, Michael. Well, with that, I'm just going to hand it back to you for final closing comments and remarks and everyone else who's been on the call. Those of you PMPs looking for your PDUs, uh, Connor, Paul, um, those are going to be going across to you. Margaret's on the call, so she's taking note of that, our learning admin. And um, anyone else that has any uh, comments, concerns, feel free to email them to us. Um, we'll get them back to Michael, come with um, answers to your questions next time. But Michael, any closing remarks? Um, my closing remarks is you're more capable of doing things than you realize. So. Unfortunately, the one thing on the flip side of the coin is there is no one in a boat rowing to you. There's no life preserver coming at you. And a lot of times we as leaders like scrum masters and others, we have to understand there's nobody but you. So first off, don't wait for others to save you. But at the same time, on the flip side of the coin is you are more capable than you realize you are. So have hope. Um, Positivity will take you a long way. So that's all I got. 
Well, thank you all for joining me. Thank you, Michael, and we look forward to seeing you again in a few weeks. Bye, everyone. All right. See you. Cheers. Okay. All right, welcome everyone sure. to our meeting for today. We have our esteemed coach and colleague, Agile coach, who's gonna be taking us through the trajectory of Agile, helping us get into the nuts and bolts of what exactly it is. Some of you are thinking of taking the PMP exam, or you're thinking of taking the ACP exam, or you just wanna know a little bit more about Agile. Well, Michael is gonna get you on the right tracks. So without much ado, I'd like to welcome Michael to the microphone and um, take it away, Michael. Good morning, everybody. I think it's morning across America right now still. Um, yes, th thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm an agile coach. I uh, have my own little side company, but I also work for uh, Comcast. Um, I'm an okay guy, go, though. So even though the customer service sometimes has issues, um, I'm an okay guy. You can still talk to me. Uh, we're going to be going through some stuff here. Um, can you all see my screen? I just want to make yeah. sure you can see my screen. Yeah, okay, and I'm, a, I'm a looking to the side because I'm sharing my second monitor because it has better resolution. I mean, I'm not really trying to show you a profile of my face, like a mugshot or anything. So I apologize that I'm not always looking at the camera. Um, you can find pretty much a lot of trainers, uh, the majority of trainers teach Agile as um, you know process and they'll go through the artifacts and things of that nature. Uh, there's a handful of trainers out of every, you know, like 100 that take you down a different route. And yes, we do talk about the artifacts because they're necessary in the roles, but we try and take you down a different motivational route. And that's the route I tend to go down. Um, we're gonna get into some human behaviors, uh, the way we communicate with each other. And my goal behind that is if I can motivate people to approach um, the process or the tools or uh, you know, our people, then everything else just comes along for the ride. And it makes more sense when you're explaining the process to say, well, if we can focus on the behavior or focus on the motivational factor, then you understand why you would want to do the process and the metrics that may or may not be present would back up your, uh, your presentation. So on my screen here, uh, this is from a, a class that I had for um, a couple of days back in 2013 with uh, the PMI in Denver. So this was sanctioned by the PMI. Um, I would assume you probably get PDU credits for this course that we're going through. So today I think it's two hours, so you get like two PDUs if you wanna claim those. And then if you show up to, I don't know, uh, if we're having you know, the second session, that would be another two hours. So the question I ask at the beginning of the class of uh, what is the most resilient parasite? Yeah, and that gets people thinking because you know that's not a normal question to ask in an agile class. But what it is, is um, it's an idea. And the reason I say that is not only do I love the movie Inception, which is what this is kind of based on, and actually the class was called Project Inception, so you might see some movie posters throughout the course material today. But the reason is if I told you to stop thinking about a pink elephant, you instantly are thinking about a pink elephant. And then if I say, well, forget I said that, then you're thinking about it again. And the more and more you think about it, you're reinforcing the idea in your head. And it gets harder and harder for you to let go of it. I mean, the worst thing to say to someone is when they're upset, be calm. And when you're trying to get them to forget something, forget we said that, right? And the reason is you're reinforcing whatever that behavioral pattern is of the moment. So if I were to say, I want you to forget that Agile is about process, but focus on a different idea, um, that would be that Agile is about loyalty. And these are the kind of comments that I use with product managers when I'm training them. A loyal customer should not be confused with a paying customer. And product managers know that right away. Uh, they understand that just because someone found your product to be the solution of the moment and they paid for it, doesn't mean they care anything about you, doesn't mean they understand anything about your company. In fact, you, they may buy a product thinking it's from this company and then realize later it was a distributor who got it from another company who actually made it in the first place, right? So there's no loyalty there when it comes to paying customers. A loyal customer is different. Sometimes we call them partners, right? And because they have a different behavioral mentality. Uh, same is true with a loyal employee. It shouldn't be confused with a paid one. The majority of your employees are paid, right? Hopefully so, or you'll be in a lawsuit, right? But 
The case is, why do we say, my goodness, that's a loyal employee? Or, wow, what, that, you know, that's loyalty right there, buddy. You know, and the reason why we call that out is it's a set of behaviors about that person that is different than the rest of your employees at the moment. It doesn't mean everyone else is disloyal, but you're calling out that behavior for, you know, a certain reason. So when we look at how we even communicate, this is uh, based on the book, uh, It Starts With Why, which is, I recommend that book highly. Um, he goes over this and he calls it the golden circle. This is, you know, a, uh, from a biologist standpoint, if you were looking down at someone's head from above them uh, into their brain, you would see the brain is made up of these different layers. Uh, the neocortex, uh, which is about your rational thinking. You know, when someone talks about metrics, they're talking from that part of their brain. Uh, when they're talking about the limbic brain systems, which include the reptilian stem, they're talking about feelings. That's when you come out of an interview and you say, I don't know what it is, but something about this person just feels right. You look at the resume and say, man, he doesn't know how to write a resume. This is really bad. But something about this guy feels right. Or that person really stutters or they have some communication problem but something about them feels right. And then you hire that person, they turn out to be the most loyal employee you've ever seen before, uh, doing things you didn't even ask them to do. They're just going ahead and doing it. And they're one of the best employees you've ever had in your life. It, that's because it was the limbic brain, the emotions behind it, um, that were causing you to make that decision. And then you tried to rationalize it, you know, with their resume or with their skill or with their output over time. So here's an example of how people explain Agile. If you come from the neocortex perspective and you were walking into a chief financial officer's office, you would say, hey, I think we need to move to Agile. You know, we would have uh, faster code delivery, maybe better quality. Uh, we would have, uh, you know, different style meetings, you know, smaller meetings throughout the week. And the CFO is like, this doesn't mean much to me. You know, go, go talk to some developer guy, right? Someone who comes from the limbic brain perspective from inside out would say to the CFO, um, you know, first off, thanks for taking the time with me today. You know, our products are subscription based, which means we're really focused on customer retention. And more so, we're concerned about a loyal customer base. What if I told you I found a way that we could inspire our customers to want to be loyal to us, to continue forward with their relationship with us, and lo and behold, give us feedback that allows us to build things in a more efficient manner. And, you know, the CFO kind of scratches his head, and he's thinking in the back because he rationalizes things, you know, based on an Excel spreadsheet that is in his head. And he goes, subscription-based services, customer retention, loyal customers. Loyal customers come back. Okay, interested. How are you, how are you going to do this? Well, we're going to, we have a process that allows us to, you know, include customers into giving feedback cycles. And I don't mean just our product works. I mean, tell us the truth. Your, your product sucks. And here's the reason why. Your product is phenomenal. I don't know what it is, but something about it makes me really comfortable. And for us to be able to go down that pathway with them to understand what's triggering them to feel that way. And if we can do that and apply it to our products on not just a an occasional um, delivery, but on a repeatable pattern. So instead of us doing this long drawn out, we give you product every six months and then you forget about us and then you're not loyal to us anymore. But if you know, if I figured out what really drove your behavior and included that into our product or service, if you're a service oriented company, and the customer every two weeks was reminded why we're awesome. Every two weeks, they showed up and said, you did what you told me you would do that would incline them to want to work with us. And the CFO was like, go on. Okay, and so if, if we constantly do this, then also our team morale is gonna increase, which I think is gonna reduce our turnover rate of our customer, our, our customer service base um, when it comes to our outward facing customer service, our, also our morale inside of our developers and QA engineers, because every two weeks or, you know, Better yet, every day, we're going to have this daily meeting where we show up and they go over what they work on and they inspire each other to work like teammates, something we don't do today because everyone reports to their manager in some spreadsheet and it just never works out. They feel like there's authoritarian regime around here and we just want teams. 
And then the CFO goes, okay, how much money do you need? And he goes through some of that and says, okay, start with a prototype team, whatever. And he says, what should I call this? And the person turns around and says, oh, by the way, it's called Agile. So you didn't start off with saying, here's Agile, here's the metrics, here's the process. I, I, I hope you believe in this. You cornered it around behaviors, feelings, customer retention, a loyalty, and it was supported by a process, supported by how you did things, and then lo and behold, by the way, you were explaining Agile in the first place. And that was just a change of how you communicate, but that's how the thought-provoking companies do communicate. And in this book, Start With Why, he goes over, that's how Apple communicates. Um, you know, for example, uh, a lot of their commercials used to say, think different. Right. They didn't try and sell your product. They tried to sell you a belief. So if you believed in that, you would do the same thing. OK, so the same here is true with Agile is you can approach it from a process oriented perspective, from a certification, a rule perspective. But if you approach it differently, um, you move people to want to join you. So uh, we're going to skip this work, uh, workshop because obviously I don't have the video that I can show you right now. But I'll, if we have time at the end, I'll go over what the video is so that you could do it with your team. Why Agile? Positives and negatives. Notice most of the positives are negatives, too. If you're faster to market with the wrong thing, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, the only person you're helping is your competitor. Okay, so when people say we're faster to market, you can say, well, anyone can be faster with the wrong thing. Heck, I could do that right now. Here, let me type hello world in a text file. Hey, look at me, I'm a developer. Is that what you wanted? Does that make me agile? Okay, so faster market only works if it's the right thing. Uh, quick feedback, that's great you get quick feedback, but if someone keeps telling you that you're wrong and every day you keep proving to them, number one, you are wrong, and two, you don't listen, how long is that customer gonna stick around? All right, so as you look at the different agile frameworks, you will notice some of them are designed more around speed, some are designed more around visibility, and do know that all those positives can be negatives if you're not approaching it properly. At the top is your serial-based waterfall mentality. Now, these sticky notes are the really, really big ones. We're talking like almost the size of a sheet of paper. Okay, so just think of that in your head. If I broke across an application, how it works on the top, and said, this is what we're going to work on over the next six months, and then someone says, we're agile. We do stories. We don't use a PRD, we don't use a BRD, an MRD, SFS, any of those acronyms that you would find out there for big documents. Instead, we use these little things called user stories. And what they are is a slice of the system uh, for a user. Okay, great, so if I sliced all these sticky notes up with my hands, you would notice that they don't cut perfectly. This is not a pair of scissors. A system doesn't work like that. You can't just cut it with a pair of scissors and say, it's gonna be perfect. No, you have crossover. You have this API calls on that database. This UI works with that API. And in fact, that API not only serves up the browser on your desktop, but then serves this mobile system over there, right? So you have cross bleed all over the place. So when you're doing this and you just line everything up and say, I'm not changing anything about scope. You just told me Agile would be faster if I made these stories smaller. But lo and behold, based on this picture here, it's taking longer. And why is that? Because of the cross bleed, because of the multiple meetings that you now have, you, you may not have a, a big release go, no go, but you have a daily stand up every day. You have now, if you're in the scrum mentality, um, you have pre-planning meetings, you have planning meetings, you have demos constantly. If you're in the Kanban flow, uh, your daily activity is, you are doing a daily planning meeting every day, just on smaller stuff. So that idea of the overhead kicks in. The only way it's faster is if I looked at those large items at the top and focused on those little green squares and said, those are the points of value. That's all the customer wants. Those are the must haves of the must shoulds and coulds. Those are the musts. Those are what you work on. Okay. So if I focused on that and that alone, it becomes like that. That's the only way agile is actually better is you're focusing on faster to market with the right thing. Quick feedback triggers us to develop the right thing. We're visible about what we are working on. 
which is the right thing. We have less documentation because we're not building everything. Okay, so that's when the positives kick in. Otherwise, if you're doing everything the way you used to do and you're just slicing things up and calling yourself agile because you have a daily scrum, then you turn into this mess. Uh, a couple of good books out there. Uh, one here is the Toyota Product Development System. You will find a lot of things about Agile are based on a lot of things Toyota did in the past. Okay, so one thing about Toyota is their their product owners must do a couple things to just work on um, architecture of a car. You are forced as a architect to go work in Japan at their car dealerships for six months. You're not allowed to go to the corporate headquarters and focus on architecture, which is what they asked you for, until you sit in sales office for six months. That's how they run it. Another thing is their chief product owners there who actually you know, govern the entire project plans and features and stuff, they're with the company at least 15 years before they're allowed to have that position. Okay, so it gives you an idea of, one, the loyal base that they have for customers to stick around that long, or I mean employees. Two, they focus on putting them in front of customers first before they allow them to do anything. And another thing about, um, I'm not sure if any of you have their Toyota minivan. I don't know how many of you have like 15 kids or anything, but you might have their minivan. Notice that if you go to Home Depot and you take out their seats in the back, you can fit a full piece of plywood in it. Now, most of us are like strapping it to our car, going into the lumber area and say, can you cut this in half for me? It's not going to fit my truck or it's not going to fit my uh, SUV or anything of that nature. Toyota said, listen, they had a case study where they told the architects to drive around America for six months with customers to where they went to observe their activities. Now, obviously, they paid the customers, you know, for them to be snooped on the whole time. But they're watching their behaviors when it came to their minivan. And what they noticed is that people were strapping plywood on top of the minivan. So they focused on the value proposition and said, that's pretty simple to solve. If we can get the seats out of there and make sure the wheel wells are further enough apart, that's a selling point. Suddenly, we solved that big problem. So that's what happened with them. And they give a couple of those examples in their books, focusing on customers and understanding their behavior of trends. And then they said, listen, you're not allowed to even do your job until you understand the trends of our customers, let alone change anything. So agile is simple, not easy. If someone's told you it's easy, they're probably a consultant. Okay, and they're trying to sell you something. Um, agile is simple. The simplicity of focus on customers respond to their feedback, have a consistent meeting every day called the daily stand-up, have demos, have pre-planning, all that stuff. Simple. The hard part is we work with people. People come with all this other stuff. They come with cultural differences. They come with gender differences. They come with ethics and religion and all that stuff. And HR tells us to avoid that. However, when you're focusing on teams, you have to understand their motivations. And that's where Agile becomes a little difficult. For example, I learned this by working with a lot of uh, the folks from India. I was noticing that the offshore team was not showing up to my daily stand-up meeting every morning, and they were the testing team at night. And I was asking them, saying, I really need you on this call. I really need you on this call every morning. We're a team. We're a team. We're a team. And the only person that showed up from India was the lead. And so I was starting to get frustrated, and I had built a good relationship with the Indians that were here in America onshore. And one of them pulled me aside and said, you just don't understand this. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, this is pretty simple. I just want to get people to show up at the meeting, people who did the work. He goes, you're not understanding this. This is, he goes, examine the situation. You're dealing with culture issues and gender issues. And I'm like, okay, explain. I'm interested. I, I want to help this team. And he said, the person who's offshore, what gender are they? And I said, she's a female. And I said, okay. Realize that in our culture, we focus on, you know, we treat people differently based on a couple things. One is gender. Two, sometimes religion. Three, education. And he said, so first off, if you're highly educated and you're onshore in America and you're a female, 
the males offshore will respect you. However, if you're offshore and you're a female, they will be very authoritarian and only the male will show up to your meeting. So he's like, you need to break through to people to help them understand what you're looking for, but you have to be empathetic to who we are. And so I thought about it and thought about it and I eventually talked to the lead offshore and said, I respect you, your professional career. I understand you're pretty highly educated to be in the position you're in leading your team. Um, I don't know anything about, you know, perhaps your religion or anything of that nature, but what I do know is that you're dealing with an American culture here that is focused on the simplicity of the people who do the work should be the ones who give the answer to the questions. And the reason is we're trying to reduce inefficiency or misunderstandings like a telephone game. I'm asking that we compromise and help me learn how to respect you guys better. But at the same time, could you please have her show up at the meeting so that we can just get the most efficient message possible about how the tests were last night? And from that day forward, she showed up to every single meeting. So Agile is simple. It's not easy because it's no longer an authoritarian perspective. It is not a long drawn out project plan, Gantt chart, um, critical pathway perspective. A lot of it is focused around behavioral pattern thinking and adjusting to that. And that means everyone's adjusting. Okay, another way to look at it too is another simple example is I worked with a company in Denver that built uh, fast search engine technology. So think of like Microsoft, Bing, Google, you know, they're all advertising companies, but in the end, uh, they have search engine technology. And we were working for a client that was in Europe, and they had multiple divisions, one in the UK, um, a, you know, a couple spread out throughout the different Europe countries. And the one thing about Europe, unlike America, is that every single country has a different set of rules. Like, on one website, you can put someone's address, but not their name. On another website, you can put their address, but not their city. And then on another website, you can put their full-blown address and name, but not the telephone number. So you had to know all of these legal laws uh, going across different you know, countries, even though it's the same company uh, that was giving up this you know, advertising. And we really disappointed our customer. And what I noticed on the demo was we were demoing search engine terms. And the customer goes, do you guys not know us yet? And like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You know, we're not showing the customer information. We're following the laws. And he goes, you still don't understand us yet. He goes, look at the words you're using. And I'm like, what about them? And he goes, look at that word, behavior. Is that how we spell it in the UK? Our customers are here. Our culture is here. You're in America and you're spelling behavior as an American. Spell it the way the UK does. And so what we reinforced every two weeks for a matter of months is we didn't know our customer. We didn't care about our customer. We weren't listening. And eventually it blew up in a meeting that they said, the example's right in your face. The word behavior. If you can't even get your test data to focus on how customers use our products, what do we need you for? So that's where Agile is simple. It's about customer needs, but it's not easy because the people you're working with, for example, Americans testing United Kingdom products, Indians testing American-based products. We have different cultures. And until you can understand the culture for whom you're testing, you're not doing Agile the way you're supposed to. Okay. All right, so here is a, um, a bell curve. We see a lot of this when it comes to like bonuses at the end of the year, right? And we're all trying to say, oh, you got all the threes in the center and the fives on the right and the ones and twos on the left, right? Let's apply this bell curve to Agile. If you were to look at your marketplace and say the majority of my customers are where, you would say they're in the center. That's like your Super Bowl ad. That's why it costs you like a couple million dollars for 30 seconds. If you're trying to attack the market with something so general that everyone just gets it, right? Agilists say, that's how we used to work. That's your six month release right there. You build so much stuff that you deploy it and you hope one, your customers are still there. And two, the ones that are there there's something in our feature base that'll, that'll get them, right? And will say, no, 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 that's, that's ridiculous. Every two weeks show up with something and get their feedback. And then the following week, the following two weeks, you work based on their feedback. And then the following week, you work on their feedback. 
So on the left-hand side of this bell curve, when it comes to market dynamics, is the idea that, first off, the people on the left care about talking about things. They're the people who use Yelp. They are the people who use Facebook Marketplace. They are the people who put reviews out there. Uh, they're the people streaming stuff in LinkedIn constantly. They're the people who care. And so they will use your product first, and then they'll tell their friends. Now, the question is what they tell their friends could be bad, it could be good. But if I could get those people to show up to my demo meetings, then they're gonna market my product for me. So for those of you who are building an internal product in your company, you're looking inside your company in different departments for people with this behavior. They're the type who like to talk, the people who like to give feedback, but also more importantly, they like to tell their friends. So if you want to market a message called, let's start doing Agile, or you want to market a service called, we do contracting for a customer, or you want to market a tangible product, we build an e-commerce website. You go after these people because they will market your message for you that number one, this company listens to feedback. Number two, they included my feedback, which is really interesting. You see that feature right there? That's because of me. And number three, this is where they're going. I didn't need a commercial for that. They did it for you. So that's how Agilists work on that. And then there's a book out there called The Tipping Point. And what it proves is that when 15 to 18% of the market of people you're trying to get to use your product or service, use it, the rest of the market catapults and starts using it. So that's just marketing 101. Okay, so we went through a lot of stuff there. Um, let me pause for a second. Uh, let me see here. Is there a way to, I don't know how to unmute anybody here. Um, audio options. I'm trying to find a way to unmute everybody. Or you can just unmute yourself. Right. If you have any I, questions, I let me pause that. there. I'll do that for you, Michael. <laughs> so folks, Thanks. if you've got any questions, you can chat them in. Otherwise, you can ask them as I unmute you. I just ask for a favor, um, if you can locally mute yourself so that whatever's happening in the background uh, isn't apparent to, to us, that will be great. So I'm going to mute everyone. Three, two, one, go. Okay, everyone's on, on mute. Yep, that's correct. Does anyone have any questions or yes, comments or concerns? That's great. Um, okay. Yes. Let me see. Sounds like we might have to mute everybody Let's again. Someone's on another call. Okay. Okay. So since no one has any questions, I'm going to keep moving forward. I just want to make sure I had a natural pause here because we're going through, if you were to say, in the limbic brain perspective, I'm going through the why right now. Mm-hmm. And a little bit of the how. I'm talking to you from inside to say, this is how human behavior works. And when you apply it to how we do our work, how Toyota did their stuff, how marketing 101 works, you can understand why now we say, I want the customer in my demo meetings. Mm -hmm. So before I even talk to you about a demo meeting or I talk to you about an iteration or any of that stuff, it's like, if you get this, you can go talk to a CFO, you can talk to a project manager, you can talk to a customer, you can talk to a funding source, you can talk to a developer and say, do you understand now why we invited the people we did to the demo meeting. And the people who weren't there, why we didn't want them there, right? And so if you can do that, then you can coach these people if you were a scrum master and do that job. Absolutely, and Michael, so, I just comment that this is, this is extremely helpful in putting everything into perspective and helping us think right. Oh, wow. Um, Try not to fall asleep for the next couple of slides because they have a lot of detail on them. Um, waterfall history. So back in 1970, Winston Royce came up with managing the development of large software teams. And then the, the Department of Defense came out with the standard based on that um, document, or at least the initial document, which is the waterfall diagram. And inside this spec for the military, they had 428 pages of specs on process. We're not talking software specs. We're talking specs of how to do the process itself. On page nine, there were four to five testing stages after coding. Page 13 said you need to have 17 documents before coding was even allowed to begin. So think BRD, MRD, SFS, and you know, like 
uh, 12 or 13 other acronyms right behind them. Test plan had to be approved. And then I just got lost on page 29. I didn't know what the heck was going on there. And then on page 30, this scared the daylights out of me. You spent all this time arguing about testing stages and test plans, but then if you updated the source code later, you didn't have to test it. So what I'm trying to say is, I tend to ask the question, do you believe that government jobs, whether you agree with the public-private you know, political battle, that's another question, but do you believe as it stands that if we turned over all government jobs to the private sector in one swoop, would that impact the private sector significantly? And no one seems to argue that fact. And I say, yes, absolutely. And I said, okay, so that means the public sector has a large amount of people in it. So back in 1988, obviously the military is ahead of any um, private sector, uh, at least in the sense of technology, because there's a lot of classified stuff out there, right? And then eventually some of it gets declassified. So you hear about the company called DARPA, and they make stuff for the military. And then eventually, like 10, you know, five, 10 years later, there's something that comes out that they say, oh, yeah, this was based on DARPA's technology, and now the public is allowed to use it. So back in 1988, if you wanted to be in software, that's what you had to follow. Now, a lot of the people who were in that timeline are now managers in companies today. So for years, they were forced to follow this procedure ingrained in their brain every single day. This is how you do software. This is how you do it correctly. And if you don't abide by this, well, one, you're not being loyal to our military. Two, you're bringing risk in. So they had ingrained for years this behavior. And then lo and behold, some young guy comes out of a startup and says, Agile, Agile, Agile. It's, it's so simple, man. Why do we need all these testing stages? Why do you need all these documents? Come on, man, just get it together. This is why Agile is simple, but it's not easy. These invoke behaviors, right? So at first there's an event, then there's an attitude change, then it becomes part of your nature, and then suddenly it's a habit. So you weren't there back in 1988, young person, to stop this from happening. You weren't next to this person for years while they were in the military serving our country. And then you weren't with them for years in the private sector while they still use this mentality. But lo and behold, you show up and you think that Agile is just going to be simple. It's not that simple. These people think differently. So that's some of the hardest parts of moving people forward. But when we go back to how do we get people out of that trend, we say, okay, so this is where you came from. Thank you for your service for our country. Great. Did you know that back in 1970, some guy came out with this and he goes, yeah, 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 we had to study that in the military and say, well, let's analyze that for a second. When you look at it, the actual person who wrote it said, I believe in this concept, but the implementation described above is risky and invites failure. He also said that a major redesign was required. And here's something that should scare the daylights out of PMP folks. The development process is returned to the origin and one can expect up to 100% overrun in schedule and or costs. So what he's saying is if you follow this process, I guarantee you it's going to cost more and you're going to be late. So when you think of your PMP exam and there's a section on ethics, is it ethical to give somebody an estimate that you know 100% chance is wrong? And it's not just wrong, like, oh, we're going to be off by, like, you know, 5% just because, you know, we lose some employees, gain some employees, and we have some just trends. No, 100% overrun is what the person who devised the waterfall original statement to be said even his process does this. So it makes you question, like, you're trying to move these people around that have been ingrained in this procedure for a long time, and they say it's, it's dedicated on my my education back in the military, and lo and behold, military was based on Winston Royce's thesis. So let's see what the doctor actually had to say. And that's what he's saying. He's not saying agile, but he's saying that something else has to be better than this. So when you focus on, okay, what else did he have to say? Some of the changes he wanted to do is the version finally delivered to the customer is actually the second version. The entire process done in miniature. Testing is the phase with the greatest risk in terms of dollars and schedule. So why are we doing it last? And it's important to involve the customer in a formal way so that he has committed himself. 
Doesn't sound like a customer to me. Sounds like a committed partner, a loyal partner. So these are all the things he said probably had to be changed. He just didn't use the term agile. But when you talk to people about agile, well, we have short sprints. We have loyal customers who show up to demo. We're focused on test-driven development. Uh, we're actually, we may build a lot of stories, but eventually we deploy an ultimate version that isn't what the original was. Hmm. Okay, so we are in agreement more than you think, person. You just didn't read all the pages below his diagram. You're so used to looking at the waterfall diagram that you forgot there, there were all these paragraphs beneath it of what he said was wrong with it and what needed to change. So that's what we kind of get to is that's how you move people around is show them where you have a constant denominator with them and then educate them a little further. So the only problem he listed at the end is the simpler method has never worked on large scale development efforts. Okay, so in essence, he's saying even if he made all these changes, can agile scale. So that's something you kind of have to maybe have in your back pocket is this is where Waterfall got its origination. It was in the military for so long. And back then, if you wanted to do anything of high tech, that's where you would be. And then when those people came into the normal private sector, they took all this with them. So why are we surprised they act that way? But if I could educate them on truly the backbone of what where things came from, they might have a conversation with me about Agile instead of an argument. Okay, so now we're gonna look in, uh, all right, here's your movie poster, the first one. He's hiding something when we need to find out what that is. Who is he? He is your customer. And this was a couple of years back. Um, they had a multiple studies that back in 2014, 2015, Generation Y would make not only up 50% of the market force, but 50% of the workforce. Because, you know, baby boomers and Generation X, they're either retiring or just getting higher up in executive positions. So they're not the doers. Not usually, not anymore. So as Generation Y kicks in, they just come with this behavioral trend. Uh, interesting thing here where it says language 99, it doesn't mean they know 99 languages. What I based that on was there were a bunch of studies about the behaviors of these people of these teenagers, right? And what they notice is that, you know, they use instant messaging and they're on their phones. And if, if we were the naughty parent, who, you know, who looked at all their text messages, we would see random nines and random 99s. And they kept studying this and saying, what is going on? Why, is, why do we see these numbers randomly showing up constantly? And what they realized is that when a couple teenagers were honest about it, they said, nine means the parent is in the room, 99 means they left the room. So you can talk about different things. So they have their own way of discussing things. We are used to PRDs and BRDs being hundreds of pages, and they can sum it up in 140 characters, a tweet. That's how they work. So when we talk about like the daily stand-up trying to keep it close to 15 minutes, it's because they already have one foot out the door. They're like, just tell me what I need to know so I can just go do what I do. Why do I need to be in here for two hours? Okay, so that's the human behavioral trends that we're working with. I'm going to skip a workshop here. So the shade here um, was this lady named Molly, but she's references Mal, and Mal means bad in the movie. So what is bad for your business? Bad is market delays, competitors, patents expiring. Sometimes it's us. Sometimes we're the problems that we're the people who have problems. And I don't just mean people who don't know Agile. Agilists have lots of problems too, right? They can't communicate very well sometimes. Um, they're pushing people a little too hard, too fast. They're asking for too much simplicity. You know, no reins on the system. Okay, so we have to look at ourselves sometimes and say, if I am the change agent, what behavior do I bring to my team? So let's look here at, uh, and normally this class, by the way, is two days. You're getting flooded with info, but part of it is I'm trying to get through all this stuff so that you can ask questions. Uh, we don't have the workshops going on, but do know this class tends to be a little slower and there's like movie clips and stuff we watch, so it's a lot funnier. This is product management 101. That's the cash cow right there. Everyone wants to milk it, okay? That was a bad product management um, joke. At the very top is waterfall. At the very bottom is agile. You start off in the red regardless of flow. 
You're building a product or a service and no one's bought it yet. You're burning cash. That's just the way it is. You go into orange, which means you have enough people on your system or enough people buying your service that it makes up for any development cost and anything to keep the lights on. Green means you're in the green making revenue dollars, uh, making profit, and you have enough to build new stuff, not just keep the existing stuff running. And then eventually your competitors come in, um, they start building similar technology, perhaps better technology. Your patents run out if you're a manufacturer and now there's generics out there and eventually you're bleeding red again because a lot of your customer base is left. Agilists get there a little faster. How? Well, we don't wait six months to deploy something. We deploy something as soon as possible. We get feedback right away. Initially, we might be working with, if we're in software, we're working with you know, IT, we're working with product managers on potential uh, sizes of the market, the amount of customers you're expecting on the system you know, in the first year as opposed to five years. So we're building a lot of backend stuff to prepare for performance. So we're demoing it to those people because they care about that. But eventually we get to the point of showing part of the website to customers, maybe a alpha group to say, some of this data is test, some of this is live. Give us, a, give us feedback on, do you like how we get the data to flow on the screen or is that not how you would do it? You know, if we have the submit button three tabs down, but you only fill in the first tab with information every time, that's really stupid. We should put the submit button on the first tab. You know, so we're understanding the feedback and getting responses. Eventually we have a live system and we're there before the big market splash. Now we may not have as much functionality as someone would potentially have in six months, you know, on the second month. But what we do have is a number of loyal people already. We have IT in our bucket, we have product management on board, we have project managers on board, funding sources on board, a couple customers saying, that's the flow I need, can you add the next feature? Great, I'll give you feedback. Now can you add the next feature? Great. And eventually there's enough features to where they say, I'm going to train my team internally to start using your product. It doesn't have all the stuff I want in the end yet, but I do know we're getting there because I've already believed in what you're doing. I'm showing up to your demo every two weeks and what you show me is great. By doing it this way, instead of focusing on the market type, like product managers typically would, we're focusing on building customer loyalty because this customer is showing up to your demo meeting and is paying you to use your product and give you free feedback so that you can build the right product. And they're giving you your, their time every two weeks. And since you respond to them, their beliefs become your beliefs. Their values are your values. So you become one and the same. So what's happening is you're locking them into your system from a technological standpoint, from a process standpoint, and more importantly, from a value standpoint. And if we approach Agile that way, then when our customers, competitors uh, kick in, they say, why would I go to that competitor? All I need is a guarantee from you is that you are going to do something like that soon. Because why would I go anywhere else? Because the cool thing is you're gonna implement whatever that is with my feedback based on my business problems, not just make it general for everybody. So why would I leave you? So then you have more time to build the next feature or sunset your product. So that's product management applied to Agile. Remember, we're not really talking about, yes, incrementals on there, but I didn't tell you about a bunch of sprints. I didn't give you sprint cycles. I didn't give you stories or story points or any of the stuff you're gonna find you know, in normal classes. I'm focusing on why people act the way they act, how we get people to stay with our system, and lo and behold, Agile is one of the gateways that gets you there. Okay. All right, so here's uh, pragmatic marketing. This is one of their older frameworks. They change it slightly every year. This is like the top dog when it comes to product management training next to the 280 group. So if you're looking for product management training, um, that's a company that I typically talk to quite often. But what they talk about here is that uh, the product owner, which is a term we're gonna be going over, sits here in the center. He knows the difference between a buyer and a user. And if you get user stories or requirements that say as a product owner, as a product owner, as a product owner, go buy them a bag of dog food and put it on their desk. And they'll be like, what the heck is this for? And you say, what's the difference between a buyer and a user? Because every one of your user stories says as a product owner. 
One, you don't use the system, and two, you certainly don't pay for the system. So one, you're neither one of those people. And he goes, well, what's the difference? And he says, who do you think bought this dog food, and who would eat it? If that's the bare basic difference between a buyer and a user, and if you can't tell your software team what the difference is, then we're going to build the wrong thing. So product owner, I never want to see a user story that says as a product owner, because you are neither the buyer nor the user. But if you were one of those, there's a good chance you're not the other one of those. So we need to build software so it works for everybody. Okay, so that's a lot of these are why questions. But when you get into the kind of hows and how we're doing things, this is actually where your agile team sits is in the center. They sit knowing enough about strategy to build the right feature set, and they know enough about the tactical and production noise to respond. So that's why they're sitting in the center and focused on buyers and users and requirements. I'm going to skip this because that's a workshop. A change in culture. There you go. So you'll see this on a lot of pictures. Normally it's just a triangle to a triangle. Mine goes a little bit 3D here. So we go from the time scope budget perspective to scope time cost quality perspective. Before we would estimate the time and budget and be like, wait a second, we didn't really estimate. We said this project would take six months. Well, when you're four months into that project, you're gonna realize you're four months late. So a couple things can happen. The time can be extended or the budget gets increased. Because to change the scope, you have to walk into some CFO's office or CEO's office and say, I don't agree with you. That always goes over real well, right? They typically give you more time, or they say, here's a bunch of money, go hire a bunch of people because they're all plug and play, and I'm sure they'll be up to speed in two weeks. Okay, so that's typically what's happening in the waterfall mentality is one of those constraints get changed. However, we're gonna flip the scale. We're gonna say, listen, we're gonna, have fixed constraints called time, cost, and quality. And how do we do that? Every two weeks, well, if you're a scrum team, every two weeks, every two weeks, every two weeks, every two weeks, the time scale has not changed. The costs remain pretty close to the same. Why? Because you're not hiring and firing people every two weeks. If you do, you got a bigger problem on your hands. Okay, so that typically is the same. The, you're not spinning up new servers every week. You may spit up a, uh, spin up a server cluster you know, once every quarter or something, so the costs do change, like licensing and server costs. But in the end, it's the same team with the same salary, with the same servers, and the same licensing, so the costs are the same as they were last week and the week before. Then quality kicks in. We're focused on maybe test-driven development, or we're focused on automation testing, things of that nature, so quality becomes a central point of the actual plan itself as opposed to it's just a stage. So what's the estimate, scope? If every two weeks I go to a customer and say, how do you feel about that? And he says, dude, I don't know what you did, but this sucks. And you say, oh, thanks for that, I'll just keep going. You're gonna lose that customer. But if he says, no, this sucks, and you say, okay. Well, we only changed so much in the last two weeks. Did you feel this way last week? No, no, I didn't feel that way. Okay, so at least we limited it down to what spawned you, okay. so. Is it something when you're in the UI? Yeah. Okay, so out of the 10 user stories we did, seven of them are the UI. Okay, so we're getting closer. Do you feel that way around this area or this area? I feel it around the second one. Okay, so it's the financial data you're having problems with. Okay, that gets us down to three stories. So these are the three things we changed. Which one do you feel uncomfortable with? Actually, all three of them. Why? Well, you see right there, it has the vendor information right there. Should I be worried that somebody's gonna see my name in that list? Oh, oh, you're having a problem with the security constraint and visibility of your vendor. Okay, we can fix that. But it started off with you were listening to how they felt, but it caused a scope change. So that's why estimate is scope, because we're focused on the must-haves, not the shoulds, not the coulds, but the musts. And then every time we're asking our customer base, reevaluating, saying, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about this? I don't want to know if it works. I already know it works because it's in production. I want to know how you feel about it because that'll determine if I continue down this path. Okay, so that's the change. All right, here's the Agile Manifesto. We value the things on the left more than the things on the right. Doesn't mean we ignore the things on the right. If I have working software that educates customers by virtue of its UI, by virtue of the data flow, by virtue of the error messages, instead of saying, 
invalid password, it might actually say invalid password, you did not meet these constraints. Out of these five constraints, this is the one you didn't meet. You didn't use a special character. Wow, I educated you. I don't need comprehensive documentation to tell you what the constraints are because I put it on the screen. So by working software, it doesn't just mean no errors. It means does it educate them? Does it lead them through whatever process you're making? If I get these people to be more interactive and more efficient, the less and less I have to support them with process constraints or additional tools because they are communicating, and so on and so on. This is taken from the Agile Coaching Book. We tend to use this analogy of a tree quite often in coaching. So a horticulturist will come to your house and he'll look up and see all the dead leaves. He doesn't start counting how many apples you have left. He looks at you dead in the eye and says, where's the closest source of water? Show it to me. Uh, yeah, you see how that water is streaming through that area where you decided to dump your oil from last year from your snowblower? What do you think is happening to that water and that oil mixture because your tree's right there? So I don't need to count how many apples you have. You're poisoning your tree. So we focus a lot on the roots, around the principles and how we want the teams to work, and that if we're feeding the tree, called the team, properly, they will start growing in different ways, and then eventually you'll be able to harvest their fruits like a, a couple quarters out. Okay, so we use that a lot. Another analogy is when Agile say, you can never interrupt the sprint. You say, guys, look outside for a second. See that tree over there? Do you think it's healthy? Yeah. Has it been here a long time? Yeah. Is it windy out? Yeah. Why didn't the why didn't the tree snap? Wind is a change. Well, it's bending exactly. I need you to bend. I'm not asking you to snap. This is not a hurricane, but I don't want you to be a petrified forest. So work with me. So we use tree analogies quite often to help teams understand, number one, how they grow as a team, number two, how you uh, get them to harvest over time. But last but not least is you're helping the team understand that like a living tree that is healthy, we don't say a petrified forest is healthy, and we certainly don't say a tree that snapped is healthy, but everything in between has a sense of healthiness to it, depending on the conditions of the weather surrounding them. So think of the weather conditions as your business. Waterfall-based planning, agile value-based planning. So we would build all this stuff and we'd focus a lot on the front end, meaning the front end of requirements, front end of design analysis and coding, and then lo and behold, we ran out of time for testing and then we just deployed it. And then we'd follow it up with hot patches. Then the agile folks say, well, one, we're gonna give more time to the people who actually do the work. We're gonna not just be focused on coding versus testing, we're gonna do test-driven development, meaning I only build until the test passes, and then I focus on automated stuff, continual integration, and then we do these quick and light deployments of pieces of code, pieces of functionality. Instead of saying I support Excel six months from now, I'm going to say I support XLS. I didn't say I support XLSX, I support XLS, 64,000 rows in a spreadsheet. And then in the next sprint or the next release, we're gonna support XLSX, meaning a million rows. So we further enhance the system. Between those two releases, no one thought XLSX was a bug because we never told the customer we did that. We told them we supported XLS. So we slowly and slowly start ramping up more and more functionality. But what you're not seeing is a lot of hot patches as a normalcy. I'm not saying you'll never have to fix the system. But what I am saying is that the normalcy is that you're slowly deploying pieces out because there's less risk to it. So when you're looking at the waterfall-based model, you can deploy all you want. However, you cannot patch someone's loyalty with a technical solution. So once you tell somebody, yeah, we work that way, and then they come back and say, no, you don't. You just broke loyalty with that customer. Okay. The Agilists may approach it, and yes, they get bugs too, but there's less scenarios of it happening. There is, and even the ones that do get tend to be smaller because you only released a portion of the code base. You did not overwrite everything because it's a six, nine month long project. 
So you're dealing with a more isolated problem, which means less business impact and less customers affected. The severity is lower. However, in this model, since it's a longer drawn out plan, and you're changing more, when something's wrong, you gotta hot patch the whole thing, right? And then everyone's upset and you spend more time trying to patch someone's loyalty when they're ticked off with you and you're saying, well, good thing we only release every six months because he'll forget about it by the time we have our next one. Versus the address are like, we really disappointed our customer in the last sprint. Let's really take care of him in this sprint and demo to him that we really care in two weeks. And let's fix our problem. Our problem is us. Okay, so that's the main difference between the plan-based models. And then I'll pause after this next slide again. Another way to look at it is since we know the time, you can start doing some equations to say, well, 17 members with an average salary is 40 bucks an hour. In two weeks, we have 10 working days, which means 80 hours is how like Accenture or TCS or one of those managed service providers would bill us. So 17 members times 80 hours equals 560 hours times $40 an hour is $22,400 in labor to do nothing. What's worse is if we build the wrong thing because then I have to pay him another $22,000 to fix it and maybe another $22,000 to fix it again. But if product owner, you just don't schedule that user story because it's not ready and you have us work on things that are ready, we're using our labor cost properly. So before we start, I want to know, is this problem in production worth $22,400? Is this customer gonna pay us $22,400 for this emergency fix? Or is this just some sales guy telling you that it sounds good? Because I have real numbers here for you that don't change very often. So I know exactly how much my sprint is worth to you. Okay, so Agile is not like chaos. I mean, on some teams it is because they're not applying the principles properly. But in the end, you have a lot of control over your cost. You have a lot of control over the consistent pattern that's involving. Um, you're impacting the business in smaller doses, which allows them to change their business processes in a more uh, fluid manner. Um, you have a way for the teams to grow career-wise and with your customer base. And then lo and behold, when we come back to Product Management 101, in the end, we need money for the company or we don't survive. We are now getting customers who stick around longer, get value hopefully earlier, are more importantly marketing our products for us so we don't even have to use all our marketing money anymore. We don't have to buy coffee cups. What good's a coffee cup when I have a customer telling someone else that we're awesome? That's better than a coffee cup. So all these pieces together are why we do Agile in the right manner. So I'll pause there. Any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to put them in chat. So basically in an hour, you covered about four hours of stuff. So if your brain's about to explode, that's why. <laughs> Mine is trying to catch up. It's buffering. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So we went over the why portion. So literally on this class, I spend the first day or day or almost an entire day on the why. Is if people understand the why, now when we get into the how and coaching people understand the procedures and all that stuff, it makes more sense. Like, yeah, I really want to pay attention to X, Y, Z because if I screw this up, I know that I'm going to screw this up with the customer, which means this to the market, to my product manager, to my business. Where before you might have said, well, the sprint, we carried the story from one sprint to another. You know, no one's really mad at us, and that's it. Well, there's a bigger picture than that. And so that's what I'm trying to employ across all of you. Um, one video I make all my new Scrum Masters watch is Moneyball. So if, you have a, if you're a new Scrum Master or have a new Scrum Master, I suggest you go buy them a DVD and say, go watch it. And then when they come and say, I watched it last time, it was really good, you say, go watch it again. And then eventually they'll pick up on a lot of the excerpts out of there. And it was about changing the way teams work. So that's a good video. Um, all right. So we're going to get into the know your agile terms. Don't fall asleep. It is an eye chart. The term you never want people to get away with is backlog. If someone says you says, well, it's in the backlog. You, you hold them by their arms and say, which one? Because a lot of people just say backlog. 
it's in the backlog. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I am going to worry about it because I don't know which one you're talking about. If they say product backlog, this is the dumping ground of ideas. If they say it's in the product backlog, it just means you're like anybody else that's just making some random requests and who knows when it'll happen. If they say release backlog, it's targeted to go to prod at some point. The question is what sprint or what flow, if you're a Kanban team, um, would eventually uh, fall on. And then if you're in the iteration sprint backlog from a scrum perspective, what that means is it is scheduled. You can exactly see what cycle it's going to appear in and it's moving forward. So backlog is very, um, it's very loaded when it comes to terms. So if you're use, working with a vendor like Accenture, Amdocs or somebody and they say it's in the backlog, you, you stop the meeting right there and say, you better tell me which one. If they say, what do you mean which one? Say, okay, we got a bigger problem on our hands. Because if you're telling me that you just have one backlog and you don't think about releases and you don't think about sprints, but you just told me on the previous phone call that you're all scrum based, we got a problem. Because that's like 101 when it comes to planning. Which backlog? Incremental and iterative. We're going to go over that in a cute little picture here in a minute. Task, user story velocity and stuff like that we're going to be covering as well. Incremental and iterative. Now, you could ask someone if they like to drink coffee or if they like to drink wine. Normally, someone likes to be caffeinated or they like to be, uh, you know, wind up. So one of the two normally works for the conversation. Here's an example of a coffee tester. The coffee in the center at the very bottom of that cup is what they're thinking of marketing. And maybe those are the beans next to it that they said, this is, the, this is the new batch of beans. We're trying to figure out those cool marketing names for this and we really don't know. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna take all these, all these coffees that we already have in the marketplace right now, and we're gonna line them all up. We're gonna line up their grounds, we're gonna line them up as if they've already been brewed, and this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a, we're gonna sniff the primary cup, and then we're gonna sniff all these, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, to figure out which aroma is closest. Then we're gonna take a sip out of the first cup, and then we're gonna sip out of this cup, and then we're gonna sip out of the first cup again, and then we're gonna sip out of this one cup way in the back, and then we're gonna sip out of the first cup. And what I'm trying to get on my palate is to understand which one is it closest to, and in what way. Is it acidic like that one, but it has a smell of chocolate like that one? And you're slowly, slowly, slowly bringing the coffee down in the cup to nothing. That's called incremental delivery. You're incrementally delivering value. I identified it has earthly tones. Ah, I, I just realized it has a pH level of such and such. That's delivery, that's incremental. But the iterative part about it is the sniffing, the sipping, the repetitive action behind the incremental value delivery. So every time I'm sniffing, I'm iterative, doing it over and over and over again. Sniff, 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 sip, sip, sip. That's like, that's why iterative is about the sprint itself. You have two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. It is repetitive, it is constant. The incremental value is about the release itself. And that may or may not follow your iterative pattern of the sprint. You could release every day as sprints come off the assembly line. You could release every two weeks to follow the sprint. You could release once a month because we just don't want to interrupt the business. Or you could say, I just don't really get Agile yet, and we're going to release every six months. Okay, fine. But that's the difference between incremental and iterative if you are on a test. Another way of looking at things is this is how the business looks at things. Fruit salad, love it. Everything in it, love it. This is how a development team sees it. That's how a product owner should see it when it comes to role definition, and this is how a product manager or a sales engineer would see it. Okay. Which fruit would you cut last if you're making fruit salad? Just think about that for a second. There's a couple of fruits there that you would have to consider, like which one do I cut first? Which one do I cut last? Think of the apples and the bananas. Why wouldn't you cut them first? They oxidize. So here's a question for the technical folks. Team, how does our product oxidize in production? What do you mean oxidize? Well, if I cut a piece of fruit, it oxidizes by just sitting there because oxygen is attacking it. That's why it gets that nasty brown, rusty color. 
That's why apple juice doesn't look like this white color. It looks brown in the jar because it's been oxidized. So tell me, how does our product oxidize in, in prod? What do you mean? Do customers use it? Yeah. So every time they use it, do they add data to it? Yeah. That's called oxidizing. It's aging. Time is aging our product. The fact that it's used, even just normally, oxidizes our product. So when it comes to delivering a feature set, you are ordering things in delivery based on a number of things. Does it oxidize in prod? Number two, do we have any nut allergies? Well, I don't see it in the requirements. I'm assuming they're okay. That's a, that's a crazy assumption to make. I don't want to kill anybody today. So how about you go check on that before we shut down someone's business because we gave them the wrong product. Okay, lactose intolerance, wheat perhaps. There's so many things when you break down a feature, whether it's fruit salad or a product line or a service that you're providing in an agile fashion, that when you break it down, you start seeing things differently. When all together, you see value and revenue, but then when you're allowed to break it down and say, before I execute delivery pattern, check on my customer. Is this who they are? Is this who you want to sell it to? That'll determine how I deliver. Um, here's some agile terms <clears throat> that you'll hear from people. 100% code coverage always makes me giggle. If you built something idiot proof, the world will make a better idiot. Okay, so you're never 100% code coverage anyway. That's a fallacy. Dev and QA managers tend to get nervous. Uh, and this is from the movie uh, Lean on Me. Joe Clark says, tear down those cages in the cafeteria. If you treat them like animals, that's exactly how, you will be, how they will behave. So when you start bringing teams together, like Dev and QA, instead of being separate, or business analysts from the teams, suddenly becoming product owners or something of that nature, or portfolio uh, project managers turn to scrum masters and now they're on the team, people start getting nervous about their careers. Naturally, right? They've been in this career, they're uncomfortable, they're uncomfortable because of the unknown. I mean, if they knew their job was ending, they'd actually be more comfortable than the fact that they just don't know, okay? So how do we work with them? We say, first off, dev and QA managers, if we bring two people to, or two types of mentality together, what do you think that turns you into? Well, that means I'm fired. Well, that's only if you choose not to work with this. Well, what do you mean? Can you become a people manager? Can you become a team manager? Well, I've never been in QA. Well, how do you think the QA manager feels right now down the hallway? He's never been a dev manager before. So he's having the same question of if we decide instead of you having your QA team versus their development team, and we say, no, we're going to cut it in half. Half of the dev move over here, half of the QA move over there, and there's still two teams. Who said we're firing you? You're only going to get fired if you choose not to be that team manager. So that means the QA manager needs to probably ask you for advice on how to work with developers. And you need to go to the QA manager and say, I've always worked with the concept delivery guys. I've never worked with the people who actually break the stuff. So coach me too. That's the difference. So a lot of these things change in Agile. Uh, metrics, I've seen this before. I had a bunch of developers who were never wanting to refactor and were always focused on deliver, 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 because they were bonus in how many lines of code they had. When I found that out, I'm like, what the heck are you doing? Well, you know, we really just want to push code out. And I looked at them and I'm like, have you ever written code before? No, I just, I just want to make sure they deliver. Okay, so I have somebody who's never been in code before dictating a policy around someone's pay rate dedicated to something that encourages the system to be slower. More code means more space, which means the system reads more lines. There's this thing called refactoring, that it removes code because we're allowed to reuse objects or reduce the size of the code base, but it still has the same functionality. But what your metric, your bonus says, don't do that because I won't pay you for that. And the same would be true with um, a bug team. If you said, you get paid based on how many bugs you have, and there are companies out there that do this, they're called crowdfunded bug finders, and a lot of people sign up for part-time work for this and you get paid based on how many bugs you have. Well, if we have a UI, what's the fastest way to find bugs? Line up a bunch of different monitors on a table and just stare at the pixels. Because guaranteed, one of the resolutions won't work. 
right? That's the problem with browsers and the problem with pixels is that it's really hard sometimes to like make things work. So let's just do that. Does that mean it's valuable? Well, why didn't you find these bugs around like the date and stuff? Well, that's hard to find, man. Why, why would I do that if I'm getting paid based on my bugs? I'm just going to go look at the pixels. That's my pay. So we have to look at how we incentivize our team. It is not about being siloed. It is not about unvaluable things. Um, it is not about authority. It is about producing something, not just for output, but a, in the end for outcome, business outcome, happy customers showing up at our demo and saying, not only does your product work, I feel comfortable with it. That's what we're after. Okay. So this was not part of the plan, okay? And in this movie, she was considered the architect and she guides the team through this maze. So that is your scrum master. The maze of process, the maze of culture, the maze of people. So in the scrum guide, it actually says service to the product owner, service to the organization, service to the delivery team. And if you go to the CSM course, you're gonna spend a majority of the class on service to the delivery team. Why? Because service to the product owner means you need to be in a product management class. Service to the organization means you need to understand business people. So sometimes program managers have a little leg up here because they're used to doing funding and stuff of that nature, but they also have a leg down because they're used to doing funding and stuff with executives. So service to the organization is about getting people to change their behaviors and their cultures to accept this idea of agile and fall in line with its principles. It is not about trying to get more funding. Okay, so that's the difference between the typical program manager mentality, perhaps project manager, and moving into a scrum master is about you're about behaviors. And if I were to look at this chart in the back, not the eye chart that says agile roadmaps, if you can read this, you don't need glasses. That was based on the movie Spaceballs. But the actual heart diagram, some people would say that looks healthy. To me, that looks like a dang heart attack. Because if I were a sprint team that delivered, didn't deliver, delivered, didn't deliver, up and down, up and down, it looks like they're in chaos. So that type of chart would mean one thing for a business person, another thing for a scrum master is like the only consistency we have is inconsistency. That's a problem. Because every two weeks we show our customer we're inconsistent. That's really bad. So they look at things differently. Uh, difference between a scrum master and an agile coach. So there's your agile coach. And there's your scrum master. Okay, so the difference is strategic versus tactical if they're both in the same company at the same time. And then there's that high performance tree I was talking about in the background from Agile Coaching Book. They're focused on the orchard of trees, which represent the teams, versus this person directly triaging a team, looking at problems versus symptoms on the direct team itself. <laughs> That's the difference. Um, these slides are based on the Scrum Guide from a couple years ago, so some of the terms have changed. So I haven't updated the slides in just a little bit, so I apologize for that. But in the end, you're responsible if you're a Scrum Master for ensuring Scrum is understood and enacted if you're truly using Scrum as the Agile framework, okay? This is not about you ensuring the product is the right product. You may be focused on speed because you want an efficient process, you want a process that's highly collaborative, highly visible, so yes, you're interested in probably speed because you're looking at in-out, in-out metrics. But you are a servant leader to the team. Again, you have three roles, service to the product owner, service to the dysfunctional team, and service to the organization. Okay, here's your angry paperclip Microsoft. Here's how Apple treats their employees with, you know, they have cameras all over the place because they don't want you to take the iPhone 76 into a bar and leave it there and be in the news, right? Amazon's about selling, Google's about buying. So, the Scrum Master going from one of these organizations to another, you'd have to approach them differently. It's not like, well, two weeks is two weeks, everybody. Their behaviors and their values are different from organization to organization. And in Microsoft, probably division by division, right? So how a Scrum Master works through this is normally the hardest job that they have because they don't have a lot of experience in human behavioral trend thinking and um, changing behavioral sets across an organization, they may good, be good at getting funding from a business source, but that's not about behavior. Okay, so this part. Agile project management, the ultimate guide to implementing agile. 
Have you ever seen people that pretend to be agile, but there's something else? In other words, they pretend to be following agile practices, but they really are not agile minded. Just because you are practicing agile practicalities does not necessarily mean that you are agile in mind. I mean, we commonly encounter people who pretend to be agile, but they are actually something else. It happens all the time in companies, agile in name only. You know, they might be doing daily stand up, sprint planning, but that doesn't mean that they are really agile in mind. In a lot of companies, they're actually still more waterfall than anything else, but they sprinkle some agile practices in there. And while there's nothing wrong in doing that, it's important to realize that agile is a mindset. And the main purpose of today's discussion is to really understand the nuts and bolts of agile, to take a look at the agile practice guide, strip it down and understand what exactly is in this book. Now, this is not meant to be an end to end 20 hour coverage of the agile practice guide, but this is just to point out what exactly is in it. So as I said in the beginning, there are a lot of teams that use Agile techniques, but they're not really Agile in mind. First and foremost, Agile is a mindset, okay? So Agile techniques and approaches are well and good, but I want to point you straight to page 9 and 10 in the Agile Practice Guide, because that's where you truly understand why Agile and what it is. Okay, so this is how the book is broken out before we get to page eight and nine. You've got an introduction to Agile. Right now, we're in the introduction itself, which is section one. Section two, an introduction to Agile. Section three, the life cycle selection. Section four, implementing Agile, creating an Agile environment. Section five, implementing Agile, delivering in an Agile environment. Section six, organizational considerations for project agility, and seven, call to action. So as you go through this book, it is important that you first have a high-level understanding of what is presented here. So let's talk about section two at a very high level. Section two includes the Agile Manifesto that we're about to jump into, the mindset for Agile, values and principles, it also covers the very important concept of definable and high uncertainty work. In other words, fully planned driven work and change driven work. And the correlation between lean, the Kanban method and agile approaches, that's section two. Section three at a high level is an introduction to the various life cycles that are discussed throughout the guide talking about iterative, incremental, agile, predictive, and so on. It also addresses suitability filters and tailoring guidelines and common combinations of approaches. Section four, implementing agile, creating in an agile environment, creating an agile environment. This section discusses critical factors to consider when creating an agile environment and servant leadership and team composition are talked about here. Section five, implementing agile delivering in an agile environment. This section includes information on how to organize teams and common practices that teams can use for delivering value on a regular basis. It provides examples of some of the empirical measurements for teams and for reporting status. Section six at a high level explores organizational factors that impact the use of agile approaches such as culture, readiness, business practices, and the role of a PMO. You definitely want to look out for the radar survey that PMI have got there. Very good for the real world practicalities of uh, transitioning to agile or hybrid. And section seven is a call to action. The call to action requests input for continuous improvement of the Agile Practice Guide. So there you have it. That is a high level view of what is in the Agile Practice Guide. Now we will begin to get into some details. Let's go to section two, 
very quick. It's an introduction to Agile. I'm going to try my best to give you the five-minute summaries of each of these. Now, for those of you who are taking the exam, by the time all is said and done in your Agile journey, you should be able to tackle questions of a purely Agile nature, such as the question you have on the screen. On your exam, you can expect questions to test you on the nuts and bolts of any flavor of Agile, but not just that, also the principles. And that's why the very beginning of section two, they begin introducing you into the concept of definable work and high uncertainty work. Definable work projects are characterized by clear procedures that have been proven successful in the past. High uncertainty projects, on the other hand, have high rates of change, complexity, call it chaos, but these characteristics can present problems for traditional predictive approaches that aim to determine the bulk of the requirements up front. In high uncertainty work, we are planning, but we're planning almost as it were on the fly in an iterative fashion. Just before you do, you plan, but you do plan. So an example of high uncertainty work, new design, problem solving, work that has not been done before, all of that is exploratory and it requires subject matter experts to collaborate and solve problems to create a solution. Examples of people encountering high uncertainty work include software systems engineers, product designers, doctors, teachers, lawyers. Think about it. They're faced with a lot of unknowns, a lot of chaos, a lot of complexity. So before talking about anything else, let's address the Agile Manifesto and Mindset. You can find this in the Agile Practice Guide. If you open up the page, and let's go there. This is on page eight and page nine. So let's start from page eight. Thought leaders in the software industry formalized the Agile movement in 2001 with the publication of the Manifesto for Agile Software Development. And it states, we are covering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value. And then they list a number of things. I'm going to modify it slightly because now Agile is used across companies. So you need to think about it like this. We are uncovering better ways of developing product by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. Think about it in your world of project management, regardless of the flavor of projects that you work on. Don't these things make sense? It's all about the people. It's all about working product, right? As opposed to having tons of documentation for a product that does not work. It's all about the people. Again, customer collaboration goes a longer way than sticking rigidly to negotiating contracts, right? We need to have a collaborative mindset, some flexibility. Responding to change over following a plan. What good is following a plan when the conditions around you change? What good is following a plan when COVID suddenly comes on the scene? you got to be agile in times like that. That's all this is saying. Let's go over to the manifesto and mindset here. 12 clarifying principles. What we took a look at previously, we know those to be the four values. And what we see here is known as the 12 principles. Let's take a look at these principles one by one. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable product. I'm changing some of these words because now this is used in different industries, not just software. Welcome changing requirements, even late in development. Agile processes harness change for the customer's competitive advantage. Think about it. In the world of predictive, we usually limit change, but in the world of agile, we welcome change. Change is good because in a lot of instances, the change is going to offer more value. It's going to offer more relevance. Number three, 
deliver working software frequently. Now that should be deliver working product frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to the shorter time scale. Industry scale is typically a couple of weeks for each iteration in the world of Agile. Number four, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. That's that collaboration going on again. Build projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment and support they need, and trust them to get the job done. In other words, a self-organizing team. Number six, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face conversation. And we may not have the luxury of that in this crazy pandemic time. That will pass. But right now, a lot of folks are leveraging video conferencing. Number seven, working software is the primary measure of progress. Working product is the primary measure of progress. It's all about the product. When all is said and done, does the product work? And did you build in the value considerations for that product to give value after it's delivered? Number eight, agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace. In other words, a constant pace of work execution. We call that velocity, as you'll see later on. Number nine, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Number 10, simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. In other words, we don't want to do busy work. We want to do work that is absolutely essential. And if not, we're going to avoid doing that work. The best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. And that encourages innovation, of course. And number 12, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, tunes, and adjusts its behavior accordingly. And that we refer to in the world of Scrum as a retrospective. The team goes back and reflects and thinks about how to improve. All right, so all of that can be summarized in an image. Think about it like this. We've got four values. We've got 12 principles. And we have several practices, so many practices, retrospective, sprints, backlog preparation, backlog refinement, daily stand-ups, demos. All of these are on page 50 of the Agile Practice Guide and throughout the book, of course. So that is how you need to think about Agile. First of all, there is a need to be Agile because not every project can be done in a predictive way. This is clearly talked about in the Agile Practice Guide, and they have a different version of the image I'm about to show you, but we call this the Stacy Complexity Model. And if you take a look at the Stacy Complexity Model on page 14 of the Agile Practice Guide, you'll see something similar to this. But all that we're saying here is that in the world of project management, you could be close to agreement with requirements or technical understanding of the project, right? Close to certainty or close to agreement, or you could be far from agreement and far from certainty. The further from agreement you are on requirements, the further you are from certainty regarding the parameters of the project, the more likely it is that you are going to be in an agile environment. It's gonna become more complex. In some cases we could say anarchy, it's gonna be really, all over the place. And when that happens, you got to switch into an agile mindset. That's where agile thrives, high variability, where there's a need to experiment and where change is likely. On the flip side, waterfall works best when the requirements are well understood and there's little chance of change. So if you go on down to your agile practice guide and take a look at page 14, again, you'll find something similar. But this forms the basis for everything coming down the pike in this book. The PMBOK guide reads, and I'll just read it to you real quick on page 13. It says, some projects have considerable uncertainty around project requirements and how to fulfill those requirements using current knowledge and technology. See that? 
these uncertainties can contribute to high rates of change in project complexity, just like I'm showing you on the screen. That's the summary. All right, let's move a few steps further. I wanna take you to another page of great importance in the Agile Practice Guide. Let's talk about the continuum of the life cycles. And this is very similar to the Stacy complexity model, but just shown in a different way. And this is going into chapter three. And it reads, no life cycle can be perfect for all projects. Instead, each project finds a spot on the continuum. You see this continuum I'm showing you here. This continuum, you could be anywhere on a continuum. Predictive, where there's a low degree of change and a low frequency of delivery, or high frequency of delivery and high degree of change. You want to be agile. Or high degree of change and low frequency of delivery, iterative, or you could be incremental. High frequency of delivery, low degree of change. And this is how you need to think about agile. It's not a me or us versus them. It is what it is. In other words, don't think of the world of Agile as being combative. It's not a combative world. Instead, we want to look at project management as being a number of possibilities on a continuum. And we use this to add value to our customers. That's the summary. So if you advance the page in the Agile Practice Guide, you'll see the Agile Manifesto and Mindset 2.2. There's an image there. And it says Agile approaches and Agile methods are, an, are umbrella terms that cover a variety of frameworks and methods. So looking deeper into the world of Agile, there are a number of methods. Um, and we call this the Agile umbrella. So visualize Agile as a blanket term referring to any kind of approach or technique, framework, method or practice that fulfills the values and principles of the Agile Manifesto. In general, there are two strategies to fulfill Agile values and principles. The first is to adopt a formal Agile approach, intentionally designed and proven to achieve desired results. Then take time to learn and understand the Agile approaches before tailoring them. The second strategy is to implement changes to project practices in a manner that fits the project context to achieve progress on a core value or principle. The end goal is not to be agile for its own sake, but rather to deliver a continuous flow of value to customers and achieve better business outcomes. In other words, if your project needs to be more predictive than anything else, let it be, you could sprinkle in some agile where you find value, but don't go off being entirely 100% rigid in your agile application when you should actually be more hybridized. And to be honest on your exam, you are going to be tested not just on agile and predictive, but a huge part of the exam is going to come across as being hybridized. So you need to be able to switch between agile thinking and predictive thinking. You need to be able to meld the words to be hybridized in your approach. Let's move on to chapter three, life cycle selection. Projects come in many shapes and they are a variety of ways to undertake them, says the Agile Practice Guide. The Agile Practice Guide refers to four types of life cycles, as you can see below. We have predictive, we have iterative, we have incremental, and we have agile. Now, these life cycles can be distinguished by certain characteristics. The predictive life cycle, we're going to deliver one time. The iterative life cycle, we're going to deliver one time. The incremental, we're going to deliver multiple times. And in the PMBOK guide, if you read the details of these, you can delineate them very easily. When we take a look at the iterative life cycle, we repeat 
until correct the work that we're doing. When you take a look at the predictive projects, those are done one time. We perform them once for the entire project. When you take a look at Agile, we repeat until correct and things of that nature. So it's important to, to note that all projects have different characteristics and table 3-1 in the Agile Practice Guide summarizes this very nicely for you. Let's move on to a quick summary of chapter four. And this is creating an agile environment. Here's the preamble. Managing a project using an agile approach requires that the project team adopt an agile mindset. The answers to the following questions will help develop an implementation strategy. How can the project team act in an agile manner? What can the team deliver quickly and obtain early feedback to, to benefit the next delivery cycle? How can the team act in a transparent manner? What work can be avoided in order to focus on high priority items? How can a servant leadership approach benefit the achievement of the team goals? Agile approaches emphasize servant leadership to empower teams. Servant leadership is the practice of leading through service to the team by focusing on understanding and addressing the needs and development of team members. There are actually 10 tenets of servant leadership. We're not going to go into them today. If you look for videos on YouTube that I put out, you might come across a few. But at a very high level, we talk about the servant leader promoting self-awareness, listening, serving those on the team, helping people grow, coaching versus controlling, promoting safety, respect and trust, and promoting the energy and intelligence of others. Servant leaders manage relationships to build communication and coordination within the team. When project managers act as servant leaders, the emphasis shifts from managing coordination to facilitating collaboration. Facilitators help everyone do their best thinking and work. So you're going to be thinking about promoting collaboration and conversation and becoming an impartial bridge. The first value of the Agile Manifesto is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. What better responsibility for a servant leader to take on than to take a hard look at processes that are impeding the team? And that's why in the world of Scrum, we usually refer to the Scrum Master as a servant leader. In the world of Agile, the team manages its own work and its work product. They self-manage and self-organize, but servant leaders work to fulfill the needs of teams, projects, and organizations. Servant leaders may work with facilities for team space, work with management to enable the team to focus on one project at a time. The servant leader focuses on paving the way for the team to do its best work. Servant leaders can have many possible titles, but what is most important is what they do. Here are some examples. They educate stakeholders how and why about Agile, being Agile. They support the team through mentoring, encouragement, and support. They help the team with technical project management activities like quantitative risk analysis. They celebrate team successes and support and bridge building activities with external groups. And those are just a few examples. Now, bear in mind for those of you uh, Scrum aficionados, we're not talking Scrum in the Agile Practice Guide, but instead we're talking Agile. It's a rather agnostic view of Agile than being very specific to Scrum. So what the Scrum Master does in the world of Scrum has overlap with what the Servant Leader does in the world of Agile, but just remember they could be extra because I, I know some folks seeing the quantitative risk analysis that will uh, get some consternation from the scrum uh, aficionados. Just remember, this is the world of agile, okay? What is the role of the project manager in an agile environment? The role of the project manager in an agile environment is somewhat of an unknown because many agile frameworks and approaches do not address the role of the project manager. Some agile practitioners think the role of a project manager is not needed due to self-organizing teams taking on 
former responsibilities. But as my buddy, my co-trainer Roy and I say, the project manager role does not go away. And the project manager can add significant value in many situations. The key difference is that their roles and responsibilities look a little bit different. So the Pembroke Guide 6 edition defines the project manager as the person assigned by the performing organization to lead the team. Many project managers are used to being in the center of coordinating the project, tracking, and doing all that stuff. However, in agile projects, there's more complexity than one person can manage. Instead, cross-functional teams coordinate their own work and collaborate with business representatives. In other words, the product owner. When working in an agile environment, bear in mind that project managers shift from being at the center to serving the team. And as a servant leader, project managers should encourage the distribution of responsibility to the team. They're helping the team. Talking about team composition, a core tenet in both the values and principles of the Agile Manifesto is the importance of individuals and interactions. And Agile optimizes the flow of value, emphasizing rapid feature delivery to the customer rather than on how people are utilized. So when teams think about how to optimize the flow of value, the following benefits become apparent. People are more likely to collaborate, teams finish valuable work faster, and teams waste much less time because they do not multitask. Multitasking is one of those items we consider to be waste. So agile teams focus on rapid product development so they can obtain feedback. In practice, the most effective agile teams tend to range in size from three to nine members, Keep your eye on that just in case you are tested on the exam about that. Another core concept in chapter four, and it's a rather long chapter, is T-shaped skills and I-shaped skills and paint drip. Now, if you've not read up these terms, I encourage you to do that. I-shaped, T-shaped, paint drip, you should. Okay. Agile teams are cross-functional. But the people often do not start off that way. However, many successful Agile teams are made up of generalizing specialists. We call them T-shaped because you've got broad scales, but the T, that bar that goes down in the letter T, that shows depth. We also have the term paint drip, where we don't just look at one specialism, but we look at various specialisms in different degrees. So like a paint drip, you have one specialism that goes all the way down and you have a second specialism that just goes a third of the way or a tenth of the way or a quarter of the way. And that forms the paint drip effect. And then you have people that are I-shaped. They only have one specialism. And that's not what we want. We don't want I-shaped. We want T-shaped. Uh, at worst, better paint drip. So when people come aboard teams, the idea is They need to have a breadth of experience as time goes on. At first, they might just be I-shaped, but as the team begins to work and there's some cross-pollination going on, there's going to be a paint drip effect. So the team's objective is flow, efficiency, optimizing the throughput of the entire team, everyone jumping in to storm, storm that work and get together to help keep the work under control. You might hear the term swarm. The team swarms the work from time to time during those periods of crunch time. Teams have adopted agile principles and practices across many industries. They organize people into cross-functional teams to iteratively develop working products. Some organizations have been able to create co-located cross-functional teams, and others may have a different situation. Uh, Some may have the team geographically dispersed or virtual. And dispersed teams may have each team member working in a completely different location, either in an office or from home. And you can be rest assured you will get questions on virtual teams on your exam. So what happens when the team member's time is not 100% dedicated to the team? Well, this is not ideal, but it cannot be avoided. The, The problem with having someone invest only a capacity of 25% or 50% is that they will multitask. We call it task switching. This is one of the items we consider to be waste. When a person multitasks between two projects, that person is not 50% on each project. Instead, due to the cost of task switching, the person is really somewhere between 20 to 40%. So keep those numbers in mind for your exam and be aware of task switching not being ideal. 
Let's talk about team workspaces. Teams need a space in which they can work together to understand their state as a team and to collaborate. Some techniques to consider for managing communication in dispersed team are fishbowl window, you turn on the webcam and you're able to see each other's environment, you know, create a fishbowl window by setting up long live video conferencing links between the various locations in which the team is dispersed. People start the link at the beginning of a workday and close it at the end. In this way, people can see and engage spontaneously with each other, reducing the collaboration lag otherwise inherent in the geographical separation. And you can set up remote pairing by using virtual conferencing tools as well. All right, that closes out chapter four. Let's jump into chapter five. So let's talk about implementing Agile, delivering in an Agile environment. One of the big things you're going to hear throughout the narrative for your PMP exam and Agile is a team charter, or you might hear team contract or social contract. You need to be aware of both. Now, every project needs a project charter, so the project team knows why the project matters and where the team is headed. Think about the charter, the team charter like this. The team charter helps the team operate, but the project charter helps you know why the project matters. And don't fall into the trap of mistaking project charter for team charter. They're very different. So when we talk about project chartering, usually that happens at a much higher level. But when we talk about team chartering, we're talking about some specifics of do's and don'ts and acceptable behavior and how the team should act. So for, for this exam, you got to have both very well defined. All right. So there's a difference between the project charter and the team charter. Are we clear? Okay. An agile project charter answers these questions. Why are we doing this project? Who benefits? What does done mean for the project? And how are we going to work together? In other words, the flow of work. A servant leader may facilitate the chartering process. A team can coalesce by working together. And the project charter is a great way to start working. I often tell people the project charter is a conversation piece. And it just helps put everyone on the same page. Teams do not need a formal process for chartering as long as teams understand how to work together. Some teams benefit from a team chartering process. Bear in mind, this is different from project charter. And here are some ideas. What do we have in this? Note the word. We've got to highlight that word, social contract. What is in the social contract? Team values, working agreements such as what ready means, ground rules, and group norms. I expect you on your exam to be tested on both the team charter, which will also be camouflaged as social contract or team contract. The servant leader together with the team might address, decide how to address other behaviors, other, uh, other behaviors. Remember the team's social contract, its team charter is how the team members interact with each other, different from the project charter again. The goal of the team charter is to create an agile environment in which team members can work to the best of their ability as a team. Let's talk about some of the common agile practices. So we have retrospectives, single most important practice because it allows the team to learn about what happened and how to improve and adapt its process. Retrospectives help team members learn from its previous work on the product and its process. One of the principles in the agile manifesto, remember at regular intervals, a team reflects on how to become more effective and then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. Team members may decide to retrospect at key times, at the end of a release or when they ship something, when more than a few weeks have passed since the previous retrospective, when the team appears to be stuck, and when the team reaches any other milestone. The next practice is backlog preparation. Now, it's just referred to casually as backlog, but we're really talking more about a product backlog in the world of Scrum, or we could talk about backlog in other agile worlds. Just bear that in mind. Remember, it's an agnostic view. The backlog is the ordered list of all the work presented in story form for a team. There's no need to create all of the stories for the entire project before the work starts. And who owns the backlog? The product owner. Now, bear in mind, we are not always building a product in the world of Agile. We could be building a service. And that's why when we talk about backlog, it's a more agnostic view to what Agile could be or even what Scrum could be used for. 
because we're not always building a product. It could be a service backlog. Just remember that. And while that term is not used, the generic backlog is very dominant in PMI literature. In iteration-based agile, the product owner often works with the team to prepare some stories for the upcoming iteration during one or more sessions in the middle of the iteration. There's no consensus on how long the refinement should be. Now, bear in mind, in the world of Scrum, backlog refinement is not one of the formal ceremonies. Nonetheless, it is important for you to understand there are many ways for the product owner to conduct backlog preparation and refinement meetings, including encouraging the team to work as tribes of developer, tester, business analyst to discuss and write the story, to present the overall story concept to the team. The team discusses and refines it into as many stories as required and to work with the team to find various ways to explore and write the stories together, making sure all of the stories are small enough so the team can produce a steady flow of completed work. The next practice is daily stand-ups. Teams use stand-ups to micro-commit to each other to uncover problems and ensure the work flows smoothly throughout the team. We're going to time box these to 15 minutes apiece in most firms. Some firms may even do it in less. The team could walk the board, in other words, the Kanban board where there is one, and anyone from the team can facilitate the stand-up. In iteration-based agile, everyone answers the following questions, and these questions have since been modified. So I am going to give you a version that is more uh, in line with the Scrum Guide of 2020 November. So what did I do since the last stand-up to move us closer to the sprint goal? What am I planning to work on between now and the next stand-up to move us closer to the sprint goal? And what are any impediments, obstacles, or blockers I might be facing? And questions like these generate answers that allow the team to self-organize and hold each other accountable. Bear in mind that not every team does these standing up. Some teams do this sitting down. And like I said, for less time. Flow-based agile has a different approach to stand-ups though. Focusing on the team's throughput, the team assesses the board from right to left. And the questions are, what do we need to do to advance this piece of work? Is anyone working on anything that is not on this board? What do we need to finish as a team? And are there any bottlenecks or blockers to the flow of work? One of the anti-patterns though in these stand-ups is that they become sta uh, status meetings instead of stand-up meetings, and we don't want that. Teams run their own stand-ups. Well-run stand-ups can be very useful, provided the nature of the team's work. And bear in mind that the Scrum Master is not necessarily always the facilitator in these. The servant leader is also not the facilitator in these by default. These should be able to run regardless whether the scrum master is there or not. So the teams are actually responsible for ensuring these do hold and go according uh, to the plan to hold them. Remember, it's a self-organizing team and anyone on the team uh, should be able to jump in and make these happen. Demos or reviews. As the team completes the features, usually in the form of user stories, the team periodically demonstrates the working product. And once the working product, the MVP or the PSI is done, there should be a demo to make sure that the team is on the right path. One of the big things about the MVP, the minimum viable product, is feedback. So as a general guideline, demonstrate whatever the team has a whatever the team has as a working product, at least once every two weeks, that frequency is enough for most teams. So team members can get feedback, valuable feedback, you know, after presenting the minimum viable product to ensure that they're on the right path. A team that does not demonstrate or release cannot learn fast enough and is likely not adopting agile techniques. So that is very important. Another practice in the world of Agile is iterative planning, planning for each sprint, planning iterations. Each team's capacity is different. Each product owner's typical story size is different. Teams consider their story size, so they do not try to commit more stories than there is team capacity. So remember, we're using empirical data to plan. In the very first sprint, we might be off, but as time goes on and you're getting that velocity, that constant pace down and understanding it, you will become more uh, intentional and more accurate. So when people are unavailable, holidays, vacations, and things like that, 
The product owner understands that the team has reduced capacity. The team will not be able to finish the same amount of work as it finished in previous time periods. So teams estimate what they can complete, which is a measure of capacity. The whole topic of capacity is covered in our course. I advise you, if you're looking for training, my friends, if you feel, wow, this stuff is going pretty quick, I, I need to get my ducks in a row for my exam. Well, we can help you. Go on down to agileprinciple.com, agileprinciple.com. We have a full-blown agile course for those of you getting ready for the PMP exam that covers all of this stuff in a lot of detail for your PMP exam, all right? Highly recommend it. All right, some of the things we want to consider when we are planning for iteration-based agile are things such as uh, continuous integration, acceptance test-driven development, spikes, testing at all levels, and TDD and BDD. These are talked about in the Agile Practice Guide. I'm not gonna dwell on these. Uh, let's move on. Our time is almost up for this very, very quick webinar. Uh, two of the very important artifacts, or well, I shouldn't call them artifacts, we'll call them uh, documents or reports that are used in the world of Agile are burn down charts and burn up charts. And iteration, burn down charts, and iteration, burn up charts. Some teams prefer looking at a burn down chart because uh, burn down charts show you as you're burning the work down and you're able to see what is left burn up charts show you as you're getting work done it's some people say more of a positive reinforcement to see what we're doing than to see oh we've got all of this left so the burn down chart show you the story points remaining to be completed the burn up chart show you the story points done and some people prefer seeing uh what is done uh, as opposed to what is left all right let's jump into the next chapter um, organizational considerations for project agility, going into chapter six. Every project exists in an organizational context. Cultures, structures, and policies can influence both the direction and the outcome of any project. These dynamics can change, can challenge project leaders. While project leaders may not have the ability to change organizational dynamics as they see fit, they are expected to navigate those dynamics skillfully. Another word of caution for those of you taking the exam, uh, this is one of the areas I would advise you to, to double down on because uh, legend has it, it is very significant on this new exam. Another piece to understand is organizational change management, which covers skills and techniques for influencing changes that support agility. PMI have a brilliant publication. It's called Managing Change in Organizations, a practice guide. It describes a comprehensive and holistic approach for successfully introducing meaningful change. And the recommendations offered there include models for describing change dynamics, a framework for achieving change, and application of change management practices at project, program, and portfolio levels. And there's overlap. When you talk about agile considerations and change management, there's overlap. In order for you to be successful in implementing agile in a firm, you need to be uh, ready for the change. You need to expect what comes with the change. 